section one of a social history of the american negro this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org a social history of the american negro by benjamin griffith brawley chapter one part one the coming of negroes to america one african origins an outstanding characteristic of recent years has been an increasing recognition of the cultural importance of africa to the world from all that has been written three facts are prominent one that at some time early in the middle ages perhaps about the seventh century there was a considerable infiltration of arabian culture into the tribes living below the sahara something of which may to-day most easily be seen among such people as the houses in the soudan and the mandingos along the west coast two that whatever influences came in from the outside there developed in africa an independent culture which must not be underestimated and three that perhaps vastly more than has been supposed this african culture had to do with early exploration and colonization in america the first of these three facts is very important but is now generally accepted and need not here detain us for the present purpose the second and third demand more attention the development of native african art is a theme of never-ending fascination for the ethnologist especially have striking resemblances between negro and oceanian culture been pointed out in political organization as well as certain forms of artistic endeavor the negro people have achieved creditable results and especially have they been honored as the originators of the iron technique it has further been shown that fetishism which is especially well developed along the west coast and its hinterland is at heart not very different from the manitou beliefs of the american indians and it is this connection that furnishes the key to some of the most striking results of the researches of the latest and most profound student of this and related problems from the soudan radiated a culture that was destined to affect europe and in course of time to extend its influence even beyond the atlantic ocean it is important to remember that throughout the early history of europe and up to the close of the fifteenth century the approach to the home of the negro was by land the soudan was thought to be the edge of the then known world homer speaks of the ethiopians as the farthest removed of men and separated into two divisions later greek writers carry the description still further and speak of the two divisions as eastern and western the eastern occupying the countries eastward of the nile and the western stretching from the western shores of that river to the atlantic coast one of these divisions says lady lugard we have to acknowledge was perhaps itself the original source of the civilization which has through egypt permeated the western world when the history of negro land comes to be written in detail it may be found that the kingdoms lying toward the eastern end of the soudan were the home of races who inspired rather than of races who received the traditions of civilization associated for us with the name of ancient egypt if now we come to america we find that the negro influence upon the indian to be so strong as to call in question all current conceptions of american archaeology and so early as to suggest the coming of men from the guinea coast perhaps even before the coming of columbus 
the first natives of africa to come were mandingos many of the words used by the indians in their daily life appeared to be not more than corruptions or adaptations of words used by the tribes of africa and the more we study the remains of those who lived in america before fourteen ninety two and the far-reaching influence of african products and habits the more must we acknowledge the strength of the position of the latest thesis this whole subject will doubtless receive much more attention from scholars but in any case it is evident that the demands of negro culture can no longer be lightly regarded or brushed aside and that as a scholarly contribution to the subject wiener's work is of the very highest importance two the negro in spanish exploration when we come to columbus himself the accuracy of whose accounts has so recently been questioned we find a negro pedro alonso nino as the pilot of one of the famous three vessels in fourteen ninety six nino sailed to santo domingo and he was also with columbus on his third voyage with two men cristobal de la guerra who served as pilot and luis de la guerra a spanish merchant in fourteen ninety nine he planned what proved to be the first successful commercial voyage to the new world the revival of slavery at the close of the middle ages and the beginning of the system of negro slavery were due to the commercial expansion of portugal in the fifteenth century the very word negro is the modern spanish and portuguese form of the latin niger in fourteen forty one prince henry sent out one gonzales who captured three moors on the africa coast these men offered as ransom ten negroes whom they had taken the negroes were taken to lisbon in fourteen forty two and in fourteen forty four prince henry regularly began the european trade from the guinea coast for fifty years his country enjoyed a monopoly of the traffic by fourteen seventy four negroes were numerous in spain and special interest attaches to juan de valladolid probably the first of many negroes who in time came to have influence and power over their people under the authority of a greater state he was addressed as judge of all the negroes and mulattoes free or slaves which are in the very loyal and noble city of seville archbishopric thereof after fifteen hundred there are frequent references to negroes especially in the spanish west indies instructions to ovando governor of hispaniola in fifteen o one prohibited the passage to the indies of jews moors or recent converts but authorized him to take over negro slaves who had been born in the power of christians these orders were actually put in force the next year even the restricted importation ovando found inadvisable and he very soon requested that negroes be not sent as they ran away to the indians with whom they soon made friends isabella accordingly withdrew her permission but after her death ferdinand reverted to the old plan and in fifteen o five sent to ovando seventeen negro slaves for work in the copper mines where the severity of the labor was rapidly destroying the indians in fifteen ten ferdinand directed that fifty negroes be sent immediately and that more be sent later and in april of this year over a hundred were bought in the lisbon market this says bourne was the real beginning of the african slave trade to america already however as early as fifteen o four a considerable number of negroes had been introduced from guinea because as we are informed the work of one negro was worth more than that of four indians in fifteen thirteen thirty negroes assisted balboa in building the first ships made on the pacific coast of america in fifteen seventeen spain formally entered upon the traffic charles v on his accession to the throne granting license for the introduction of negroes to the number of four hundred and thereafter importation to the west indies became a thriving industry 
those who came in these early years were sometimes men of considerable intelligence having been trained as mohammedans or catholics by fifteen eighteen negroes were at work in the sugar mills in hispaniola where they seemed to have suffered from indulgence in drinks made from sugar-cane in fifteen twenty one it was ordered that negro slaves should not be employed on errands as in general these tended to cultivate too close acquaintance with the indians in fifteen twenty two there was a rebellion on the sugar plantations in hispaniola primarily because the services of certain indians were discontinued twenty negroes from the admiral's mill uniting with twenty others who spoke the same language killed a number of christians they fled and nine leagues away they killed another spaniard and sacked a house one negro assisted by twelve indian slaves also killed nine other christians after much trouble the negroes were apprehended and several of them hanged it was about fifteen twenty six the negroes were first introduced within the present limits of the united states being brought to a colony near what later became jamestown virginia here the negroes were harshly treated and in course of time they rose against their oppressors and fired their houses the settlement was broken up and the negroes and their spanish companions returned to hispaniola whence they had come in fifteen forty in quivira in mexico there was a negro who had taken holy orders and in fifteen forty two there were established at guamanga three brotherhoods of the true cross of spaniards one being for indians and one for negroes the outstanding instance of a negro's heading in exploration is that of estebanico or estevanillo or esteban that is stephen one of the four survivors of the ill-fated expedition of de narvaez who sailed from spain june seventeen fifteen twenty seven having returned to spain after many years of service in the new world pamphilio de narvaez petitioned for a grant and accordingly the right to conquer and colonize the country between the rio de las palmas in eastern mexico and florida was accorded him his force originally consisted of six hundred soldiers and colonists the whole conduct of the expedition incompetent in the extreme furnished one of the most appalling tragedies of early exploration in america the original number of men was reduced by half by storms and hurricanes and desertions in santo domingo and cuba and those who were left landed in april fifteen twenty eight near the entrance to tampa bay on the west coast of florida one disaster followed another in the vicinity of pensacola bay and the mouth of the mississippi until at length only four men survived these were alvar nunez cabeza de vaca andres dorantes de carranza a captain of infantry alonzo del castillo maldonato and estebanico who had originally come from the west coast of morocco and who was a slave of dorantes these men had most remarkable adventures in the years between fifteen twenty eight and fifteen thirty six and as a narrative of suffering and privation cabeza de vaca's journal has hardly an equal in the annals of the continent both dorantes and estebanico were captured and indeed for a season or two all four men were forced to sojourn among the indians they treated the sick and with such success did they work that their fame spread far and wide among the tribes crowds followed them from place to place showering presents upon them with alonzo de castillo estevanico sojourned for a while with the iguanzas a very savage tribe that killed its own male children and bought those of strangers he at length escaped from these people and spent several months with the abavaras he afterwards went with de vaca to the maliaconas only a short distance from the abavaras and still later he accompanied alonzo de castillo in exploring the country toward the rio grande he was unexcelled as a guide who could make his way through new territory in fifteen thirty nine he went with fray marcos of nice the father provincial of the franciscan order in new spain as a guide to the seven cities of cibola the villages of the ancestors of the present zunai indians in western new mexico 
preceding fray marcos by a few days and accompanied by natives who joined him on the way he reached hawica the southernmost of the seven towns here he and all but three of his indian followers were killed three development of the slave trade portugal and spain having demonstrated that the slave trade was profitable england also determined to engage in the traffic and as early as fifteen thirty william hawkins a merchant of plymouth visited the guinea coast and took away a few slaves england really entered the field however with the voyage in fifteen sixty two of captain john hawkins son of william who in october of this year also went to the coast of guinea he had a fleet of three ships and one hundred men and partly by the sword and partly by other means he took three hundred or more negroes whom he took to santo domingo and sold profitably he was richly laden going homeward and some of his stores were seized by spanish vessels hawkins made two other voyages one in fifteen sixty four and another with drake in fifteen sixty seven on his second voyage he had four armed ships the largest being the jesus a vessel of seven hundred tons and a force of one hundred and seventy men december and january fifteen sixty four to five he spent in picking up freight and by sickness and fights with the negroes he lost many of his men then at the end of january he set out for the west indies he was becalmed for twenty-one days but he arrived at the island of dominica march nine he traded along the spanish coasts and on his return to england he touched at various points in the west indies and sailed along the coast of florida on his third voyage he had five ships he himself was again in command of the jesus while drake was in charge of the judith a little vessel of fifty tons he got together between four and five hundred negroes and again went to dominica he had various adventures and at last was thrown by a storm on the coast of mexico here after three days he was attacked by a spanish fleet of twelve vessels and all of his ships were destroyed except the judith and another small vessel the minion which was so crowded that one hundred men risked the dangers on land rather than go to sea with her on this last voyage hawkins and drake had among their companions the earls of pembroke and leicester who were then like other young elizabethans seeking fame and fortune it is noteworthy that in all that he did hawkins seems to have had no sense of cruelty or wrong he held religious services morning and evening and in the spirit of the later cromwell he enjoined upon his men to serve god daily love one another preserve their victuals, beware of fire and keep good company queen elizabeth evidently regarded the opening of the slave trade as a worthy achievement for after his second voyage she made hawkins a knight giving him for a crest the device of a negro's head and bust with the arms securely bound france joined in the traffic in sixteen twenty four and then holland and denmark and the rivalry soon became intense england with her usual aggressiveness assumed a commanding position and much more than has commonly been supposed the navigation ordinance of sixteen fifty one and the two wars with the dutch in the seventeenth century had as their basis the struggle for supremacy in the slave trade the english trade proper began with the granting of rights to special companies to one in sixteen eighteen to another in sixteen thirty one and in sixteen sixty two to the company of royal adventurers rechartered in sixteen seventy two as the royal african company to which in sixteen eighty seven was given the exclusive right to trade between the gold coast and the british colonies in america james duke of york was interested in this last company and it agreed to supply the west indies with three thousand slaves annually in sixteen ninety eight on account of the incessant clamour of english merchants the trade was open generally and any vessel carrying the british flag was by act of parliament permitted to engage in it on payment of a duty of ten per cent on english goods exported to africa new england immediately engaged in the traffic and vessels from boston and newport went forth to the gold coast laden with hogsheads of rum in course of time there developed a three-cornered trade by which molasses was brought from the west indies to new england 
made into rum to be taken to africa and exchanged for slaves the slaves in turn being brought to the west indies or the southern colonies a slave purchased for one hundred gallons of rum worth ten pounds brought from twenty pounds to fifty pounds when offered for sale in america nupo soon had twenty-two still houses and even these could not satisfy the demand england regarded the slave trade as of such importance that when in seventeen thirteen she accepted the peace of utrecht she insisted on having awarded to her for thirty years the exclusive right to transport slaves to the spanish colonies in america when in the course of the eighteenth century the trade became fully developed scores of vessels went forth each year to engage in it but just how many slaves were brought to the present united states and how many were taken to the west indies or south america it is impossible to say in seventeen twenty six the three cities of london bristol and liverpool alone had one hundred and seventy one ships engaged in the traffic and the profits were said to warrant a thousand more though such a number was probably never reached so far as england alone was concerned four planting of slavery in the colonies it is only for virginia that we can state with definiteness the year in which negro slaves were first brought to an english colony on the mainland when legislation on the subject of slavery first appears elsewhere slaves are already present about the last of august sixteen nineteen says john rolfe in john smith's general history came in a dutch man-of-war that sold us twenty niggers these niggers were sold into servitude and virginia did not give statutory recognition to slavery as a system until sixteen sixty one the importations being too small to make the matter one of importance in this year however an act of assembly staked that negroes were incapable of making satisfaction for the time lost in running away by addition of time and thus slavery gained a firm place in the oldest of the colonies End of chapter 1, part 1section two of the social history of the american negro by benjamin griffith raleigh this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter one part two negroes were first imported into massachusetts from barbados a year or two before sixteen thirty eight but in john winthrop's journal under date february twenty sixth of this year we have positive evidence on the subject as follows mr pierce in the salem ship the desire returned from the west indies after seven months he had been at providence and brought some cotton and tobacco and negroes etc from thence and salt from tortugos dry fish and strong liquors are the only commodities for those parts he met there two men of war sent forth by the lords etc of providence with letters of mart who had taken divers prizes from the spaniard and many negroes it was in sixteen forty one that there was passed in massachusetts the first act on the subject of slavery and this was the first positive statement in any of the colonies with reference to the matter said this act there shall never be any bond slavery villainage nor captivity among us unless it be lawful captives taken in just wars and such strangers as willingly sell themselves or are sold to us and these shall have all the liberties and christian usages which the law of god established in israel requires this article clearly sanctioned slavery of the three classes of persons referred to the first was made up of indians the second of white people under the system of indenture and the third of negroes in this whole matter as in many others massachusetts moved in advance of the other colonies the first definitely to legalize slavery in course of time she became also the foremost representative of sentiment against the system in sixteen forty six one john smith brought home two negroes from the guinea coast where we are told he had been the means of killing near a hundred more the general court conceiving themselves bound by the first opportunity to, to bear witness against the heinous and crying sin of man's stealing ordered that the negroes be sent at public expense to their native country in later cases however massachusetts did not find herself able to follow this precedent in general in these early years 
new england was more concerned about indians than about negroes as the presence of the former in large numbers was a constant menace while negro slavery had not yet assumed its most serious aspects in new york slavery began under the dutch rule and continued under the english before or about sixteen fifty the dutch west india company brought some negroes to new netherland most of these continued to belong to the company though after a period of labor under the common system of indenture some of the more trusty were permitted to have small farms from the produce of which they made return to the company their children however continued to be slaves in sixteen sixty four new netherland became new york the next year in the code of english laws that was drawn up it was enacted that no christian shall be kept in bond slavery villainage or captivity except who shall be judged thereunto by authority or such as willingly have sold or shall sell themselves as at first there was some hesitancy about making negroes christians this act like the one in massachusetts by implication permitted slavery it was in sixteen thirty two that the grant including what is now the states of maryland and delaware was made to george calvert first lord baltimore though slaves are mentioned earlier it was in sixteen sixty three to four that the maryland legislature passed its first enactment on the subject of slavery it was declared that all negroes and other slaves within this province and all negroes and other slaves to be here in after imported into this province shall serve during life and all children born of any negro or other slave shall be slaves as their fathers were for the term of their lives in delaware and new jersey the real beginning of slavery are unusually hazy the dutch introduced the system in both of these colonies in the laws of new jersey the word slaves occurs as early as sixteen sixty four and acts for the regulation of the conduct of those in bondage began with the practical union of the colony with new york in seventeen o two the lot of the slave was somewhat better here than in most of the colonies although the system was in existence in delaware almost from the beginning of the colony it did not receive legal recognition until seventeen twenty one when there was passed an act providing for the trial of slaves in a special court with two justices and six freeholders as early as sixteen thirty nine there are incidental reference to negroes in pennsylvania and there are frequent references after this date in this colony there were strong objections to importing of negroes in spite of the demand for them penn in his charter to the free society of traders in sixteen eighty two enjoined upon the members of this company that if they held black slaves these should be free at the end of fourteen years the negroes then to become the company's tenants in sixteen eighty eight there originated in germantown a protest against negro slavery that was the first formal action ever taken against the barter in human flesh within the boundaries of the united states here a small company of germans was assembled april eighteenth sixteen eighty eight and there was drawn up a document signed by garrett hendrix franz daniel pastorius dirk optin graf and abraham optin graf the protest was addressed to the monthly meeting of the quakers about to take place in lower dublin the monthly meeting on april thirty felt that it could not pretend to take action on such an important matter and referred it to the quarterly meeting in june this in turn passed it on to the yearly meeting the highest tribunal of the quakers here it was laid on the table and for the next few years nothing resulted from it about sixteen ninety six however opposition to slavery on the part of the quakers began to be active in the colony at large before seventeen hundred the lot of the negro was regularly one of servitude laws were made for servants white or black and regulations and restrictions were largely identical in seventeen hundred however legislation began more definitely to fix the status of the slave in this year an act of the legislature forbade the selling of negroes out of the province without their consent but in other ways it denied the personality of the slave this act met further formal approval in seventeen o five when special courts were ordained for the trial and punishment of slaves and when importation from carolina was forbidden on the ground that it made trouble with the indians nearer home 
in seventeen hundred a maximum duty of twenty shillings was placed on each negro imported and in seventeen o five this was doubled there being already some competition with white labor in seventeen twelve the assembly sought to prevent importation altogether by a duty of twenty pounds a head this act was repealed in england and a duty of five pounds in seventeen fifteen was also repealed in seventeen twenty nine however the duty was fixed at two pounds at which figure it remained for a generation it was almost by accident that slavery was officially recognized in connecticut in sixteen fifty the code of laws compiled for the colony in this year was especially harsh on the indians it was enacted that certain of them who incurred the displeasure of the colony might be made to serve the person injured or be shipped out and exchanged for negroes in sixteen eighty the governor of the colony informed the board of trade that as for blacks there came sometimes three or four in a year from barbados and they are usually sold at the rate of twenty-two pounds apiece these people were regarded rather as servants than as slaves and early legislation was mainly in the line of police regulations designed to prevent their running away in sixteen fifty two it was enacted in rhode island that all slaves brought into the colony should be set free after ten years of service this law was not designed as might be supposed to restrict slavery it was really a step in the evolution of the system and the limit of ten years was by no means observed the only legal recognition of the law was in the series of acts beginning january four seventeen o three to control the wandering of african slaves and servants and another beginning in april seventeen o eight in which the slave trade was indirectly legalized by being taxed in course of time rhode island became the greatest slave trader in the country becoming a sort of clearing-house for the other colonies new hampshire profiting by the experience of the neighboring colony of massachusetts deemed it best from the beginning to discourage slavery there were so few negroes in the colony as to form a quantity practically negligible the system was recognized however an act being passed in seventeen fourteen to regulate the conduct of slaves and another four years later to regulate that of masters in north carolina even more than in most of the colonies the system of negro slavery was long controlled by custom rather than by legal enactment it was recognized by law in seventeen fifteen however and police regulations to govern the slaves were enacted in south carolina the history of slavery is particularly noteworthy the natural resources of this colony offered a ready home for the system and the laws here formulated were as explicit as any ever enacted slaves were first imported from barbados and their status received official confirmation in sixteen eighty two by seventeen twenty the number had increased to twelve thousand the white people numbering only nine thousand by sixteen ninety eight such was the fear from the preponderance of the negro population that a special act was passed to encourage white immigration legislation for the better ordering of slaves was passed in sixteen ninety and in seventeen twelve the first regular slave law was enacted once before seventeen thirteen the year of the asiento contract of the peace of utrecht and several times after this date prohibitive duties were placed on negroes to guard against their too rapid increase by seventeen thirty four however importation had again reached large proportions and in seventeen forty in consequence of recent insurrectionary efforts a prohibitive duty several times larger than the previous one was placed upon negroes brought into the province the colony of georgia was chartered in seventeen thirty two and actually founded the next year oglethorpe's idea was that the colony should be a refuge for persecuted christians and the debtor classes of england slavery was forbidden on the ground that georgia was to defend the other english colonies from the spaniards on the south and that it would not be able to do this if like south carolina it dissipated its energies in guarding negro slaves for years the development of georgia was slow and the prosperous condition of south carolina constantly suggested to the planters that the one thing needful for their highest welfare was slavery again and again were petitions addressed to the trustees george whitefield being among those who most urgently advocated the innovation moreover negroes from south carolina were sometimes hired for life 
and purchases were openly made in savannah it was not until seventeen forty nine however that the trustees yielded to the request in seventeen fifty five the legislature passed an act that regulated the conduct of the slaves and in seventeen sixty five a more regular code was adopted thus did slavery finally gain a foothold in what was destined to become one of the most important of the southern states for the first fifty or sixty years of the life of the colonies the introduction of negroes was slow the system of white servitude furnished most of the labor needed and england had not yet won supremacy in the slave trade it was in the last quarter of the seventeenth century that importations began to be large and in the course of the eighteenth century the numbers grew by leaps and bounds in sixteen twenty five six years after the first negroes were brought to the colony there were in virginia only twenty three negroes twelve male eleven female in sixteen fifty nine there were three hundred but in sixteen eighty three there were three thousand and in seventeen o eight twelve thousand in sixteen eighty governor simon bradstreet reported to england with reference to massachusetts that no company of blacks or slaves had been brought into the province since its beginning for the space of fifty years with the exception of a small vessel that two years previously after twenty months voyage to madagascar had brought hither between forty and fifty negroes mainly women and children who were sold for ten pounds fifteen pounds and twenty pounds apiece occasionally two or three negroes were brought from barbados or other islands and altogether there were in massachusetts at the time not more than one hundred or one hundred and twenty the colonists were at first largely opposed to the introduction of slavery and numerous acts were passed prohibiting it in virginia massachusetts and elsewhere and in georgia as we have seen it had at first been expressly forbidden english businessmen however had no scruples about the matter about sixteen sixty three a british committee on foreign plantations declared that black slaves are the most useful appurtenances of a plantation and twenty years later the lords commissioners of trade stated that the colonists could not possibly subsist without an adequate supply of slaves laws passed in the colonies were regularly disallowed by the crown and royal governors were warned that the colonists would not be permitted to discourage a traffic so beneficial to the nation before seventeen seventy two virginia passed not less than thirty-three acts looking toward the prohibition of the importation of slaves but in every instance the act was annulled by england in the far south especially in south carolina we have seen that there were increasingly heavy duties in spite of all such efforts for restriction however the system of negro slavery once well started developed apace in two colonies not among the original thirteen but important in the later history of the united states negroes were present at a very early date in the spanish colony of florida from the very first and in the french colony of louisiana as soon as new orleans really began to grow negroes accompanied the spaniards in their voyages along the south atlantic coast early in the sixteenth century and specially trained spanish slaves assisted in the founding of st augustine in fifteen sixty five the ambitious schemes in france of the great adventurer john law and especially the design of the mississippi company chartered seventeen seventeen included an agreement for the importation into louisiana of six thousand white persons and three thousand negroes the company having secured among other privileges the exclusive right to trade with the colony for twenty-five years and the absolute ownership of all mines in it the sufferings of some of the white emigrants from france the kidnapping the revenge of the chicanery that played so large a part all make a story complete in itself as for the negroes it was definitely stipulated that these should not come from another french colony without the consent of the governor of that colony the contract had only begun to be carried out when law's bubble burst however in june seventeen twenty one there were six hundred negroes in louisiana in seventeen forty five the number had increased to two thousand twenty the stories connected with these people are as tragic and wildly romantic as are most of the stories in the history of louisiana in fact this colony from the very first owed not a little of its abandon and its fascination to the mysticism that the negroes themselves brought from africa in the midst of much that is apocryphal one or two events or episodes stand out with distinctness in seventeen twenty nine perrier governor at the time testified with reference to a small company of negroes who had been sent against the indians as follows fifteen negroes in whose hands we had put weapons performed prodigies of valor if the blacks did not cost so much and if their labors were not so necessary to the colony it would be better to turn them into soldiers 
and to dismiss those we have who are so bad and so cowardly that they seem to have been manufactured purposely for this colony not always however did the negroes fight against the indians in seventeen thirty some representatives of the powerful banbaras had an understanding with the chickasaws by which the latter were to help them in exterminating all the white people and in setting up an independent republic they were led by a strong and desperate negro named samba but as a result of this effort for freedom samba and seven of his companions were broken on the wheel and a woman was hanged already however there had been given the suggestion of the possible alliance in the future of the indian and the negro from the very first also because of the freedom from restraint of all the elements of population that entered into the life of the colony there was the beginning of that mixture of the races which was later to tell so vitally on the social life of louisiana and whose effects are so readily apparent even to-day five the wake of the slave ship thus it was that negroes came to america thus it was also we might say that the negro problem came though it was not for decades not until the budding years of american nationality that the ultimate reaches of the problem were realized those who came were by no means all of exactly the same race stock and language plantations frequently exhibited a variety of customs and sometimes traditional enemies became brothers in servitude the center of the colonial slave trade was the african coast for about two hundred miles east of the great niger river from this comparatively small region came as many slaves as from all the rest of africa together a number of those who came were of entirely different race stock from the negroes some were moors and a very few were malays from madagascar the actual procuring of the slaves was by no means as easy a process as is sometimes supposed in general the slave mart brought out the most vicious passions of all who were in any way connected with the traffic the captain of the vessel had to resort to various expedients to get his cargo his commonest method was to bring with him a variety of gay cloth cheap ornaments and whiskey which he would give in exchange for slaves brought to him his task was most simple when a chieftain of one tribe brought to him several hundred prisoners of war ordinarily however the work was more toilsome and kidnapping a favorite method though individuals were sometimes enticed on vessels the work was always dangerous for the natives along the slave coast soon became suspicious after they had seen some of their tribesmen taken away they learned not to go unarmed while a slave vessel was on the coast and very often there were hand-to-hand -hand encounters it was not long before it began to be impressed upon those interested in the trade that it was not good business to place upon the captain of a vessel the responsibility of getting together three or four hundred slaves and that it would be better if he could find his cargo waiting for him when he came thus arose the so-called factories which were nothing more than warehouses along the coast were placed small settlements of europeans whose business it was to stimulate slave-hunting expeditions negotiate for slaves brought in and see that they were kept until the arrival of the ships practically every nation engaged in the traffic planted factories of this kind along the west coast from cape verde to the equator and thus it was that this part of africa began to be the most flagrantly exploited region in the world thus whisky and all the other vices of civilization began to come to a simple and home-loving people once on board the slaves were put in chains two by two when the ship was ready to start the hold of the vessel was crowded with moody and unhappy wretches who most often were made to crouch so that their knees touched their chins but who also were frequently made to lie on their sides spoon fashion sometimes the space between floor and ceiling was still further diminished by the water barrels on the top of these barrels boards were placed on the boards the slaves had to lie and in the little space that remained they had to subsist as well as they could there was generally only one entrance to the hold and provision for only the smallest amount of air through the gratings on the sides the clothing of a captive if there was any at all consisted of only a rag about the loins the food was half rotten rice yams beans or soup and sometimes bread and meat the cooking was not good nor was any care taken to see that all were fed water was always limited a pint a day being a generous allowance frequently no more than a gill could be had the rule was to bring the slaves from the hold twice a day for an airing about eight o'clock in the morning and four in the afternoon but this plan was not always followed on deck they were made to dance by the lash and they were also forced to sing thus were born the sorrow of songs the last cry of those who saw their homeland vanish behind them for ever sometimes there were stern fights on board 
sometimes food was refused in order that death might be hastened when opportunity served some leaped overboard in the hope of being taken back to africa throughout the night the hold resounded with the moans of those who awoke from dreams of home to find themselves in bonds women became hysterical and both men and women became insane fearful and contagious diseases broke out smallpox was one of these more common was ophthalmia a frightful inflammation of the eyes a blind and hence a worthless slave was thrown to the sharks the putrid atmosphere the melancholy and the sudden transition from heat to cold greatly increased the mortality and frequently when morning came a dead and a living slave were found shackled together a captain always counted on losing one-fourth of his cargo sometimes he lost a great deal more back on the shore a grave figure with strained gaze watched the ship fade away an old woman sadly typical of the great african mother with her vision she better than any one else perceived the meaning of it all the men with hard faces who came to buy and sell might deceive others but not her in a great vague way she felt that something wrong had attacked the very heart of her people she saw men wild with the whiskey of the christian nations commit crimes undreamed of before she did not like the coast towns the girl who went thither came not home again and a young man was lost to all that africa held dear in course of time she saw every native craft despise them instead of the fabric that her own fingers wove her children yearned for the tinsel and the jujaws of the trader she cursed this man and she called upon all her spirits to banish the evil but when at last all was of no avail when the strongest youth or the dearest maiden had gone she went back to her hut and ate her heart out in the darkness she wept for her children and would not be comforted because they were not then slowly to the untutored mind somehow came the promise these are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb they shall hunger no more neither thirst any more neither shall the sun light on them nor any heat for the lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them unto living fountains of water and god shall wipe away all tears from their eyes End of chapter one part two section three of a social history of the american negro by benjamin griffith brawley this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two part one the negro in the colonies the negroes who were brought from africa to america were brought hither to work and to work under compulsion hence any study of their social life in the colonial era must be primarily a study of their life under the system of slavery and of the efforts of individuals to break away from the same one servitude and slavery for the antecedents of negro slavery in america one must go back to the system of indentured labor known as servitude this has been defined as a legalized status of indian white and negro servants preceding slavery in most if not all of the english mainland colonies a study of servitude will explain many of the acts with reference to negroes especially those about intermarriage with white people for the origins of the system one must go back to social conditions in england in the seventeenth century while villainage had been formally abolished in england at the middle of the fourteenth century it still lingered in remote places and even if men were not technically villains they might be subjected to long periods of service by the middle of the fifteenth century the demand for wool had led to the enclosure of many farms for sheep raising and accordingly to distress on the part of many agricultural laborers conditions were not improved early in the sixteenth century and they were in fact made more acute the abolition of the monasteries doing away with many of the sources of relief men out of work were thrown upon the highways and thus became a menace to society in fifteen sixty four the price of wheat was nineteen shillings a quarter and wages were seven pence a day the situation steadily grew worse and in sixteen ten while wages were still the same wheat was thirty-five shillings a quarter 
rents were constantly rising moreover and many persons died from starvation in the course of the seventeenth century paupers and dissolute persons more and more filled the jails and workhouses meanwhile in the young colonies across the sea labor was scarce and it seemed to many an act of benevolence to bring from england persons who could not possibly make a living at home and give them some chance in the new world from the very first children and especially young people between the ages of twelve and twenty were the most desired the london company undertook to meet half of the cost of the transportation and maintenance of children sent out by parish authorities the understanding being that it would have the service of the same until they were of age the company was to teach each boy a trade and when his freedom year arrived was to give to each one fifty acres a cow some seed corn tools and firearms he then became the company's tenant for seven years more giving to it one half of his produce at the end of which time he came into full possession of twenty-five acres after the company collapsed individuals took up the idea children under twelve years of age might be bound for seven years and persons over twenty-one for no more than four but the common term was five years under this system fell servants voluntary and involuntary hundreds of people too poor to pay for their transportation sold themselves for a number of years to pay for the transfer some who were known as free willers had some days in which to dispose of themselves to the best advantage in america if they could not make satisfactory terms they too were sold to pay for the passage more important from the standpoint of the system itself however was the number of involuntary servants brought hither political offenders vagrants and other criminals were thus sent to the colonies and many persons especially boys and girls were kidnapped in the streets of london and spirited away thus came irishmen or scotchmen who had incurred the ire of the crown cavaliers or roundheads according as one party or the other was out of power and farmers who had engaged in monmouth's rebellion and in the year sixteen eighty alone it was estimated that not less than ten thousand persons were spirited away from england it is easy to see how such a system became a highly profitable one for shipmasters and those in connivance with them virginia objected to the criminals and in sixteen seventy one the house of burgesses passed a law against the importing of such persons and the same was approved by the governor seven years later however it was set aside for the transportation of political offenders as having the status of an apprentice the servant could sue in court and he was regularly allowed freedom dues at the expiration of his term he could not vote however could not bear weapons and of course could not hold office in some cases especially where the system was voluntary servants sustained kindly relations with their masters a few even becoming secretaries or tutors more commonly however the lot of the indentured labourer was a hard one his food often being only coarse indian meal and water mixed with molasses the moral effect of the system was bad in the fate to which it subjected woman and in the evils resulting from the sale of the labour of children in this whole connection however it is to be remembered that the standards of the day were very different from those of our own the modern humanitarian impulse had not yet moved the heart of england and flogging was still common for soldiers and sailors criminals and children alike the first negroes brought to the colonies were technically servants and generally as negro slavery advanced white servitude declined james the second in fact did whatever he could to hasten the end of servitude in order that slavery might become more profitable economic forces were with him for while a slave varied in price from ten pounds to fifty pounds the mere cost of transporting a servant was from six pounds to ten pounds servitude became slavery when to such incidents as alienation disfranchisement whipping and limited marriage were added those of perpetual service and a denial 
of civil juridical marital and property rights as well as a denial of the possession of children even after slavery was well established however white men and women were frequently retained as domestic servants and the system of servitude did not finally pass in all of its phases before the beginning of the revolutionary war negro slavery was thus distinctively an evolution as the first negroes were taken by pirates the rights of ownership could not legally be given to those who purchased them hence slavery by custom preceded slavery by statute little by little the colonies drifted into the sterner system the transition was marked by such an act as that in rhode island which in sixteen fifty two permitted a negro to be bound for ten years we have already referred to the act of assembly in virginia in sixteen sixty one to the effect that negroes were incapable of making satisfaction for time lost in running away by addition of time even before it had become generally enacted or understood in the colonies however that a child born of slave parents should serve for life a new question had arisen that of the issue of a free person and a slave this led virginia in sixteen sixty two to lead the way with an act declaring that the status of a child should be determined by that of the mother which act both gave to slavery the sanction of law and made it hereditary from this time forth virginia took a commanding lead in legislation and it is to be remembered that when we refer to this province we by no means have reference to the comparatively small state of to-day but to the richest and most populous of the colonies this position virginia maintained until after the revolutionary war and not only the present west virginia but the great northwest territory were included in her domain the slave had none of the ordinary rights of citizenship in a criminal case he could be arrested tried and condemned with but one witness against him and he could be sentenced without a jury in virginia in sixteen thirty one hugh davis was ordered to be soundly whipped before an assembly of negroes and others for abusing himself to the dishonor of god and the shame of christians by defiling his body in lying with a negro just ten years afterwards in sixteen forty one robert sweet was ordered to do penance in church according to the laws of england for getting a negro woman with child and the woman to be whipped thus from the very beginning the intermixture of the races was frowned upon and went on all the same by the time moreover that the important acts of sixteen sixty one and sixteen sixty two had formally sanctioned slavery doubt had arisen in the minds of some virginians as to whether one christian could legitimately hold another in bondage and in sixteen sixty seven it was definitely stated that the conferring of baptism did not alter the condition of a person as to his bondage or freedom so that masters free from this doubt could now more carefully endeavor the propagation of christianity in sixteen sixty nine an act about the casual killing of slaves provided that if any slave resisted his master and under the extremity of punishment chanced to die his death was not to be considered a felony and the master was to be acquitted in sixteen seventy it was made clear that none but freeholders and housekeepers should vote in the election of burgesses and in the same year provision was taken against the possible ownership of a white servant by a free negro who nevertheless was not debarred from buying any of his own nation in sixteen ninety two there was legislation for the more speedy prosecution of slaves committing capital crimes and this was re-enacted in seventeen o five when some provision was made for the compensation of owners and when it was further declared that negro mulatto and indian slaves within the dominion were real estate and incapable in law to be witnesses in any cases whatsoever and in seventeen twenty three there was an elaborate and detailed act directing the trial of slaves committing capital crimes and for the more effectual punishing conspiracies and insurrections of them and for the better government of negroes mulattoes and indians bond or free this last act specifically stated that no slave should be set free upon any pretense whatsoever except for some meritorious services to be adjudged and allowed by the governor and council all this legislation was soon found to be too drastic and too difficult to enforce 
the modification was inevitable this came in seventeen thirty two when it was made possible for a slave to be a witness when another slave was on trial for a capital offence and in seventeen forty four this provision was extended to civil cases as well in seventeen forty eight there was a general revision of all existing legislation with special provision against attempted insurrections thus did virginia pave the way and more and more slave codes took on some degree of definiteness and uniformity very important was the act of seventeen o five which provided that a slave might be inventoried as real estate as property henceforth there was nothing to prevent his being separated from his family before the law he was no longer a person but a thing two the indian the mulatto and the free negro all along it is to be observed the problem of the negro was complicated by that of the indian at first there was a feeling that indians were to be treated not as negroes but as on the same basis as englishmen an act in virginia of sixteen sixty one to two summed up this feeling in the provision that they were not to be sold as servants for any longer time than english people of the same age and injuries done to them were to be duly remedied by the laws of england about the same time a powhatan indian sold for life was ordered to be set free an interesting enactment of sixteen seventy attempted to give the indian an intermediate status between that of the englishman and the negro slave as servants not being christians imported into the colony by shipping that is negroes were to be slaves for their lives but those that came by land were to serve if boys or girls until thirty years of age if men or women twelve years and no longer all such legislation however was radically changed as a result of nathaniel bacon's rebellion of sixteen seventy six in which the aid of the natives was invoked against the english governor henceforth indians taken in war became the slaves for life of their captors an elaborate act of sixteen eighty two summed up the new status and indians sold by other indians were to be adjudged deemed and taken to be slaves to all intents and purposes any law usage or custom to the contrary notwithstanding indian women were to be tithables and they were required to pay levies just as negro women from this time forth enactments generally included indians along with negroes but of course the laws placed on the statute books did not always bear close relation to what was actually enforced and in general the indian was destined to be a vanishing rather than a growing problem very early in the eighteenth century in connection with the wars between the english and the spanish in florida hundreds of indians were shipped to the west indies and some to new england massachusetts in seventeen twelve prohibited such importation as the indians were malicious surly and very ungovernable and she was followed to similar effect by pennsylvania in seventeen twelve by new hampshire in seventeen fourteen and by connecticut and rhode island in seventeen fifteen if the indian was destined to be a vanishing factor the mulatto and the free negro most certainly were not in spite of all the laws to prevent it the intermixture of the races increased and manumission somehow also increased sometimes a master in his will provided that several of his slaves should be given their freedom occasionally a slave became free by reason of what was regarded as an act of service to the commonwealth as in the case of one will slave belonging to robert ruffin of the county of surrey in virginia who in seventeen ten divulged a conspiracy there is moreover on record a case of an indentured negro servant john g ween who by his unusual thrift in the matter of some hogs which he raised on the share system with his master was able as early as sixteen forty one to purchase his own son from another master to the perfect satisfaction of all concerned of special importance for some years were those persons who were descendants of negro fathers and indentured white mothers and who at first were of course legally free by sixteen ninety one the problem had become acute in virginia in this year for prevention of that abominable mixture and spurious issue which hereafter may increase in this dominion as well by negroes mulattoes and indians intermarrying with english or other white women as by their unlawful accompanying with one another it was enacted that 
for the time to come whatsoever english or other white man or woman being free shall intermarry with a negro mulatto or indian man or woman bond or free shall within three months after such marriage be banished and removed from this dominion for ever and that the justices of each respective county within this dominion make it their particular care that this act be put in effectual execution a white woman who became the mother of a child by a negro or mulatto was to be fined fifteen pounds sterling in default of payment was to be sold for five years while the child was to be bound in servitude to the church wardens until thirty years of age it was further provided that if any negro or mulatto was set free he was to be transported from the country within six months of his manumission which enactment is typical of those that it was difficult to enforce and that after a while were only irregularly observed in seventeen o five it was enacted that no negro mulatto or indian shall from and after the publication of this act bear any office ecclesiastical civil or military or be in any place of public trust or power within this her majesty's colony and dominion of virginia and to clear any doubt that might arise as to who should be accounted a mulatto it was provided that the child of an indian and the child grandchild or great-grandchild of a negro shall be deemed accounted held and taken to be a mulatto it will be observed that while the act of sixteen seventy said that none but freeholders and housekeepers could vote this act of seventeen o five did not specifically legislate against voting by a mulatto or a free negro and that some such privilege was exercised for a while appears from the definite provision in seventeen twenty three that no free negro mulatto or indian whatsoever shall hereafter have any vote at the election of burgesses or any other election whatsoever in the same year it was provided that free negroes and mulattoes might be employed as drummers or trumpeters in servile labor but that they were not to bear arms and all free negroes above sixteen years of age were declared tithable in seventeen sixty nine however all free negro and mulatto women were exempted from levies as tithables such levies having proved to be burdensome and derogatory to the rights of free-born subjects more than other colonies maryland seems to have been troubled about the intermixture of the races certainly no other phase of slavery here received so much attention this was due to the unusual emphasis on white servitude in the colony in sixteen sixty three it was enacted that any free-born woman intermarrying with a slave should serve the master of the slave during the life of her husband and that any children resulting from the union were also to be slaves this act was evidently intended to frighten the indentured woman from such a marriage it had a very different effect many masters in order to prolong the indenture of their white female servants encouraged them to marry negro slaves accordingly a new law in sixteen eighty one threw the responsibility not on the indentured woman but on the master or mistress in case a marriage took place between a white woman servant and a slave the woman was to be free at once any possible issue was to be free and the minister performing the ceremony and the master or mistress were to be fined ten thousand pounds of tobacco this did not finally dispose of the problem however and in seventeen fifteen in response to a slightly different situation it was enacted that a white woman who became the mother of a child by a free negro father should become a servant for seven years the father also a servant for seven years and the child a servant until thirty-one years of age any white man who begot a negro woman with child whether a free woman or a slave was to undergo the same penalty as a white woman a provision that in course of time was notoriously disregarded in seventeen seventeen the problem was still unsettled and in this year it was enacted that negroes or mulattoes of either sex intermarrying with white people were to be slaves for life except mulattoes born of white women who were to serve for seven years and the white person so intermarrying also for seven years it is needless to say that with all these changing and contradictory provisions many servants and negroes did not even know what the law was in seventeen twenty eight however free mulatto women having illegitimate children by negroes and other slaves and free negro women having illegitimate children by white men and their issue were subjected to the same penalties as in the former act were provided against white women thus vainly did the colony of maryland struggle with the problem of race intermixture generally throughout the south the rule in the matter of the child of the negro father and the indentured white mother was that the child should be bound in servitude for thirty or thirty-one years in the north as well as in the south the intermingling of the blood of the races was discountenanced 
in pennsylvania as early as sixteen seventy seven a white servant was indicted for cohabiting with a negro in sixteen ninety eight the chester county court laid it down as a principle that the mingling of the races was not to be allowed in seventeen twenty two a woman was punished for promoting a secret marriage between a white woman and a negro a little later the assembly received from the inhabitants of the province a petition inveighing against cohabiting and in seventeen twenty five to six a law was passed positively forbidding the mixture of the races in massachusetts as early as seventeen o five and seventeen o eight restraining acts to prevent a spurious and mixed issue ordered the sale of offending negroes and mulattoes out of the colony's jurisdiction and punished christians who intermarried with them by a fine of fifty pounds after the revolutionary war such marriages were declared void and the penalty of fifty pounds was still exacted and not until eighteen forty three was this act repealed thus was the color line with its social and legal distinctions extended beyond the conditions of servitude and slavery and thus early was an important phase of the ultimate negro problem foreshadowed generally then in the south in the colonial period the free negro could not vote could not hold civil office could not give testimony in cases involving white men and could be employed only for fatigue duty in the militia he could not purchase white servants could not intermarry with white people and had to be very circumspect in his relations with slaves no deprivation of privilege however relieved him of the obligation to pay taxes such advantages as he possessed were mainly economic the money gained from his labor was his own he might become skilled at a trade he might buy land he might buy slaves he might even buy his wife and child if as most frequently happened they were slaves and he might have one gun with which to protect his home once in a long while he might even find some opportunity for education as when the church became the legal warden of negro apprentices frequently he found a place in such a trade as that of the barber or in other personal service and such work accounted very largely for the fact that he was generally permitted to remain in communities where tech technically he had no right to be in the north his situation was little better than in the south and along economic lines even harder everywhere his position was a difficult one he was most frequently regarded as idle and shiftless and as a breeder of mischief but if he showed unusual thrift he might even be forced to leave his home and go elsewhere liberty the boon of every citizen the free negro did not possess for all the finer things of life the things that make life worth living the lot that was his was only less hard than that of the slave three first effort for social betterment if now we turn aside from laws and statutes and consider the ordinary life and social intercourse of the negro we shall find more than one contradiction for in the colonial era codes affecting slaves and free negroes had to grope their way to uniformity especially is it necessary to distinguish between the earlier and the later years of the period for as early as seventeen sixty the liberalism of the revolutionary era began to be felt if we consider what was strictly the colonial epoch we may find it necessary to make a division about the year seventeen o five before this date the status of the negro was complicated by the incidents of the system of servitude after it however in virginia pennsylvania and massachusetts alike special discrimination against him on account of race was given formal recognition by seventeen fifteen there were in virginia twenty three thousand negroes and in all the colonies fifty eight thousand eight hundred and fifty or fourteen per cent of the total population by seventeen fifty six however the negroes in virginia numbered one hundred and twenty thousand one hundred and fifty six and the white people but a hundred and seventy three thousand three hundred and sixteen thirty eight of the forty nine counties had more negro than white tithables and eleven of the counties had a negro population varying from one-fourth to one-half more than the white a great many of the negroes had only recently been imported from africa and they were especially baffling to their masters of course when they conversed in their native tongues at first only men were brought but soon women came also and the treatment accorded these people varied all the way from occasional indulgence to the utmost cruelty the hours of work regularly extended from sunrise to sunset though corn husking and rice beating were sometimes continued after dark and overseers were almost invariably ruthless often having a share in the crops those who were house servants would go about only partially clad and the slave might be marked or branded like one of the lower animals he was not thought to have a soul and the law sought to deprive him of all human attributes 
holiday amusement consisted largely of the dances that the negroes had brought with them these being accompanied by the beating of drums and the blowing of horns and funeral ceremonies featured african mummeries for those who were criminal offenders simple execution was not always considered severe enough the right hand might first be amputated the criminal then hanged and his head cut off and his body quartered and the parts suspended in public places sometimes the hanging was in chains and several instances of burning are on record a master was regularly reimbursed by the government for a slave legally executed and in seventeen fourteen there was a complaint in south carolina that the treasury had become almost exhausted by such reimbursements in massachusetts hanging was the worst legal penalty but the obsolete common law punishment was revived in seventeen fifty five to burn alive a slave woman who had killed her master in cambridge end of section three section four of a social history of the american negro by benjamin griffith brawley this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two part two the relations between the free negro and the slave might well have given cause for concern above what was after all only an artificial barrier spoke the call of race and frequently of kindred sometimes at a later date jealousy arose when a master employed a free negro to work with his slaves the one receiving pay and the others laboring without compensation in general however the two groups worked like brothers each giving the other the benefit of any temporary advantage that it possessed sometimes the free negro could serve by reason of the greater freedom of movement that he had and if no one would employ him or if as frequently happened he was browbeaten and cheated out of the reward of his labor the slave might somehow see that he got something to eat in a state of society in which the relation of master and slave was the rule there was of course little place for either the free negro or the poor white man when the pressure became too great the white man moved away the negro finding himself everywhere buffeted in the colonial era at least had little choice but to work out his salvation at home as well as he could more and more character told and if a man had made himself known for his industry and usefulness a legislative act might even be passed permitting him to remain in the face of a hostile law even before seventeen hundred there were in virginia families in which both parents were free colored persons and in which every effort was made to bring up the children in honesty and morality when some prosperous negroes found themselves able to do so they occasionally purchased negroes who might be their own children or brothers in order to give them that protection without which on account of recent manumission they might be required to leave the colony in which they were born thus whatever the motive the tie that bound the free negro and the slave was a strong one and in spite of the fact that negroes who owned slaves were generally known as hard masters as soon as any men of the race began to be really prominent their best endeavor was devoted to the advancement of their people it was not until immediately after the revolutionary war however that leaders of vision and statesmanship began to be developed it was only the materialism of the eighteenth century that accounted for the amazing development of the system of negro slavery and only this that defeated the benevolence of oglethorpe's scheme for the founding of georgia as yet there was no united protest no general movement for freedom and as von holst said long afterwards if the agitation had been wholly left to the churches it would have been long before men could have rightly spoken of a slavery question the puritans however were not wholly unmindful of the evil and the quakers were untiring in their opposition though it was roger williams who in sixteen thirty seven made the first protest that appears in the colonies both john elliot and cotton mather were somewhat generally concerned about the harsh treatment of the negro and the neglect of his spiritual welfare somewhat more to the point was richard baxter the eminent english nonconformist who was a contemporary of both of these men remember said he in speaking of negroes and other slaves that they are of as good a kind as you that is they are reasonable creatures as well as you and born to as much natural liberty if their sin have enslaved them to you yet nature made them your equals 
on the subject of man-stealing he is even stronger to go as pirates and catch up poor negroes or people of another land that never forfeited life or liberty and to make them slaves and sell them is one of the worst kinds of thievery in the world such statements however were not more than the voice of individual opinion the principles of the quakers carried them far beyond the puritans and their history shows what might have been accomplished if other denominations had been as sincere and as unselfish as the society of friends the german town protest of sixteen eighty eight has already been remarked in sixteen ninety three george keith in speaking of fugitives quoted with telling effect the text thou shalt not deliver unto his master the servant which is escaped from his master unto thee deuteronomy twenty three fifteen in sixteen ninety six the yearly meeting in pennsylvania first took definite action in giving as its advice that friends be careful not to encourage the bringing in of any more negroes and that such that have negroes be careful of them bring them to meetings have meetings with them in their families and restrain them from loose and lewd living as much as in them lies and from rambling abroad on first days or other times as early as seventeen thirteen the quakers had in mind a scheme for freeing the negroes and returning them to africa and by seventeen fifteen their efforts against importation had seriously impaired the market for slaves in philadelphia within a century after the germantown protest the abolition of slavery among the quakers was practically accomplished in the very early period there seems to have been little objection to giving a free negro not only religious but also secular instruction indeed he might be entitled to this as in virginia where in sixteen ninety one the church became the agency through which the laws of negro apprenticeship were carried out thus in seventeen twenty seven it was ordered that david james a free negro boy be bound to mr james isdell who was to teach him to read the bible distinctly also the trade of a gunsmith and carry him to the clerk's office and take indenture to that purpose in general the english church did a good deal to provide for the religious instruction of the free negro the reports made in seventeen twenty four to the english bishop by the virginia parish ministers are evidence that the few free negroes in the parishes were permitted to be baptized and were received into the church when they had been taught the catechism among negroes moreover as well as others in the colonies the society for the propagation of the gospel in foreign parts was active as early as seventeen o five in goose creek parish in south carolina among a population largely recently imported from africa a missionary had among his communicants twenty blacks who well understood the english tongue the most effective work of the society however was in new york where as early as seventeen o four a school was opened by elias Neu, a frenchman who after several years of imprisonment because of his protestant faith had come to new york to try his fortune as a trader in seventeen o three he had called the attention of the society to the negroes who were without god in the world and of whose souls there was no manner of care taken and had suggested the appointment of a catechist he himself was prevailed upon to take up the work and he accordingly resigned his position as an elder in the french church and conformed to the church of england he worked with success for a number of years but in seventeen twelve was embarrassed by the charge that his school fomented the insurrection that was planned in that year he finally showed however that only one of his students was in any way connected with the uprising from slave advertisements of the eighteenth century we may gain many sidelights not only on the education of negroes in the colonial era but on their environment and suffering as well one slave can write a pretty good hand plays on the fife extremely well another can both read and write and is a good fiddler still others speak dutch and good english good english and high dutch or sweet and english well charles thomas of delaware bore the following remarkable characterization very black has white teeth has had his left leg broke speaks both french and english and is a very great rogue one man who came from the west indies was born in dominica and speaks french but very little english he is a very ill-natured fellow and has been much cut in his back by often whipping a negro named simon who in seventeen forty ran away in pennsylvania could bleed and draw teeth pretending to be a great doctor worst of all the incidents of slavery however was the lack of regard for home ties and this situation of course obtained in the north as well as the south in the early part of the eighteenth century marriages in new york were by mutual consent only without the blessing of the church and burial was in a common field without any christian office 
in massachusetts in seventeen ten rev samuel phillips drew up a marriage formulary especially designed for slaves and concluding as follows for you must both of you bear in mind that you remain still and really and truly as ever your master's property and therefore it will be justly expected both by god and man that you behave and conduct yourselves as obedient and faithful servants in massachusetts however as in new york marriage was most often by common consent simply without the office of ministers as yet there was no racial consciousness no church no business organization and the chief cooperative effort was in insurrection until the great chain of slavery was thrown off little independent effort could be put forth even in the state of servitude or slavery however the social spirit of the race yearned to assert itself and such an event as a funeral was attractive primarily because of the social features that it developed as early as sixteen ninety three there is record of the formation of a distinct society by negroes in one of his manuscript diaries preserved in the library of the massachusetts historical society cotton mather in october of this year wrote as follows besides the other praying and pious meetings which i have been continually serving in our neighborhood a little after this period a company of poor negroes of their own accord addressed me for my countenance to a design which they had of erecting such a meeting for the welfare of their miserable nation that were servants among us i allowed their design and went one evening and prayed and preached on psalm sixty eight thirty one with them and gave them the following orders which i insert duly for the curiosity of the occasion the rules to which mather here refers are noteworthy as containing not one suggestion of anti-slavery sentiment and as portraying the altogether abject situation of the negro at the time he wrote nevertheless the text used was an inspiring one in any case the document must have historical importance as the earliest thing that has come down to us in the nature of the constitution or by-laws for a distinctively negro organization it is herewith given entire rules for the society of negroes sixteen ninety three we the miserable children of adam and of noah thankfully admiring and accepting the free grace of god that offers to save us from our miseries by the lord jesus christ freely resolve with his help to become the servants of that glorious lord and that we may be assisted in the service of our heavenly master we now join together in a society wherein the following rules are to be observed one it shall be our endeavour to meet in the evening after the sabbath and pray together by turns one to begin and another to conclude the meeting and between the two prayers a psalm shall be sung and a sermon repeated two our coming to the meeting shall never be without the leave of such as have power over us and we will be careful that our meeting may begin and conclude between the hours of seven and nine and that we may not be unseasonably absent from the families whereto we pertain three as we will with the help of god at all times avoid all wicked company so we will receive none into our meeting but such as have sensibly reformed their lives from all manner of wickedness and therefore none shall be admitted without the knowledge and consent of the minister of god in this place unto whom we will also carry every person that seeks for admission among us to be by him examined instructed and exhorted for we will as often as may be obtain some wise and good man of the english in the neighbourhood and especially the officers of the church to look in upon us and by their presence and counsel do what they think fitting for us five if any of our number fall into the sin of drunkenness or swearing or cursing or lying or stealing or notorious disobedience or unfaithfulness unto their masters we will admonish him of his miscarriage and forbid his coming to the meeting for at least one fortnight and except he then come with great signs and hopes of his repentance we will utterly exclude him with blotting his name out of our list six if any of our society defile himself with fornication we will give him our admonition and so debar him from the meeting at least half a year nor shall he return to it ever any more without exemplary testimonies of his becoming a new creature seven we will as we have opportunity set ourselves to do all the good we can to the other negro servants in the town and if any of them should at unfit hours be abroad much more if any of them should run away from their masters we will afford them no shelter but we will do what in us lies that they may be discovered and punished if any of us are found faulty in this matter they shall be no longer of us eight none of our society shall be absent from our meeting without giving a reason of the absence and if it be found that any have pretended unto their owners that they came unto the meeting when they were otherwise and elsewhere employed 
we will faithfully inform their owners and also do what we can to reclaim such person from all such evil courses for the future nine it shall be expected from every one in the society that he learn the catechism and therefore it shall be one of our usual exercises for one of us to ask the questions and for all the rest in their order to say the answers in the catechism either the new english catechism or the assembly's catechism or the catechism in the negro christianized four early insurrections the negroes who came to america directly from africa in the eighteenth century were strikingly different from those whom generations of servitude later made comparatively docile they were wild and turbulent in disposition and were likely at any moment to take revenge for the great wrong that had been inflicted upon them the planters in the south knew this and lived in constant fear of uprisings when the situation became too threatening they placed prohibitive duties on importations they also sought to keep their slaves in subjection by barbarous and cruel modes of punishment both crucifixion and burning being legalized in some early codes on sea as well as on land negroes frequently rose upon those who held them in bondage and sometimes they actually won their freedom more and more however in any study of negro insurrections it becomes difficult to distinguish between a clearly organized revolt and what might be regarded as as simply a personal crime so that those uprisings considered in the following discussion can only be construed as the more representative of the many attempts for freedom made by negro slaves in the colonial era in sixteen eighty seven there was in virginia a conspiracy among the negroes in the northern neck that was detected just in time to prevent slaughter and in surrey county in seventeen ten there was a similar plot betrayed by one of the conspirators in seventeen eleven in south carolina several negroes ran away from their masters and kept out armed robbing and plundering houses and plantations and putting the inhabitants of the province in great fear and terror and governor gibbs more than once wrote to the legislature about amending the negro act as the one already enforced did not reach up to some of the crimes that were daily being committed for one sebastian a spanish negro alive or dead a reward of fifty pounds was offered and he was at length brought in by the indians and taken in triumph to charleston in seventeen twelve in new york occurred an outbreak that occasioned greater excitement than any uprising that had preceded it in the colonies early in the morning of april seventh some slaves of the carmentee and papa tribes who had suffered ill usage set on fire the house of peter van tilbergen armed with guns and knives killed and wounded several persons who came to extinguish the flames they fled however when the governor ordered the cannon to be fired to alarm the town and they got away to the woods as well as they could but not before they had killed several more of the citizens some shot themselves in the woods and others were captured altogether eight or ten white persons were killed and aside from those negroes who had committed suicide eighteen or more were executed several others being transported of those executed one was hanged alive in chains some were burned at the stake and one was left to die a lingering death before the gaze of the town in may seventeen twenty some negroes in south carolina were fairly well organized and killed a man named benjamin Goddle, one white woman and a little negro boy they were pursued and twenty-three taken and six convicted three of the latter were executed the other three escaping in october seventeen twenty two the negroes near the mouth of the rappahannock in virginia undertook to kill the white people while the latter were assembled in church but were discovered and put to flight on this occasion as on most others sunday was the day chosen for the outbreak the negroes then being best able to get together in april seventeen twenty three it was thought that some fires in boston had been started by negroes and the selectmen recommended that if more than two negroes were found lurking together on the streets they should be put in the house of correction in seventeen twenty eight there was a well-organized attempt in savannah then a place of three thousand white people and two thousand seven hundred negroes the plan to kill all the white people failed because of disagreement as to the exact method but the body of negroes had to be fired on more than once before it dispersed in seventeen thirty there was in williamsburg virginia an insurrection that grew out of a report that colonel spotswood had orders from the king to free all baptized persons on his arrival men from all the surrounding counties had to be called in before it could be put down the first open rebellion in south carolina in which negroes were actually armed and embodied took place in seventeen thirty the plan was for each negro to kill his master in the dead of night then for all to assemble supposedly for a dancing bout rush upon the heart of the city take possession of the arms and kill any white man they saw the plot was discovered and the leaders executed 
in this same colony three formidable insurrections broke out within the one year seventeen thirty nine one in st paul's parish one in st john's and one in charleston to some extent these seem to have been fomented by the spaniards in the south and in one of them six houses were burned and as many as twenty-five white people killed the negroes were pursued and fourteen killed within two days twenty more were killed and forty were taken and some of whom were shot some hanged and some gibbeted alive this exemplary punishment as governor gibbs called it was by it no means effective for in the very next year seventeen forty there broke out what might be considered the most formidable insurrection in the south in the whole colonial period a number of negroes having assembled at stono first surprised and killed two young men in a warehouse from which they then took guns and ammunition they then elected as captain one of their own number named cato whom they agreed to follow and they marched towards the southwest with drums beating and colors flying like a disciplined company they entered the home of a man named godfrey and having murdered him and his wife and children they took all the arms he had set fire to this house and proceeded towards jonesboro on their way they plundered and burned every house to which they came killing every white person they found and compelling the negroes to join them governor bull who happened to be returning to charleston from the southward met them and observing them armed spread the alarm which soon reached the presbyterian church at wilton where a number of planters was assembled the women were left in the church trembling with fear while the militia formed and marched in quest of the negroes who by this time had become formidable from the number that had joined them they had marched twelve miles and spread desolation through all the plantations on their way they had then halted in an open field and too soon had begun to sing and drink and dance by way of triumph during these rejoicings the militia discovered them and stationed themselves in different places around them to prevent their escape one party then advanced into the open field and attacked the negroes some were killed and the others were forced to the woods many ran back to the plantations hoping thus to avoid suspicion but most of them were taken and tried such as had been forced to join the uprising against their will were pardoned but all of the chosen leaders and the first insurgents were put to death all carolina we are told was struck with terror and consternation by this insurrection in which more than twenty white persons were killed it was followed immediately by the famous and severe negro act of seventeen forty which among other provisions imposed a duty of one hundred pounds on africans and one hundred and fifty pounds on colonial negroes this remained technically in force until eighteen twenty two and yet as soon as security and confidence were restored there was a relaxation in the execution of the provisions of the act and the negroes little by little regained confidence in themselves and again began to plan and act in concert about the time of cato's insurrection there were also several uprisings at sea in seventeen thirty one on a ship returning to rhode island from guinea with a cargo of slaves the negroes rose and killed three of the crew all the members of which died soon afterwards with the exception of the captain and his boy the next year captain john major of portsmouth new hampshire was murdered with all his crew his schooner and cargo being seized by the slaves in seventeen thirty five the captives on the dolphin of london while still on the coast of africa overpowered the crew broke into the powder room and finally in the course of their effort for freedom blew up both themselves and the crew a most remarkable design as an insurrection perhaps not as formidable as that of cato but in some ways the most important single event in the history of the negro in the colonial period was the plot in the city of new york in seventeen forty one new york was at the time a thriving town of twelve thousand inhabitants and the calamity that now befell it was unfortunate in every way it was not only a negro insurrection though the negro finally suffered most bitterly it was also a strange compound of the effects of whiskey and gambling of the designs of abandoned white people and of prejudice against the catholics prominent in the remarkable drama were john hewson a shoemaker and alehouse keeper sarah hewson his wife john rome also a shoemaker and alehouse keeper margaret carey alias salem berg commonly known as peggy john urie a priest and a number of negroes chief among whom were caesar prince cuffy and quack prominent among those who helped to work out the plot were mary burton a white servant of hewson's sixteen years of age arthur price a young white man who at the time of the proceedings happened to be in prison on a charge of stealing a young seaman named wilson and two white women mrs earl and mrs hogg the latter of whom assisted in the store kept by her husband robert hogg hewson's house on the outskirts of the town was a resort for negroes and hewson himself aided and abetted the negro men in any crime that they might commit rome was of similar quality peggy was a prostitute 
and it was caesar who paid for her board with the hewsons in the previous summer she had found lodging with these people a little later she had removed to rome's and just before christmas she had come back to hewsons and a few weeks thereafter she became a mother at both the public houses the negroes would engage in drinking and gambling and importance also attaches to an organization of theirs known as the geneva society which had angered some of the white citizens by its imitation of the rites and forms of freemasonry events really began on the night of saturday february twenty eighth seventeen forty one with a robbery in the house of hogg the merchant from which were taken various pieces of linen and other goods several silver coins chiefly spanish and metals to the value of about sixty pounds on the day before in the course of a simple purchase by wilson mrs hogg had revealed to the young seaman her treasure he soon spoke of the same to caesar prince and cuffy with whom he was acquainted he gave them the plan of the house and they in turn spoke of the matter to hewson wilson however when later told of the robbery by mrs hogg at once turned suspicion upon the negroes especially caesar and mary burton testified that she saw some of the speckled linen in question in peggy's room after caesar had gone thither on wednesday march eighteenth a fire broke out on the roof of miss majesty's house at fort george one week later on march twenty five there was a fire at the home of captain warm in the southwest end of the city and the circumstances pointed to incendiary origin one week later on april one there was a fire in the storehouse of a man named van zant on the following saturday evening there was another fire and while the people were returning from this there was still another and on the next day sunday there was another alarm and by this time the whole town had been worked up to the highest pitch of excitement as yet there was nothing to point to any connection between the stealing and the fires on the day of the last one however mrs earl happened to overhear remarks by three negroes that caused suspicion to light upon them mary burton was insisting that stolen goods had been brought by prince and caesar to the house of her master and although a search of the home of hewson failed to produce a great deal arrests were made right and left the case was finally taken to the supreme court and because of the white persons implicated the summary methods ordinarily used in dealing with negroes were waived for the time being peggy at first withstood all questioning denying any knowledge of the events that had taken place one day in prison however she remarked to arthur price that she was afraid the negroes would tell but that she would not forswear herself unless they brought her into the matter how forswear asked price there are fourteen sworn she said what is it about mr hogg's goods he asked no she replied about the fire what peggy asked price were you going to set the town on fire no she replied but since i knew of it they made me swear she also remarked that she had faith in prince cuff and caesar all the while she used the vilest possible language and at last thinking suddenly that she had revealed too much she turned upon price and with an oath warned him that he had better keep his counsel that afternoon she said further to him that she could not eat because mary had brought her into the case a little later peggy much afraid voluntarily confessed that early in may she was at the home of john rome where in the course of december the negroes had had several meetings among other things they had conspired to burn the fort first of all then the city then to get all the goods they could and kill anybody who had money one evening just about christmas she said rome and his wife and ten or eleven negroes had been together in a room rome had talked about how rich some people were gradually working on the feelings of the negroes and promising them that if they did not succeed in their designs he would take them to a strange country and set them free meanwhile giving them the impression that he bore a charmed life a little later it appeared caesar gave to hewson twelve pounds hewson was then absent for three days and when he came again he brought with him seven or eight guns some pistols and some swords as a result of these and other disclosures it was seen that not only hewson and rome but also uri who was not so much a priest as an adventurer had instigated the plots of the negroes and quack testified that hewson was the first contriver of the plot to burn the houses of the town and kill the people though he himself he confessed did fire at the fort with a lighted stick the punishment was terrible quack and cuffy the first to be executed were burned at the stake on may thirty all through the summer the trials and executions continued harassing new york and indeed the whole country altogether twenty white persons were arrested four hewson his wife peggy and uri were executed and some of their acquaintances were forced to leave the province one hundred and fifty-four negroes were arrested thirteen were burned eighteen were hanged and seventy-one transported it is evident from these events and from the legislation of the era that except for the earnest work of such a sect as the quakers there was little genuine effort for the improvement of the social condition of the negro people in the colonies 
they were not even regarded as potential citizens and both in and out of the system of slavery were subjected to the harshest regulations towards amicable relations with the other racial elements that were coming to build up a new country only the slightest measure of progress was made instead insurrection after insurrection revealed the sharpest antagonism and any outbreak promptly called forth the severest and frequently the most cruel punishment end of section four section five of a social history of the american negro by benjamin griffith brawley this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three part one the revolutionary era one sentiment in england and america the materialism of the eighteenth century with all of its evils at length produced a liberalism of thought that was to shake to their very foundations old systems of life in both europe and america the progress of the cause of the negro in this period is to be explained by the general diffusion of ideas that made for the rights of man everywhere cowper wrote his humanitarian poems in close association with the romanticism of the day the missionary movement in religion began to gather force and the same impulse which in england began the agitation for a free press and for parliamentary reform and which in france accounted for the french revolution in america led to the revolt from great britain no patriot could come under the influence of any one of these movements without having his heart and his sense of justice stirred to some degree in behalf of the slave at the same time it must be remembered that the contest of the americans was primarily for the definite legal rights of englishmen rather than for the more abstract rights of mankind which formed the platform of the french revolution hence arose the great inconsistency in the position of men who were engaged in a stern struggle for liberty at the same time that they themselves were holding human beings in bondage in england the new era was formally signalized by an epoch-making decision in november seventeen sixty nine charles stuart once a merchant in norfolk and later receiver-general of the customs of north america took to england his negro slave james somerset who being sick was turned adrift by his master later somerset recovered and stuart seized him intending to have him borne out of the country and sold in jamaica somerset objected to this and in so doing raised the important legal question did a slave by being brought to england become free the case received an extraordinary amount of attention for everybody realized that the decision would be far-reaching in its consequences after it was argued at three different sittings lord mansfield chief justice of england in seventeen seventy two handed down from the court of king's bench the judgment that as soon as ever any slave set his foot upon the soil of england he became free this decision may be taken as fairly representative of the general advance that the cause of the negro was making in england at the time early in the century sentiment against the slave trade had begun to develop many pamphlets on the evils of slavery were circulated and as early as seventeen seventy six a motion for the abolition of the trade was made in the house of commons john wesley preached against the system adam smith showed its ultimate expensiveness and burke declared that the slavery endured by the negroes in the english settlements was worse than that ever suffered by any other people foremost in the work of protest were thomas clarkson and william wilberforce the one being the leader in investigation and in the organization of the movement against slavery while the other was the parliamentary champion of the cause for years assisted by such debaters as burke fox and the younger pitt wilberforce worked until on march twenty five eighteen o seven the bill for the abolition of the slave trade received the royal assent and still later until slavery itself was abolished in the english dominions eighteen thirty three this high thought in england necessarily found some reflection in america where the logic of the position of the patriots frequently forced them to take up the cause of the slave as early as seventeen fifty one benjamin franklin and his observations concerning the increase of mankind pointed out the evil effects of slavery upon population and the production of wealth and in seventeen sixty one james otis in his argument against the writs of assistance spoke so vigorously of the rights of black men as to leave no doubt as to his own position 
to patrick henry slavery was a practice totally repugnant to the first impressions of right and wrong and in seventeen seventy seven he was interested in a plan for gradual emancipation received from his friend robert pleasance washington desired nothing more than to see some plan adopted by which slavery might be abolished by law while joel barlow in his columbiad gave significant warning to columbia of the ills that she was heaping up for herself two of the expressions of sentiment of the day by reason of their deep yearning and philosophic calm somehow stand apart from others thomas jefferson in his notes on virginia wrote the whole commerce between master and slave is a perpetual exercise of the most boisterous passions the most unremitting despotism on the one part and degrading submission on the other the man must be a prodigy who can retain his manners and morals undepraved by such circumstances i tremble for my country when i reflect that god is just that his justice cannot sleep for ever that considering numbers nature and natural means only a revolution of the wheel of fortune an exchange of situation is among possible events that it may become probable by supernatural interference the almighty has no attribute which can take side with us in such a contest henry lawrence that fine patriot whose business sense was excelled only by his idealism was harassed by the problem and wrote to his son colonel john lawrence as follows you know my dear son i abhor slavery i was born in a country where slavery had been established by british kings and parliaments as well as by the laws of that country ages before my existence i found the christian religion and slavery growing under the same authority and cultivation i nevertheless disliked it in former days there was no combating the prejudices of men supported by interest the day i hope is approaching when from principles of gratitude as well as justice every man will strive to be foremost in showing his readiness to comply with the golden rule not less than twenty thousand pounds sterling would all my negroes produce if sold at public auction to-morrow i'm not the man who enslaved them they are indebted to englishmen for that favour nevertheless i'm devising means for manumitting many of them and for cutting off the entail of slavery great powers oppose me the laws and customs of my country my own and the avarice of my countrymen what will my children say if i deprive them of so much estate these are difficulties but not insuperable i will do as much as i can in my time and leave the rest to a better hand stronger than all else however were the immortal words of the declaration of independence we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights that among these are life liberty and the pursuit of happiness within the years to come these words were to be denied and assailed as perhaps no others in the language but in spite of all they were to stand firm and justify the faith of seventeen seventy six before jefferson himself and others had become submerged in a gilded opportunism it is not to be supposed that such sentiments were by any means general nevertheless these instances alone show that some men at least in the colonies were willing to carry their principles to their logical conclusion naturally opinion crystallized in formal resolutions or enactments unfortunately most of these were in one way or another rendered ineffectual after the war nevertheless the main impulse that they represented continued to live in seventeen sixty nine virginia declared that the discriminatory tax levied on free negroes and mulattoes since sixteen sixty eight was derogatory to the rights of free-born subjects and accordingly should be repealed in october seventeen seventy four the first continental congress declared that in its articles of association that the united colonies would neither import nor purchase any slave imported after the first day of december next and that they would wholly discontinue the trade on april sixteenth seventeen seventy six the congress further resolved that no slaves be imported into any of the thirteen colonies and the first draft of the declaration of independence contained a strong passage censuring the king of england for bringing slaves into the country and then inciting them to rise against their masters on april fourteenth seventeen seventy five the first abolition society in the country was organized in pennsylvania in seventeen seventy eight virginia once more passed an act prohibiting the slave trade and the methodist conference in baltimore in seventeen eighty strongly expressed its disapproval of slavery two the negro in the war as in all the greater wars in which the country has engaged the position of the negro was generally improved by the american revolution it was not by reason of any definite plan that this was so for in general the disposition of the government was to keep him out of the conflict nevertheless between the hesitating policy of america and the overtures of england the negro made considerable advance the american cause in truth presented a strange and embarrassing dilemma as we have remarked 
in the war itself moreover began the stern cleavage between the north and the south at the moment the rift was not clearly discerned but afterwards it was to widen into a chasm massachusetts bore more than her share of the struggle and in the south the combination of tory sentiment and the aristocratic social system made enlistment especially difficult in this latter section moreover there was always the lurking fear of an uprising of the slaves and before the end of the war came south carolina and georgia were very nearly demoralized in the course of the conflict south carolina lost not less than twenty five thousand slaves about one-fifth of all she had georgia did not lose so many but proportionally suffered even more some of the negroes went into the british army some went away with the loyalists and some took advantage of the confusion and escaped to the indians in virginia until they were stopped at least some slaves entered the continental army as free negroes three or four facts are outstanding the formal policy of congress and of washington and his officers was against the enlistment of negroes and especially of slaves nevertheless while things were still uncertain some negroes entered the regular units the inducements offered by the english moreover forced a modification of the american policy in actual operation and before the war was over the colonists were so hard pressed that in more ways than one they were willing to receive the assistance of negroes throughout the north negroes served in the regular units but while in the south especially there was much thought given to the training of slaves in only one of all the colonies was there a distinctively negro military organization and that one was rhode island in general it was understood that if a slave served in the war he was to be given his freedom and it is worthy of note that many slaves served in the field instead of their masters in massachusetts on may twenty ninth seventeen seventy five the committee of safety passed an act against the enlistment of slaves as inconsistent with the principles that are to be supported another resolution of june six dealing with the same matter was laid on the table washington took command of the forces in and about boston july three seventeen seventy five and on july ten issued instructions to the recruiting officers in massachusetts against the enlisting of negroes toward the end of september there was a spirited debate in congress over a letter to go to washington the southern delegates led by rutledge of south carolina endeavoring to force instructions to the commander-in-chief to discharge all slaves and free negroes in the army a motion to this effect failed to win a majority nevertheless a council of washington and his generals on october eight agreed unanimously to reject all slaves and by a great majority to reject negroes altogether and in his general orders of november twelfth washington acted on this understanding meanwhile however lord dunmore issued his proclamation declaring free those indentured servants and negroes who would join the english army and in great numbers the slaves in virginia flocked to the british standard then on december fourteenth somewhat to the amusement of both the negroes and the english the virginia convention issued a proclamation offering pardon to those slaves who returned to their duty within ten days on december thirty washington gave instruction for the enlistment of free negroes promising later to lay the matter before congress and a congressional committee on january sixteenth seventeen seventy six reported that those free negroes who had already served faithfully in the army at cambridge might re-enlist but no others the debate in this connection having drawn very sharply the line between the north and the south henceforth for all practical purposes the matter was left in the hands of the individual colonies massachusetts on january sixth seventeen seventy seven passed a resolution drafting every seventh man to complete her quota without any exception save the people called quakers and this was as near as she came at any time in the war to the formal recognition of the negro the rhode island assembly in seventeen seventy eight resolved to raise a regiment of slaves who were to be freed at enlistment their owners in no case being paid more than one hundred and twenty pounds in the battle of rhode island august twenty ninth seventeen seventy eight the negro regiment under colonel green distinguished itself by deeds of desperate valor repelling three times the assaults of an overwhelming force of hessian troops a little later when green was about to be murdered some of these same soldiers had to be cut to pieces before he could be secured maryland employed negroes as soldiers and sent them into regiments along with white men and it is to be remembered that at the time the negro population of maryland was exceeded only by that of virginia and south carolina for the far south there was the famous lawrence plan for the raising of negro regiments in a letter to washington of march sixteenth seventeen seventy nine henry lawrence suggested the raising and training of three thousand negroes in south carolina 
washington was rather conservative about the plan having in mind the ever-present fear of the arming of negroes and wondering about the effect on those slaves who were not given a chance for freedom on june thirty seventeen seventy nine however sir henry clinton issued a proclamation only less far-reaching than dunmore's threatening negroes if they joined the rebel army and offering them security if they came within the british lines this was effective assistance of any kind that the continental army could now get was acceptable and the plan for the raising of several battalions of negroes in the south was entrusted to colonel john lawrence a member of washington's staff in his own way colonel lawrence was a man of parts quite as well as his father he was thoroughly devoted to the american cause and washington said of him that his only fault was a courage that bordered on rashness he eagerly pursued his favorite project able-bodied slaves were to be paid for by congress at the rate of one thousand dollars each and one who served to the end of the war was to receive his freedom and fifty dollars in addition in south carolina however lawrence received little encouragement and in seventeen eighty he was called upon to go to france on a patriotic mission he had not forgotten the matter when he returned in seventeen eighty two but by that time cornwallis had surrendered and the country had entered upon the critical period of adjustment to the new conditions washington now wrote to lawrence i must confess that i am not at all astonished at the failure of your plan that spirit of freedom which at the commencement of this contest would have gladly sacrificed everything to the attainment of its object has long since subsided and every selfish passion has taken its place it is not the public but private interest which influences the generality of mankind nor can the americans any longer boast an exception under these circumstances it would rather have been surprising if you had succeeded nor will you i fear have better success in georgia from this brief survey we may at least see something of the anomalous position occupied by the negro in the american revolution altogether not less than three thousand and probably more members of the race served in the continental army at the close of the conflict new york rhode island and virginia freed their slave soldiers in general however the system of slavery was not affected and the english were bound by the treaty of peace not to carry away any negroes as late as seventeen eighty six it is nevertheless interesting to note a band of negroes calling themselves the king of england's soldiers harassed and alarmed the people on both sides of the savannah river slavery remained but people could not forget the valor of the negro regiment in rhode island or the courage of individual soldiers they could not forget that it was a negro crispus attucks who had been the patriot leader in the boston massacre or the scene when he and one of his companions jonas caldwell lay in funeral hall those who were at bunker hill could not fail to remember peter salem who when major pitcairn of the british army was exulting in his expected triumph rushed forward shot him in the breast and killed him or samuel poor whose officers testified that he performed so many brave deeds that to set forth particulars of his conduct would be tedious these and many more some with very humble names in a dark day worked for a better country they died in faith not having received the promises but having seen them far off three the northwest territory and the constitution the materialism and selfishness which rose in the course of the war to oppose the liberal tendencies of the period in which washington felt did so much to embarrass the government became pronounced in the debates on the northwest territory and the constitution at the outbreak of the revolutionary war the region west of pennsylvania east of the mississippi river north of the ohio river and south of canada was claimed by virginia new york connecticut and massachusetts the territory afforded to these states a source of revenue not possessed by the others for the payment of debts incurred in the war and maryland and other seaboard states insisted that in order to equalize matters these claimants should cede their rights to the general government the formal sessions were made and accepted in the years seventeen eighty two to six in april seventeen eighty four after virginia had made her session the most important congress adopted the temporary form of government drawn up by thomas jefferson for the territory south as well as north of the ohio river jefferson's most significant provision however was rejected this declared that after the year eighteen hundred there shall be neither slavery nor involuntary servitude in any of the said states other than in the punishment of crimes whereof the party shall have been duly convicted to have been personally guilty this early ordinance although it did not go into effect is interesting as an attempt to exclude slavery from the great west that was beginning to be opened up on march three seventeen eighty six moreover the ohio company was formed in boston by a group of new england businessmen for the purpose of purchasing land in the west and promoting settlement 
and early in june seventeen eighty seven dr manasseh cutler one of the chief promoters of the company appeared in new york where the last continental congress was sitting for the concrete purpose of buying land he doubtless did much to hasten action by congress and on july thirteenth was passed an ordinance for the government of the territory of the united states northwest of the ohio the southern states not having ceded the area south of the river it was declared that there shall be neither slavery nor involuntary servitude in the said territory otherwise than in punishment of crimes whereof the party shall be duly convicted to this was added the stipulation soon afterwards embodied in the federal constitution for the return of any person escaping into the territory from whom labor or service was lawfully claimed in any one of the original states in this shape the ordinance was adopted even south carolina and georgia concurring and thus was paved the way for the first fugitive slave law slavery already looming up as a dominating issue was the cause of two of the three great compromises that entered into the making of the constitution of the united states the third which was the first made being the concession to the smaller states of equal representation in the senate these were the first but not the last of the compromises that were to mark the history of the subject and as some clear-headed men of the time perceived it would have been better and cheaper to settle the question at once on the high plane of right rather than to leave it indefinitely to the future south carolina however with able representation largely controlled the thought of the convention and she and georgia made the most extreme demands threatening not to accept the constitution if there was not compliance with them an important question was that of representation the southern states advocating representation according to numbers slave and free while the northern states were in favor of the representation of free persons only williamson of north carolina advocated the counting of three-fifths of the slaves but this motion was at first defeated and there was little real progress until governor morris suggested that the representation be according to the principle of wealth mason of virginia pointed out practical difficulties which caused the resolution to be made to apply to direct taxation only and in this form it began to be generally acceptable by this time however the deeper feelings of the delegates on the subject of slavery had been stirred and they began to speak plainly davy of north carolina declared that his state would never enter the union on any terms that did not provide for counting at least three-fifths of the slaves and that if the eastern states meant to exclude them altogether the business was at an end it was finally agreed to reckon three-fifths of the slaves in estimating taxes and to make taxation the basis of representation the whole discussion was renewed however in connection with the question of importation there were more threats from the far south and some of the men from new england prompted by commercial interest even if they did not favor the sentiments expressed were at least disposed to give them passive acquiescence from maryland and virginia however came earnest protest luther martin declared unqualifiedly that to have a clause in the constitution permitting the importation of slaves was inconsistent with the principles of the revolution and dishonorable to the american character and george mason could foresee only a future in which a just providence would punish such a national sin as slavery by national calamities such utterances were not to dominate the convention however it was a day of expediency not of morality a bargain was made between the commercial interests of the north and the slaveholding interests of the south the granting to congress of unrestricted power to enact navigation laws being conceded in exchange for twenty years continuance of the slave trade the main agreements on the subject of slavery were thus finally expressed in the constitution representatives and direct taxes shall be apportioned among the several states which may be included within this union according to their respective numbers which shall be determined by adding to the whole number of free persons including those bound to servitude for a term of years and excluding indians not taxed three-fifths of all other persons article one section two the migration or importation of such persons as any of the states now existing shall think proper to admit shall not be prohibited by the congress prior to the year eighteen o eight but a tax or duty may be imposed not exceeding ten dollars on each person article one section nine no person held to service or labor in one state under the laws thereof escaping into another shall in consequence of any law or regulation therein be discharged from such service or labor but shall be delivered up on claim of the party to whom such service or labor may be due article four section two with such provisions though without the use of the question begging word slaves the institution of human bondage received formal recognition in the organic law of the new republic of the united states just what is the light in which we are to regard the slaves wondered james wilson in the course of the debate are they admitted as citizens he asked 
then why are they not admitted on an equality with white citizens are they admitted as property then why is not other property admitted into the computation such questions and others to which they gave rise were to trouble more heads than his in the course of the coming years and all because a great nation did not have the courage to do the right thing at the right time end of section five section six of a social history of the american negro by benjamin griffith brawley this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three part two four early steps toward abolition in spite however of the power crystallized in the constitution the moral movement that had set in against slavery still held its ground and it was destined never wholly to languish until slavery ceased altogether to exist in the united states throughout the century the quakers continued their good work in the generation before the war john woolman of new jersey travelled in the southern colonies preaching that the practice of continuing slavery is not right and anthony benazet opened in philadelphia a school for negroes which he himself taught without remuneration and otherwise influenced pennsylvania to begin the work of emancipation in general the quakers conducted their campaign along the lines on which they were most likely to succeed attacking the slave trade first of all but more and more making an appeal to the central government and the first abolition society organized in pennsylvania in seventeen seventy five and consisting mainly of quakers had for its original object merely the relief of free negroes unlawfully held in bondage the organization was forced to suspend its work in the course of the war but in seventeen eighty four it renewed its meetings and men of other denominations than the quakers now joined in greater numbers in seventeen eighty seven the society was formally reorganized as the pennsylvania society for promoting the abolition of slavery the relief of free negroes unlawfully held in bondage and for improving the condition of the african race benjamin franklin was elected president and there was adopted a constitution which was more and more to serve as a model for similar societies in the neighboring states four years later by seventeen ninety one there were in the country as many as twelve abolition societies and these represented all the states from massachusetts to virginia with the exception of new jersey where a society was formed the following year that of new york formed in seventeen eighty five with john jay as president took the name of the manumission society limiting its aims at first to promoting manumission and protecting those negroes who had already been set free all of the societies had very clear ideas as to their mission the prevalence of kidnapping made them emphasize the relief of free negroes lawfully held in bondage and in general each one in addition to its executive committee had committees for inspection advice and protection for the guardianship of children for the superintending of education and for employment while the societies were originally formed to attend to local matters their efforts naturally extended in course of time to national affairs and on december eighth seventeen ninety one nine of them prepared petitions to congress for the limitation of the slave trade these petitions were referred to a special committee and nothing more was heard of them at the time after two years accordingly the organizations decided that a more vigorous plan of action was necessary and on january one seventeen ninety four delegates from nine societies organized in philadelphia the american convention of abolition societies the object of the convention was twofold to increase the zeal and efficiency of the individual societies by its advice and encouragement and to take upon itself the chief responsibility in regard to national affairs it prepared an address to the country and presented to congress a memorial against the fitting out of vessels in the united states to engage in the slave trade and it had the satisfaction of seeing congress in the same year pass a bill to this effect some of the organizations were very active in one as far south as that in maryland was at first very powerful always were they interested in suits in courts of law in seventeen ninety seven the new york society reported ninety complaints thirty-six persons freed twenty-one cases still in suit 
and nineteen on pure consideration the pennsylvania society reported simply that it had been instrumental in the liberation of many hundreds of persons the different branches however did not rest with mere liberation they endeavored generally to improve the condition of the negroes in their respective communities each one being expected to report to the convention on the number of freedmen in its state and on their property employment and conduct from time to time also the convention prepared addresses to these people and something of the spirit of its work and also of the social condition of the negro at the time may be seen from the following address of seventeen ninety six to the free africans and other free people of color in the united states the convention of deputies from the abolition societies in the united states assembled at philadelphia have undertaken to address you upon subjects highly interesting to your prosperity they wish to see you act worthily of the rank you have acquired as free men and thereby to do credit to yourselves and to justify the friends and advocates of your color in the eyes of the world as a result of our united reflections we have concluded to call your attention to the following articles of advice we trust they are dictated by the purest regard for your welfare for we view you as friends and brethren in the first place we earnestly recommend to you a regular attention to the important duty of public worship by which means you will evince gratitude to your creator and at the same time promote knowledge union friendship and proper conduct among yourselves secondly we advise such of you as have not been taught reading writing and the first principles of arithmetic to acquire them as early as possible carefully attend to the instruction of your children in the same simple and useful branches of education cause them likewise early and frequently to read the holy scriptures these contain amongst other great discoveries the precious record of the original equality of mankind and of the obligations of universal justice and benevolence which are derived from the relation of the human race to each other in a common father thirdly teach your children useful trades or to labor with their hands in cultivating the earth these employments are favorable to health and virtue in the choice of masters who are to instruct them in the above branches of business prefer those who will work with them by this means they will acquire habits of industry and be better preserved from vice than if they worked alone or under the eye of persons less interested in their welfare in forming contracts for yourselves or children with masters it may be useful to consult such persons as are capable of giving you the best advice and who are known to be your friends in order to prevent advantages being taken of your ignorance of the laws and customs of our country fourthly be diligent in your respective callings and faithful in all the relations you bear in society whether as husbands wives fathers children or hired servants be just in all your dealings be simple in your dress and furniture and frugal in your family expenses thus you will act like christians as well as freemen and by these means you will provide for the distresses and wants of sickness and old age fifthly refrain from the use of spiritus liquors the experience of many thousands of the citizens of the united states has proved that these liquors are not necessary to lessen the fatigue of labor nor to obviate the effects of heat or cold nor can they in any degree add to the innocent pleasures of society sixthly avoid frolicking and amusements which lead to expense and idleness they beget habits of dissipation and vice and thus expose you to deserved reproach amongst your white neighbors seventhly we wish to impress upon your minds the moral and religious necessity of having your marriages legally performed also to have exact registers preserved of all the births and deaths which occur in your respective families eighthly endeavor to lay up as much as possible of your earnings for the benefit of your children in case you should die before they are able to maintain themselves your money will be safest and most beneficial when laid out in lots houses or small farms ninthly we recommend to you at all times and upon all occasions to behave yourselves to all persons in a civil and respectful manner by which you may prevent contention and remove every just occasion of complaint we beseech you to reflect that it is by your good conduct alone that you can refute the objections which have been made against you as rational and moral creatures and remove many of the difficulties which have occurred in the general emancipation of such of your brethren as are yet in bondage 
with hearts anxious for your welfare we commend you to the guidance and protection of that being who is able to keep you from all evil and who is the common father and friend of the whole family of mankind theodore foster president philadelphia january sixth seventeen ninety six thomas p cope secretary the general impulse for liberty which prompted the revolution and the early abolition societies naturally found some reflection in formal legislation the declarations of the central government under the confederation were not very effective and for more definite enactments we have to turn to the individual states the honor of being the first actually to prohibit and abolish slavery really belongs to vermont whose constitution adopted in seventeen seventy seven even before she had come into the union declared very positively against the system in seventeen eighty two the old virginia statute forbidding emancipation except for meritorious services was repealed the repeal was in force ten years and in this time manumissions were numerous maryland soon afterwards passed acts similar to those in virginia prohibiting the further introduction of slaves and removing restraints on emancipation and new york and new jersey also prohibited the further introduction of slaves from africa or from other states in seventeen eighty in spite of considerable opposition because of the course of the war the pennsylvania assembly passed an act forbidding the further introduction of slaves and giving freedom to all persons thereafter born in the state similar provisions were enacted in connecticut and rhode island in seventeen eighty four meanwhile massachusetts was much agitated and beginning in seventeen sixty six there were before the court several cases in which negroes sued for their freedom their general argument was that the royal charter declared that all persons residing in the province were to be as free as the king's subjects in great britain that by magna carta no subject could be deprived of liberty except by the judgment of his peers and that any laws that may have been passed in the province to mitigate or regulate the evil of slavery did not authorize it sometimes the decisions were favorable but at the beginning of the revolution massachusetts still recognized the system by the decision that no slave could be enlisted in the army in seventeen seventy seven however some slaves brought from jamaica were ordered to be set at liberty and it was finally decided in seventeen eighty three that the declaration in the massachusetts bill of rights to the effect that all men are born free and equal prohibited slavery in the same year new hampshire incorporated in her constitution a prohibited article by the time the convention for the framing of the constitution of the united states met in philadelphia in seventeen eighty seven two of the original thirteen states massachusetts and new hampshire had positively prohibited slavery and in three others pennsylvania connecticut and rhode island gradual abolition was in progress the next decade was largely one of the settlement of new territory and by its close the pendulum seemed to have swung decidedly backward in seventeen ninety nine however after much effort and debating new york at last declared for gradual abolition and new jersey did likewise in eighteen o four in general gradual emancipation was the result of the work of people who were humane but also conservative and who questioned the wisdom of thrusting upon the social organism a large number of negroes suddenly emancipated sometimes however a gradual emancipation act was later followed by one for immediate manumission as in new york in eighteen seventeen at first those who favored gradual emancipation were numerous in the south as well as in the north but in general after gabriel's insurrection in eighteen hundred though some individuals were still outstanding the south was quiescent the character of the acts that were really put in force can hardly be better stated than has already been done by the specialist in the subject we read gradual emancipation is defined as the extinction of slavery by depriving it of its hereditary quality in distinction from the clauses in the constitutions of vermont massachusetts and new hampshire which directly or indirectly affected the condition of slavery as already existing the gradual emancipation acts left this condition unchanged and affected only the children born after the passage of the act or after a fixed date most of these acts followed that of pennsylvania in providing that the children of a slave mother should remain with her owner as servants until they reached a certain age of from twenty one to twenty eight years as stated in the various enactments in pennsylvania however they were to be regarded as free in connecticut on the other hand they were to be held in servitude until twenty-five years of age and after that to be free the most liberal policy was that of rhode island where the children were pronounced free but were to be supported by the town 
and educated in reading writing and arithmetic morality and religion the latter clauses however were repealed the following year leaving the children to be supported by the owner of the mother until twenty-one years of age and only if he abandoned his claims to the mother to become a charge to the town in new york and new jersey they were to remain as servants until a certain age but were regarded as free and liberal opportunities were given the master for the abandonment of his claims the children in such cases to be supported at the common charge the manumission and emancipation acts were naturally followed as in the case of the constitutional provision in vermont by the attempts of some of the slave owners to dispose of their property outside the state amendments to the laws were found necessary and the abolition societies found plenty of occasion for their exertions in protecting free blacks from seizure and illegal sale and in looking after the execution and amendment of the laws the process of gradual emancipation was also unsatisfactory on the account of the length of time it would require and in pennsylvania and connecticut attempts were made to obtain acts for immediate emancipation five beginning of racial consciousness of supreme importance in this momentous period more important perhaps in its ultimate effect than even the work of the abolition societies was what the negro was doing for himself in the era of the revolution began that racial consciousness on which almost all later effort for social betterment has been based by seventeen hundred the only cooperative effort on the part of the negro was such as that in the isolated society to which cotton mather gave rules or in a spasmodic insurrection or rather crude development of native african worship as yet there was no genuine basis of racial self-respect in one way or another however in the eighteenth century the idea of association developed and especially in boston about the time of the revolution negroes began definitely to work together thus they assisted individuals in test cases in the courts and when james swan in his dissuasion from the slave trade made such a statement as that no country can be called free where there is one slave it was at the earnest desire of the negroes in boston that the revised edition of the pamphlet was published from the very beginning the christian church was the race's foremost form of social organization it was but natural that the first distinctively negro churches should belong to the democratic baptist denomination there has been much discussion as to which was the very first negro baptist church and good claims have been put forth by the harrison street baptist church of petersburg virginia and for a church in williamsburg virginia organization in each case going back to seventeen seventy six a student of this subject however has shown that there was a negro baptist church at silver bluff on the south carolina side of the savannah river in aiken county just twelve miles from augusta georgia founded not earlier than seventeen seventy three not later than seventeen seventy five in any case special interest attaches to the first bryan baptist church of savannah founded in january seventeen eighty eight the origin of this body goes back to george leal a negro born in virginia who might justly lay claim to being america's first foreign missionary converted by a georgia baptist minister he was licensed as a probationer and was known to preach soon afterwards at a white quarterly meeting in seventeen eighty three he preached in the vicinity of savannah and one of those who came to hear him was andrew bryan a slave of jonathan bryan leal then went to jamaica and in seventeen eighty four began to preach in kingston where with four brethren from america he formed a church at first he was subjected to persecution nevertheless by seventeen ninety one he had baptized over four hundred persons eight or nine months after he left for jamaica andrew bryan began to preach and at first he was permitted to use the building at yamacraw in the suburbs of savannah of this however he was in course of time dispossessed the place being a rendezvous for those negroes who had been taken away from their homes by the british many of these men were taken before the magistrates from time to time and some were whipped and others imprisoned bryan himself having incurred the ire of the authorities was twice imprisoned and once publicly whipped being so cut that he bled abundantly but he told his persecutors that he would freely suffer death for the cause of jesus christ and after a while he was permitted to go on with his work for some time he used a barn being assisted by his brother samson then for fifty pounds he purchased his freedom and afterwards he began to use for worship a house that samson had been permitted to erect by seventeen ninety one his church had two hundred members but over a hundred more had been received as converted members though they had not won their master's permission to be baptized 
an interesting sidelight on these people is furnished by the statement that probably fifty of them could read though only three could write years afterwards in eighteen thirty two when the church had grown to great numbers a large part of the congregation left the bryan church and formed what is now the first african baptist church of savannah both congregations however remembered their early leader as one clear in the grand doctrines of the gospel truly pious and the instrument of doing more good among the poor slaves than all the learned doctors in america while bryan was working in savannah in richmond virginia rose lock carey a man of massive and erect frame and of great personality born a slave in seventeen eighty carey worked for a number of years in a tobacco factory leading a wicked life converted in eighteen o seven he made rapid advance in education and he was licensed as a baptist preacher he purchased his own freedom and that of his children his first wife having died organized a missionary society and then in eighteen twenty one himself went as a missionary to the new colony of liberia in whose interest he worked heroically until his death in eighteen twenty eight more clearly defined than the origin of negro baptist churches are the beginnings of african methodism almost from the time of its introduction in the country methodism made converts among the negroes and in seventeen eighty six there were nearly two thousand negroes in the regular churches of the denomination which like the baptist denomination it must be remembered was before the revolution largely overshadowed in official circles by the protestant episcopal church the general embarrassment of the episcopal church in america in connection with the war and the departure of many loyalist ministers gave opportunity to other denominations as well as to certain bodies of negroes the white members of st george's methodist episcopal church of philadelphia however determined to set apart its negro membership and to segregate it in the gallery then in seventeen eighty seven came a day when the negroes choosing not to be insulted and led by richard allen and absalom jones left the edifice and with these two men as overseers on april seventeen organized the free african society this was intended to be without regard to religious tenets the members being banded together to support one another in sickness and for the benefit of their widows and fatherless children the society was in the strictest sense fraternal there being only eight charter members absalom jones richard allen samuel boston joseph johnson cato freeman caesar cranchell james potter and william white by seventeen ninety the society had on deposit in the bank of north america forty two pounds nine shillings i d and that it generally stood for racial enterprise may be seen from the fact that in seventeen eighty eight an organization in newport known as the negro union in which paul cuff was prominent wrote proposing a general exodus of the negroes to africa nothing came of the suggestion of the time but at least it shows that representative negroes of the day were beginning to think together about matters of general policy in course of time the free african society of philadelphia resolved into an african church and this became affiliated with the protestant episcopal church whose bishop had exercised an interest in it out of this organization developed st thomas's episcopal church organized in seventeen ninety one and formally opened for service july seventeen seventeen ninety four allen was at first selected for ordination but he decided to remain a methodist and jones was chosen in his stead and thus became the first negro rector in the united states meanwhile however in seventeen ninety one allen himself had purchased a lot at the corner of sixth and lombard streets he had once set about arranging for the building that became bethel church and in seventeen ninety four he formally sold the lot to the church and the new house of worship was dedicated by bishop asbury of the methodist episcopal church with this general body allen and his people for a number of years remained affiliated but difficulties arose in separate churches having come into being in other places a convention of negro methodists was at length called to meet in philadelphia april ninth eighteen sixteen to this came sixteen delegates richard allen jacob tepsisco clayton durham james champion thomas wester of philadelphia daniel coker richard williams henry harden stephen hill edward williamson nicholas valued of baltimore jacob marsh edward jackson william andrew of attleboro pennsylvania peter spencer of wilmington delaware and peter cuff of salem new jersey and these were the men who founded the african methodist episcopal church coker of whom we shall hear more in connection with liberia was elected bishop but resigned in favor of allen who served until his death in eighteen thirty one 
in seventeen ninety six a congregation in new york consisting of james varick and others also withdrew from the main body of the methodist episcopal church and in eighteen hundred dedicated a house of worship for a number of years it had the oversight of the older organization but after preliminary steps in eighteen twenty on june twenty one eighteen twenty one the african methodist episcopal zion church was formally organized to the first conference came nineteen preachers representing six churches and one thousand four hundred and twenty six members Berwick was elected district chairman but soon afterwards was made bishop the polity of this church from the first differed somewhat from that of the a m e denomination and that representation of the laity was a prominent feature and there was no bar to the ordination of women of denominations other than the baptist and the methodist the most prominent in the earlier years was the presbyterian whose first negro ministers were john gloucester and john chavis gloucester owed his training to the liberal tendencies that about eighteen hundred were still strong in eastern tennessee and kentucky in eighteen ten took charge of the african presbyterian church which in eighteen o seven had been established in philadelphia he was distinguished by a rich musical voice and the general dignity of his life and he himself became the father of four presbyterian ministers chavis had a very unusual career after passing through a regular course of academic studies at washington academy now washington and lee university in eighteen o one he was commissioned by the general assembly of the presbyterians as a missionary to the negroes he worked with increasing reputation until nat turner's insurrection caused the north carolina legislature in eighteen thirty two to pass an act silencing all negro preachers then in wake county and elsewhere he conducted schools for white boys until his death in eighteen thirty eight in these early years distinction also attaches to lemuel haynes a revolutionary patriot and the first negro preacher of the congregational denomination in seventeen eighty five he became the pastor of a white congregation in torrington connecticut and in eighteen eighteen began to serve another in manchester new hampshire after the church the strongest organization among negroes has undoubtedly been that of secret societies commonly known as lodges the benefit societies were not necessarily secret and called for separate consideration on march sixth seventeen seventy five an army lodge attached to one of the regiments stationed under general gage in or near boston initiated prince hall and fourteen other colored men into the mysteries of freemasonry these fifteen men on march two seventeen eighty four applied to the grand lodge of england for a warrant this was issued to african lodge number four five nine with prince hall as master september twenty ninth seventeen eighty four various delays and misadventures befell the warrant however so that it was not actually received before april twenty ninth seventeen eighty seven the lodge was then duly organized may sixth from this beginning developed the idea of masonry among the negroes of america as early as seventeen ninety two hall was formally styled grand master and in seventeen ninety seven he issued a license to thirteen negroes to assemble and work as a lodge in philadelphia and there was also at this time a lodge in providence thus developed in eighteen o eight the african grand lodge of boston afterwards known as prince hall lodge of massachusetts the second grand lodge called the first independent african grand lodge of north america in and for the commonwealth of pennsylvania organized in eighteen fifteen and the hiram grand lodge of pennsylvania something of the interest of the masons and their people and the calm judgment that characterized their procedure may be seen from the words of their leader prince hall speaking in seventeen ninety seven and having in mind the revolution in haiti and recent indignities inflicted upon the race in boston he said when we hear of the bloody wars which are now in the world and thousands of our fellow-men slain fathers and mothers bewailing the loss of their sons wives for the loss of their husbands towns and cities burnt and destroyed what must be the heartfelt sorrow and distress of these poor and unhappy people though we cannot help them the distance being so great yet we may sympathize with them in their troubles and mingle a tear of sorrow with them and do as we are exhorted to weep with those that weep now my brethren as we see and experience that all things here are frail and changeable and nothing here to be depended upon let us seek those things which are above which are sure and steadfast and unchangeable and at the same time let us pray to almighty god while we remain in the tabernacle that he would give us the grace and patience and strength to bear up under all our troubles which at this day god knows we have our share patience i say for were we not possessed of a great measure of it 
you could not bear up under the daily insults you meet within the streets of boston much more on public days of recreation how are you shamefully abused and that at such a degree that you may truly be said to carry your lives in your hands and the arrows of death are flying about your heads helpless old women have their clothes torn off their backs even to the exposing of their nakedness and by whom are these disgraceful and abusive actions committed not by the men born and bred in boston for they are better bred but by a mob or horde of shameless low-lived envious spiteful persons some of them not long since servants in gentlemen's kitchens scouring knives tending horses and driving chaise twas said by a gentleman who saw that filthy behaviour in the common that in all the places he had been in he never saw so cruel behaviour in all his life and that a slave in the west indies on sundays or holidays enjoys himself and friends without molestation not only this man but many in town who have seen their behaviour to you and that without any provocations twenty or thirty cowards fall upon one man have wondered at the patience of the blacks tis not for want of courage in you for they know that they dare not face you man for man but in a mob which we despise and had rather suffer wrong than do wrong to the disturbance of the community and the disgrace of our reputation for every good citizen does honour to the laws of the state where he resides my brethren let us not be cast down into these and many other abuses we at present labour under for the darkest is before the break of day my brethren let us remember what a dark day it was with our african brethren six years ago in the french west indies nothing but the snap of the whip was heard from morning to evening hanging breaking on the wheel burning and all manner of tortures inflicted on those unhappy people for nothing else but to gratify their master's pride wantonness and cruelty but blessed be god the scene is changed they now confess that god hath no respect of persons and therefore receive them as their friends and treat them as brothers thus doth ethiopia begin to stretch forth her hand from a sink of slavery to freedom and equality an african society was organized in new york in eighteen o eight and chartered in eighteen ten and out of it grew in course of time three or four other organizations generally close to the social aim of the church and sometimes directly fathered by the secret societies were the benefit organizations which even in the days of slavery existed for aid in sickness or at death in fact it was the hopelessness of the general situation coupled with the yearning for care when helpless that largely called these societies into being their origin has been explained somewhat as follows although it was unlawful for negroes to assemble without the presence of a white man and so unlawful to allow a congregation of slaves on a plantation without the consent of the master these organizations existed and held these meetings on the lots of some of the lawmakers themselves the general plan seems to have been to select some one who could read and write and make it the secretary the meeting-place having been selected the members would come by ones and twos make their payments to the secretary and quietly withdraw the book of the secretary was often kept covered up on the bed in many of the societies each member was known by number and in paying simply announced his number the president of such a society was usually a privileged slave who had the confidence of his or her master and could go and come at will thus a form of communication could be kept up between all members in event of death of a member provision was made for a decent burial and all the members as far as possible obtained permits to attend the funeral here and again their plan of getting together was brought into play in richmond they would go to the church by ones and twos and there sit as near together as convenient at the close of the service a line of march would be formed when sufficiently far from the church to make it safe to do so it is reported that the members were faithful to each other and that every obligation was faithfully carried out this was the first form of insurance known to the negro from which his family received a benefit all along of course a determining factor in the negro's social progress was the service that he was able to render to any community in which he found himself as well as to his own people sometimes he was called upon to do very hard work sometimes very unpleasant or dangerous work but if he answered the call of duty and met an actual human need his service had to receive recognition an example of such work was found in his conduct in the course of the yellow fever epidemic in philadelphia in seventeen ninety three knowing that fever in general was not quite as severe in its ravages upon negroes as upon white people the daily papers of philadelphia called upon the colored people in the town to come forward and assist with the sick the negroes consented absent jones and william gray were appointed to superintend the operations though as usual it was upon richard allen that much of the real responsibility fell 
in september the fever increased and upon the negroes devolved also the duty of removing corpses in the course of their work they encountered much opposition thus jones said that a white man threatened to shoot him if he passed his house with a corpse this man himself the negroes had to bury three days afterwards when the epidemic was over under date so january twenty three seventeen ninety four matthew clarkson the mayor wrote the following testimony having during the prevalence of the late malignant disorder had almost daily opportunities of seeing the conduct of absalom jones and richard allen and the people employed by them to bury the dead i with cheerfulness give this testimony of my approbation of their proceedings as far as the same came under my notice their diligence attention and decency of deportment afforded me at the time much satisfaction after the lapse of years it is with something of the pathos of martyrdom that we are impressed by the service of these strongly people who by their self-abnegation and patriotism endeavor to win and deserve the privileges of american citizenship all the while in one way or another the negro was making advance in education as early as seventeen o four we have seen that nao opened a school in new york there was benazay's school in philadelphia before the revolutionary war and in seventeen ninety eight one for negroes was established in boston in the first part of the century we remember also some negroes were apprenticed in virginia under the oversight of the church in seventeen sixty four the editor of a paper in williamsburg virginia established a school for negroes and we have seen that as many as one-sixth of the members of andrew bryant's congregation in the far southern city of savannah could read by seventeen ninety exceptional men like gloucester and chavis of course avail themselves of such opportunities as came their way all told by eighteen hundred the negro had received much more education than is commonly supposed two persons one in science and one in literature because of their unusual attainments attracted much attention the first was benjamin banneker of maryland and the second phyllis wheatley of boston banneker in seventeen seventy constructed the first clock striking the hours that was made in america and from seventeen ninety two to eighteen o six published an almanac adapted to maryland and the neighboring states he was thoroughly scholarly in mathematics and astronomy and by his achievements won a reputation for himself in europe as well as in america phyllis wheatley after a romantic girlhood of transition from africa to a favorable environment in boston in seventeen seventy three published her poems on various subjects which volume she followed with several interesting occasional poems for the summer of this year she was the guest in england of the countess of huntingdon whose patronage she had won by an elegiac poem on george whitefield in conversation even more than in verse-making she exhibited her refined taste and accomplishment and presents were showered upon her one of them being a copy of the magnificent seventeen seventy glasgow folio edition of paradise lost which was given by brooke watson lord mayor of london and which is now preserved in the library of harvard university in the earlier years of the next century her poems found their way into the common school readers one of those in her representative volume was addressed to scipio moorhead a young negro of boston who had shown some talent for painting thus even in a dark day there were those who were trying to struggle upward to the light end of section six section seven of a social history of the american negro by benjamin griffith raleigh this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four the new west the south and the west indies the twenty years of the administrations of the first three presidents of the united states or we might say the three decades between seventeen ninety and eighteen twenty constitute what might be considered the dark ages of negro history and yet as with most dark ages at even a glance below the surface these years will be found to be throbbing with life and we have already seen that in them the negro was doing what he could on his own account to move forward after the high moral stand of the revolution however the period seems quiescent and it was indeed a time of definite reaction this was attributable to three great events the opening of the southwest with the consequent demand for slaves the haitian revolution beginning in seventeen ninety one and gabriel's insurrection in eighteen hundred in no way was the reaction to be seen more clearly 
than in the decline of the work of the american convention of delegates from the abolition societies after seventeen ninety eight neither connecticut nor rhode island sent delegates the southern states all fell away by eighteen o three and while from new england came the excuse that local conditions hardly made aggressive effort any longer necessary the lack of zeal in this section was also due to some extent to a growing question as to the wisdom of interfering with slavery in the south in virginia that just a few years before had been so active a statute was now passed imposing a penalty of one hundred dollars on any person who assisted a slave in asserting his freedom provided he failed to establish the claim and another provision enjoined that no member of an abolition society should serve as a juror in a freedom suit even the pennsylvania society showed signs of faint-heartedness and in eighteen o six the convention decided upon triennial rather than annual meetings it did not again become really vigorous until after the war of eighteen twelve one the cotton gin the new southwest and the first fugitive slave law of incalculable significance in the history of the negro in america was the series of inventions in england by arkwright hargreaves and crompton in the years seventeen sixty eight to seventy nine in the same period came the discovery of the power of steam by james watt of glasgow and its application to cotton manufacture and improvements followed quickly in printing and bleaching there yet remained one final invention of importance for the cultivation of cotton on a large scale eli whitney a graduate of yale went to georgia and was employed as a teacher by the widow of general green on her plantation seeing the need of some machine for the more rapid separating of cotton seed from the fiber he labored until in seventeen ninety three he succeeded in making his cotton gin of practical value the tradition is persistent however that the real credit of the invention belongs to a negro on the plantation the cotton gin created great excitement throughout the south and began to be utilized everywhere the cultivation and exporting of the staple grew by leaps and bounds in seventeen ninety one only thirty-eight bales of standard size were exported from the united states in eighteen sixteen however the cotton sent out of the country was worth twenty four million one hundred and six thousand dollars and was by far the most valuable article of export the current price was twenty eight cents a pound thus at the very time that the northern states were abolishing slavery an industry that had slumbered became supreme and the fate of hundreds of thousands of negroes was sealed meanwhile the opening of the west went forward and from maine and massachusetts carolina and georgia journeyed the pioneers to lay the foundations of ohio indiana and illinois and alabama and mississippi it was an eager restless caravan that moved and sometimes more than a hundred persons and a score of wagons were to be seen going from a single town in the east baptists and methodists and democrats the careers of boone and Savier, and those who went with them and the story of their fights with the indians are now a part of the romance of american history in seventeen ninety a cluster of log huts on the ohio river was named in honor of the society of the cincinnati in seventeen ninety two kentucky was admitted to the union the article on slavery in her constitution encouraging the system and discouraging emancipation and tennessee also entered as a slave state in seventeen ninety six of tremendous import to the negro were the questions relating to the mississippi territory after the revolution georgia laid claim to great tracts of land now comprising the states of alabama and mississippi with the exception of the strip along the coast claimed by spain in connection with florida this territory became a rich field for speculation and its history in its entirety makes a complicated story a series of sales to what were known as the yazoo companies especially in that part of the present states whose northern boundary would be a line drawn from the mouth of the yazoo to the chattahoochee resulted in conflicting claims the last grant sale being made in seventeen ninety five by a corrupt legislature at the price of a cent and a half an acre 
james jackson now raised the cry of bribery and corruption resigned from the united states senate secured a seat in the state legislature and on february thirteenth seventeen ninety six carried through a bill rescinding the action of the previous year and the legislature burned the documents concerned with the yazoo sale in token of its complete repudiation of them the purchasers to whom the companies had sold lands now began to bombard congress with petitions and president adams helped to arrive at a settlement by which georgia transferred the lands in question to the federal government which undertook to form of them the mississippi territory and to pay any damages involved in eighteen o two georgia threw the whole burden upon the central government by transferring to it all of her land beyond her present boundaries though for this she exacted an article favorable to slavery all was now made into the mississippi territory to which congress held out the promise that it would be admitted as a state as soon as its population numbered sixty thousand but alabama was separated from mississippi in eighteen sixteen the old matter of claims was not finally disposed of until an act of eighteen fourteen appropriated five million dollars for the purpose in the same year andrew jackson's decisive victories over the creeks at talladega and horseshoe bend of which more must be said resulted in the cession of a vast tract of the land of that unhappy nation and thus finally opened for settlement three-fourths of the present state of alabama it was in line with the advance that slavery was making a new territory that there was passed the first fugitive slave act seventeen ninety three this grew out of the discussion incident to the seizure in seventeen ninety one at washington penn of a negro named john who was taken to virginia and the correspondence between the governor of pennsylvania and the governor of virginia with reference to the case the important third section of the act read as follows and be it also enacted that when a person held to labor in any of the united states or in either of the territories on the northwest or the south of the river ohio under the laws thereof shall escape into any other of the said states or territory the person to whom such labor or service may be due his agent or attorney is hereby empowered to seize or arrest such fugitive from labor and to take him or her before any judge of the circuit or district courts of the united states residing or being within this state or before any magistrate of a county city or town corporate wherein such seizure or arrest shall be made and upon proof to the satisfaction of such judge or magistrate either by oral testimony or affidavit taken before and certified by a magistrate of any such state or territory that the person so seized or arrested death under the laws of the state or territory from which he or she fled o oh, service or labor to the person claiming him or her it shall be the duty of such judge or magistrate to give a certificate thereof to such claimant his agent or attorney which shall be sufficient warrant for removing the said fugitive from labor to the state or territory from which he or she fled it will be observed that by the terms of this enactment a master had the right to recover a fugitive slave by proving his ownership before a magistrate without a jury or any other of the ordinary forms of law a human being was thus placed at the disposal of the lowest of courts and subjected to such procedures was not allowed even in petty property suits a great field for the bribery of magistrates was opened up an opportunity was given for committing to slavery negro men about whose freedom there should have been no question by the close of the decade seventeen ninety to eighteen hundred the fear occasioned by the haitian revolution had led to a general movement against the importation of negroes especially of those from the west indies even georgia in seventeen ninety eight prohibited the importation of all slaves and this provision although very loosely enforced was never repealed in south carolina however to the utter chagrin and dismay of the other states importation prohibited in seventeen eighty seven was again legalized in eighteen o three and in the four years immediately following thirty nine thousand seventy five negroes were brought to charleston most of these going to the territories when in eighteen o three ohio was carved out of the northwest territory as a free state an attempt was made to claim the rest of the territory for slavery but this failed in the congressional session of eighteen o four to five the matter of slavery in the newly acquired territory of louisiana was brought up and slaves were allowed to be imported if they had come to the united states before seventeen ninety eight the purpose of this provision being to guard against the consequences of south carolina's recent act 
although such a clause never received rigid enforcement the mention of louisiana however brings us concretely to to saint louva to the greatest nigger in the new world in the period and one of the greatest of all time to to saint louverture louisiana and the formal closing of the slave trade when the french revolution broke out in seventeen eighty nine it was not long before its general effects were felt in the west indies of special importance was santo domingo because of the commercial interests centred there the eastern end of the island was spanish but the western portion was french and in this latter part was a population of six hundred thousand of which number fifty thousand were french creoles fifty thousand mulattoes and five hundred thousand pure negroes all political and social privileges were monopolized by the creoles while the negroes were agricultural laborers and slaves and between the two groups floated the restless element of the free people of color when the general assembly in france decreed equality of rights to all citizens the mulattoes of santo domingo made a petition for the enjoyment of the same political privileges as the white people to the unbounded consternation of the latter they were rewarded with a decree which was so ambiguously worded that it was open to different interpretations and which simply heightened the animosity that for years had been smouldering a new petition to the assembly in seventeen ninety one primarily for an interpretation brought forth on may fifteen the explicit degree that the people of color were to have all the rights and privileges of citizens provided they had been born of free parents on both sides the white people were enraged by the decision turned royalist and trampled the national cockade underfoot and throughout the summer armed strife and conflagration were the rule to add to the confusion the black slaves struck for freedom and on the night of august twenty three seventeen ninety one drenched the island in blood in the face of these events the conventional assembly rescinded its order then announced that the original decree must be obeyed and it sent three commissioners with troops to santo domingo real authority being invested in santhonax and pole Burrell on june twenty seventeen ninety three at cape francois trouble was renewed by a quarrel between a mulatto and a white officer in the marines the seamen came ashore and loaned their assistance to the white people and the negroes now joined forces with the mulattoes in the battle of two days that followed the arsenal was taken and plundered thousands were killed in the streets and more than half of the town was burned the french commissioners were the unhappy witnesses of the scene but they were practically helpless having only about a thousand troops Santhonax, however issued a proclamation offering freedom to all slaves who were willing to range themselves under the banner of the republic this was the first proclamation for the freeing of slaves in santo domingo and as a result of it many of the negroes came in and were enfranchised soon after this proclamation paul Varel left his colleague at the cape and went to port au prince the capital of the west here things were quiet and the cultivation of the crops was going forward as usual the slaves were soon unsettled however by the news of what was being done elsewhere and paul Varel was convinced that emancipation could not be delayed and that for the safety of the planters themselves it was necessary to extend it to the whole island in september seventeen ninety three he set in circulation from okai a proclamation to this effect and at the same time he exhorted all the planters in the vicinity who concurred in his work to register their names this almost all of them did as they were convinced of the need of measures for their personal safety and on february fourth seventeen ninety four the conventional assembly in paris formally approved all that had been done by decreeing the abolition of slavery in all the colonies of france all the while the spanish and the english had been looking on with interest and had even come to the french part of the island as if to aid in the restoration of order among the former at first in charge of a little royalist band was the negro toussaint later called louverture he was then a man in the prime of life forty-eight years old and already his experience had given him the wisdom that was needed to bring peace in santo domingo in april seventeen ninety four impressed by the decree of the assembly he returned to the jurisdiction of france and took service under the republic in seventeen ninety six he became a general of brigade in seventeen ninety seven general-in-chief with the military command of the whole colony he had once compelled the surrender of the english who had invaded his country with the aid of a commercial agreement with the united states he next starved out the garrison of his rival the mulatto rigaud 
whom he forced to consent to leave the country he then imprisoned room the agent of the directory and assumed civil as well as military authority he also seized the spanish part of the island which had been ceded to france some years before but had not been actually surrendered he then in may eighteen o one gave to santo domingo a constitution by which he not only assumed power for life but gave to himself the right of naming his successor and all the while he was awakening the admiration of the world by his bravery his moderation and his genuine instinct for government across the ocean however a jealous man was watching with interest the career of the gilded african none knew better than napoleon that it was because he did not trust france that toussaint had sought the friendship of the united states and none read better than he the logic of events as adams says bonaparte's acts as well as his professions showed that he was bent on crushing democratic ideas and that he regarded san domingo as an outpost of american republicanism although toussaint had made a rule as arbitrary as that of bonaparte himself by a strange confusion of events toussaint louverture because he was a negro became the champion of republican principles with which he had nothing but the instinct of personal freedom in common toussaint's government was less republican than that of bonaparte he was doing by necessity in san domingo what bonaparte was doing by choice in france this was the man to whom the united states ultimately owes the purchase of louisiana on october one eighteen o one bonaparte gave orders to general leclerc for a great expedition against santo domingo in january eighteen o two leclerc appeared and war followed in the course of this toussaint who was ordinarily so wise and who certainly knew that from napoleon he had most to fear made the great mistake of his life and permitted himself to be led into a conference on a french vessel he was betrayed and taken to france where within the year he died of pneumonia in the dungeon of Joux. immediately there was a proclamation annulling the decree of seventeen ninety four giving freedom to the slaves bonaparte however had not estimated the force of toussaint's work and to assist the negroes in their struggle now came a stalwart ally yellow fever by the end of the summer only one-seventh of leclerc's army remained and he himself died in november at once bonaparte planned a new expedition while he was arranging for the leadership of this however the european war broke out again meanwhile the treaty for the retrocession of the territory of louisiana had not yet received the signature of the spanish king because godoy the spanish representative would not permit the signature to be affixed until all the conditions were fulfilled and toward the end of eighteen o two the civil officer at new orleans closed the mississippi to the united states jefferson at length moved by the plea of the south sent a special envoy no less a man than james monroe to france to negotiate the purchase bonaparte disgusted by the failure of his egyptian expedition and his project for reaching india and especially by his failure in santo domingo in need of also of ready money listened to the offer and the people of the united states who within the last few years have witnessed the spoliation of haiti have not yet realized how much they owe to the courage of five hundred thousand haitian negroes who refused to be slaves the slavery question in the new territory was a critical one it was on account of it that the federalists had opposed the acquisition the american convention endeavored to secure a provision like that of the northwest ordinance and the yearly meeting of the society of friends in philadelphia in eighteen o five prayed that effectual measures may be adopted by congress to prevent the introduction of slavery into any of the territories of the united states nevertheless the whole territory without regard to latitude was thrown open to the system march to eighteen o five in spite of this victory for slavery however the general force of the events in haiti was such as to make more certain the formal closing of the slave trade at the end of the twenty-year period for which the constitution had permitted it to run the conscience of the north had been profoundly stirred and in the far south was the ever-present fear of a reproduction of the events in haiti the agitation in england moreover was at last about to bear fruit in the act of eighteen o seven forbidding the slave trade in america it seems from the first to have been an understood thing especially by the southern representatives that even if such an act passed it would be only irregularly enforced and the debates were concerned rather with the disposal of illegally imported africans and with the punishment of those concerned in the importation than with the proper limitation of the traffic by water 
on march two eighteen o seven the act was passed forbidding the slave trade after the close of the year in course of time it came very near to being a dead letter as may be seen from presidential messages reports of cabinet officers letters of collectors of revenue letters of district attorneys reports of committees of congress reports of naval commanders statements on the floor of congress the testimony of eyewitnesses and the complaints of home and foreign anti-slavery societies ferdinandina and calveston were only two of the most notorious ports for smuggling a regular chain of posts was established from the head of st mary's river to the upper country and through the indian nation by means of which the negroes were transferred to every part of the country if dealers wished to form a caravan they would give an indian alarm so that the woods might be less frequented and if pursued in georgia they would escape into florida one small schooner contained one hundred and thirty souls they were almost packed into a small space between a floor laid over the water cask and the deck not near three feet insufficient for them to sit upright and so close that chafing against each other their bones pierced the skin and became galled and ulcerated by the motion of the vessel many american vessels were engaged in the trade under spanish colors and the traffic to africa was pursued with uncommon vigor at havana the crews of vessels being made up of men of all nations who were tempted by the high wages to be earned evidently officials were negligent in the discharge of their duty but even if the offenders were apprehended it did not necessarily follow that they would receive effective punishment president madison in his message of december five eighteen ten said it appears that american citizens are instrumental in carrying on a traffic in enslaved africans equally in violation of the laws of humanity and in defiance of those of their own country and on january seventh eighteen nineteen the register of the treasury made to the house the amazing report that it doth not appear from an examination of the records of this office and particularly of the accounts to the date of their last settlement of the collectors of the customs and of the several marshals of the united states that any forfeitures had been incurred under the said act a supplementary and compromising and ineffective act of eighteen eighteen sought to concentrate efforts against smuggling by encouraging informers and one of the following year that authorized the president to make such regulations and arrangements as he may deem expedient for the safekeeping support and removal beyond the limits of the united states of recaptured africans and that bore somewhat more fruit was in large measure due to the colonization movement and of importance in connection with the founding of liberia thus while the formal closing of the slave trade might seem to be a great step forward the lackness with which the decree was enforced places it definitely in the period of reaction three gabriel's insurrection and the rise of the negro problem gabriel's insurrection of eighteen hundred was by no means the most formidable revolt that the southern states witnessed in design it certainly did not surpass the scope of the plot of denmark vesey twenty-two years later and in actual achievement it was insignificant when compared not only with nat turner's insurrection but even with the uprising sixty years before at the last moment in fact a great storm that came up made the attempt to execute the plan a miserable failure nevertheless coming as it did so soon after the revolution in haiti and giving evidence of young and unselfish leadership the plot was regarded as of extraordinary significance gabriel himself was an intelligent slave only twenty-four years old and his chief assistant was jack bowler aged twenty-eight throughout the summer of eighteen hundred he matured his plan holding meetings at which a brother named martin interpreted various texts from scriptures bearing on the situation of the negroes his insurrection was finally set for the first day of september it was well planned the rendezvous was to be a brook six miles from richmond under cover of night the force of eleven hundred was to march in three columns on the city then a town of eight thousand inhabitants the right wing to seize the penitentiary building which had just been converted into an arsenal while the left took possession of the powder house these two columns were to be armed with clubs and while they were doing their work the central force armed with muskets knives and pikes was to begin the carnage none being spared except the french whom it is significant that the negroes favored in richmond at the time there were not more than four or five hundred men with about thirty muskets but in the arsenal were several thousand guns and the powder house was well stocked seizure of the mills was to guarantee the insurrectionists a food supply and meanwhile in the country districts were the new harvests of corn and flocks and herds were fat in the fields on the day appointed for the uprising virginia witnessed such a storm as she had not seen in years bridges were carried away and roads and plantations completely submerged 
brook swamp the strategic point for the negroes was inundated and the country negroes could not get into the city nor could those in the city get out to the place of rendezvous the forests of more than a thousand dwindled to three hundred and these almost paralyzed by fear and superstition were dismissed meanwhile a slave who did not wish to see his master killed divulged the plot and all richmond was soon in arms a troop of united states cavalry was ordered to the city and arrest followed quickly three hundred dollars was offered by governor monroe for the arrest of gabriel and as much more for jack bowler bowler surrendered but it took weeks to find gabriel six men were convicted and condemned to be executed on september twelfth and five more on september eighteen gabriel was finally captured on september twenty four at norfolk on a vessel that had come from richmond he was convicted on october three and executed on october seven he showed no disposition to dissemble as to his own plan at the same time he said not one word that incriminated anybody else after him twenty-four more men were executed then it began to appear that some mistakes had been made and the killing ceased about the time of this uprising some negroes were also assembled for an outbreak in suffolk county there were alarms in petersburg and in the country near edenton north carolina as far away as charleston the excitement was intense there were at least three other negro insurrections of importance in the period seventeen ninety to eighteen twenty when news came of the uprising of the slaves in santo domingo in seventeen ninety one the negroes in louisiana planned a similar effort they might have succeeded better if they had not disagreed as to the hour of the outbreak when one of them informed the commandant as a punishment twenty-three of the slaves were hanged along the banks of the river and their corpses left dangling for days but three white men who assisted them and who were really the most guilty of all were simply sent out of the colony in camden south carolina on july fourth eighteen sixteen some other negroes risked all for independence on various pretexts men from the country districts were invited to the town on the appointed night and different commands were assigned all except that of commander-in-chief which position was to be given to him who first forced the gates of the arsenal again the plot was divulged by a favorite and confidential slave of whom we are told that the state legislature purchased the freedom settling upon him a pension for life about six of the leaders were executed on or about may one eighteen nineteen there was a plot to destroy the city of augusta georgia the insurrectionists were to assemble at beach island proceed to augusta set fire to the place and then destroy the inhabitants guards were posted and a white man who did not answer when hare was shot and fatally wounded a negro named coot was tried as being at the head of the conspiracy and sentenced to be executed a few days later other trials followed his not a muscle moved when the verdict was pronounced upon him the deeper meaning of such events as these could not escape the discerning more than one patriot had to wonder just whither the country was drifting already it was evident that the ultimate problem transcended the mere question of slavery and many knew that human beings could not always be confined to an artificial status throughout the period the slave trade seemed to flourish without any real check and it was even accentuated by the return to power of the old royalist houses of europe after the fall of napoleon meanwhile it was observed that slave labor was driving out of the south the white man of small means an antagonism between the men of the up country and the seaboard capitalists was brewing the ordinary social life of the negro in the south left much to be desired and conditions were not improved by the rapid increase as for slavery itself no one could tell when or where or how the system would end all only knew that it was developing apace and meanwhile there was the sinister possibility of the alliance of the negro and the indian sincere plans of gradual abolition were advanced in the south as well as the north but in the lower section they seldom got more than a respectful hearing in his dissertation on slavery with a proposal for the gradual abolition of it in the state of virginia st george tucker professor of law in the university of william and mary and one of the judges of the general court of virginia in seventeen ninety six advanced a plan by which he figured that after sixty years there would be only one-third as many slaves as at first at this distance his proposal seems extremely conservative at the time however it was laid on the table by the virginia house of delegates and from the senate the author received merely a civil acknowledgment two men of the period widely different in temper and tone but both earnest seekers after truth looked forward to the future with foreboding one with the eye of the scientist the other with the vision of the seer hezekiah niles had full sympathy with the groping and striving of the south 
but he insisted that slavery must ultimately be abolished throughout the country that the minds of the slaves should be exalted and that reasonable encouragement should be given free negroes said he we are ashamed of the thing we practice there is no attribute of heaven that takes part with us and we know it and in the contest that must come and will come there will be a heap of sorrows such as the world has rarely seen on the other hand rose lorenzo dow the foremost itinerant preacher of the time the first protestant to expound the gospel in alabama and mississippi and the reformer who at the very moment that cotton was beginning to be supreme presumed to tell the south that slavery was wrong everywhere he arrested attention with his long hair his harsh voice and his wild gesticulation startling all conservative hearers but he was made in the mould of heroes in his lifetime he travelled not less than two hundred thousand miles preaching to more people than any other man of his time several times he went to canada once to the west indies and three times to england everywhere drawing great crowds about him in a cry from the wilderness he more than once clothed his thought in enigmatic garb but the meaning was always ultimately clear at this distance when slavery and the civil war are alike viewed in the perspective the words of the oracle are almost uncanny in the rest of the southern states the influence of these foreigners will be known and felt in its time and the seeds from the hoary alliance and the de Capigandi, who have had a hand in those grades of generals from the inquisitor to the vicar general and down the struggle will be dreadful the cup will be bitter and when the agony is over those who survive may see better days farewell End of section seven. Section eight of a social history of the American Negro by Benjamin Griffith Brawley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter five, part one Indian and Negro. It is not the purpose of the present chapter to give a history of the seminole wars or even to trace fully the connection of the negro with these contests we do hope to show at least however that the negro was more important than anything else as an immediate cause of controversy though the general pressure of the white man upon the indian would in time of course have made trouble in any case strange parallels constantly present themselves and incidentally it may be seen that the policy of the government in force in other and even later years with reference to the negro was at this time also very largely applied in the case of the indian one creek seminole and negro to eighteen seventeen the war of eighteen twelve on august seventh seventeen eighty six the continental congress by a definite and far-reaching ordinance sought to regulate for the future the whole conduct of indian affairs two great districts were formed one including the territory north of the ohio and west of the hudson and the other including that south of the ohio and east of the mississippi and for anything pertaining to the indian in each of these two great tracts a superintendent was appointed as affecting the negro the southern district was naturally of vastly more importance than the northern in the eastern portion of this mainly in what are now georgia eastern tennessee and eastern alabama were the cherokees and the great confederacy of the creeks while toward the west in the present mississippi and western alabama were the chickasaws and the choctaws of muscogean stock and originally a part of the creeks were the seminoles runaways who about seventeen fifty under the leadership of a great chieftain sacoffi separated from the main confederacy which had its centre in southwest georgia just a little south of columbus and overran the peninsula of florida in eighteen o eight came another band under miko hadjo to the present site of tallahassee the mikosuke tribe was already on the ground in the vicinity of this town and at first its members objected to the newcomers who threatened to take their lands from them but at length all abode peaceably together under the general name of seminoles about eighteen ten these people had twenty towns the chief ones being mikasuki and tallahassee from the very first they had received occasional additions from the 
de massey who had been driven out of south carolina and of fugitive negroes by the close of the eighteenth century all along the frontier the indian had begun to feel keenly the pressure of the white man and in his struggle with the invader he recognized in the oppressed negro a natural ally those negroes who by any chance became free were welcomed by the indians fugitives from bondage found refuge with them and while indian chiefs commonly owned slaves the variety of servitude was very different from that under the white man the negroes were comparatively free and intermarriage was frequent thus a mulatto woman who fled from bondage married a chief and became the mother of a daughter who in course of time became the wife of the famous osceola this very close connection of the negro with the family life of the indian was the determining factor in the resistance of the seminoles to the demands of the agents of the united states and a reason stronger even than his love for his old hunting ground for his objection to removal to new lands beyond the mississippi very frequently the indian could not give up his negroes without seeing his own wife and children led away into bondage and thus to native courage and pride was added the instinct of a father for the preservation of his own in the two years between the americans and the english it was but natural that the indian should side with the english and it was in some measure but a part of the game that he should receive little consideration at the hands of the victor in the politics played by the english and the french the english and the spaniards and finally between the americans and all europeans the indian was ever the loser in the very early years of the carolina colonies some effort was made to enslave the indians but such servants soon made their way to the indian country and it was not long before they taught the negroes to do likewise this constant escape of slaves with its attendant difficulties largely accounted for the establishing of the free colony of georgia between south carolina and the spanish possession florida it was soon evident however that the problem had been aggravated rather than settled when congress met in seventeen seventy six it received from georgia a communication setting forth the need of preventing slaves from deserting their masters and as soon as the federal government was organized in seventeen eighty nine it received also from georgia an urgent request for protection from the creeks who were charged with various ravages and among other documents presented was a list of one hundred and ten negroes who were said to have left their masters during the revolution and to have found refuge among the creeks meanwhile by various treaties written and unwritten the creeks were being forced toward the western line of the state and in any agreement the outstanding stipulation was always for the return of fugitive slaves for a number of years the creeks retreated without definitely organized resistance in the course of the war of eighteen twelve however moved by the english and by a visit from tecumseh they suddenly rose and on august thirty eighteen thirteen under the leadership of weathersford they attacked fort mims a stockade thirty-five miles north of mobile the five hundred and fifty-three men women and children in this place were almost completely massacred only fifteen white persons escaped by hiding in the woods a number of negroes being taken prisoner this occurrence spurred the whole southwest to action volunteers were called for and the tennessee legislature resolved to exterminate the whole tribe andrew jackson with colonel coffee administered decisive defeats at talladega and tohopeka or whole shoe bend on the tallapoosa river and the creeks were forced to sue for peace by the treaty of fort jackson august nine eighteen fourteen the future president now a major-general in the regular army and in command at mobile demanded that the unhappy nation give up more than half of its land as indemnity for the cost of the war that it hold no communication with a spanish garrison or town that it permit the necessary roads to be made or forts to be built in any part of the territory and that it surrender the prophets who had instigated the war this last demand was ridiculous or only for moral effect for the so-called prophets had already been left dead on the field of battle the greeks were quite broken however and jackson passed on to fame and destiny at the battle of new orleans january eighth eighteen fifteen in april of this year he was made commander-in-chief of the southern division it soon developed that his chief task in this capacity was to reckon with the seminoles 
on the apalachicola river the british had rebuilt an old fort calling it the british post on the apalachicola early in the summer of eighteen fifteen the commander nichols had occasion to go to london and he took with him his troops the chief francis and several creeks leaving in the fort seven hundred and sixty-three barrels of cannon powder twenty five hundred muskets and numerous pistols and other weapons of war the negroes from georgia who had come to the vicinity who numbered not less than a thousand and who had some well kept farms up and down the banks of the river now took charge of the fort and made it their headquarters they were joined by some creeks and the so-called negro fort soon caused itself to be greatly feared by any white people who happened to live near demands on the spanish governor for its suppression were followed by threats of the use of the soldiery of the united states and general gaines under orders in the section wrote to jackson asking authority to build near the boundary another post that might be used as the base for any movement that had as its aim to overawe the negroes jackson readily complied with the request saying i have no doubt that this fort has been established by some villains for the purpose of murder rapine and plunder and that it ought to be blown up regardless of the ground it stands on if you have come to the same conclusion destroy it and restore the stolen negroes and property to their rightful owners gaines accordingly built fort scott not far from where the flint and the chattahoochee joined to form the apalachicola it was necessary for gaines to pass the negro fort in bringing supplies to his own men and on july seventeenth eighteen sixteen the boats of the americans were within range of the fort and opened fire there was some preliminary shooting and then since the walls were too stubborn to be battered down by a light fire a ball made red hot in the cook's galley was put in the gun and sent screaming over the wall and into the magazine the roar of the shock the scene that followed may be imagined but not described several hundred barrels of gunpowder tore the earth the fort and all the wretched creatures in it to fragments two hundred and seventy men women and children died on the spot of sixty-four taken out alive the greater number died soon after the seminoles in the west more and more identified with the creeks were angered by their failure to recover the lands lost by the treaty of fort jackson and also by the building of fort scott one settlement foul town fifteen miles east of fort scott was especially excited and in the fall of eighteen seventeen sent a warning to the americans not to cross or cut a stick of timber on the east side of the flint the warning was regarded as a challenge foul town was taken on a morning in november and the seminole wars had begun two first seminole war and the treaties of indian spring and fort moultrie in the course of the first seminole war eighteen seventeen to eighteen jackson ruthlessly laid waste the towns of the indians he also took pensacola and he awakened international difficulties by his rather summary execution of two british subjects arbuthnot and armbrister who were traitors to the indians and sustained generally pleasant relations with them for his conduct especially in this last instance he was severely criticized in congress but it is significant of his rising popularity that no form of vote of censure could pass against him on the session of florida to the united states he was appointed territorial governor but he served for a brief term only as early as eighteen twenty two he was nominated for the presidency by the legislature of tennessee and in eighteen twenty three he was sent to the united states senate of special importance in the history of the creeks about this time was the treaty of indian spring of january eighth eighteen twenty one an iniquitous agreement in the signing of which bribery and firewater were more than usually present by this the creeks ceded to the united states for the benefit of georgia five million acres of their most valuable land in cash they were to receive two hundred thousand dollars in payments extending over fourteen years the united states government moreover was to hold two hundred and fifty thousand dollars as a fund from which the citizens of georgia were to be reimbursed for any claims for runaway slaves of course that the citizens of the state had against the creeks prior to the year eighteen o two in the actual execution of this agreement a slave was frequently estimated at two or three times his real value and the creeks were expected to pay whether the fugitive was with them or not all possible claims however amounted to one hundred and one thousand dollars this left one hundred and forty nine thousand dollars of the money in the hands of the government this sum was not turned over to the indians as one might have expected but retained until eighteen thirty four when the georgia citizens interested petitioned for a division 
the request referred to the commission on indian affairs and the chairman gilmer of georgia was in favor of dividing the money among the petitioners as compensation for the offspring which the slaves would have borne had they remained in bondage this suggestion was rejected at the time but afterwards the division was made nevertheless and history records few more flagrant violations of all principles of honor and justice the first seminole war while in some ways disastrous to the indians was in fact not much more than the preliminary skirmish of a conflict that was not to cease until eighteen forty two in general the indians mindful of the ravages of the war of eighteen twelve did not fully commit themselves and bided their time they were in fact so much under cover that they led the americans to underestimate their real numbers when the session of florida was formally completed however july seventeenth eighteen twenty one they were found to be on the very best spots of land in the territory on may twenty eighteen twenty two colonel gad humphreys was appointed agent to them william p duval as governor of the territory being ex officio superintendent of indian affairs altogether the indians at this time according to the official count numbered one thousand five hundred and ninety four men one thousand three hundred and fifty seven women and nine hundred and ninety three children a total of three thousand nine hundred and forty four with one hundred and fifty negro men and six hundred and fifty negro women and children in the interest of these people humphreys labored faithfully for eight years and not a little of the comparative quiet in his period of service is to be credited to his own sympathy good sense and patience in the spring of eighteen twenty three the indians were surprised by the suggestion of a treaty that would definitely limit their boundaries and outline their future relations with the white man the representative chiefs had no desire for a conference were exceedingly reluctant to meet the commissioners and finally came to the meeting prompted only by the hope that such terms might be arrived at as would permanently guarantee them in the peaceable possession of their homes over the very strong protest of some of them a treaty was signed at fort moultrie on the coast five miles below st augustine september eighteenth eighteen twenty three william p duval james gadsden and bernard segui being the representatives of the united states by this treaty we learn that the indians in view of the fact that they have thrown themselves on and have promised to continue under the protection of the united states and of no other nation power or sovereignty and in consideration of the promises and stipulations herein after made do cede and relinquish all claim or title which they have to the whole territory of florida with the exception of such district of country as shall herein be allotted to them they are to have restricted boundaries the extreme point of which is nowhere to be nearer than fifteen miles to the gulf of mexico the united states promises to distribute as soon as the indians are settled on their new land under the direction of their agent implements of husbandry and stock of cattle and hogs to the amount of six thousand dollars and an annual sum of five thousand dollars a year for twenty successive years and to restrain and prevent all white persons from hunting settling or otherwise intruding upon the land set apart for the indians though any american citizen lawfully authorized is to pass and repass within the said district and navigate the waters thereof without any hindrance toll or exactions from said tribes for facilitating removal and as compensation for any losses or inconvenience sustained the united states is to furnish rations of corn meat and salt for twelve months with a special appropriation of four thousand five hundred dollars for those who have made improvements and two thousand dollars more for the facilitating of transportation the agent subagent and interpreter are to reside within the indian boundary to watch over the interests of said tribes and the united states further undertake as an evidence of their humane policy towards said tribes to allow one thousand dollars a year for twenty years for the establishment of a school and one thousand dollars a year for the same period for the support of a gun and blacksmith of supreme importance is article seven the chiefs and warriors aforesaid for themselves and tribes stipulate to be active and vigilant in the preventing the retreating to or passing through the district of country assigned them of any absconding slaves or fugitives from justice and further agree to use all necessary exertions to apprehend and deliver the same to the agent who shall receive orders to compensate them agreeably to the trouble and expense incurred we have dwelt at length upon the provisions of this treaty because it contained all the seeds of future trouble between the white man and the indian six prominent chiefs nia mathla john blunt tuskegee hajo mulatto king 
emathlochi and ekonchatniko refused absolutely to sign and their marks were not won until each was given a special reservation of from two to four square miles outside the seminole boundaries old nia mathla in fact never did accept the treaty in good faith and when the time came for the execution of the agreement he summoned his warriors to resistance governor duval broke in upon his war council deposed the war leaders and elevated those who favored peaceful removal the seminoles now retired to their new lands but nia mouth mathla was driven into practical exile he retired to the creeks by whom he was raised to the dignity of a chief it was soon realized by the seminoles that they had been restricted to some pine woods by no means as fertile as their old lands nor were matters made better by one or two seasons of drought to allay their discontent twenty square miles more to the north was given them but to offset this new session their rations were immediately reduced three from the treaty of fort moultrie to the treaty of payne's landing now succeeded ten years of trespassing of insult and of increasing enmity kidnappers constantly lurked near the indian possessions and instances of injury unredressed increased the bitterness and rancor under date may twenty eighteen twenty five humphreys wrote to the indian bureau that the white settlers were already thronging to the vicinity of the indian reservation and were likely to become troublesome as to some recent disturbances writing from st augustine february nine eighteen twenty five he said from all i can learn here there is little doubt that the disturbances near tallahassee which have of late occasioned so much clamor were brought about by a course of unjustifiable conduct on the part of the whites similar to that which it appears to be the object of the territorial legislature to legalize in fact it is stated that one indian had been so severely whipped by the head of the family which was destroyed by these disturbances as to cause his death if such be the fact the subsequent act of the indians however lamentable must be considered as one of retaliation and i can not but think it is to be deplored that they were afterwards hunted with so unrelenting a revenge the word hunted was used advisedly by humphreys for as we shall see later when war was renewed one of the common means of fighting employed by the american officers was the use of bloodhounds sometimes guns were taken from the indians so that they had nothing with which to pursue the chase on one occasion when some indians were being marched to headquarters a woman far advanced in pregnancy was forced onward with such precipitancy as to produce a premature delivery which almost terminated her life more far-reaching than anything else however was the constant denial of the rights of the indian in court in cases involving white men as humphreys said the great disadvantage under which the seminoles labored as witnesses destroyed everything like equality of rights some of the negroes that they had had been born among them and some others had been purchased from white men and duly paid for no receipts were given however and efforts were frequently made to recapture the negroes by force the indian conscious of his rights protested earnestly against such attempts and naturally determined to resist all efforts to wrest from him his rightfully acquired property by eighteen twenty seven however the territorial legislature had begun to memorialize congress and to ask for the complete removal of the indians meanwhile the negro question was becoming more prominent and orders from the department of war increasingly peremptory were made on humphreys for the return of definite negroes for duval and humphreys however who had actually to execute the commissions the task was not always so easy under date march twenty eighteen twenty seven the former wrote to the latter many of the slaves belonging to the whites are now in the possession of the white people these slaves cannot be obtained for their indian owners without a lawsuit and i see no reason why the indians shall be compelled to surrender all slaves claimed by our citizens when this surrender is not mutual meanwhile the annuity began to be withheld from the indians in order to force them to return negroes and a friendly chief hicks constantly waited upon humphreys only to find the agent little more powerful than himself thus matters continued through eighteen twenty nine and eighteen thirty in violation of all legal procedure the indians were constantly required to relinquish beforehand property in their possession to settle a question of claim on march twenty one eighteen thirty humphreys was informed that he was no longer agent for the indians he had been honestly devoted to the interest of these people but his efforts were not in harmony with the policy of the new administration 
just what that policy was may be seen from jackson's special message on indian affairs of february twenty two eighteen thirty one the senate had asked for information as to the conduct of the government in connection with the act of march thirty eighteen o two to regulate trade and intercourse with the indian tribes and to preserve peace on the frontiers the nullification controversy was in everybody's mind and already friction had arisen between the new president and the abolitionists in spite of jackson's attitude toward south carolina his message in the present instance was a careful defense of the whole theory of state rights nothing in the conduct of the federal government toward the indian tribes he insisted had ever been intended to attack or even to call in question the rights of a sovereign state in one way the southern states had seemed to be an exception as early as seventeen eighty four the settlements within the limits of north carolina were advanced farther to the west than the authority of the state to enforce an obedience of its laws after the revolution the tribes desolated the frontiers under these circumstances the first treaties in seventeen eighty five and seventeen ninety with the cherokees were concluded by the government of the united states nothing of all this said jackson had in any way affected the relation of any indians to the state in which they happened to reside and he concluded as follows toward this race of people i entertain the kindest feelings and am not sensible that the views which i have taken of their true interests are less favorable to them than those which oppose their emigration to the west years since i stated to them my belief that if the states chose to extend their laws over them it would not be in the power of the federal government to prevent it my opinion remains the same and i can see no alternative for them but that of their removal to the west or a quiet submission to the state laws if they prefer to remove the united states agree to defray their expenses to supply them the means of transportation and a year's support after they reach their new homes a provision too liberal and kind to bear the stamp of injustice either course promises them peace and happiness whilst an obstinate perseverance in the effort to maintain their possessions independent of the state authority cannot fail to render their condition still more helpless and miserable such an effort ought therefore to be discountenanced by all who sincerely sympathize in the fortunes of this peculiar people and especially by the political bodies of the union as calculated to disturb the harmony of the two governments and to endanger the safety of the many blessings which they enable us to enjoy End of section eight. Section nine of A Social History of the American Negro by Benjamin Griffith Brawley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter five, part two. The policy thus formally enunciated was already in practical operation in the closing days of the administration of john quincy adams a delegation came to washington to present to the administration the grievances of the cherokee nation the formal reception of the delegation fell to the lot of eaton the new secretary of war the cherokees asserted that not only did they have no rights in the georgia courts in cases involving white men but that they had been notified by georgia that all laws usages and agreements in force in the indian country would be null and void after june one eighteen thirty and naturally they wanted the interposition of the federal government eden replied at great length reminding the cherokees that they had taken sides with england in the war of eighteen twelve that they were now on american soil only by sufferance and that the central government could not violate the rights of the state of georgia and he strongly advised immediate removal to the west the cherokees quite broken acted in accord with this advice and so in eighteen thirty two did the creeks to whom jackson had sent a special talk urging removal as the only basis of federal protection to the seminoles as early as eighteen twenty seven overtures for removal had been made 
but before the treaty of fort moultrie had really become effective they had been intruded upon and they in turn had become more slow about returning runaway slaves from some of the clauses in the treaty of fort moultrie as some of the chiefs were quick to point out the understanding was that the same was to be in force for twenty years and they felt that any slowness on their part about the return of negroes was fully nullified by the efforts of the professional negro stealers with whom they had to deal early in eighteen thirty two however colonel james gadsden of florida was directed by lewis cass the secretary of war to enter into negotiation for the removal of the indians of florida there was great opposition to a conference but the indians were finally brought together at payne's landing on the ocklawaha river just seventeen miles from fort king here on may ninth eighteen thirty two was wrested from them a treaty which is of supreme importance in the history of the seminoles the full text was as follows treaty of payne's landing may ninth eighteen thirty two whereas a treaty between the united states and the seminole nation of indians was made and concluded at payne's landing on the ocklawaha river on the ninth of may one thousand eight hundred and thirty two by james gadsden commissioner on the part of the united states and the chiefs and headmen of said seminole nation of indians on the part of said nation which treaty is in the words following to wit the seminole indians regarding with just respect the solicitude manifested by the president of the united states for the improvement of their condition by recommending a removal to the country more suitable to their habits and wants than the one they at present occupy in the territory of florida are willing that their confidential chiefs jumper fucha lus to hadjo charlie e mantla koi hadjo holati e mantla yaha hadjo sam jones accompanied by their agent major john fagan and their faithful interpreter abraham should be sent at the expense of the united states as early as convenient to examine the country assigned to the creeks west of the mississippi river and should they be satisfied with the character of the country and of the favorable disposition of the creeks to reunite with the seminoles as one people the articles of the compact and agreement herein stipulated at payne's landing on the ocklawaha river this ninth day of may one thousand eight hundred and thirty two between james gadsden for and in behalf of the government of the united states and the undersigned chiefs and headmen for and in behalf of the seminole indians shall be binding on the respective parties article one the seminole indians relinquish to the united states all claim to the land they at present occupy in the territory of florida and agree to emigrate to the country assigned to the creeks west of the mississippi river it being understood that an additional extent of country proportion to their numbers will be added to the creek territory and that the seminoles will be received as a constituent part of the creek nation and be readmitted to all the privileges as a member of the same article two four and in consideration of the relinquishment of claim in the first article of this agreement and in full compensation for all the improvements which may have been made on the lands thereby ceded the united states stipulate to pay to the seminole indians fifteen thousand four hundred dollars to be divided among the chiefs and warriors of the several towns in a ratio proportioned to their population the respective proportions of each to be paid on their arrival in the country they consent to remove to it being understood that their faithful interpreters abraham and cudjo shall receive two hundred dollars each of the above sum in full remuneration of the improvements to be abandoned on the lands now cultivated by them article three the united states agree to distribute as they arrive at their new homes in the creek territory west of the mississippi river a blanket 
and a home spun frock to each of the warriors women and children of the seminole tribe of indians article four the united states agree to extend the annuity for the support of a blacksmith provided for in the sixth article of the treaty at camp moultrie for ten years beyond the period therein stipulated and in addition to the other annuities secured under that treaty the united states agree to pay the sum of three thousand dollars a year for fifteen years commencing after the removal of the whole tribe these sums to be added to the creek annuities and the whole amount to be so divided that the chiefs and warriors of the seminole indians may receive their equitable proportion of the same as members of the creek confederation article five the united states will take the cattle belonging to the seminoles at the valuation of some discreet person to be appointed by the president and the same shall be paid for in money to the respective owners after their arrival at their new homes or other cattle such as may be desired will be furnished them notice being given through their agent of their wishes upon this subject before their removal that time may be afforded to supply the demand article six the seminoles being anxious to be relieved from the repeated vexatious demands of forest slaves and other property alleged to have been stolen and destroyed by them so that they may remove unembarrassed to their new homes the united states stipulate to have the same property properly investigated and to liquidate such as may be satisfactorily established provided the amount does not exceed seven thousand dollars article seven the seminole indians will remove within three years after the ratification of this agreement and the expenses of their removal shall be defrayed by the united states and such subsistence shall also be furnished them for a term not exceeding twelve months after their arrival at their new residence as in the opinion of the president their numbers and circumstances may require the emigration to commence as early as practicable in the year eighteen hundred and thirty three and with those indians at present occupying the big swamp and other parts of the country beyond the limits as defined in the second article of the treaty concluded at camp moultrie creek so that the whole of that proportion of the seminoles may be removed within the year aforesaid and the remainder of the tribe in about equal proportions during the subsequent years of eighteen hundred and thirty four and five in testimony whereof the commissioner james gadsden and the undersigned chiefs and headmen of the seminole indians have here unto subscribed their names and affixed their seals done at camp at payne's landing on the ocklawaha river in the territory of florida on this ninth day of may one thousand eight hundred and thirty two and of the independence of the united states of america the fifty sixth signed james gadsden l s holadi imantler his x mark jumper his x mark cujo interpreter his x mark erastus rogers b joskin holadi imantler his x mark jumper his x mark fudge ta lusta hajo his x mark charlie imantla his x mark coy hadjo his x mark r pi uki or sam jones his x mark yaha hadjo his x mark maiko noha his x mark takosi imantla or john hicks his x mark cat sha tusta nugi his x mark halat amiko his x mark hitch it i maiko his x mark inaha his x mark yaha imantla chopko his x mark moki his she lar ni his x mark now therefore be it known that i andrew jackson president of the united states of america having seen and considered said treaty do by and with the advice and consent of the senate as expressed by their resolution of the eighth day of april one thousand eight hundred and thirty four accept ratify and confirm the same and every clause and article thereof in witness whereof i have caused the seal of the united states to be hereunto affixed having signed the same with my hand done at the city of washington this twelfth day of april in the year of our lord one thousand eight hundred and thirty four and of the independence of the united states of america the fifty eighth 
signed andrew jackson by the president lewis mclean secretary of state it will be seen that by the terms of this document seven chiefs were to go and examine the country assigned to the creeks and that they were to be accompanied by major john fagan the successor of humphreys and the negro interpreter abraham the character of fagan may be seen from the facts that he was soon in debt to different ones of the indians and to abraham and that he was found to be short in his accounts while the indian chiefs were in the west three united states commissioners conferred with them as to the suitability of the country for a future home and at fort gibson arkansas march twenty eighth eighteen thirty three they were beguiled into signing an additional treaty in which occurred the following sentence and the undersigned seminole chiefs delegated as aforesaid on behalf of their nation hereby declare themselves well satisfied with the location provided for them by the commissioners and agree that their nation shall commence the removal to their new home as soon as the government will make arrangements for their emigration satisfactory to the seminole nation they of course had no authority to act on their own initiative and when all returned in april eighteen thirty three and fagan explained what had happened the seminoles expressed themselves in no uncertain terms the chiefs who had gone west denied strenuously that they had signed away any rights to land but they were nevertheless upbraided as the agents of deception some of the old chiefs of whom micanope was the highest authority resolved to resist the efforts to dispossess them and john hicks who seems to have been substituted for sam jones on the commission was killed because he argued too strongly for migration meanwhile the treaty of payne's landing was ratified by the senate of the united states and proclaimed as in force by president jackson april twelfth eighteen thirty four and in connection with it the supplementary treaty of fort gibson was also ratified the seminoles however were not showing any haste about removing and ninety of the white citizens of vala chua county sent a protest to the president alleging that the indians were not returning their fugitive slaves jackson was made angry and without even waiting for the formal ratification of the treaties he sent the document to the secretary of war with an endorsement on the back directing him to inquire into the alleged facts and if found to be true to direct the seminoles to prepare to remove west and join the creeks general wiley thompson was appointed to succeed fagan as agent and general duncan l clinch was placed in command of the troops whose services it was thought might be needed it was at this juncture that osceola stepped forward as the leading spirit of his people four osceola and the second seminole war osceola osceola or asci holar sometimes called powell because after his father's death his mother married a white man of that name was not more than thirty years of age he was slender of only average height and slightly round-shouldered but he was also well proportioned muscular and capable of enduring great fatigue he had light deep restless eyes and a shrill voice and he was a great admirer of order and technique he excelled in athletic contests and in his earlier years had taken delight in engaging in military practice with the white men as he was neither by descent nor formal election a chief he was not expected to have a voice in important deliberations but he was a natural leader and he did more than any other man to organize the seminoles to resistance it is hardly too much to say that to his single influence was due a contest that ultimately cost ten million dollars and the loss of thousands of lives never did a patriot fight more valiantly for his own and it stands to the eternal disgrace of the american arms that he was captured under a flag of truce it is well to pause for a moment and reflect upon some of the deeper motives that entered into the impending contest a distinguished congressman speaking in the house of representatives a few years later touched eloquently upon some of the events of these troublous years let us remember that this was the time of the formation of anti-slavery societies a pronounced activity on the part of the abolitionists and recall also that nat turner's insurrection was still fresh in the public mind giddings stated clearly 
the issue as it appeared to the people of the north when he said i hold that if the slaves of georgia or any other state leave their masters the federal government has no constitutional authority to employ our army or navy for their recapture or to apply the national treasure to repurchase them there could be no question of the fact that the war was very largely won over fugitive slaves under date october twenty eighth eighteen thirty four general thompson wrote to the commissioner of indian affairs there are many very likely negroes in this nation the seminole some of the whites in the adjacent settlements manifest a restless desire to obtain them and i have no doubt that indian raised negroes are now in the possession of the whites in a letter dated january twenty eighteen thirty four governor duval had already said to the same official the slaves belonging to the indians have a controlling influence over the minds of their masters and are entirely opposed to any change of residence six days later he wrote the slaves belonging to the indians must be made to fear for themselves before they will cease to influence the minds of their masters the first step towards the emigration of these indians must be the breaking up of the runaway slaves and the outlaw indians and the new orleans courier of july twenty seventh eighteen thirty nine revealed all the fears of the period when it said every day's delay in subduing the seminoles increases the danger of a rising among the serviles all the while injustice and injury to the indians continued ikan chantimico well known as one of those chiefs to whom special reservations had been given by the treaty of fort moultrie was the owner of twenty slaves valued at fifteen thousand dollars observing negro stealers hovering around his estate he armed himself and his men the kidnappers then furthered their designs by circulating the report that the indians were arming themselves for union with the main body of seminoles for the general purpose of massacring the white people face to face with this charge ikan chatimico gave up his arms and threw himself on the protection of the government and his negroes were at once taken and sold into bondage a similar case was that of john walker an Apalachicola chief who wrote to thompson under date july twenty eighth eighteen thirty five i am induced to write you in consequence of the depredations making and attempted to be made upon my property by a company of negro stealers some of whom are from columbus georgia and have connected themselves with brown and douglas i should like your advice how i am to act i dislike to make or to have any difficulty with the white people but if they trespass upon my premises and my rights i must defend myself the best way i can if they do make this attempt and i have no doubt they will they must bear the consequences but is there no civil law to protect me are the free negroes and the negroes belonging to this town to be stolen away publicly and in the face of law and justice carried off and sold to fill the pockets of these worse than land pirates douglas and his company hired a man who has two large drain dogs for the purpose to come down and take billy he is from mobile and follows for a livelihood catching runaway negroes such were the motives fears and incidents in the years immediately after the treaty of payne's landing beginning at the close of eighteen thirty four and continuing through april eighteen thirty five thompson had a series of conferences with the seminole chiefs at these meetings my canopy influenced by osceola and other young seminoles took a more definite stand than he might otherwise have assumed especially did he insist with reference to the treaty that he understood that the chiefs who went west were to examine the country and for his part he knew that when they returned they would report unfavorably thompson then becoming angry delivered an ultimatum to the effect that if the treaty was not observed the annuity from the great father in washington would cease to this osceola stepping forward replied that he and his warriors did not care if they never received another dollar from the great father and drawing his knife he plunged it in the table and said the only treaty i will execute is with this henceforward there was deadly enmity between the young seminole and thompson more and more osceola made his personality felt constantly asserting to the men of his nation that whoever recommended emigration was an enemy of the seminoles and he finally arrived at an understanding with many of them that the treaty would be resisted with their very lives thompson however on april twenty three eighteen thirty five had a sort of secret conference with sixteen of the chiefs who seemed favorably disposed toward 
migration and he persuaded them to sign a document freely and fully assenting to the treaties of payne's landing and fort gibson the next day there was a formal meeting at which the agent backed up by clinch and his soldiers upbraided the indians in a very harsh manner his words were met by groans angry gesticulations and only half muffled imprecations clinch endeavored to appeal to the indians and to advise them that resistance was both unwise and useless thompson however with his usual lack of tact rushed onward in his course and learning that five chiefs were unalterably opposed to the treaty he arbitrarily struck their names off the roll of chiefs an action the high-handedness of which was not lost on the seminoles immediately after the conference moreover he forbade the sale of any more arms and powder to the indians to the friendly chiefs the understanding had been given that the nation might have until january one eighteen thirty six to make preparation for removal by which time all were to assemble at fort brooke tampa bay for emigration about the first of june osceola was one day on a quiet errand of trading at fort king with him was his wife the daughter of a mulatto slave woman who had run away years before and married an indian chief by southern law this woman followed the condition of her mother and when the mother's former owner appeared on the scene and claimed the daughter thompson who desired to teach osceola a lesson readily agreed that she should be remanded into captivity osceola was highly enraged and this time it was his turn to upbraid the agent thompson now had him overpowered and put it in irons in which situation he remained for the better part of two days in this period of captivity his soul plotted revenge and at length he too planned a ruse de guerre feigning assent to the treaty he told thompson that if he was released not only would he sign himself but he would also bring his people to sign the agent was completely deceived by osceola's tactics true to his professions wrote thompson on june three he this day appeared with seventy-nine of his people men women and children including some who had joined him since his conversion and redeemed his promise he told me many of his friends were out hunting whom he could and would bring over on their return i have now no doubt of his sincerity and as little that the greatest difficulty is surmounted osceola now rapidly urged forward preparations for war which however he did not wish actually started until after the crops were gathered by the fall he was ready and one day in october when he and some other warriors met charlie imantla who had upon him the gold and silver that he had received from the sale of his cattle preparatory to migration they killed this chief and osceola threw the money in every direction saying that no one was to touch it as it was the price of the red man's blood the true drift of events became even more apparent to thompson and clinch in november when five chiefs friendly to migration with five hundred of their people suddenly appeared at fort brooke to ask for protection when in december thompson sent final word to the seminoles that they must bring in their horses and cattle the indians did not come on the appointed day on the contrary they sent their women and children to the interior and girded themselves for battle to osceola late in the month a runner brought word that some troops under the command of major date were to leave fort brooke on the twenty fifth and on the night of the twenty seventh were to be attacked by some seminoles in the wahoo swamp osceola himself with some of his men was meanwhile lying in the woods near fort king waiting for an opportunity to kill thompson on the afternoon of the twenty eighth the agent dined not far from the fort at the home of the sutler a man named rogers and after dinner he walked with lieutenant smith to the crest of a neighboring hill here he was surprised by the indians and both he and smith fell pierced by numerous bullets the indians then pressed on to the home of the sutler and killed rogers his two clerks and a little boy on the same day the command of major date including seven officers and one hundred and ten men was almost completely annihilated only three men escaping date and his horse were killed at the first onset these two attacks began the actual fighting of the second seminole war that the negroes were working shoulder to shoulder with the indians in these encounters may be seen from the report of captain belton who said lieutenant keyes third artillery had both arms broken from the first shot was unable to act and was tomahawked the latter part of the second attack by a negro and further a negro named harry controls the p-band of about a hundred warriors forty miles southeast of us who have done most of the mischief and keep this post constantly observed osceola now joined forces with those indians who had attacked date and in the early morning of the last day of the year occurred the battle of oif la couchy 
a desperate encounter in which both osceola and clinch gave good accounts of themselves clinch had two hundred regulars and five or six hundred volunteers the latter fled early in the contest and looked on from a distance and clinch had to work desperately to keep from duplicating the experience of dade osceola himself was conspicuous in a red belt and three long feathers but although twice wounded he seemed to bear a charmed life he posted himself behind a tree from which station he constantly sallied forth to kill or wound an enemy with almost infallible aim after these early encounters the fighting became more and more bitter and the contest more prolonged early in the war the dispersing agent reported that there were only three thousand indians including negroes to be considered but this was clearly an understatement within the next year and a half the indians were hard pressed and before the end of this period the notorious thomas s jessup had appeared on the scene as commanding major-general this man seems to have determined never to use honorable means of warfare if some ignoble instrument could serve his purpose in a letter sent to colonel harvey from tampa bay under date may twenty five eighteen thirty seven he said if you see powell osceola tell him i shall send up and take all the negroes who belong to the white people and he must not allow the indian negroes to mix with them tell him i am sending to cuba for bloodhounds to trail them and i intend to hang every one of them who does not come in and it might be remarked that for his bloodhounds joseph spent or said he spent as much as five thousand dollars a fact which thoroughly aroused giddings and other persons from the north who by no means cared to see such an investment of public funds by our order number one sixty dated august three eighteen thirty seven joseph invited his soldiers to plunder and rapine saying all indian property captured from this date will belong to the corps or detachment making it from st augustine under date october twenty eighteen thirty seven in a confidential communication he said to one of his lieutenants should powell and his warriors come within the fort seize him and the whole party it is important that he wildcat john cowagee and tustin Nugi, be secured hold them until you have my orders in relation to them two days later he was able to write to the secretary of war that osceola was actually taken said he that chief came into the vicinity of fort peyton on the twentieth and sent a messenger to general hernandez desiring to see and converse with him the sickly season being over and there being no further necessity to temporize i sent a party of mounted men and seized the entire body and now have them securely lodged in the fort osceola wildcat and others thus captured were marched to st augustine but wildcat escaped osceola was ultimately taken to fort moultrie in the harbor of charleston where in january eighteen thirty eight he died important in this general connection was the fate of the deputation that the influential john ross chief of the cherokees was persuaded to send from his nation to induce the seminoles to think more favorably of migration my canopy twelve other chieftains and a number of warriors accompanied the cherokee deputation to the headquarters of the united states army at fort mellon where they were to discuss the matter these warriors also jessup seized and ross wrote to the secretary of war a dignified but bitter letter protesting against this unprecedented violation of that sacred rule which has ever been recognized by every nation civilized and uncivilized of treating with all due respect those who have had ever presented themselves under a flag of truce before the enemy for the purpose of proposing the termination of warfare he had indeed been most basely used as the agent of deception this chapter we trust has shown something of the real nature of the points at issue in the seminole wars in the course of these contests the rights of indian and negro alike were ruthlessly disregarded there was redress for neither before the courts and at the end in dealing with them every honorable principle of men and nations was violated it is interesting that the three representatives of colored peoples who in the course of the nineteenth century it was most difficult to capture toussaint louverture the negro osceola the indian and aguinaldo the filipino were all taken through treachery and on two of these three occasions this treachery was practiced by responsible officers of the united states army end of section nine section ten of a social history of the american negro by benjamin griffith brawley this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter six early approach to the negro problem one the ultimate problem and the missouri compromise in a previous chapter we have already indicated the rise of the negro problem 
in the last decade of the eighteenth and the first two decades of the nineteenth century and what was the negro problem it was certainly not merely a question of slavery in the last analysis this institution was hardly more than an incident slavery has ceased to exist but even to-day the problem is with us the question was rather what was to be the final place in the american body politic of the negro population that was so rapidly increasing in the country in the answering of this question supreme importance attached to the negro himself but the problem soon transcended the race ultimately it was the destiny of the united states rather than of the negro that was to be considered and all the ideals on which the country was based came to the testing if one studied those ideals he soon realized that they were based on teutonic or at least english foundations by eighteen twenty however the young american republic was already beginning to be the hope of all of the oppressed people of europe and greeks and italians as well as germans and swedes were turning their faces toward the promised land the whole background of latin culture was different from the teutonic and yet the people of southern as well as of northern europe somehow became a part of the life of the united states in this life was it also possible for the children of africa to have a permanent and an honourable place with their special tradition and gifts with their shortcomings above all with their distinctive colour could they too become genuine american citizens some said no but in taking this position they denied not only the ideals on which the country was founded but also the possibilities of human nature itself in any case the answer to the first question at once suggested another what shall we do with the negro about this there was very great difference of opinion it not always being supposed that the negro himself had anything whatever to say about the matter some said send the negro away get rid of him by any means whatsoever others said if he must stay keep him in slavery still others said not to keep him permanently in slavery but emancipate him only gradually and already there were beginning to be persons who felt that the negro should be emancipated everywhere immediately and that after this great event had taken place he and the nation together should work out his salvation on the broadest possible plane into the agitation was suddenly thrust the application of missouri for entrance into the union as a slave state the struggle that followed for two years was primarily a political one but in the course of the discussion the evils of slavery were fully considered meanwhile in eighteen nineteen alabama and maine also applied for admission alabama was allowed to enter without much discussion as she made equal the number of slave and free states maine however brought forth more talk the southern congressmen would have been perfectly willing to admit this as a free state if missouri had been admitted as a slave state but the north felt that this would have been to concede altogether too much as missouri from the first gave promise of being unusually important at length largely through the influence of henry clay there was adopted a compromise whose main provisions were one that maine was to be admitted as a free state two that in missouri there was to be no prohibition of slavery but three that slavery was to be prohibited in any other states that might be formed out of the louisiana purchase north of the line of thirty six degrees thirty minutes by this agreement the strife was allayed for some years but it is now evident that the missouri compromise was only a postponement of the ultimate contest and that the social questions involved were hardly touched certainly the significance of the first clear drawing of the line 
between the sections was not lost upon thoughtful men jefferson wrote from monticello in eighteen twenty this momentous question like a fire-bell in the night awakened and filled me with terror i considered it at once as the knell of the union it is hushed indeed for the moment but this is a reprieve only not a final sentence i can say with conscious truth that there is not a man on earth who would sacrifice more than i would to relieve us from this heavy reproach in any practicable way the cession of that kind of property for so it is misnamed is a bagatelle that would not cost me a second thought if in that way a general emancipation and expatriation could be effected and gradually and with due sacrifice as i think it might be for the time being however the south was concerned mainly about immediate dangers nor was this section placed more at ease by denmark vesey's attempted insurrection in eighteen twenty two a representative south carolinian writing after this event said we regard our negroes as the jacobins of the country against whom we should always be upon our guard and who although we fear no permanent effects from any insurrectionary movements on their part should be watched with an eye of steady and unremitted observation meanwhile from a ratio of forty three point seventy two to fifty six point twenty eight in seventeen ninety the total negro population in south carolina had by eighteen twenty come to outnumber the white fifty two point seventy seven to forty seven point twenty three and the tendency was increasingly in favor of the negro the south the whole country in fact was more and more being forced to consider not only slavery but the ultimate reaches of the problem whatever one might think of the conclusion and in this case the speaker was pleading for colonization no statement of the problem as it impressed men about eighteen twenty or eighteen thirty was clearer than that of rev dr knott president of union college at albany in eighteen twenty nine the question said he was by no means local slavery was once legalized in new england and new england built slave ships and manned these with new england seamen in eighteen twenty the slave population in the country amounted to one million five hundred thousand the number doubled every twenty years and it was easy to see how it would progress from one million five hundred thousand to three million to six million to twelve million to twenty four million twenty four millions of slaves what a drawback from our strength what a tax on our resources what a hindrance to our growth what a stain on our character and what an impediment to the fulfilment of our destiny could our worst enemies or the worst enemies of republics wish us a severer judgment how could one know that wakeful and sagacious enemies without word not discover the vulnerable point and use it for the country's overthrow or was there not danger that among a people goaded from age to age there might at length arise some second to saint louverture who reckless of consequences would array a force and cause a movement throughout the zone of bondage leaving behind him plantations waste and mansions desolate who could believe that such a tremendous physical force would remain forever spellbound and quiescent after all however slavery was doomed public opinion had already pronounced upon it and the moral energy of the nation would sooner or later effect its overthrow but continued not the solemn question here arises in what condition will this momentous change place us the freedmen of other countries have long since disappeared having been amalgamated in the general mass here there can be no amalgamation our manumitted bondmen have remained already to the third and fourth as they will to the thousandth generation a distinct a degraded and a wretched race after this sweeping statement which has certainly not been justified by time not proceeded to argue the expediency of his organization garrett smith who later drifted away from colonization said frankly on the same occasion that the ultimate solution was either amalgamation or colonization and that of the two courses he preferred to choose the latter others felt as he did we shall now accordingly proceed to consider at somewhat greater length the two solutions that about eighteen twenty had the clearest advocates colonization and slavery two colonization early in seventeen seventy three reverend samuel hopkins of newport called on his friend reverend ezra stiles afterwards president of yale college 
and suggested the possibility of educating negro students perhaps two at first who would later go as missionaries to africa styles thought that for the plan to be worth while there should be a colony on the coast of africa that at least thirty or forty persons should go and that the enterprise should not be private but should have the formal backing of a society organized for the purpose in harmony with the original plan two young negro men sailed from new york for africa november twelfth seventeen seventy four but the revolutionary war followed and nothing more was done at the time in seventeen eighty four however and again in seventeen eighty seven hopkins tried to induce different merchants to fit out a vessel to convey a few emigrants and in the latter year he talked with a young man from the west indies dr william thornton who expressed a willingness to take charge of the company the enterprise failed for lack of funds though thornton kept up his interest and afterwards became a member of the first board of managers of the american colonization society hopkins in seventeen ninety one spoke before the connecticut emancipation society which he wished to see incorporated as a colonization society and in a sermon before the providence society in seventeen ninety three he reverted to his favorite theme meanwhile as a result of the efforts of wilberforce clarkson and granville sharp in england in may seventeen eighty seven some four hundred negroes and sixty white persons were landed at sierra leone some of the negroes in england had gained their freedom in consequence of lord mansfield's decision in seventeen seventy two others had been discharged from the british army after the american revolution and all were leading in england a more or less precarious existence the sixty white persons sent along were abandoned women and why sierra leone should have had this weight placed upon it at the start history has not yet told it is not surprising to learn that disease and disorder were rife and by seventeen ninety one a mere handful survived as early as in his notes on virginia privately printed in seventeen eighty one thomas jefferson had suggested a colony for negroes perhaps in the new territory of ohio the suggestion was not acted upon but it is evident that by eighteen hundred several persons had thought of the possibility of removing the negroes in the south to some other place either within or without the country gabriel's insurrection in eighteen hundred again forced the idea concretely forward virginia was visibly disturbed by this outbreak and in secret session on december twenty one the house of delegates passed the following resolution that the governor be requested to correspond with the president of the united states on the subject of purchasing land without the limits of this state whither persons obnoxious to the laws or dangerous to the peace of society may be removed the real purpose of this resolution was to get rid of those negroes who had had some part in the insurrection and had not been executed but not in eighteen hundred or in eighteen o two or eighteen o four was the general assembly thus able to banish those whom it was afraid to hang monroe however acted in accordance with his instructions and jefferson replied to him under date november twenty fourth eighteen o one he was not now favorable to deportation to some place within the united states and thought that the west indies probably santo domingo might be better there was little real danger that the exiles would stimulate vindictive or predatory dissents on the american coasts and in any case such a possibility was overweighed by the humanity of the measures proposed africa would offer at last an undoubted resort thought jefferson if all others more desirable should fail six months later on july thirteenth eighteen o two the president wrote about the matter to rufus king then minister in london the course of events in the west indies he said had given an impulse to the minds of negroes in the united states there was a disposition to insurgency and it now seemed that if there was to be colonization africa was by all means the best place an african company might also engage in commercial operations and if there was cooperation with sierra leone there was the possibility of one strong rather than two weak colonies would king accordingly enter into conference with the english officials with reference to disposing of any negroes who might be sent it is material to observe remarked jefferson that they are not felons or common malefactors but persons guilty of what the safety of society under actual circumstances obliges us to treat as a crime 
but which their feelings may represent in a far different shape they are such as will be a valuable acquisition to the settlement already existing there and well calculated to cooperate in the plan of civilization king accordingly opened correspondence with thornton and wedderborne the secretaries of the company having charge of sierra leone but was informed that the colony was in a languishing condition and that funds were likely to fail and that in no event would they be willing to receive more people from the united states as these were the very ones who had already made most trouble in the settlement on january twenty two eighteen o five the general assembly of virginia passed a resolution that embodied a request to the united states government to set aside a portion of territory in the new louisiana purchase to be appropriated to the residence of such people of color as have been or shall be emancipated or may hereafter become dangerous to the public safety nothing came of this by the close then of jefferson's second administration the northwest the southwest the west indies and sierra leone had all been thought of as possible fields for colonization but from the consideration nothing visible had resulted now followed the period of southern expansion and of increasing materialism and before long came the war of eighteen twelve by eighteen eleven a note of doubt had crept into jefferson's dealing with the subject said he nothing is more to be wished than that the united states would themselves undertake to make such an establishment on the coast of africa but for this the national mind is not yet prepared it may perhaps be doubted whether many of these people would voluntarily consent to such an exchange of situation and very certain that few of those advanced to a certain age and habits of slavery would be capable of self-government this should not however discourage the experiment nor the early trial of it and the proposition should be made with all the prudent cautions and attentions requisite to reconcile it to the interests the safety and the prejudices of all parties from an entirely different source however and prompted not by expediency but the purest altruism came an impulse that finally told in the founding of liberia the heart of a young man reached out across the sea samuel j mills an undergraduate of williams college in eighteen o eight formed among his fellow-students a missionary society whose work later told in the formation of the american bible society and the board of foreign missions mills continued his theological studies at andover and then at princeton and while at the latter place he established a school for negroes at parsipani thirty miles away he also interested in his work and hopes rev robert finley of basking ridge new jersey who succeeded in assembling at princeton the first meeting ever called to consider the project of sending negro colonists to africa and who in a letter to john p mumford of new york under date february fourteenth eighteen fifteen expressed his interest by saying we should send to africa a population partly civilized and christianized for its benefit and our blacks themselves would be put in a better condition in this same year eighteen fifteen the country was startled by the unselfish enterprise of a negro who had long thought of the unfortunate situation of his people in america and who himself shouldered the obligation to do something definite in their behalf paul cuff had been born in may seventeen fifty nine on one of the elizabeth islands near new bedford massachusetts the son of a father who was once a slave from africa and of an indian mother interested in navigation he made voyages to russia england africa the west indies and the south and in time he commanded his own vessel became generally respected and by his wisdom rose to a fair degree of opulence for twenty years he had thought especially about africa and in eighteen fifteen he took to sierra leone a total of nine families and thirty-eight persons at an expense to himself at nearly four thousand dollars the people that he brought were well received at sierra leone and cuff himself had greater and more far-reaching plans when he died september seventh eighteen seventeen he left an estate valued at twenty thousand dollars dr finley's meeting at princeton was not very well attended and hence not a great success nevertheless he felt sufficiently encouraged to go to washington in december eighteen sixteen to use his effort for the formation of a national colonization society it happened that in february of this same year eighteen sixteen general charles fenton mercer member of the house of delegates came upon the secret journals of the legislature for the period eighteen o one to five and saw the correspondence between monroe and jefferson 
interested in the colonization project on december fourteenth monroe then being president-elect he presented in the house of delegates resolutions embodying the previous enactments and these passed one hundred and thirty two to fourteen finley was generally helped by the effort of mercer and on december twenty one eighteen sixteen there was held in washington a meeting of public men and interested citizens henry clay then speaker of the house of representatives presiding a constitution was adopted at an adjourned meeting on december twenty eighth and on january one eighteen seventeen were formally chosen the officers of the american society for colonizing the free people of color of the united states at this last meeting henry clay again presiding spoke in glowing terms of the possibilities of the movement elias b caldwell a brother-in-law of finley made the leading argument and john randolph of roanoke virginia and robert wright of maryland spoke of the advantages to accrue from the removal of the free negroes from the country which remarks were very soon to awaken much discussion and criticism especially on the part of the negroes themselves it is interesting to note that mercer had no part at all in the meeting of january one not even being present he did not feel that any but southern men should be enrolled in the organization however bushrod washington the president was a southern man twelve of the seventeen vice-presidents were southern men among them being andrew jackson and william crawford and all of the twelve managers were slaveholders membership in the american colonization society originally consisted first of such as sincerely desired to afford the free negroes an asylum from oppression and who hoped through them to extend to africa the blessings of civilization and christianity second of such as sought to enhance the value of their own slaves by removing the free negroes and third of such as desired to be relieved of any responsibility whatsoever for free negroes the movement was widely advertised as an effort for the benefit of the blacks in which all parts of the country could unite it being understood that it was not to have the abolition of slavery for its immediate object nor was it to aim directly at the instruction of the great body of the blacks such points as the last were to prove in course of time hardly less than a direct challenge to the different abolitionist organizations in the north and more and more the society was denounced as a movement on the part of slaveholders for perpetuating their institutions by doing away with the free people of color it is not to be supposed however that the south with its usual religious fervor did not put much genuine feeling into the colonization scheme one man in georgia named tubman freed his slaves thirty in all and placed them in charge of the society with a gift of ten thousand dollars thomas hunt a young virginian afterwards a chaplain in the union army sent to liberia the slaves he had inherited paying the entire cost of the journey and others acted in a similar spirit of benevolence it was but natural however for the public to be somewhat uncertain as to the tendencies of the organization when the utterances of representative men were sometimes directly contradictory on january twenty eighteen twenty seven for instance henry clay then secretary of state speaking in the hall of the house of representatives at the annual meeting of the society said of all classes of our population the most vicious is that of the free colored it is the inevitable result of their moral political and civil degradation contaminated themselves they extend their vices to all around them to the slaves and to the whites just a moment later he said every emigrant to africa is a missionary carrying with him credentials in the holy cause of civilization religion and free institutions how persons contaminated and vicious could be missionaries of civilization and religion was something possible only in the logic of henry clay in the course of the next month robert y hayne gave a southern criticism in two addresses on a memorial presented in the united states in it by the colonization society the first of these speeches was a clever one characterized by much wit and good-humored raillery the second was a sober arraignment hayne emphasized the tremendous cost involved in the physical impossibility of the whole undertaking estimating that at least sixty thousand persons a year would have to be transported to accomplish anything like the desired result at the close of his brilliant attack still making a veiled plea for the continuance of slavery he nevertheless rose to genuine statesmanship in dealing with the problem of the negro saying while this process is going on the colored classes are gradually diffusing themselves throughout the country 
and are making steady advances in intelligence and refinement and if half the zeal were displayed in bettering their condition that is now wasted in the vain and fruitless effort of sending them abroad their intellectual and moral improvement would be steady and rapid william lord garrison was untiring and merciless in flaying the inconsistencies and selfishness of the colonization organization in an editorial in the liberator july ninth eighteen thirty one he charged the society first with persecution in compelling free people to emigrate against their will and in discouraging their education at home second with falsehood in saying that the negroes were natives of africa when they were no more so than white americans were natives of great britain third with cowardice in asserting that the continuance of the negro population in the country involved dangers and finally with infidelity in denying that the gospel has full power to reach the hatred in the hearts of men in thoughts on african colonization eighteen thirty two he developed exhaustively ten points as follows that the american colonization society was pledged not to oppose the system of slavery that it apologized for slavery and slaveholders that it recognized slaves as property that by deporting negroes it increased the value of slaves that it was the enemy of immediate abolition that it was nourished by fear and selfishness that it aimed at the utter expulsion of the blacks that it was the disparager of free negroes that it denied the possibility of elevating the black people of the country and that it deceived and misled the nation other criticisms were numerous a broadside the shields of american slavery broad enough to hide the wrongs of two millions of stolen men placed side by side conflicting utterances of members of the society and in august eighteen thirty kendall fourth auditor in his report to the secretary of the navy wondered why the resources of the government should be used to colonize recaptured africans to build homes for them to furnish them with farming utensils to pay instructors to teach them to purchase ships for their convenience to build forts for their protection to supply them with arms and munitions of war to enlist troops to guard them and to employ the army and navy in their defense criticism of the american colonization society was prompted by a variety of motives but the organization made itself vulnerable at many points the movement attracted extraordinary attention but has had practically no effect whatever on the position of the negro in the united states its work in connection with the founding of liberia however is of the highest importance and must later receive detailed attention three slavery we have seen that from the beginning there were liberal-minded men in the south who opposed the system of slavery and if we actually take note of all the utterances of different men and of the proposals for doing away with the system we shall find that about the turn of the century there was in this section considerable anti-slavery sentiment between eighteen hundred and eighteen twenty however the opening of new lands in the southwest the increasing emphasis on cotton and the rapidly growing negro population gave force to the argument of expediency and the missouri compromise drew sharply the lines of the contest the south now came to regard slavery as its peculiar heritage public men were forced to defend the institution and in general the best thought of the section began to be obsessed and dominated by the negro just as it is to-day in large measure in taking this position the south deliberately committed intellectual suicide in such matters as freedom of speech and literary achievement and in genuine statesmanship if not for the time being in political influence this part of the country declined and before long the difference between it and new england was appalling calhoun and hayne were strong but between eighteen twenty and eighteen sixty the south had no names to compare with longfellow and emerson in literature or with morris and hoe in invention the foremost college professor du of william and mary and even the outstanding divines Furman, the baptists of south carolina in the twenties and palmer the presbyterian of new orleans in the fifties are all now remembered mainly because they defended their section in keeping the negro in bonds william and mary college and even the university of virginia as compared with harvard and yale became provincial institutions and instead of the washington or jefferson of an earlier day now began to be nourished such a leader as bob toombs who for all of his fire and eloquence was a demagogue in making its choice the south could not and did not blame the negro per se for it was freely recognized that upon slave labor rested such economic stability as the section possessed the tragedy was simply that thousands of intelligent americans deliberately turned their faces to the past and preferred to read the novels of walter scott 
and live in the middle ages rather than study the french revolution and live in the nineteenth century one hundred years after we find that the chains are still forged that thought is not yet free thus the negro problem began to be and still is very largely the problem of the white men of the south the era of capitalism has not yet dawned and still far in the future was the day when the poor white man and the negro were slowly to realize that their interests were largely identical the argument with which the south came to support its position and to defend slavery need not here detain us at length it was formally stated by dew and others and it was to be heard on every hand one could hardly go to church to say nothing of going to a public meeting without hearing echoes of it in general it was maintained that slavery had made for the civilization of the world in that it had mitigated the evils of war had made labor profitable it had changed the nature of savages and elevated woman the slave trade was of course horrible and unjust but the great advantages of the system more than outweighed a few attendant evils emancipation and deportation were alike impossible even if practicable they would not be expedient measures for they meant the loss to virginia of one-third of her property as for morality it was not to be expected that the negro should have the sensibilities of the white man moreover the system had the advantage of cultivating a republican spirit among the white people in short said do the slaves in both the economic and the moral point of view were entirely unfit for a state of freedom among the whites holland already cited in eighteen twenty two maintained five points as follows one that the united states are one for national purposes but separate for their internal regulation and government two that the people of the north and east always exhibited an unfriendly feeling on subjects affecting the interests of the south and west three that the institution of slavery was not an institution of the south's voluntary choosing four that the southern sections of the union both before and after the declaration of independence had uniformly exhibited a disposition to restrict the extension of the evil and had always manifested as cordial a disposition to ameliorate it as those of the north and east and five that the actual state and condition of the slave population reflected no disgrace whatever on the character of the country as the slaves were infinitely better provided for than the laboring poor of other countries of the world and were generally happier than millions of white people in the world such arguments the clergy supported and endeavored to reconcile with christian precept rev dr richard Furman, president of the baptist convention of south carolina after much inquiry and reasoning arrived at the conclusion that the holding of slaves is justifiable by the doctrine and example contained in holy writ and is therefore consistent with christian uprightness both in sentiment and conduct steady further the christian golden rule of doing to others as we would they should do to us has been urged as an unanswerable argument against holding slaves but surely this rule is never to be urged against that order of things which the divine government has established nor do our desires become a standard to us under this rule unless they have a due regard to justice propriety and the general good a father may very naturally desire that his son should be obedient to his orders is he therefore to obey the orders of his son a man might be pleased to be exonerated from his debts by the generosity of his creditors or that his rich neighbor should equally divide his property with him and in certain circumstances might desire these to be done would the mere existence of this desire oblige him to exonerate his debtors and to make such division of his property calhoun in eighteen thirty seven formally accepted slavery saying that the south should no longer apologize for it and the whole argument from the standpoint of expediency received eloquent expression in the senate of the united states from no less a man than henry clay who more and more appears in the perspective as a pro-southern advocate said he i am no friend of slavery but i prefer the liberty of my own country to that of any other people and the liberty of my own race to that of any other race the liberty of the descendants of africa and the united states is incompatible with the safety and liberty of the european descendants their slavery forms an exception an exception resulting from a stern and an inexorable necessity to the general liberty in the united states after the lapse of years the pro-slavery argument is pitiful in its numerous fallacies it was in line with much of the discussion of the day that question whether the negro was actually a human being and but serves to show to what extremes economic interest will sometimes drive men otherwise of high intelligence and honor End of section ten. Section eleven of a social history of the American Negro by Benjamin Griffith Brawley. 
this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven the negro reply one revolt we have already seen that on several occasions in colonial times the negroes in bondage made a bid for freedom many men risking their all and losing their lives in consequence in general these early attempts failed completely to realize their aim organization being feeble and the leadership untrained and exerting only an emotional hold over adherents in charleston south carolina in eighteen twenty two however there was planned an insurrection about whose scope there could be no question the leader denmark vesey is interesting as an intellectual insurrectionist just as the more famous nat turner is typical of the more fervent sort it is the purpose of the present chapter to study the attempts for freedom made by these two men and also those of two daring groups of captives who revolted at sea one denmark vesey's insurrection denmark vesey is first seen as one of the three hundred and ninety slaves on the ship to captain vesey who commanded a vessel trading between st thomas and cape francois santo domingo and who was engaged in supplying the french of the latter place with slaves at the time the boy was fourteen years old and of unusual personal beauty alertness and magnetism he was shown considerable favoritism and was called telemaque afterwards corrected to telmaque and then to denmark on his arrival at cape francois denmark was sold with others of the slaves to a planter who owned a considerable estate on his next trip however captain vesey learned that the boy was to be returned to him as unsound and subject to epileptic fits the laws of the place permitted the return of a slave in such a case and while it has been thought that denmark's fits may have been feigned in order that he might have some change of estate there was quite enough proof in the matter to impress the king's physician captain vesey never had reason to regret having to take the boy back they made several voyages together and denmark served until eighteen hundred as his faithful personal attendant in this year the young man now thirty-three years of age and living in charleston won fifteen hundred dollars in an east bay street lottery six hundred dollars of which he devoted immediately to the purchase of his freedom the sum was much less than he was really worth but captain vesey liked him and had no reason to drive a hard bargain with him in the early years of his full manhood accordingly denmark vesey found himself a free man in his own right and possessed of the means for a little real start in life he improved his time and proceeded to win greater standing and recognition by regular and industrious work at his trade that of a carpenter over the slaves he came to have unbounded influence among them in accordance with the standards of the day he had several wives and children none of whom could he call his own and he understood perfectly the fervor and faith and superstition of the negroes with whom he had to deal to his remarkable personal magnetism moreover he added just the strong passion and the domineering temper that were needed to make his conquest complete thus for twenty years he worked on he already knew french as well as english but he now studied and reflected upon as wide a range of subjects as possible it was not expected at the time that there would be religious classes or congregations of negroes apart from the white people but the law was not strictly observed and for a number of years a negro congregation had a church in Hampstead in the suburbs of charleston at the meetings here and elsewhere vesey found his opportunity and he drew interesting parallels between the experiences of the jews and the negroes he would rebuke a companion on the street for bowing to a white person and if such a man replied we are slaves he would say you deserve to be if the man then asked what he could do to better his condition he would say go and buy a spelling-book and read the fable of hercules and the wagoner at the same time if he happened to engage in conversation with white people in the presence of negroes he would often take occasion to introduce some striking remark on slavery he regularly held up to emulation the work of the negroes of santo domingo and either he or one of his chief lieutenants clandestinely sent a letter to the president of santo domingo to ask if the people there 
would help the negroes of charleston if the latter made an effort to free themselves about eighteen twenty moreover when he heard of the african colonization scheme and the opportunity came to him to go he put this by waiting for something better this was the period of the missouri compromise reports of the agitation and the debates in congress were eagerly scanned by those negroes in charleston who could read rumor exaggerated them and some of the more credulous of the slaves came to believe that the efforts of northern friends had actually emancipated them and that they were being illegally held in bondage nor was the situation improved when the city marshal john j lafar on january fifteen eighteen twenty one reminded those ministers or other persons who kept night and sunday schools for negroes that the law forbade the education of such persons and would have to be enforced meanwhile vesey was very patient after a few months however he ceased to work at his trade in order that all the more he might devote himself to the mission of his life this was as he conceived it an insurrection that would do nothing less than totally annihilate the white population of charleston in the prosecution of such a plan the greatest secrecy and faithfulness were of course necessary and vesey waited until about christmas eighteen twenty one to begin active recruiting he first sounded ned and rolla bennett slaves of governor thomas bennett and then peter poyas and jack purcell after christmas he spoke to Gullo, jack and monday gell and lot forrester and frank ferguson became his chief agents for the plantation outside of charleston in the whole matter of the choice of his chief assistants he showed remarkable judgment of character his penetration was almost uncanny rolla was plausible and possessed uncommon self-possession bold and ardent he was not to be deterred from his purpose by danger ned's appearance indicated that he was a man of firm nerves and desperate courage peter was intrepid and resolute true to his engagements and cautious in observing secrecy when it was necessary he was not to be daunted or impeded by difficulties and though confident of success was careful in providing against any obstacles or casualties which might arise and intent upon discovering every means which might be in their power if thought of beforehand gulla jack was regarded as a sorcerer and as such feared by the natives of africa who believe in witchcraft he was not only considered invulnerable but that he could make others so by his charms and that he could and certainly would provide all his followers with arms his influence amongst the africans was inconceivable monday was firm resolute discreet and intelligent he was also daring and active a harness-maker in the prime of life and he could read and write with facility but he was also the only man of prominence in the conspiracy whose courage failed him at court and who turned traitor to these names must be added that of bato bennett who was only eighteen years old and who brought to the plan all the ardor and devotion of youth in general vesey sought to bring into the plan those negroes such as stevedores and mechanics who worked away from home and who had some free time he would not use men who were known to become intoxicated and one talkative man named george he excluded from his meetings nor did he use women not because he did not trust them but because in case of mishap he wanted the children to be properly cared for take care said peter poyas in speaking about the plan to one of the recruits and don't mention it to those waiting men who receive presents of old coats etc from their masters or their betrayers i will speak to them with his lieutenant's vesey finally brought into the plan the negroes for seventy or eighty miles around charleston the second monday in july eighteen twenty two or sunday july fourteen was the time originally set for the attack july was chosen because in midsummer many of the white people were away at different resorts and sunday received favorable consideration because on that day the slaves from the outlying plantations were frequently permitted to come to the city lists of the recruits were kept peter poyas is said to have gathered as many as six hundred names chiefly from that part of charleston known as south bay in which he lived and it is a mark of his care and discretion that of all those afterwards arrested and tried not one belonged to his company monday gill who joined late and was very prudent had forty-two names all such lists however were in course of time destroyed during the period that these enlistments were carrying on vesey held frequent meetings of the conspirators at his house and as arms were necessary to their success each night a hat was handed round and collections made for the purpose of purchasing them and also to defray other necessary expenses a negro who was a blacksmith and had been accustomed to make edge tools was employed to make pike heads and bayonets with sockets to be fixed at the ends of long poles and used as pikes 
of these pikeheads and bayonets one hundred were said to have been made at an early day and by the sixteenth june as many as two or three hundred and between three and four hundred daggers a bundle containing some of the poles neatly trimmed and smoothed off and nine or ten feet long was afterwards found concealed on a farm on charleston neck where several of the meetings were held having been carried there to have the pikeheads and bayonets fixed in place governor bennett stated that the number of poles thus found was thirteen but so wary were the negroes that he and other prominent men underestimated the means of attack it was thought that the negroes in charleston might use their masters arms while those from the country were to bring hoes hatchets and axes for their main supply of arms however vesey and peter poyas depended upon the magazines and storehouses in the city they planned to seize the arsenal in meeting street opposite st michael's church it was the key to the city held the arms of the state and had for some time been neglected poyas had a given signal at midnight was to move upon his point killing the sentinel two large gun and powder stores were by arrangement to be at the disposal of the insurrectionists and other leaders coming from six different directions were to seize strategic points and thus aid the central work of poyas meanwhile a body of horse was to keep the streets clear eat only dry food said gullah jack as the day approached parch corn and ground nuts and when you join us as we pass put this crab claw in your mouth and you can't be wounded on may twenty five a slave of colonel prelow while on an errand at the wharf was accosted by another slave william paul who remarked i have often seen a flag with the number seventy six but never one with the number ninety six upon it before as this man showed no knowledge of what was going on paul spoke to him further and quite frankly about the plot the slave afterwards spoke to a free man about what he had heard this man advised him to tell his master about it and so he did on prelow's return on may thirty prelow immediately informed the intendant or mayor and by five o'clock in the afternoon both the slave and paul were being examined paul was placed in confinement but not before his testimony had implicated peter poyas and mingo hart a man who had been appointed to lead one of the companies of horse hearth and poise were cool and collected however they ridiculed the whole idea and the wardens completely deceived discharged them in general at this time the authorities were careful and endeavoured not to act hastily about june eight however paul greatly excited and fearing execution confessed that the plan was very extensive and said that it was led by an individual who bore a charmed life ned bennett hearing that his name had been mentioned voluntarily went before the intendant and asked to be examined thus again completely baffling the officials all the while in the face of the greatest danger vesey continued to hold his meetings by friday june fourteenth however another informant had spoken to his master and all too fully were peter poyas's fears about waiting men justified this man said that the original plan had been changed for the night of sunday june sixteenth was now the time set for the insurrection and otherwise he was able to give all essential information on saturday night june fifteen jesse blackwood an aide sent into the country to prepare the slaves to enter the following day while he penetrated two lines of guards was at the third line halted and sent back into the city bessie now realized in a moment that all his plans were disclosed and immediately he destroyed any papers that might prove to be incriminating on sunday june sixteen at ten o'clock at night captain cattle's corps of hustlers captain miller's light infantry captain martindale's neck rangers the charleston riflemen and the city guard were ordered to rendezvous for guard the whole organized as a detachment under command of colonel r y hayne it was his work on this occasion that gave hayne that appeal to the public which was later to help him to pass on to the governorship and then to the united states senate on the fateful night twenty or thirty men from the outlying districts who had not been able to get word of the progress of events came to the city in a small boat but thus they sent word to them to go back as quickly as possible two courts were formed for the trial of the conspirators the first after a long session of five weeks was dissolved july twenty a second was convened but after three days closed its investigation and adjourned august eighth all the while the public mind was greatly excited the first court which speedily condemned thirty-four men to death was severely criticized the new york daily advertiser termed the execution a bloody sacrifice but charleston replied with a reminder of the negroes who had been burned in new york in seventeen forty one some of the negroes blamed the leaders for the trouble into which they had been brought but vesey himself made no confession he was by no means alone do not open your lips said poyas die silent as you shall see me do something of the solicitude of owners for their slaves may be seen from the request of governor bennett himself in behalf of bateau bennett he asked for a special review of the case of this young man who was among those condemned to death with a view to the mitigation of his punishment 
the court did review the case but it did not change its sentence throughout the proceedings the white people of charleston were impressed by the character of those who had taken part in the insurrection many of them possessed the highest confidence of their owners and not one was of bad character as a result of this effort for freedom one hundred and thirty-one negroes were arrested thirty-five were executed and forty-three banished of those executed denmark vesey peter poyas ned bennett rolla bennett bato bennett and jesse blackwood were hanged july two gullah jack and one more on july twelve twenty-two were hanged on a huge gallows friday july twenty six four more were hanged july thirty and one on august nine of those banished twelve had been sentenced for execution but were afterwards given banishment instead twenty-one were to be transported by their masters beyond the limits of the united states one a free man required to leave the state satisfied the court by offering to leave the united states while nine others who were not definitely sentenced were strongly recommended to their owners for banishment the others of the one hundred and thirty-one were acquitted the authorities at length felt that they had executed enough to teach the negroes a lesson and the hanging ceased but within the next year or two governor bennett and others gave to the world most gloomy reflections upon the whole proceeding and upon the grave problem at their door thus closed the insurrection that for the ambitiousness of its plan the care with which it was matured and the faithfulness of the leaders to one another was never equal by a similar attempt for freedom in the united states to nat turner's insurrection about noon on sunday august twenty one eighteen thirty one on the plantation of joseph travers joseph travers at cross keys in southampton county in southeastern virginia were gathered four negroes henry porter hark travis nelson williams and sam francis evidently preparing for a barbecue they were soon joined by a gigantic and athletic negro named will francis and by another named jack reese two hours later came a short strong-looking man who had a face of great resolution and at whom one would not have needed to glance a second time to know that he was to be the master spirit of the company seeing will and his companion he raised a question as to their being present to which will replied that life was worth no more to him than the others and that liberty was as dear to him this answer satisfied the latest comer and nat turner now went into conference with his most trusted friends one can only imagine the purpose the eagerness and the firmness on those dark faces throughout that long summer afternoon and evening when at last in the night the low whispering ceased the doom of nearly threescore white persons and it might be added of twice as many negroes was sealed cross keys was seventy miles from norfolk just about as far from richmond twenty-five miles from the dismal swamp fifty miles from murfreesboro in north carolina and also fifteen miles from jerusalem the county seat of southampton county the community was settled primarily by white people of modest means joseph travis the owner of nat turner had recently married the widow of one putnam moore nat turner who originally belonged to one benjamin turner was born october two eighteen hundred he was mentally precocious and had marks on his head and breast which were interpreted by the negroes who knew him as marking him for some high calling in his mature years he also had on his right arm a knot which was the result of a blow which he had received he experimented in paper gunpowder and powder and as is recorded of him that he was never known to swear an oath to drink a drop of spirits or to commit a theft instead he cultivated fasting and prayer and the reading of the bible more and more nat gave himself up to a life of the spirit and to communion with the voices that he said he heard he once ran away for a month but felt commanded by the spirit to return about eighteen twenty five a consciousness of his great mission came to him and daily he laboured to make himself more worthy as he worked in the field he saw drops of blood on the corn and he also saw white spirits and black spirits contending in the skies while he thus so largely lived in a religious or mystical world and was immersed he was not a professional baptist preacher on may twelfth eighteen twenty eight he was left no longer in doubt a great voice said unto him that the serpent was loosed that christ had laid down the yoke that he nat was to take it up again and that the time was fast approaching when the first should be last and the last should be first an eclipse of the sun in february eighteen thirty one was interpreted as the sign for him to go forward yet he waited a little longer until he had made sure of his most important associates it is worthy of note that when he began his work while he wanted the killing to be as effective and widespread as possible he commanded that no outrage be committed and he was obeyed when on the sunday in august nat and his companions finished their conference they went to find austin a brother spirit and then all went to the cider press and drank except nat it was understood that he as the leader was to spill the first blood and that he was to begin with his own master joseph travis going to the house hark placed a ladder against the chimney on this nat ascended 
then he went downstairs unbarred the doors and removed the guns from their places he and will together entered travis's chamber and the first blow was given to the master of the house the hatchet glanced off and travis called to his wife but this was with his last breath for will at once dispatched him with his axe the wife and the three children of the house were also killed immediately then followed a drill of the company after which all went to the home of salafiel francis six hundred yards away sam and will knocked and francis asked who was there sam replied that he had a letter for him the man came to the door where he was seized and killed by repeated blows over the head he was the only white person in the house in silence all passed on to the home of mrs reese who was killed while asleep in bed her son awoke but was also immediately killed a mile away the insurrectionists came to the home of mrs turner which they reached about sunrise on monday morning henry austin and sam went to the still where they found and killed the overseer peebles austin shooting him then all went to the house the family saw them coming and shut the door to no avail however as will with one stroke of his axe opened it and entered to find mrs turner and mrs newsom in the middle of the room almost frightened to death will killed mrs turner with one blow of his axe and after nat had struck mrs newsom over the head with his sword will turned and killed her also by this time the company amounted to fifteen nine were mounted to the home of mrs whitehead and six others went along a byway to the home of henry bryant as they neared the first house richard whitehead the son of the family was standing in the cotton patch near the fence will killed him with his axe immediately in the house he killed mrs whitehead almost severing her head from her body with one blow margaret a daughter tried to conceal herself and ran but was killed by turner with a fence rail the men in this first company were now joined by those in the second the six who had gone to the bryant home who informed them that they had done the work assigned which was to kill henry bryant himself his wife and child and his wife's mother by this time the killing had become fast and furious the company divided again some would go ahead and nat would come up to find work already accomplished generally fifteen or twenty of the best mounted were put in front to strike terror and prevent escape and nat himself frequently did not get to the houses where killing was done more and more of the negroes now about forty in number were getting drunken and noisy the alarm was given and by nine or ten o'clock on monday morning one captain harris and his family had escaped prominent among the events of the morning however was the killing at the home of mrs waller ten children who were gathering for school as the men neared the home of james parker it was suggested that they call there but turner objected as this man had already gone to jerusalem and he himself wished to reach the county seat as soon as possible however he and some of the men remained at the gate while others went to the house half a mile away this exploit proved to be the turning point of the events of the day uneasy at the delay of those who went to the house turner went thither also on his return he was met by a company of white men who had fired on those negroes left at the gate and dispersed them on discovering these men turner ordered his own men to halt and form as now they were beginning to be alarmed the white men eighteen in number approached and fired but were forced to retreat reinforcements for them from jerusalem were already at hand however and now the great pursuit of the negro insurrectionists began hark's horse was shot under him and five or six of the men were wounded turner's force was largely dispersed but on monday night he stopped at the home of major ridley and his company again increased to forty he tried to sleep a little but a sentinel gave the alarm all were soon up in the number was again reduced to twenty final resistance was offered at the home of dr blunt but here still more of the men were put to flight and were never again seen by turner a little later however the leader found two of his men named jacob and nat these he sent with word to henry hark nelson and sam to meet him at the place where on sunday they had taken dinner together with what thoughts nat turner returned alone to this place on tuesday evening can only be imagined throughout the night he remained but no one joined him and he presumed that his followers had all either been taken or had deserted him nor did any one come on wednesday or on thursday on thursday night having supplied himself with provisions from the travis home he scratched a hole under a pile of fence rails and here he remained for six weeks leaving only at night to get water all the while of course he had no means of learning of the fate of his companions or of anything else meanwhile not only the vicinity but the whole south was being wrought up to an hysterical state of mind a reward of five hundred dollars for the capture of the man was offered by the governor and other rewards were also offered on september thirty a false account of his capture appeared in the newspapers on october seven another on october eight still another by this time turner had begun to move about 
a little at night not speaking to any human being and returning always to his hole before daybreak early on october fifteenth a dog smelt his provisions and led thither two negroes nat appealed to these men for protection but they at once began to run and excitedly spread the news turner fled in another direction and for ten days more hid among the wheat stacks on the francis plantation all the while not less than five hundred men were on the watch for him and they found the stick that he had notched from day to day once he thought of surrendering and walked within two miles of jerusalem three times he tried to get away and failed on october twenty five he was discovered by francis who discharged at him a load of buckshot twelve of which passed through his hat and he was at large for five days more on october thirty benjamin phipps a member of the patrol passing a clearing in the woods noticed a motion among the boughs he paused and gradually he saw nat's head emerging from a hole beneath the fugitive now gave up as he knew that the woods were full of men he was taken to the nearest house and the crowd was so great and the excitement so intense that it was with difficulty that he was taken to jerusalem for more than two months from august twenty five to october thirty he had eluded his pursuers remaining all the while in the vicinity of his insurrection while nat turner was in prison thomas c gray his counsel received from him what are known as the confessions this pamphlet is now almost inaccessible but it was in great demand at the time it was printed and it is now the chief source for information about the progress of the insurrection turner was tried on november five and sentenced to be hanged six days later asked in court by gray if he still believed in the providential nature of his mission he asked was not christ crucified of his execution itself we read nat turner was executed according to sentence on friday the eleventh of november eighteen thirty one at jerusalem between the hours of ten a m and two p m he exhibited the utmost composure throughout the whole ceremony and although assured that he might if he thought proper address the immense crowd assembled on the occasion declined availing himself of the privilege and being asked if he had any further confessions to make replied that he had nothing more than he had communicated and told the sheriff in a firm voice that he was ready not a limb or muscle was observed to move his body after death was given over to the surgeons for dissection of fifty-three negroes arraigned in connection with the insurrection seventeen were executed and twelve transported the rest were discharged except four free negroes sent on to the superior court three of the four were executed such figures as these however give no conception of the number of those who lost lives in connection with the insurrection in general if slaves were convicted by legal process and executed or transported or if they escaped before trial they were paid for by the commonwealth if killed they were not paid for and a man like phipps might naturally desire to protect his prisoner in order to get his reward in spite of this the negroes were slaughtered without trial and sometimes under circumstances of the greatest barbarity one man proudly boasted that he had killed between ten and fifteen a party went from richmond with the intention of killing every negro in southampton county approaching the cabin of a free negro they asked is this southampton county yes sir came the reply you have just crossed the line by yonder tree they shot him dead and rode on in general the period was one of terror with voluntary patrols frequently drunk going in all directions these men tortured burned or maimed the negroes practically at will said one old woman of them the patrols were low drunken whites and in nat's time if they heard any of the colored folks praying or singing a hymn they would fall upon em and abuse em and sometimes kill em the brightest and best was killed in nat's time the whites always suspect such ones they killed a great many had a place called duplan they killed antonio a slave of mr j stanley whom they shot then they pointed their guns at him and told him to confess about the insurrection he told him he didn't know anything about any insurrection they shot several balls through him quartered him and put his head on a pole at the fork of the road leading to the court it was there but a short time he had no trial they never do in nat's time the patrols would tie up the free colored people flog them and try to make them lie against one another and often kill them before anybody could interfere mr james cole high sheriff said if any of the patrols came on his plantation he would lose his life in defense of his people one day he heard a patroller boasting how many negroes he had killed mr cole said if you don't pack up as quick as god almighty we'll let you and get out of this town and never be seen in it again i'll put you where dogs won't bark at you he went off and wasn't seen in them parts again the immediate panic created by the nat turner insurrection in virginia and the other states of the south it would be impossible to exaggerate when the news of what was happening at cross keys spread two companies on horse and foot came from murfreesboro as quickly as possible on the wednesday after the memorable sunday night there came from fortress monroe three companies and a piece of artillery these commands were reinforced from various sources until not less than eight hundred men were in arms many of the negroes fled to the dismal swamp and the wildest rumors were afloat 
one was that wilmington had been burned and at raleigh and fayetteville the wildest excitement prevailed in the latter place scores of white women and children fled to the swamps coming out two days afterwards muddy chilled and half starved slaves were imprisoned wholesale in wilmington four men were shot without trial and their heads placed on poles at the four corners of the town in macon georgia a report was circulated that an armed band of negroes was only five miles away and within an hour the women and children were assembled and in the largest building in the town with a military force in front for protection the effects on legislation were immediate throughout the south the slave codes became more harsh and while it was clear that the uprising had been one of slaves rather than of free negroes as usual special disabilities fell upon the free people of color delaware that only recently had limited the franchise to white men now forbade the use of firearms by free negroes and would not suffer any more to come within the state tennessee also forbade such immigration while maryland passed a law to the effect that all free negroes must leave the state and be colonized in africa a monstrous piece of legislation that it was impossible to put into effect and that showed once for all the futility of attempts at forcible emigration as a solution of the problem in general however the insurrection assisted the colonization scheme and also made more certain the carrying out of the policy of the jackson administration to remove the indians of the south to the west it also focused the attention of the nation upon the status of the negro crystallized opinion in the north and thus helped with the formation of anti-slavery organizations by it for the time being the negro lost in the long run he gained three the amistad and creole cases on june twenty eighth eighteen thirty nine a schooner the amistad sailed from havana bound for Kwana ya in the vicinity of preto Prankip. she was under the command of her owner don raymond ferrer was laden with merchandise and had on board fifty-three negroes forty-nine of whom supposedly belonged to a spaniard don jose ruiz the other four belonging to don pedro montes during the night of june thirty the slaves under the head of one of their number named sank rose upon the crew killed the captain a slave of his and two sailors and while they permitted most of the crew to escape they took into close custody the two owners ruiz and montes montes who had some knowledge of nautical affairs was ordered to steer the vessel back to africa so he did by day when the negroes were watching but at night he tried to make his way to some land nearer at hand other vessels passed from time to time and from these the negroes bought provisions but montes and ruiz were so closely watched that they could not make known their plight at length on august twenty sixth the schooner reached long island sound where it was detained by the american brig of war washington in command of captain gedney who secured the negroes and took them to new london connecticut it took a year and a half to dispose of the issue thus raised the case attracted the greatest amount of attention led to international complications and was not really disposed of until a former president had exhaustively argued the case for the negroes before the supreme court of the united states in a letter of september sixth eighteen thirty nine to john forsyth the american secretary of state calderon the spanish minister formally made four demands one that the amistad be immediately delivered up to her owner together with every article on board at the time of her capture two that it be declared that no tribunal in the united states had the right to institute proceedings against or to impose penalties upon the subjects of spain for crimes committed on board a spanish vessel and in the waters of spanish territory three that the negroes be conveyed to havana for or otherwise placed at the disposal of the representatives of spain and for that if in consequence of the intervention of the authorities in connecticut there should be any delay in the desired delivery of the vessel and the slaves the owners both of the latter and of the former be indemnified for the injury that might accrue to them in support of his demands called rome invoked the law of nations the stipulation of existing treaties and those good feelings so necessary in the maintenance of the friendly relations that subsist between the two countries and are so interesting to both forsyth asked for any papers bearing on the question and called rome replied that he had none except the declaration on oath of montes and ruiz meanwhile the abolitionists were insisting that the protection had not been afforded the african strangers cast on american soil and that in no case did the executive arm of the government have any authority to interfere with the regular administration of justice these africans it was said are detained in jail under process of the united states courts in a free state after it has been decided by the district judge on sufficient proof that they are recently from africa were never the lawful slaves of ruiz and montez and when it is clear as noonday that there is no law or treaty stipulation that requires the further detention of these africans or their delivery to spain or its subjects 
writing on october twenty fourth to the spanish representative with reference to the arrest of ruiz and montes forsyth informed him that the two spanish subjects had been arrested on process of issuing from the superior court of the city of new york upon affidavits of certain men natives of africa for the purpose of securing their appearance before the proper tribunal to answer for wrongs alleged to have been inflicted by them upon the persons of said africans that consequently the occurrence constituted simply a case of resort by individuals against others to the judicial courts of the country which are equally open to all without distinction and that the agency of the government to obtain the release of messieurs ruiz and montez could not be afforded in the manner requested further pressure was brought to bear by the spanish representative however and there was cited the case of abraham wendell captain of the brig franklin who was prosecuted at first by spanish officials for maltreatment of his mate but with reference to whom documents were afterwards sent from havana to america much more correspondence followed than felix grundy of tennessee attorney-general of the united states at length muddled everything by the following opinion these negroes deny that they are slaves if they should be delivered to the claimants no opportunity may be afforded for the assertion of their right to freedom for these reasons it seems to me that a delivery to the spanish minister is the only safe course for this government to pursue the fallacy of all this was shown in a letter dated november eighteenth eighteen thirty nine from b f butler united states district attorney in new york to aaron vale acting secretary of state said butler it does not appear to me that any question has yet arisen under the treaty with spain because although it is an admitted principle that neither the courts of this state nor those of the united states can take jurisdiction of criminal offences committed by foreigners within the territory of a foreign state yet it is equally settled in this country that our courts will take cognizant of civil actions between foreigners transiently within our jurisdiction founded upon contracts or other transactions made or had in a foreign state southern influence was strong however and a few weeks afterwards an order was given from the department of state to have a vessel anchor off new haven connecticut january tenth eighteen forty to receive the negroes from the united states marshal and take them to cuba and on january seventh the president van buren issued the necessary warrant the rights of humanity however were not to be handled in this summary fashion the executive order was stayed and the case went further on its progress to the highest tribunal in the land meanwhile the anti-slavery people were teaching the africans the rudiments of english in order that they might be better able to tell their own story from the first a committee had been appointed to look out for their interests and while they were awaiting the final decision in their case they cultivated a garden of fifteen acres the appearance of john quincy adams in behalf of these negroes before the supreme court of the united states february twenty fourth and march one eighteen forty one is in every way one of the most beautiful acts in american history in the fullness of years with his own administration as president twelve years behind him the old man eloquent came once more to the tribunal that he knew so well to make a last plea for the needy and oppressed to the task he brought all his talents his profound knowledge of law his unrivalled experience and his impressive personality and his argument covers one hundred and thirty five octavo pages he gave an extended analysis of the demand of the spanish minister who asked the president to do what he simply had no constitutional right to do the president said adams has no power to arrest either citizens or foreigners but even that power is almost insignificant compared with that of sending men beyond seas to deliver them up to a foreign government the secretary of state had degraded the country in the face of the whole civilized world not only by allowing these demands to remain unanswered but by proceeding throughout the whole transaction as if the executive were earnestly desirous to comply with every one of the demands the spanish minister had naturally insisted in his demands because he had not been properly met at first the slave trade was illegal by international agreement and the only thing to do under the circumstances was to release the negroes adams closed his plea with a magnificent review of his career and of the labors of the distinguished jurists he had known in the court for nearly forty years and be it recorded wherever the name of justice is spoken he won his case lewis tappan now accompanied the africans on a tour through the states to raise money for their passage home the first meeting was in boston several members of the company interested the audience by their readings from the new testament or by their descriptions of their own country and of the horrors of the voyage sank gave the impression of great dignity and of extraordinary ability and Kali, a boy only eleven years of age also attracted unusual attention near the close of eighteen forty one accompanied by five missionaries and teachers the africans set sail from new york to make their way first to sierra leone and then to their own homes as well as they could 
while this whole incident of the amistad was still engaging the interest of the public there occurred another that also occasioned international friction and even more prolonged debate between the slavery and anti-slavery forces on october twenty five eighteen forty one the brig creole captain ensor of richmond virginia sailed from richmond and on october twenty seventh from hampton roads with a cargo of tobacco and one hundred and thirty slaves bound for new orleans on the vessel also aside from the crew were the captain's wife and child and three or four passengers who were chiefly in charge of the slaves one man john r hewell being directly in charge of those belonging to an owner named mccarger about nine thirty on the night of sunday november seventh while out at sea nineteen of the slaves rose killed the others wounded the captain and generally took command of the vessel madison washington began the uprising by an attack on gifford the first mate and ben blacksmith one of the most aggressive of his assistants killed hewell the insurgents seized the arms of the vessel permitted no conversation between members of the crew except in their hearing demanded and obtained the manifests of slaves and threatened that if they were not taken to abaco or some other british port they would throw the officers and crew overboard the creole reached nassau new providence on tuesday november ninth and the arrival of the vessel at once occasioned intense excitement gifford went ashore and reported the matter and the american consul john f bacon contended to the english authorities that the slaves on board the brig were as much a part of the cargo as the tobacco and entitled to the same protection from loss to the owners the governor sir francis cockburn however was uncertain whether to interfere in the business at all he liberated those slaves who were not concerned in the uprising spoke of all the slaves as passengers and guaranteed to the nineteen who were shown by an investigation to have been connected with the uprising all the rights of prisoners called before an english court he told them further that the british government would be communicated with before their case was finally passed upon that if they wished copies of the informations these would be furnished them and that they were privileged to have witnesses examined in refutation of the charges against them from time to time negroes who were natives of the island crowded about the brig in small boats and intimidated the american crew but when on the morning of november twelfth the attorney-general questioned them as to their intentions they replied with transparent good humor that they intended no violence and had assembled only for the purpose of conveying to shore such of the persons on the creel as might be permitted to leave and might need their assistance the attorney-general required however that they throw overboard a dozen stout cudgels that they had here the whole case really rested daniel webster as secretary of state aroused the anti-slavery element by making a strong demand for the return of the slaves basing his argument on the sacredness of vessels flying the american flag but the english authorities at nassau never returned any of them on march twenty one eighteen forty two joshua r giddings untiring defender of the rights of the negro offered in the house of representatives resolutions to the effect that slavery could exist only by positive law of the different states that the states had delegated no control over slavery to the federal government which alone had jurisdiction on the high seas and that therefore slaves on the high seas became free and the coastwise trade was unconstitutional the house strongly pro-southern replied with a vote of censure and giddings resigned but he was immediately re-elected by his ohio constituency End of section eleven section twelve of a social history of the american negro by benjamin griffith brawley this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eight the negro reply to organization and agitation it is not the purpose of the present chapter primarily to consider social progress on the part of the negro a little later we shall endeavor to treat this interesting subject for the period between the missouri compromise and the civil war just now we are concerned with the attitude of the negro himself toward the problem that seemed to present itself to america and for which such different solutions were proposed so far as slavery was concerned we have seen that the remedy suggested by denmark vesey and nat turner was insurrection it is only to state an historical fact however to say that the great heart of the negro people in the south did not believe in violence but rather hoped and prayed for a better day to come by some other means but what was the attitude of those people progressive citizens and thinking leaders who were not satisfied with the condition of the race and who had to take a stand on the issues that confronted them if we study the matter from this point of view 
we shall find an amount of ferment and unrest and honest difference of opinion that is sometimes overlooked or completely forgotten in the questions of a later day one walker's appeal the most widely discussed book written by a negro in the period was one that appeared in boston in eighteen twenty nine david walker the author had been born in north carolina in seventeen eighty five of a free mother and a slave father and he was therefore free he received a fair education travelled widely over the united states and by eighteen twenty seven was living in boston as the proprietor of a second-hand clothing store on brattle street he felt very strongly on the subject of slavery and actually seems to have contemplated leading an insurrection in eighteen twenty eight he addressed various audiences of negroes in boston and elsewhere and in eighteen twenty nine he published his appeal in four articles together with a preamble to the colored citizens of the world but in particular and very expressly to those of the united states of america the book was remarkably successful appearing in september by march of the following year it had reached its third edition and in each successive edition the language was more bold and vigorous walker's projected insurrection did not take place and he himself died in eighteen thirty while there was no real proof of the fact among the negro people there was a strong belief that he met with foul play article one walker headed our wretchedness in consequence of slavery a trip over the united states had convinced him that the negroes of the country were the most degraded wretched and abject set of beings that ever lived since the world began he quoted a south carolina paper as saying the turks are the most barbarous people in the world they treat the greeks more like brutes than human beings and then from the same paper cited an advertisement of the sale of eight negro men and four women are we men he exclaimed i ask you o my brothers are we men have we any other master but jesus christ alone is he not their master as well as ours what right then have we to obey and call any man master but himself how we could be so submissive to a gang of men whom we cannot tell whether they are as good as ourselves or not i never could conceive the whites he asserted have always been an unjust jealous unmerciful avaricious and bloodthirsty set of beings always seeking after power and authority as heathen the white people had been cruel enough but as christians they were ten times more so as heathen they were not quite so audacious as to go and take vessel loads of men women and children and in cold blood through devilishness throw them into the sea and murder them in all kind of ways but being christians enlightened and sensible they are completely prepared for such hellish cruelties next was considered our wretchedness in consequence of ignorance in general the writer maintained that his people as a whole did not have intelligence enough to realize their own degradation even if boys studied books they did not master their text nor did their information go sufficiently far to enable them actually to meet the problems of life if one would but go to the south or west he would see there a son take his mother who bore almost the pains of death to give him birth and by the command of a tyrant strip her as naked as she came into the world and apply the cowhide to her until she fell a victim to death in the road he would see a husband take his dear wife not unfrequently in a pregnant state and perhaps far advanced and beat her for an unmerciful wretch until her infant fell a lifeless lump at her feet moreover there have been and are this day in boston new york philadelphia and baltimore colored men who are in league with tyrants and who receive a great portion of their daily bread of the monies which they acquire from the blood and tears of their more miserable brethren whom they scandalously deliver into the hands of our natural enemies in article three walker considered a wretchedness in consequence of the preachers of the religion of jesus christ 
here was a fertile field which was only partially developed walker evidently did not have at hand the utterances of Furman and others to serve as a definite point of attack he did point out however the general failure of christian ministers to live up to the teachings of christ even here in boston we are informed pride and prejudice have got to such a pitch that in the very houses erected to the lord they have built little places for the reception of colored people where they must sit during meeting or keep away from the house of god hypocrisy could hardly go further than that of preachers who could not see the evils at their door but could send out missionaries to convert the heathen notwithstanding article four was headed our wretchedness in consequence of the colonizing plan this was a bitter arraignment especially directed against henry clay i appeal and ask every citizen of these united states said walker and of the world both white and black who has any knowledge of mr clay's public labors for these states i want you candidly to answer the lord who sees the secrets of your hearts do you believe that mr henry clay late secretary of state and now in kentucky is a friend to the blacks further than his personal interest extends does he care a pinch of snuff about africa whether it remains a land of pagans or and of blood or of christians so long as he gets enough of her sons and daughters to dig of gold and silver for him was he not made by the creator to sit in the shade and make the blacks work without remuneration for their services to support him and his family i have been for some time taking notice of this man's speeches and public writings but never to my knowledge have i seen anything in his writings which insisted on the emancipation of slavery which has almost ruined his country walker then paid his compliments to elias b caldwell and john randolph the former of whom he had said the more you improve the condition of these people the more you cultivate their minds the more miserable you make them in their present state here the work continues is a demonstrative proof of a plan got up by a gang of slaveholders to select the free people of color from among the slaves that our more miserable brethren may be the better secured in ignorance and wretchedness to work their farms and dig their mines and thus go on enriching the christians with their blood and groans what our brethren could have been thinking about who have left their native land and gone away to africa i am unable to say the americans may say or do as they please but they have to raise us from the condition of brutes to that of respectable men and to make a national acknowledgment to us for the wrongs they have inflicted on us you may doubt it if you please i know that thousands will doubt they think they have us so well secured in wretchedness to them and their children that it is impossible for such things to occur so did the antediluvians doubt noah until the day in which the flood came and swept them away so did the sodomites doubt until lot had got out of the city and god rained down fire and brimstone from heaven upon them and burnt them up so did the king of egypt doubt the very existence of god saying who is the lord that i should let israel go so did the romans doubt but they got dreadfully deceived this document created the greatest consternation in the south the mayor of savannah wrote of two mayor otis of boston demanding that walker be punished otis in a widely published letter replied expressing his disapproval of the pamphlet but saying that the author had done nothing that made him amenable to the laws in virginia the legislature considered passing an extraordinary bill not only forbidding the circulation of such seditious publications but forbidding the education of free negroes the bill passed the house of delegates but failed in the senate the appeal even found its way to louisiana where there were already rumors of an insurrection and immediately a law was passed expelling all free negroes who had come to the state since eighteen twenty five to the convention movement as may be inferred from walker's attitude the representative men of the race were almost a unit in their opposition to colonization they were not always opposed to colonization itself for some looked favorably upon settlement in canada and a few hundred made their way to the west indies they did object however to the plan offered by the american colonization society which more and more impressed them as a device on the part of slaveholders to get free 
negroes out of the country in order that slave labor might be more valuable richard allen bishop of the african methodist episcopal church and the foremost negro of the period said we were stolen from our mother country and brought here we have tilled the ground and made fortunes for thousands and still they are not weary of our services but they who stay to till the ground must be slaves is there not land enough in america or corn enough in egypt why should they send us into a far country to die see the thousands of foreigners immigrating to america every year and if there be ground sufficient for them to cultivate and bread for them to eat why would they wish to send the first tillers of the land away africans have made fortunes for thousands who are yet unwilling to part with their services but the free must be sent away and those who remain must be slaves i have no doubt that there are many good men who do not see as i do and who, who are sending us to liberia but they have not only duly considered the subject they are not men of colour this land which we have watered with our tears and our blood is now our mother country and we are well satisfied to stay where wisdom abounds and the gospel is free this point of view received popular expression in a song which bore the cumbersome title the colored man's opinion of colonization and which was sung to the tune of home sweet home the first stanza was as follows great god if the humble and weak are as dear to thy love as the proud to thy children give ear our brethren would drive us in deserts to roam forgive them o father and keep us at home home sweet home we have no other this this is our home to this sentiment formal expression was given in the measures adopted at various negro meetings in the north in eighteen seventeen the greatest excitement was occasioned by report that through the efforts of the newly formed colonization society all free negroes were forcibly to be deported from the country resolutions of protest were adopted and these were widely circulated of special importance was the meeting in philadelphia in january presided over by james fortin of this the full report is as follows at a numerous meeting of the people of color convened at bethel church to take into consideration the propriety of remonstrating against the contemplated measure that is to exile us from the land of our nativity james fortin was called to the chair and russell parrott appointed secretary the intent of the meeting having been stated by the chairman the following resolutions were adopted without one dissenting voice whereas our ancestors not of choice were the first successful cultivators of the wilds of america we their descendants feel ourselves entitled to participate in the blessings of her luxuriant soil which their blood and sweat manured and that any measure or system of measures having a tendency to banish us from her bosom would not only be cruel but in direct violation of those principles which have been the boast of this republic resolved that we view with deep abhorrence the unmerited stigma attempted to be cast upon the reputation of the free people of color by the promoters of this measure that they are a dangerous and useless part of the community when in the state of disfranchisement in which they live in the hour of danger they cease to remember their wrongs and rallied around the standard of their country resolved that we never will separate ourselves voluntarily from the slave population of this country they are our brethren by the ties of consanguinity of suffering and of wrong and we feel that there is more virtue in suffering privations with them than fancied advantages for a season resolved that without arts without science without a proper knowledge of government to cast upon the savage wilds of africa the free people of colour seems to us the circuitous route through which they must return to perpetual bondage resolved that having the strongest confidence in the justice of god and philanthropy of the free states we cheerfully submit our destinies to the guidance of him who suffers not a sparrow to fall without his special providence resolved that a committee of eleven persons be appointed to open a correspondence with the hon joseph hopkinson member of congress from this city and likewise to inform him of the sentiments of this meeting and that the following named persons constitute the committee and that they have power to call a general meeting when they in their judgment may deem it proper rev absalom jones rev richard allen 
james fortin robert douglas francis perkins reverend john gloucester robert gordon james johnson qua moni clarkson john somerset randall shepherd james fortin chairman russell parrot secretary in eighteen twenty seven in new york was begun the publication of freedom's journal the first negro newspaper in the united states the editors were john b russworm and samuel e cornish russworm was a recent graduate of bowdoin college and was later to become better known as the governor of maryland in africa by eighteen thirty feeling was acute throughout the country especially in ohio and kentucky and on the part of negro men had developed the conviction that the time had come for national organization and protest in the spring of eighteen thirty hezekiah grice of baltimore who had become personally acquainted with the work of lundy and garrison sent a letter to prominent negroes in the free states bringing in question the general policy of emigration received no immediate response but in august he received from richard allen an urgent request to come at once to philadelphia arriving there he found in session a meeting discussing the wisdom of emigration to canada and allen showed him a printed circular signed by peter williams rector of st philip's church new york peter vogel sang and thomas l jennings of the same place approving the plan of convention the philadelphians now issued a call for a convention of the negroes of the united states to be held in their city september fifteenth eighteen thirty this september meeting was held in bethel a m e church bishop richard allen was chosen president dr belfast burton of philadelphia and austin stewart of rochester vice presidents junius c morrell of pennsylvania secretary and robert cowley of maryland assistant secretary there were accredited delegates from seven states well this meeting might really be considered the first national convention of negroes in the united states aside of course from the gathering of denominational bodies it seems to have been regarded merely as preliminary to a still more formal assembling for the minutes of the next year were printed as the minutes and proceedings of the first annual convention of the people of color held by adjournments in the city of philadelphia from the sixth to the eleventh of june inclusive eighteen thirty one philadelphia eighteen thirty one the meetings of this convention were held in the wesleyan church on lombard street richard allen had died earlier in the year and grice was not present not long afterwards he emigrated to haiti where he became prominent as a contractor rev james w c pennington of new york however now for the first time appeared on the larger horizon of race affairs and john bowers of philadelphia served as president abraham d shad of delaware and william duncan of virginia as vice presidents william whipper of philadelphia as secretary and thomas l jennings of new york as assistant secretary delegates from five states were present the gathering was not large but it brought together some able men moreover the meeting had some distinguished visitors among them benjamin lundy william lord garrison rev s s jocelyn of new haven and arthur tappan of new york the very first motion of the convention resolved that a committee be appointed to institute an inquiry into the condition of the free people of color throughout the united states and report their views upon the subject at a subsequent meeting as a result of its work this committee recommended that the work of organizations interested in settlement in canada be continued that the free people of color be annually called to assemble by delegation and it submitted the necessity of deliberate reflection on the dissolute intemperate and ignorant condition of a large portion of the colored population of the united states and lastly your committee view with unfeigned regret and respectfully submit to the wisdom of this convention the operations and misrepresentations of the american colonization society in these united states we feel sorrowful to see such an immense and wanton waste of lives and property not doubting the benevolent feelings of some individuals engaged in that cause but we cannot for a moment doubt but that the cause of many of our unconstitutional unchristian and unheard of sufferings emanate from that unhallowed source and we would call on christians of every denomination firmly to resist it 
the report was unanimously received and adopted jocelyn tappan and garrison addressed the convention with reference to a proposed industrial college in new haven toward the twenty thousand dollar expense of which one individual tappan himself had subscribed one thousand dollars with the understanding that the remaining nineteen thousand dollars be raised within a year and the convention approved the project provided the negroes had a majority of at least one on the board of trustees an illuminating address to the public called attention to the progress of emancipation abroad to the fact that it was american persecution that led to the calling of the convention and that it was this also that first induced some members of the race to seek an asylum in canada where already there were two hundred log houses and five hundred acres under cultivation in eighteen thirty two eight states were represented by a total of thirty delegates by this time we learned that a total of eight hundred acres had been secured in canada that two thousand negroes had gone thither but that considerable hostility had been manifested on the part of the canadians hesitant the convention appointed an agent to investigate the situation it expressed itself as strongly opposed to any national aid to the american colonization society and urged the abolition of slavery in the district of columbia all of which activity is well to remember was a year before the american anti-slavery society was organized in eighteen thirty three there were fifty-eight delegates and abraham shad now of washington was chosen president the convention again gave prominence to the questions of canada and colonization and expressed itself with reference to the new law in connecticut prohibiting negroes from other states from attending schools within the state the eighteen thirty four meeting was held in new york prudence crandall was commended for her stand in behalf of the race and july four was set apart as a day for prayer and addresses on the condition of the negro throughout the country by this time we hear much of societies for temperance and moral reform especially of the so-called phoenix societies for improvement in general culture literature mechanic arts and morals of these organizations rev christopher rush of the a m e scion church was general president and among the directors were rev peter williams boston crummell the father of alexander crummell and rev william paul quinn afterwards a well-known bishop of the a m e church the eighteen thirty five and eighteen thirty six meetings were held in philadelphia and especially were the students of lane seminary in cincinnati commended for their zeal in the cause of abolition a committee was appointed to look into the dissatisfaction of some emigrants to liberia and generally to review the work of the colonization society in the decade eighteen thirty seven to eighteen forty seven frederick douglass was outstanding as a leader and other men who were now prominent were dr james mccune smith rev james w c pennington alexander crummell william c nell and martin r delaney these are important names in the history of the period these were the men who bore the brunt of the contest in the furious days of texas annexation and the compromise of eighteen fifty about eighteen fifty three and eighteen fifty four there was renewed interest in the idea of an industrial college steps were taken for the registry of negro mechanics and artisans who were in search of employment and of the names of persons who were willing to give them work and there was also a committee on historical records and statistics that was not only to compile studies in negro biography but also to reply to any assaults of note immediately after the last of the conventions just mentioned those who were interested in emigration and had not been able to get a hearing in the regular convention issued a call for a national emigration convention of colored men to take place in cleveland ohio august twenty four to twenty six eighteen fifty four the preliminary announcement said no person will be admitted to a seat in the convention who would introduce the subject of emigration to the eastern hemisphere either to asia africa or europe as our object and determination are to consider our claims to the west indies central and south america and the canadas this restriction has no reference to personal preference or individual enterprise but to the great question of national claims to come before the convention douglas pronounced the call uncalled for unwise unfortunate and premature and his position led him into a wordy discussion in the press with james m whitfield 
of buffalo prominent at the time as a writer delaney explained the call as follows it was a mere policy on the part of the authors of these documents to confine their scheme to america including the west indies whilst they were the leading advocates of the regeneration of africa lest they compromise themselves and their people to the avowed enemies of their race at the secret sessions he informs us africa was the topic of greatest interest in order to account for this position it is important to take note of the changes that had taken place between eighteen seventeen and eighteen fifty four when james fortin and others in philadelphia in eighteen seventeen protested against the american colonization society as the plan of a gang of slaveholders to drive free people from their homes they had abundant ground for the feeling by eighteen thirty nine however not only had the personnel of the organization changed but largely through the influence of garrison the purpose and aim had also changed and not virginia and maryland but new york and pennsylvania were now dominant in influence colonization had at first been regarded as a possible solution of the race problem money was now given however rather as an aid to the establishment of a model negro republic in africa whose effort would be to discourage the slave trade and encourage energy and thrift among those free negroes from the united states who chose to emigrate and to give native africans a demonstration of the advantages of civilization in view of the changed conditions delaney and others who disagreed with douglas felt that for the good of the race in the united states the whole matter of emigration might receive further consideration at the same time remembering old discussions they did not wish to be put in the light of betrayers of their people the pittsburgh daily morning post of october eighteen eighteen fifty four sneered at the new plan as follows if dr delaney drafted this report it certainly does him much credit for learning and ability and cannot fail to establish for him a reputation for vigor and brilliancy of imagination never yet surpassed it is a vast conception of impossible birth the committee seem to have entirely overlooked the strength of the powers on earth that would oppose the africanization of more than half of the western hemisphere we have no motive in noticing this gorgeous dream of the committee except to show its fallacy its impracticability in fact its absurdity no sensible man whatever his color should be for a moment deceived by such impracticable theories however in spite of all opposition the emigration convention met upon delaney fell the real brunt of the work of the organization in eighteen fifty five bishop james theodore holly was commissioned to fauston sol luke emperor of haiti and he received in his visit of a month much official attention with some inducement to emigrate delaney himself planned to go to africa as the head of a niger valley exploring party of the misrepresentation and difficulties that he encountered he himself has best told he did get to africa however and he had some interesting and satisfactory interviews with representative chiefs the civil war put an end to his project he himself accepting a major's commission from president lincoln through the influence of holly about two thousand persons went to haiti but not more than a third of these remained a plan fostered by whitfield for a colony in central america came to naught when this leading spirit died in san francisco on his way thither three sojourner truth and woman suffrage with its challenge to the moral consciousness it was but natural that anti-slavery should soon become allied with temperance woman suffrage and other reform movements that were beginning to appeal to the heart of america especially were representative women quick to see that the arguments used for their cause were very largely identical with those used for the negro when the woman suffrage movement was launched at seneca falls new york in eighteen forty eight lucretia mott elizabeth cady stanton and their co-workers issued a declaration of sentiments which like many similar documents copied the phrasing of the declaration of independence this set in part the history of mankind is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations on the part of man towards woman having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over her he has never permitted her to exercise her inalienable right 
to the elective franchise he has made her if married in the eye of the law civilly dead he has denied her the facilities for obtaining a thorough education all colleges being closed to her it mattered not at the time that male suffrage was by no means universal or that amelioration of the condition of woman had already begun the movement stated its case clearly and strongly in order that it might fully be brought to the attention of the american people in eighteen fifty the first formal national woman's rights convention assembled in worcester massachusetts to this meeting came a young quaker woman who was already listed in the cause of temperance in fact wherever she went susan b anthony entered into causes she possessed great virtues and abilities and at the same time was capable of very great devotion she not only sympathized with the negro when an opportunity offered she drank tea with him to her own unspeakable satisfaction lucy stone an oberlin graduate was representative of those who came into the agitation by the anti-slavery path beginning in eighteen forty eight to speak as an agent of the anti-slavery society almost from the first she began to introduce the matter of woman's rights in her speeches to the second national women's suffrage convention held in akron ohio in eighteen fifty two and presided over by mrs francis d gage came sojourner truth the libyan sibyl was then in the fullness of her powers she had been born of slave parents about seventeen ninety eight in ulster county new york in her later years she remembered vividly the cold damp cellar room in which slept the slaves of the family to which she belonged and where she was taught by her mother to repeat the lord's prayer and to trust in god when in the course of gradual emancipation she became legally free in eighteen twenty seven her master refused to comply with the law and kept her in bondage she left but was pursued and found rather than have her go back a friend paid for her services for the rest of the year then came an evening when searching for one of her children who had been stolen and sold she found herself a homeless wanderer a quaker family gave her lodging for the night subsequently she went to new york city joined a methodist church and worked hard to improve her condition later having decided to leave new york for a lecture tour through the east she made a small bundle of her belongings and informed a friend that her name was no longer isabella but sojourner she went on her way speaking to people wherever she found them assembled and being entertained in many aristocratic homes she was entirely untaught in the schools but was witty original and always suggestive by her tact and her gift of song she kept down ridicule and by her fervor and faith she won many friends for the anti-slavery cause as to her name she said and the lord gave me sojourner because i was to travel up and down the land showing the people their sins and being a sign unto them afterwards i told the lord i wanted another name because everybody else had two names and the lord gave me truth because i was to declare the truth to the people on the second day of the convention in akron in a corner crouched against the wall sat this woman of care her elbows resting on her knees and her chin resting upon her broad hard palms in the intermission she was employed in selling the life of sojourner truth from time to time came to the presiding officer the request don't let her speak it will ruin us every newspaper in the land will have our cause mixed with abolition and niggers and we shall be utterly denounced gradually however the meeting waxed warm baptist methodist episcopalian presbyterian and universalist preachers had come to hear and discuss the resolutions presented one argued the superiority of the male intellect and other the sin of eve and the women most of whom did not speak in meeting were becoming filled with dismay then slowly from her seat in the corner rose sojourner truth who till now had scarcely lifted her head slowly and solemnly to the front she moved laid her old bonnet at her feet and turned her great speaking eyes upon the chair mrs gage quite equal to the occasion stepped forward and announced sojourner truth and begged the audience to be silent a few minutes the tumult subsided at once and every eye was fixed on this almost amazon form which stood nearly six feet high head erect and eye piercing the upper air like one in a dream at her first word there was a profound hush she spoke in deep tones which though not loud reached every ear in the house and even the throng at the doors and windows to one man who had ridiculed the general helplessness of woman 
her needing to be assisted into carriages and to be given the best place everywhere she said nobody ever helped me into carriages or ober mud puddles or gives me any best place and raising herself to her full height with a voice pitched like rolling thunder she asked and ain't i a woman look at me look at my arm and she bared her right arm to the shoulder showing her tremendous muscular power i have ploughed and planted and gathered into barns and no man could head me and ain't i a woman i could work as much and eat as much as a man when i could get it and bear the lash as well and ain't i a woman i've borne five children and seen em most all sold off into slavery and when i cried out with a mother's grief none but jesus heard and ain't i a woman they talks bout dis ting in de head what dis they call it intellect said some one near dat's it honey what's dat got to do with women's rights or niggers rights if my cup won't hold but a pint and yourn holds a quart wouldn't ye be mean not to let me have my little half measure full and she pointed her significant finger and sent a keen glance at the minister who had made the argument the cheering was long and loud then that little man in black dare he say women can't have as much rights as man cause christ wasn't a woman but where did christ come from rolling thunder could not have stilled that crowd as did those deep wonderful tones as the woman stood there with her outstretched arms and her eyes of fire raising her voice she repeated war did christ come from from god and a woman man had nothing to do with him turning to another objector she took up the defense of eve she was pointed and witty solemn and serious at will and at almost every sentence awoke deafening applause and she ended by asserting if the first woman god made was strong enough to turn the world upside down all alone these together and she glanced over the audience ought to be able to turn it back and get it right side up again and now day is asking to do it the men better let em amid roars of applause wrote mrs gage she returned to her corner leaving more than one of us with streaming eyes and hearts beating with gratitude thus as so frequently happened sojourner truth turned a difficult situation into splendid victory she not only made an eloquent plea for the slave but placing herself upon the broadest principles of humanity she saved the day for woman suffrage as well End of section 12section thirteen of a social history of the american negro by benjamin griffith brawley this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine liberia in a former chapter we have traced the early development of the american colonization and society whose efforts culminated in the founding of the colony of liberia the recent world war with africa as its prize fixed attention anew upon the little republic this comparatively small tract of land just slightly more than one three hundredth part of the surface of africa is now of interest and strategic importance not only because if we accept abyssinia which claims slightly different race origin and haiti which is now really under the government of the united states it represents the one distinctively negro government in the world but also because it is the only tract of land on the great west coast of the continent that has survived even through the war the aggression of great european powers it is just at the bend of the shoulder of africa and its history is as romantic as its situation is unique liberia has frequently been referred to as an outstanding example of the incapacity of the negro for self-government such a judgment is not necessarily correct it is indeed an open question if in view of the nature of its beginning the history of the country proves anything one way or the other with reference to the capacity of the race the early settlers were frequently 
only recently out of bondage but upon them were thrust all the problems of maintenance and government and they brought with them moreover the false ideas of life and work that obtained in the old south sometimes they suffered from neglect sometimes from excessive solicitude never were they really left alone in spite of all however more than a score of native tribes have been subdued by only a few thousand civilized men the republic has preserved its integrity and there has been handed down through the years a tradition of constitutional government one the place and the people the resources of liberia are as yet imperfectly known there is no question however about the fertility of the interior or of its capacity when properly developed there are no rivers of the first rank but the longest streams are about three hundred miles in length and at convenient distances apart flow down to a coastline somewhat more than three hundred miles long here in a tract of land only slightly larger than our own state of ohio are a civilized population between thirty thousand and one hundred thousand in number and a native population estimated at two million of the civilized population the smaller figure thirty thousand is the more nearly correct if we consider only those persons who are fully civilized and this number would be about evenly divided between americo liberians and natives especially in the towns along the coast however there are many people who have received only some degree of civilization and most of the households in the larger towns have several native children living in them if all such elements are considered the total might approach one hundred thousand the natives and their different tribes fall into three or four large divisions in general they follow their native customs and the foremost tribes exhibit remarkable intelligence and skill in industry outstanding are the dignified mandingo with the mohammedan tradition and the ra'i distinguished for skill in the arts and with a culture similar to that of the mandingo also easily recognized are the kapuisi skilful in weaving and ironwork the crew intelligent seafaring and eager for learning the gribo ambitious and aggressive and in language connection close to the crew the basa with characteristics somewhat similar to those of the crew but in general not quite so ambitious the boozy wild and highly tattooed and the cannibalistic mano by reason of numbers if nothing else liberia's chief asset for the future consists in her native population two history a colonization and settlement in pursuance of its plans for the founding of a permanent colony on the coast of africa the american colonization society in november eighteen seventeen sent out two men samuel j mills and ebenezer burgess who were authorized to find a suitable place for a settlement going by way of england these men were cordially received by the officers of the african institution and given letters to responsible persons in sierra leone arriving at the latter place in march eighteen eighteen they met john Cazell, a native and a man of influence who had received some training in america and had returned to his people built a house of worship and become a preacher Cazell undertook to accompany them on their journey down the coast and led the way to sherbrooke island a place long in disputed territory but since included within the limits of sierra leone here the agents were hospitably received they fixed upon the island as a permanent site and in may turned their faces homeward mills died on the voyage in june and was buried at sea but burgess made a favorable report though the island was afterwards to prove by no means healthy the society was impressed but efforts might have languished at this important stage if monroe now president had not found it possible to bring the resources of the united states government to assist in the project smuggling with the accompanying evil of the sale of recaptured africans had by eighteen eighteen become a national disgrace and on march three eighteen nineteen a bill designed to do away with the practice became a law this said in part the president of the united states is hereby authorized to make such regulations 
and arrangements as he may deem expedient for the safekeeping support and removal beyond the limits of the united states of all such negroes mulattoes or persons of color as may be so delivered and brought within their jurisdiction and to appoint a proper person or persons residing upon the coast of africa as agent or agents for receiving the negroes mulattoes or persons of color delivered from on board vessels seized in the prosecution of the slave trade by commanders of the united states armed vessels for the carrying out of the purpose of this act one hundred thousand dollars was appropriated and monroe was disposed to construe as broadly as necessary the powers given him under it in his message of december twenty he informed congress that he had appointed rev samuel bacon of the american colonization society with john bankson as assistant to charter a vessel and take the first group of emigrants to africa the understanding being that he was to go to the place fixed upon by mills and burgess thus the national government and the colonization society while technically separate began to work in practical cooperation the ship elizabeth was made ready for the voyage the government informed the society that it would receive on board such free blacks recommended by the society as might be required for the purpose of the agency thirty three thousand dollars was placed in the hands of mr bacon rev samuel a crozer was appointed as the society's official representative eighty-eight emigrants were brought together thirty-three men and eighteen women the rest being children and on february five eighteen twenty convoyed by the war sloop cayenne the expedition set forth an interesting record of the voyage important for the side lights it gives was left by daniel coker the respected minister of a large methodist congregation in baltimore who was persuaded to accompany the expedition for the sake of the moral influence that he might be able to exert there was much bad weather at the start and it was the icy sea that on february four made it impossible to get under way until the next day on board moreover there was much distrust of the agents in charge with much questioning of their motives nor were matters made better by a fight between one of the emigrants and the captain of the vessel it was a restless company uncertain as to the future and dissatisfied and peevish from day to day kizel afterwards remarked that some would not be governed by white men and some would not be governed by black men and some would not be governed by mulattoes but the truth was they did not want to be governed by anybody on march three however the ship sighted the cape verde islands and six days afterwards was anchored at sierra leone and coker rejoiced that at last he had seen africa kilzell however whom the agents had counted on seeing was found to be away at sherbro accordingly six days after their arrival they too were making efforts to go on to sherbro for they were allowed at anchor only fifteen days and time was passing rapidly meanwhile bankson went to find kizel captain seber was at first decidedly unwilling to go further but his reluctance was at length overcome bacon purchased for three thousand dollars a british schooner that had formerly been engaged in the slave trade and on march seventeen both ship and schooner got under way for sherbro the next day they met bankson who informed them that he had seen kizel this man although he had not heard from america since the departure of mills and burgess had already erected some temporary houses against the rainy season he permitted the newcomers to stay in his little town until land could be obtained sent them twelve thousand a bushel of rice but he also with both dignity and pathos warned bankson that if he and his companions came with christ in their hearts it was well that they had come if not it would have been better if they had stayed in america now followed much fruitless bargaining with the native chiefs in all of which coker regretted that the slave traders had so ruined the people that it seemed impossible to make any progress in a palaver without the offering of rum meanwhile a report was circulated through the country that a number of americans had come and turned kazell out of his own town and put some of his people in the hold of their ship disaster followed disaster the marsh the bad water and the malaria played havoc with the colonists and all three of the responsible agents died 
the few persons who remained alive made their way back to sierra leone thus the first expedition failed one year later in march eighteen twenty one a new company of twenty one emigrants in charge of j b wynne and ephraim bacon arrived at freetown in the brig nautilus it had been the understanding that in return for their passage the members of the first expedition would clear the way for others but when the agents of the new company saw the plight of those who remained alive they brought all of the colonists together at fora bay and bacon went farther down the coast to seek a more favorable site a few persons who did not wish to go to fora bay remained in sierra leone and became british subjects bacon found a promising tract about two hundred and fifty miles down the coast at cape Montserrado, but the natives were not especially eager to sell as they did not wish to break up the slave traffic meanwhile wynne and several more of the colonists died and bacon now returned to the united states the second expedition had thus proved to be little more successful than the first but the future site of monrovia had at least been suggested in november came dr eli ayres as agent of the society and in december captain robert f stockton of the alligator with instructions to cooperate these two men explored the coast and on december eleventh arrived at maserado bay through the jungle they made their way to a village and engaged in a palaver with king peter and five of his associates the negotiations were conducted in the presence of an excited crowd and with imminent danger but stockton had great tact and at length for the equivalent of three hundred dollars he and heirs purchased the mouth of the maserado river cape Montserrado, and the land for some distance in the interior there was also an understanding for half a dozen gallons of rum and some trade cloth and tobacco with king george who resided on the cape and claimed a sort of jurisdiction over the northern districts of the peninsula of mount serrado by virtue of which the settlers were permitted to pass across the river and commence the laborious task of clearing away the heavy forests which covered the site of their intended town then the agent returned to effect the removal of the colonists from farrar bay leaving a very small company as a sort of guard on perseverance or providence island at the mouth of the river some of the colonists refused to leave remained and thus became british subjects for those who had remained on the island there was trouble at once a small vessel the prize of an english cruiser bound to sierra leone with thirty liberated africans put into the roads for water and had the misfortune to part her cable and come ashore the natives claimed to a prescriptive right which interest never fails to enforce to its fullest extent to seize and appropriate the wrecks and cargoes of vessels stranded under whatever circumstances on their coast the vessel in question drifted to the mainland one mile from the cape a small distance below george's town and the natives proceeded to act in accordance with tradition they were fired on by the prize master and forced to desist and the captain appealed to the few colonists on the island for assistance they brought him to play a brass field piece and two of the natives were killed and several more wounded the english officers crew and the captured africans escaped though the small vessel was lost but the next day the days the natives feeling outraged made another attack in the course of which some of them and one of the colonists were killed in the course of the operations moreover through the carelessness of some of the settlers themselves fire was communicated to the storehouse and three thousand dollars worth of property destroyed though the powder and some of the provisions were saved thus at the very beginning by accident though it happened the shadow of england fell across the young colony involving it in difficulties with the natives when then heirs returned with the main crowd of settlers on january seventh eighteen twenty two which arrival was the first real landing of settlers on what is now liberian soil he found that the days wished to annul the agreement previously made and to give back the articles paid he himself was seized in the course of a palaver and he was able to arrive at no better understanding than that the colonists might remain only until they could make a new purchase elsewhere now appeared on the scene boatswain a prominent chief from the interior who sometimes exercised jurisdiction over the coast tribes and who hearing that there was trouble in the bay 
had come hither bringing with him a sufficient following to enforce his decrees through this man shone something of the high moral principle so often to be observed in responsible african chiefs and to him heirs appealed hearing the story he decided in favor of the colonists saying to peter having sold your country and accepted payment you must take the consequences let the americans have their land immediately to the agent he said i promise you protection if these people give you further disturbance send for me and i swear if they oblige me to come again to quiet them i will do it to purpose by taking their heads from their shoulders as i did old king george's on my last visit to the coast to settle disputes thus on the word of a native chief was the foundation of liberia assured by the end of april all of the colonists who were willing to move had been brought from sierra leone to their new home it was now decided to remove from the low and unhealthy island to the higher land of cape monserrado only a few hundred feet away on april twenty eighth there was a ceremony of possession and the american flag was raised the advantages of the new position were obvious to the natives as well as the colonists and the removal was attended with great excitement by july the island was completely abandoned meanwhile however things had not been going well the days had been rendered very hostile and from them there was constant danger of attack the rainy season moreover had set in shelter was inadequate supplies were low and the fever continually claimed its victims Ayers at length became discouraged he proposed that the enterprise be abandoned and that the settlers return to sierra leone and on june four he did actually leave with a few of them it was at this juncture that elijah johnson one of the most heroic of the colonists stepped forth to fame the early life of the man is a blank in seventeen eighty nine he was taken to new jersey he received some instruction and studied for the methodist ministry took part in the war of eighteen twelve and eagerly embraced the opportunity to be among the first to come to the new colony to the suggestion that the enterprise be abandoned he replied two years long have i sought at home here i have found it here i remain to him the great heart of the colonists responded among the natives he was known and respected as a valiant fighter he lived until march twenty three eighteen forty nine closely associated with johnson his colleague in many an effort and the pioneer in mission work was the baptist minister lot carey from richmond virginia who also had become one of the first permanent settlers he was a man of most unusual versatility and force of character he died november eighth eighteen twenty eight as the result of a powder explosion that occurred while he was acting in defense of the colony against the days july eighteen twenty two was a hard month for the settlers not only were their supplies almost exhausted but they were on a rocky cape and the natives would not permit any food to be brought to them on august eight however arrived jehudi ashman a young man from vermont who had worked as a teacher and as the editor of a religious publication for some years before coming on this mission he brought with him a company of liberated africans and emigrants to the number of fifty-five and as he did not intend to remain permanently he had yielded to the entreaty of his wife and permitted her to accompany him on the voyage he held no formal commission from the american colonization society but seeing the situation he felt that it was his duty to do what he could to relieve the distress and he faced difficulties from the very first on the day after his arrival his own brig the strong was in danger of being lost the vessel parted its cable and on the following morning broke it again and drifted until it was landlocked between cape monserrado and cape mount a small anchor was found however and the brig was again moored but five miles from the settlement the rainy season was now on in full force there was no proper place for the storing of provisions and even with the newcomers it soon developed that there were in the colony only thirty-five men capable of bearing arms so great had been the number of deaths from the fever sometimes almost all of these were sick on september ten only two were in condition for any kind of service ashman tried to make terms with the native chiefs but their malignity was only partially concealed 
his wife languished before his eyes and died september fifteenth just five weeks after her arrival he himself was incapacitated for several months nor at the height of his illness was he made better by the ministrations of a french charlatan he never really recovered from the great inroads made upon his strength at this time as a protection from sudden attack a clearing around the settlement was made defences had to be erected without tools and so great was the anxiety that throughout the months of september and october a nightly watch of twenty men was kept on sunday november tenth the report was circulated that the days were crossing the Maserata river and at night it became known that seven or eight hundred were on the peninsula only half a mile to the west the attack came at early dawn on the eleventh and the colonists might have been annihilated if they had not brought a field piece into play when this was turned against the natives advancing in compact array it literally tore through masses of living flesh until scores of men were killed even so the days might have won the engagement if they had not stopped too soon to gather plunder as it was they were forced to retreat of the settlers three men and one woman were killed two men and two women injured and several children taken captive though these were afterwards returned at this time the colonists suffered greatly from the lack of any supplies for the treatment of wounds only medicines for the fever were on hand and in the hot climate those whose flesh had been torn by bullets suffered terribly in this first encounter as often in these early years the real burden of conflict fell upon carey and johnson after the battle these men found that they had on hand ammunition sufficient for only one hour's defence all were placed on a special allowance of provisions and november twenty three was observed as a day of prayer a passing vessel furnished additional supplies and happily delayed for some days the inevitable attack this came from two sides very early in the morning of december two there was a desperate battle three bullets passed through ashman's clothes one of the gunners was killed and repeated attacks were resisted only with the most dogged determination an accident or as the colonists regarded it a miracle saved them from destruction a guard hearing a noise discharged a large gun and several muskets the schooner prince regent was passing with major lang midshipman gordon and eleven especially trained men on board the officers hearing the sound of guns came ashore to see what was the trouble major lang offered assistance if ground was given for the erection of a british flag and generally attempted to bring about an adjustment of difficulties on the basis of submitting these to the governor of sierra leone to these propositions elijah johnson replied we want no flagstaff put up here that it will cost more to get down than it will to whip the natives however gordon and the men under him were left behind for the protection of the colony until further help could arrive within one month he and seven of the eleven were dead he himself had found a ready place in the hearts of the settlers and to him and his men liberia owes much they came in a needy hour and gave their lives for the cause of freedom an american steamer passing in december eighteen twenty two gave some temporary relief on march thirty one eighteen twenty three the cayenne with captain r t spence in charge arrived from america with supplies as many members of his crew became ill after only a few days spence soon deemed it advisable to leave his chief clerk however richard seaton heroically volunteered to help with the work remained behind and died after only three months on may twenty four came the oswego with sixty-one new colonists and dr ayres who already the society's agent now returned with the additional authority of government agent and surgeon he made a survey and attempted a new allotment of land only to find that the colony was soon in ferment because some of those who possessed the best holdings or who had already made the beginnings of homes were now required to give these up there was so much rebellion that in december ayres again deemed it advisable to leave the year eighteen twenty three was in fact chiefly noteworthy for the misunderstandings that arose between the colonists and ashman this man had been placed in a most embarrassing situation by the arrival of dr ayres he not only found himself superseded in the government but had the additional misfortune to learn that his drafts had been dishonored and that no provision had been made to remunerate him for his past services or provide for his present needs finding his services undervalued and even the confidence of the society withheld he was naturally indignant though his attachment to the cause remained steadfast seeing the authorized agent leaving the colony and the settlers themselves in a state of insubordination with no formal authority behind him he yet resolved to forget his own wrongs and to do what he could to save from destruction that for which he had already suffered so much 
he was young and perhaps not always as tactful as he might have been on the other hand the colonists had not yet learned fully to appreciate the real greatness of the man with whom they were dealing as for the society at home not even so much can be said the real reason for the withholding of confidence from ashman was that many of the members objected to his persistent attacks on the slave trade by the regulations that governed the colony at the time each man who received rations was required to contribute to the general welfare two days of labor a week early in december twelve men cast off all restraint and on the thirteenth ashman published a notice in which he said there are in the colony more than a dozen healthy persons who will receive no more provisions out of the public store until they earn them on the nineteenth in accordance with this notice the provisions of the recalcitrants were stopped the next morning however the men went to the storehouse and while provisions were being issued each seized a portion and went to his home ashman now issued a circular reminding the colonists of all their struggles together and generally pointing out to them how such a breach of discipline struck at the very heart of the settlement the colonists rallied to his support and the twelve men returned to duty the trouble however was not yet over on march nineteenth eighteen twenty four ashman found it necessary to order a cut in provisions he had previously declared to the board that in his opinion the evil was incurable by any of the remedies which fall within the existing provisions and counter remonstrances had been sent by the colonists who charged him with oppression neglect of duty and the seizure of public property he now seeing that his latest order was especially unpopular prepared new dispatches on march twenty two reviewed the whole course of his conduct in a strong and lengthy address and by the last of the month had left the colony meanwhile the society having learned that things were not going well with the colony had appointed his secretary rev r r gurley to investigate conditions gurley met ashman at the cape verde islands and urgently requested that he return to monrovia this ashman was not unwilling to do as he desired the fullest possible investigation into his conduct gurley was in liberia from august thirteenth to august twenty two eighteen twenty four only for from the time of his visit conditions improved ashman was fully vindicated and remained for four years more until his strength was all but spent there was adopted what was known as the gurley constitution according to this the agent in charge was to have supreme charge and preside at all public meetings he was to be assisted however by eleven officers annually chosen the most important of whom he was to appoint on nomination by the colonists among these were a vice-agent two councillors two justices of the peace and two constables there was to be a guard of twelve privates two corporals and one sergeant for a long time it was the custom of the american colonization society to send out two main shipments of settlers a year one in the spring and one in the fall on february thirteenth eighteen twenty four arrived a little more than a hundred emigrants mainly from petersburg virginia these people were unusually intelligent and industrious and received a hearty welcome within a month practically all of them were sick with the fever on this occasion as on many others lot carey served as physician and so successful was he that only three of the sufferers died another company of unusual interest was that which arrived early in eighteen twenty six it brought along a printer a press with the necessary supplies and books sent by friends in boston unfortunately the printer was soon disabled by the fever sickness however and wars with the natives were not the only handicaps that engaged the attention of the colony in these years at this period the slave trade was carried on extensively within sight of monrovia fifteen vessels were engaged in it at the same time almost under the guns of the settlement and in july of this year a contract was existing for eight hundred slaves to be furnished in the short space of four months within eight miles of the cape four hundred of these were to be purchased for two american traders ashman attacked the spaniards engaged in the traffic and labored generally to break up slave factories on one occasion he received as many as one hundred and sixteen slaves into the colony as free men he also adopted an attitude of justice toward the native crews of special importance was the attack on trade town a stronghold of french and spanish traders about one hundred miles below monrovia here there were not less than three large factories on the day of the battle april ten there were three hundred and fifty natives on shore under the direction of the traders but the colonists had the assistance of some american vessels and a liberian officer captain barber was of outstanding courage and ability the town was fired after eighty slaves had been surrendered the flames reached the ammunition of the enemy and over two hundred and fifty casks of gunpowder exploded 
by july however the traders had built a battery at trade town and were prepared to give more trouble all the same a severe blow had been dealt to their work in his report rendered at the close of eighteen twenty five ashman showed that the settlers were living in neatness and comfort two chapels had been built and the militia was well organized equipped and disciplined the need of some place for the temporary housing of immigrants having more and more impressed itself upon the colony before the end of eighteen twenty six a receptacle capable of holding one hundred and fifty persons was erected ashman himself served on until eighteen twenty eight by which time his strength was completely spent he sailed for america early in the summer and succeeded in reaching new haven only to die after a few weeks no man had given more for the founding of liberia the principal street in monrovia is named after him aside from wars with the natives the most noteworthy being the day gola war of eighteen thirty two the most important feature of liberian history in the decade eighteen twenty eight to eighteen thirty eight was the development along the coast of other settlements than monrovia these were largely the outgrowth of the activity of local branch organizations of the american colonization society and they were originally supposed to have the oversight of the central organization and of the colony of monrovia the circumstances under which they were founded however gave them something of a feeling of independence which did much to influence their history thus arose about seventy-five miles farther down the coast under the auspices especially of the new york and pennsylvania societies the grand basso settlements at the mouth of the st john's river the town adena being outstanding nearly a hundred miles farther south at the mouth of the sino river another colony developed as its most important town greenville and as most of the settlers in this vicinity came from mississippi their province became known as mississippi in africa hundred miles farther on cape palmas just about twenty miles from the cabala river marking the boundary of the french possessions developed the town of harbor in what became known as maryland in africa this colony was even more aloof than others from the parent settlement of the american colonization society when the first colonists arrived at monrovia in eighteen thirty one they were not very cordially received there being trouble about the allotment of land they waited for some months for reinforcements and then sailed down the coast to the vicinity of the cavalla river where they secured land for their future home and where their distance from the other colonists from america made it all the more easy for them to cultivate their traditions of independence these four ports are now popularly known as monrovia grand basso sino and cape palmas and to them for general prominence might now be added cape mount about fifty miles from monrovia higher up the coast and just a few miles from the mono river which now marks the boundary between sierra leone and liberia in eighteen thirty eight on a constitution drawn up by professor greenleaf of harvard college was organized the commonwealth of liberia the government of which was vested in a board of directors composed of delegates from the state societies and which included all the settlements except maryland this remote colony whose seaport is cape palmas did not join with the others until eighteen fifty seven ten years after liberia had become an independent republic when a special company of settlers arrived from baltimore and formally occupied cape palmas eighteen thirty four dr james hall was governor and he served in this capacity until eighteen thirty six when failing health forced him to return to america he was succeeded by john b russworm a young negro who had come to liberia in eighteen twenty nine for the purpose of superintending the system of education the country however was not yet ready for the kind of work he wanted to do and in course of time he went into politics he served very efficiently as governor of maryland from eighteen thirty six to eighteen fifty one especially exerting himself to standardize the currency and to stabilize the revenues five years after his death maryland suffered greatly from an attack by the Grebos, twenty-six colonists being killed and appealed to monrovia for help led to the sending of a company of men and later to the incorporation of the colony in the republic of all the events of the period special interest attaches to the murder of i f c finley governor of mississippi in africa to his father rev robert finley the organization of the american colonization society had been very largely due in september eighteen thirty eight governor finley left his colony to go to monrovia on business and making a landing at bossa cove he was robbed and killed by the crews this unfortunate murder led to a bitter conflict between the settlers in the vicinity and the natives this is sometimes known as the fish war from being waged around fish point and did not really cease for a year End of section thirteen
Section 14 of A Social History of the American Negro by Benjamin Griffith Brawley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 9, Part 2 B. The Commonwealth of Liberia. The first governor of the newly formed Commonwealth was Thomas H. Buchanan a man of singular energy who represented the new york and pennsylvania societies and who had come in eighteen thirty six especially to take charge of the grand bassa settlements becoming governor in eighteen thirty eight he found it necessary to proceed vigorously against the slave dealers at trade town he was also victorious in eighteen forty in a contest with the gola tribe led by chief katumba the golas had defeated the day tribe so severely that a mere remnant of the latter had taken refuge with the colonists at millsburg a station a few miles up the st paul's river thus as it happened more than once a tribal war in time involved the very existence of the new american colonies governor buchanan's victory greatly increased his prestige and made it possible for him to negotiate more and more favorable treaties with the natives a contest of different sort was that with a methodist missionary john says who held that all goods used by missionaries including those sold to the natives should be admitted free of duty the governor contended that such privilege should be extended only to goods intended for the personal use of missionaries and the colonization society stood behind him in this opinion as early as eighteen forty moreover some shadow of future events was cast by trouble made by english traders on the mono river the sierra leone boundary Buchanan sent an agent to England to represent him in an inquiry into the matter, but in the midst of his vigorous work he died in 1841. He was the last white man formerly under any auspices at the head of Liberian affairs. Happily, his period of service had given opportunity and training to an efficient helper, upon whom now the burden fell, and of whom it is hardly too much to say, that he is the foremost figure in liberian history joseph jenkin roberts was a mulatto born in virginia in eighteen o nine at the age of twenty with his widowed mother and younger brothers he went to liberia and engaged in trade in course of time he proved to be a man of unusual tact and graciousness of manner moving with ease among people of widely different rank his ability soon demanded recognition and he was at the head of the force that defeated katumba as governor he realized the need of cultivating more far-reaching diplomacy than the commonwealth had yet known he had the cooperation of the maryland governor russworm in such a matter as that of uniform customs duties and he visited the united states where he made a very good impression he soon understood that he had to reckon primarily with the english and the french england had indeed assumed an attitude of opposition to the slave trade but her traders did not scruple to sell rum to slave dealers and especially were they interested in the palm oil of liberia when the commonwealth sought to impose customs duties england took the position that as liberia was not an independent government she had no right to do so and the english attitude had some show of strength from the fact that the american colonization society an outside organization had a veto power over whatever liberia might do when in eighteen forty five the liberian government seized the little ben an english trading vessel whose captain acted in defiance of the revenue laws the british in turn seized the john says belonging to a liberian named benson and sold the vessel for eight thousand pounds liberia appealed to the united states but the oregon boundary question as well as slavery had given the american government 
problems enough at home and the secretary of state edward everett finally replied to lord aberdeen eighteen forty five that america was not presuming to settle differences arising between liberian and british subjects the liberians being responsible for their own acts the colonization society powerless to act except through its own government in january eighteen forty six resolved that the time had arrived when it was expedient for the people of the commonwealth of liberia to take into their own hands the whole work of self-government including the management of all their foreign relations forced to act for itself liberia called a constitutional convention and on july twenty sixth eighteen forty seven issued a declaration of independence and adopted the constitution of the liberian republic in october joseph jenkin roberts governor of the commonwealth was elected the first president of the republic it may well be questioned if by eighteen forty seven liberia had developed sufficiently internally to be able to assume the duties and responsibilities of an independent power there were at the time not more than four thousand five hundred civilized people of american origin in the country these were largely illiterate and scattered along a coastline more than three hundred miles in length it is not to be supposed however that this consummation had been attained without much yearning and heart beat and high spiritual fervor there was something pathetic in the effort of this small company most of whose members had never seen africa but for the sake of their race had made their way back to the fatherland the new seal of the republic bore the motto the love of liberty brought us here the flag modelled on that of the united states had six red and five white stripes for the eleven signers of the declaration of independence and in the upper corner next to the staff a lone white star in a field of blue the declaration itself said in part we the people of the republic of liberia were originally inhabitants of the united states of north america in some parts of that country we were debarred by law from all the rights and privileges of men in other parts public sentiment more powerful than law frowned us down we were everywhere shut out from all civil office we were excluded from all participation in the government we were taxed without our consent we were compelled to contribute to the resources of a country which gave us no protection we were made a separate and distinct class and against us every avenue of improvement was effectually closed strangers from all lands of a color different from ours were preferred before us we uttered our complaints but they were unattended to or met only by alleging the peculiar institution of the country all hope of a favorable change in our country was thus wholly extinguished in our bosom and we looked with anxiety abroad for some asylum from the deep degradation the western coast of africa was the place selected by american benevolence and philanthropy for our future home removed beyond those influences which depressed us in our native land it was hoped we would be enabled to enjoy those rights and privileges and exercise and improve those faculties which the god of nature had given us in common with the rest of mankind see the republic of liberia with the adoption of its constitution the republic of liberia formally asked to be considered in the family of nations and since eighteen forty seven the history of the country has naturally been very largely that of international relations in fact preoccupation with the questions raised by powerful neighbors has been at least one strong reason for the comparatively slow internal development of the country the republic was officially recognized by england in eighteen forty eight by france in eighteen fifty two but on account of slavery not by the united states until eighteen sixty two continuously there has been an observance of the forms of order and only one president has been deposed for a long time the presidential term was two years in length but by an act of nineteen o seven it was lengthened to four years from time to time there have been two political parties but not always has such a division been emphasized it is well to pause and note exactly what was the task set before the little country a company of american negroes suddenly found themselves placed on an unhealthy and uncultivated coast which was thenceforth to be their home if we compare them with the pilgrim fathers we find that as the pilgrims had to subdue the indians so they had to hold their own against a score of aggressive tribes the pilgrims had the advantage of a thousand years of culture and experience in government the negroes only recently out of bondage had been deprived of any opportunity for improvement whatsoever 
not only however did they have to contend against native tribes and labor to improve their own shortcomings on every hand they had to meet the designs of nations supposedly more enlightened and christian on the coast spanish traders defied international law on one side the english and on the other the french from the beginning showed a tendency toward arrogance and encroachment to crown the difficulty the american government under whose auspices the colony had largely been founded became more and more half-hearted in its efforts for protection and at length abandoned the enterprise altogether it did not cease however to regard the colony as the dumping-ground of its own troubles and whenever a vessel with slaves from the congo was captured on the high seas it did not hesitate to take these people to the liberian coast and leave them there nearly dead though they might be from exposure or cramping it is well for one to remember such facts as these before he is quick to belittle or criticize to the credit of the congo men be it said that from the first they labored to make themselves a quiet and industrious element in the body politic the early administrations of president roberts four terms eighteen forty eight to eighteen fifty five were mainly devoted to the quelling of the native tribes that continued to give trouble and to the cultivating of friendly relations with foreign powers soon after his inauguration roberts made a visit to england the power from which there was most to fear and on this occasion as on several others england varied her arrogance with a rather excessive friendliness toward the little republic she presented to roberts the lark a ship with four guns and sent the president home on a war vessel some years afterwards when the lark was out of repair england sent instead of schooner the quail roberts made a second visit to england in eighteen fifty two to adjust disputes with traders on the western boundary he also visited france and louis napoleon not to be outdone by england presented to him a vessel the hirondel and also guns and uniforms for his soldiers in general the administrations of roberts we might better say his first series of administrations for he was later to be called again to office made a period of constructive statesmanship and solid development and not a little of the respect that the young republic won was due to the personal influence of his first president roberts however happened to be very fair and generally successful though his administrations were the desire on the part of the people that the highest office in the country be held by a black man seems to have been a determining factor in the choice of his successor there was an interesting campaign toward the close of his last term there were about this time two political parties in the country the old republicans and the true liberians a party which had been formed in opposition to roberts's foreign policies but during the canvass the platform of this new party lost ground the result was in favor of the republican candidate stephen ellen benson four terms eighteen fifty six to eighteen sixty three was forced to meet in one way or another almost all of the difficulties that have since played a part in the life of the liberian people he had come to the country in eighteen twenty two at the age of six and had developed into a practical and efficient merchant to his high office he brought the same principles of sobriety and good sense that had characterized him in business on february twenty eighth eighteen fifty seven the independent colony of maryland formally became a part of the republic this action followed immediately upon the struggle with the gray bows in the vicinity of cape palmas in which assistance was rendered by the liberians under ex-president roberts in eighteen fifty eight an incident that threatened complications with france but that was soon happily closed arose from the fact that a french vessel which sought to carry away some crew laborers to the west indies was attacked by these men when they had reason to fear that they might be sold into slavery and not to have to work simply along the coast as they had first supposed the ship was seized and all but one of the crew the physician were killed trouble meanwhile continued with british smugglers in the west and to this whole matter we shall have to give further and special attention in eighteen fifty eight and a year or two thereafter the numerous arrivals from america especially of congo men captured on the high seas were such as to present a serious social problem flagrant violation by the south of the laws against the slave trade 
led to the seizure by the united states government of many africans hundreds of these people were detained at a time at such a port as key west the government then adopted the policy of ordering commanders who seized slave ships at sea to land the africans directly upon the coast of liberia without first bringing them to america and appropriated two hundred and fifty thousand dollars for the removal and care of those at key west the suffering of many of these people is one of the most tragic stories in the history of slavery to liberia came at one time six hundred and nineteen at another eight hundred and sixty seven and within two months as many as four thousand there was very naturally consternation on the part of the people at this sudden immigration especially as many of the africans arrived cramped or paralyzed or otherwise ill from the conditions under which they had been forced to travel president benson stated the problem to the american government the united states sent some money to liberia the people of the republic helped in every way they could and the whole situation was finally adjusted without any permanently bad effects though it is well for students to remember just what liberia had to face at this time important toward the close of benson's terms was the completion of the building of the liberia college of which joseph jenkin roberts became the first president the administrations of daniel bashiel warner two terms eighteen sixty four to eighteen sixty seven and the earlier one of james spriggs payne eighteen sixty eight to eighteen sixty nine were comparatively uneventful both of these men were republicans but warner represented something of the shifting of political parties at the time at first a republican he went over to the whig party devoted to the policy of preserving liberia from white invasion moved to distrust of english merchants who delighted in defrauding the little republic he established an important ports of entry law in eighteen sixty five which it is hardly necessary to say was very unpopular with the foreigners commerce was restricted to six ports and a circle six miles in diameter around each port on account of the civil war and the hopes that emancipation held out to the negroes in the united states immigration from america ceased rapidly but a company of three hundred and forty six came from barbados at this time the liberian government assisted these people with four thousand dollars set apart for each man an allotment of twenty-five rather than the customary ten acres the colonization society appropriated ten thousand dollars and after a pleasant voyage of thirty-three days they arrived without the loss of a single life in the company was a little boy arthur barclay who was later to be known as the president of the republic at the semi-centennial of the american colonization society held in washington in january eighteen sixty seven it was shown that the society and its auxiliaries had been directly responsible for the sending of more than twelve thousand persons to africa of these four thousand five hundred and forty one had been born free three hundred and forty four had purchased their freedom five thousand nine hundred and fifty seven had been emancipated to go to africa and one thousand two hundred and twenty seven had been settled by the maryland society in addition five thousand seven hundred and twenty two captured africans had been sent to liberia the need of adequate study of the interior having more and more impressed itself benjamin anderson an adventurous explorer assisted with funds by a citizen of new york in eighteen sixty nine studied the country for two hundred miles from the coast he found the land constantly rising and made his way to masarda the chief city of the western mandingos he summed up his work in his narrative of a journey to masarda and made another journey of exploration in eighteen seventy four edward james roy eighteen seventy to october twenty sixth eighteen seventy one a whig whose party was formed out of the elements of the old true liberian party attracts attention by reason of a notorious british loan to which further reference must be made of the whole amount of one hundred thousand pounds sums were wasted or misappropriated until it has been estimated that the country really reaped the benefit of little more than a quarter of the whole amount president roy added to other difficulties by his seizure of a bank building belonging to an industrial society of the st paul's river settlements by proclamation to lengthen his term of office twice a constitutional amendment for lengthening the presidential term from two years to four had been considered and voted down roy contested the last vote 
insisted that his term ran to january eighteen seventy four and issued a proclamation forbidding the coming biennial election he was deposed his house sacked some of his cabinet officers tried before a court of impeachment and he himself was drowned as he was pursued while attempting to escape to a british ship in the harbor a committee of three was appointed to govern the country until a new election could be held and in this hour of storm and stress the people turned once more to the guidance of their old leader joseph j roberts two terms eighteen seventy two to eighteen seventy five his efforts were mainly devoted to restoring order and confidence though there was a new war with the rebos to be waged he was succeeded by another trusted leader james s payne eighteen seventy six to eighteen seventy seven whose second administration was as devoid as the first of striking incident in fact the whole generation succeeding the loan of eighteen seventy one was a period of depression the country not only suffered financially but faith in it was shaken both at home and abroad coffee grown in liberia fell as that produced at brazil grew in favor the farmer witnessing a drop in value from twenty four to four cents a pound farms were abandoned immigration from the united states ceased and the country entered upon a period of stagnation from which it has not yet fully recovered within just a few years after eighteen seventy one however conditions in the united states led to an interesting revival of the whole idea of colonization and to noteworthy effort on the part of the negroes themselves to better their condition the withdrawal of federal troops from the south and all the evils of the aftermath of reconstruction led to such a terrorizing of the negroes and such a denial of civil rights that there set in the movement that culminated in the great exodus from the south in eighteen seventy nine the movement extended all the way from north carolina to louisiana and arkansas in so far as it led to migration to kansas and other states in the west it belongs to american history however there was also interest in going to africa applications by the thousands poured in upon the american colonization society and one organization in arkansas sent hundreds of its members to seek the help of the new york state colonization society in all such endeavor negro baptists and methodists joined hands and especially prominent was bishop h m turner of the african methodist episcopal church by eighteen seventy seven there was organized in south carolina the liberian exodus and joint stock company in north carolina there was the freedmen's emigration aid society and there were similar organizations in other states the south carolina organization had the threefold purpose of emigration missionary activity and commercial enterprise and to these ends it purchased a vessel the azor at a cost of seven thousand dollars the white people of charleston unfortunately embarrassed the enterprise in every possible way among other things insisting when the azor was ready to sail that it was not seaworthy and needed a new copper bottom to cost two thousand dollars the vessel at length made one or two trips however on one voyage carrying as many as two hundred and seventy four emigrants it was then stolen and sold in liverpool and one gets an interesting sidelight on southern conditions in the period when he knows that even the united states circuit court in south carolina refused to entertain the suit brought by the negroes in the administration of anthony w gardner three terms eighteen seventy eight to eighteen eighty three difficulties with england and germany reached a crisis territory in the northwest was seized the british made a formal show of force at monrovia and the looting of a german vessel along the crew coast and personal indignities inflicted by the natives upon the shipwrecked germans led to the bombardment of nana crew by a german warship and the presentation at monrovia of a claim for damages payment of which was forced by the threat of the bombardment of the capital to the liberian people the outlook was seldom darker than in this period of calamities president gardner very ill resigned office in january of his last year of service being succeeded by the vice president alfred f russell more and more was pressure brought to bear upon liberian officials for the granting of monopolies and concessions especially to englishmen and in his message of eighteen eighty three president russell said 
recent events admonish us as to the serious responsibility of claims held against us by foreigners and we cannot tell what complications may arise in the midst of all this however russell did not forget the natives and the need of guarding them against liquor and exploitation hillary richard wright johnson four terms eighteen eighty four to eighteen ninety one the next president was a son of the distinguished elijah johnson and the first man born in liberia who had risen to the highest place in the republic whigs and republicans united in his election much of his time had necessarily to be given to complications arising from the loan of eighteen seventy one but the western boundary was adjusted with great loss with great britain at the mono river though new difficulties arose with the french who were pressing their claim to territory as far as the cavallo river in the course of the last term of president johnson there was an interesting grant by act approved january twenty one eighteen ninety to f f whittakin of pennsylvania of the right to construct maintain and operate a system of railroads telegraph and telephone lines whittakin bought up in england stock to the value of half a million dollars but died on the way to liberia to fulfil his contract his nephew f f whittakin asked for an extension of time which was granted but after a while the whole project languished joseph james cheeseman eighteen ninety two to november fifteen eighteen ninety six was a whig he conducted what was known as the third grebo war and laboured especially for a sound currency he was a man of unusual ability and his devotion to his task undoubtedly contributed toward his death in office near the middle of his third term as up to this time there had been no internal improvement and little agricultural or industrial development in the country o f cook the agent of the new york state colonization society in eighteen ninety four signified to the legislature a desire to establish a station where experiments could be made as to the best means of introducing receiving and propagating beasts of burden commercial plants etc his request was approved and one thousand acres of land granted for the purpose by act of january twenty eighteen ninety four results however were neither permanent nor far-reaching in fact by the close of the century immigration had practically ceased and the activities of the american colonization society had also ceased many of the state organizations having gone out of existence in eighteen ninety three julius c stevens of goldsboro north carolina went to liberia and served for a nominal salary as agent of the american colonization society becoming also a teacher in the liberia college and in time commissioner of education in connection with which post he edited his liberian school reader but he died in nineteen o three william d coleman as vice president finished the incomplete term of president cheeseman to the end of eighteen ninety seven and later was elected for two terms in his own right in the course of his last administration however his interior policy became very unpopular as he was thought to be harsh in his dealing with the natives and he resigned in december nineteen hundred as there was at the time no vice-president he was succeeded by the secretary of state garretson w gibson a man of scholarly attainments who was afterwards elected for a whole term nineteen o two to nineteen o three the feature of this term was the discussion that arose over the proposal to grant a concession to an english concern known as the west african gold concessions limited this offered to the legislators a bonus of one thousand five hundred pounds and for this bribe it asked for the sole right to prospect for and obtain gold precious stones and all other minerals over more than half of liberia specifically it asked for the right to acquire freehold land and to take up leases for eighty years in blocks of from ten to a thousand acres to import all mining machinery and all other things necessary free of duty to establish banks in connection with the mining enterprises these to have the power to issue notes to construct telegraphs and telephones to organize auxiliary syndicates and to establish its own police it was seen that english impudence could hardly go further though time was to prove that there were still other things to be borne the proposal was indignantly rejected arthur barclay nineteen o four to nineteen eleven had already served in three cabinet positions before coming to the presidency he had also been a professor 
in the liberia college and for some years had been known as the leader of the bar in monrovia it was near the close of his second term that the president's term of office was lengthened from two to four years and he was the first incumbent to serve for the longer period in his first inaugural address president barclay emphasized the need of developing the resources of the hinterland and of attaching the native tribes to the interests of the state in his foreign policy he was generally enlightened and broad-minded but he had to deal with the arrogance of england in nineteen o six a new british loan was negotiated this also was for one hundred thousand pounds more than two-thirds of which amount was to be turned over to the liberian development company an english scheme for the development of the interior the company was to work in cooperation with the liberian government and as security for the loan british officials were to have charge of the customs revenue the chief inspector acting as financial adviser to the republic it afterwards developed that the company never had any resources except those it had raised on the credit of the republic and the country was forced to realize that it had been cheated a second time meanwhile the english officials who on various pretexts of reform had taken charge of the barracks and the customs in monrovia were carrying things with a high hand the liberian force appeared with english insignia on the uniforms and in various other ways the commander sought to overawe the populace at the climax of the difficulties on february thirteenth nineteen o nine a british warship happened to appear in the waters of monrovia and the calamity was averted only by the skilful diplomacy of the liberians already however in nineteen o eight liberia had sent a special commission to ask the aid of the united states this consisted of garrison w gibson former president j j dawson vice president at the time and charles b dunbar the commission was received by president roosevelt and by secretary taft just before the latter was nominated for the presidency on may eighth nineteen o nine a return commission consisting of roland p faulkner george sale and emmett j scott arrived in monrovia the work of this commission must receive further and special attention president barclay was succeeded by daniel edward howard two long terms nineteen twelve to nineteen nineteen who at his inauguration began the policy of giving prominence to the native chiefs the feature of president howard's administrations was of course liberia's connection with the great war in europe war against germany having been declared on the morning of april tenth nineteen eighteen a submarine came to monrovia and demanded that the french wireless station be torn down the request being refused the town was bombarded the excitement of the day was such as has never been duplicated in the history of liberia in one house two young girls were instantly killed and an elderly woman and a little boy fatally wounded but except in this one home the actual damage was comparatively slight though there might have been more if a passing british steamer had not put the submarine to flight suffering of another and more far-reaching sort was that due to the economic situation the comparative scarcity of food in the world and the profiteering of foreign merchants in liberia by the summer of nineteen nineteen brought about a condition that threatened starvation nor was the situation better early in nineteen twenty when butter retailed at one dollar and twenty five cents a pound sugar at seventy two cents a pound and oil at one dollar a gallon president howard was succeeded by charles dunbar burgess king who as president-elect had visited europe and america and who was inaugurated january five nineteen twenty his address on this occasion was a comprehensive presentation of the needs of liberia especially along the lines of agriculture and education he made a plea also for an enlightened native policy said he we cannot afford to destroy the native institutions of the country our true mission lies not in the building here in africa of a negro state based solely on western ideas but rather a negro nationality indigenous to the soil having its foundation rooted in the institutions of africa and purified by western thought and development End of section 14. Section 15 of A Social History of the American Negro by Benjamin Griffith Brawley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 9, Part 3, 
international relations our study of the history of liberia has suggested two or three matters that call for special attention of prime importance is the country's connection with world politics any consideration of liberia's international relations falls into three divisions first that of titles to land second that of foreign loans and third that of so-called internal reform in the very early years of the colony the raids of slave traders gave some excuse for the first aggression on the part of a european power driven from the pongo regions northwest of sierra leone pedro blanco settled in the galenas territory northwest of the liberian frontier and established elaborate headquarters for his mammoth slave-trading operations in west africa with slave-trading substations at cape mount st paul river bassa and at other points of the liberian coast employing numerous police watchers spies and servants to obtain jurisdiction the colony of liberia began to purchase from the lords of the soil as early as eighteen twenty four the lands of the st paul basin and the grain coast from the maffa river on the west to the grand sesters river on the east so that by eighteen forty five twenty-four years after the establishment of the colony liberia with the aid of great britain had destroyed throughout these regions the baneful traffic in slaves and the slave barracoons and had driven the slave-trading leaders from the liberian coast the trade continued to flourish however in the galenas territory and in course of time as we have seen the colony had also to reckon with british merchants in this section the declaration of independence in eighteen forty seven being very largely a result of the defiance of liberian revenue laws by englishmen while president roberts was in england not long after his inauguration lord ashley moved by motives of philanthropy undertook to raise two thousand pounds with which he roberts might purchase the galenas territory and by eighteen fifty six roberts had secured the title and deeds to all of this territory from the maffa river to Sherbro island the whole transaction was thoroughly honorable roberts informed england of his acquisition and his right to the territory was not then called in question trouble however developed out of the attitude of john m harris a british merchant and in eighteen sixty two while president benson was in england he was officially informed that the right of liberia was recognized only to the land east of turner's peninsula to the river san pedro harris now worked up a native war against the bias the liberians defended themselves and in the end the british government demanded eight thousand eight hundred and seventy eight point nine point three pounds as damages for losses sustained by harris and arbitrarily extended its territory from sherbro island to cape mount in the course of the discussion claims mounted up to eighteen thousand pounds great britain promised to submit this boundary question to the arbitration of the united states but when the time arrived at the meeting of one of the commissions in sierra leone she firmly declined to do so after this whenever she was ready to take more land she made a plausible pretext and was ready to back up her demands with force on march twenty eighteen eighty two four british men-of-war came to monrovia and sir a e havelock governor of sierra leone came ashore and president gardner was forced to submit to an agreement by which in exchange for four thousand seven hundred and fifty pounds and the abandonment of all further claims the liberian government gave up all right to the galenas territory from sherbro island to the maffa river this agreement was repudiated by the liberian senate but when havelock was so informed he replied 
her majesty's government cannot in any case recognize any rights on the part of liberia to any portions of the territories in dispute liberia now issued a protest to other great powers but this was without avail even the united states counselling acquiescence though through the offices of america the agreement was slightly modified and the boundary fixed at the mano river trouble next arose on the east in eighteen forty six the maryland colonization society purchased the lands of the ivory coast east of cape palmas as far as the san pedro river these lands were formally transferred to liberia in eighteen fifty seven and remained in the undisputed possession of the republic for forty years france now not to be outdone by england on the pretext of title deeds obtained by french naval commanders who visited the coast in eighteen ninety in eighteen ninety one put forth a claim not only to the ivory coast but to land as far away as grand bassa and cape mount the next year under threat of force she compelled liberia to accept a treaty which for twenty five thousand francs and the relinquishment of all other claims permitted her to take all the territory east of the kavala river in nineteen o four great britain asked permission to advance her troops into liberian territory to suppress a native war threatening her interests she occupied at this time what is known as the kari lehan section which is very fertile and of easy access to the sierra leone railway this land she never gave up instead she offered liberia six thousand pounds or some poor land for it france after eighteen ninety two made no endeavour to delimit her boundary and roused by the action of great britain she made great advances in the hinterland claiming tracts of maryland and sino and now france and england each threatened to take more land if the other was not stopped president barclay visited both countries but by a treaty of nineteen o seven his commission was forced to permit france to occupy all the territory seized by force and as soon as this agreement was reached france began to move on to other land in the basin of the st paul's and st john's rivers this is all then simply one more story of the oppression of the weak by the strong for eighty years england has not ceased to intermeddle in liberian affairs cajoling or browbeating as at the moment seemed advisable and france has been only less bad certainly no country on earth now has better reason than liberia to know that they should get who have the power and they should keep who can the international loans and the attempts at reform must be considered together in eighteen seventy one at the rate of seven per cent there was authorized a british loan of a hundred thousand pounds for their services the british negotiators retained thirty thousand pounds and twenty thousand pounds more was deducted as the interest for three years president boy ordered mr chinnery a british subject in the liberian consul general in london to supply the liberian secretary of treasury with goods and merchandise to the value of ten thousand pounds and other sums were misappropriated until the country itself actually received the benefit of not more than twenty seven thousand pounds if so much this whole unfortunate matter was an embarrassment to liberia for years but in eighteen ninety nine the republic assumed responsibility for eighty thousand pounds the interest being made a first charge on the customs revenue in nineteen o six not yet having learned the lesson of cavetti cricus donna forentis and moved by the representations of sir harry h johnston the country negotiated a new loan of a hundred thousand pounds thirty thousand pounds of this amount was to satisfy pressing obligations but the greater portion was to be turned over to the liberian development company a great scheme by which the government and the company were to work hand in hand for the development of the country as security for the loan british officials were to have charge of the customs revenue the chief inspector acting as financial adviser to the republic when the company had made a road of fifteen miles in one district and made one or two other slight improvements it represented to the liberian government that its funds were exhausted when president barclay as for an accounting the managing director expressed surprise that such a demand should be made upon him the liberian people were chagrined and at length they realized that they had been cheated a second time with all the bitter experiences of the past to guide them 
meanwhile the english representatives in the country were demanding that the judiciary be reformed that the frontier force be under british officers and that inspector lamont as financial adviser have a seat in the liberian cabinet and a veto power over all expenditures and the independence of the country was threatened if these demands were not complied with meanwhile also the construction of barracks went forward under major cadell a british officer and the organization of the frontier force was begun not less than a third of this force was brought from sierra leone and the whole cadell fitted out with suits and caps stamped with the emblems of his britannic majesty's service he also persuaded the monrovia city government to let him act without compensation as chief of police and he likewise became street commissioner tax collector and city treasurer the liberian people naturally objected to the usurping of all these prerogatives but cadell refused to resign and presented a large bill for his services he also threatened violence to the president if his demands were not met within twenty-four hours then it was that the british warship the mutiny suddenly appeared at monrovia february twelfth nineteen o nine happily the liberians rose to the emergency they requested that any british soldiers at the barracks be withdrawn in order that they might be free to deal with the insurrectionary movement said to be there on the part of liberian soldiers and thus tactfully they brought about the withdrawal of major cadell by this time however the liberian commission to the united states had done its work and just three months after cadell's retirement the return american commission came after studying the situation it made the following recommendations that the united states extend its aid to liberia in the prompt settlement of pending boundary disputes that the united states enable liberia to refund its debt by assuming as a guarantee for the payment of obligation under such arrangement the control and collection of the liberian customs that the united states lend its assistance to the liberian government in the reform of its internal finances that the united states lend its aid to liberia in organizing and drilling an adequate constabulary or frontier police force that the united states establish and maintain a research station at liberia and that the united states reopen the question of establishing a coaling station in liberia under the fourth of these recommendations major now colonel charles young went to liberia where from time to time since he has rendered most efficient service arrangements were also made for a new loan one of one million seven hundred thousand dollars which was to be floated by banking institutions in the united states germany france and england and in nineteen twelve an american general receiver of customs and financial adviser to the republic of liberia with an assistant from each of the other three countries mentioned opened his office in monrovia it will be observed that a complicated and expensive receivership was imposed on the liberian people when an arrangement much more simple would have served the loan of one million seven hundred thousand dollars soon proving inadequate for any large development of the country negotiations were begun in nineteen eighteen for a new loan one of five million dollars among the things proposed were improvements on the harbor of monrovia some good roads through the country a hospital and the broadening of the work of education about the loan two facts were outstanding first any money to be spent would be spent wholly under american and not under liberian auspices and second to the liberians acceptance of the terms suggested meant practically a surrender of their sovereignty as american appointees were to be in most of the important positions in the country at the same time that upon themselves would fall the ultimate burden of the interest of the loan by the spring of nineteen twenty in liberia the commencement of the rainy season it was interesting to note that although the necessary measures of approval had not yet been passed by the liberian congress perhaps as many as fifteen american officials had come out to the country to begin work in education engineering and sanitation just a little later in the year president king called an extra session of the legislature to consider amendments while it was in session a cablegram from the united states was received saying that no amendments to the plan would be accepted and that it must be accepted as submitted or the friendly interests which had heretofore existed would become lessened the liberians were not frightened however and stood firm meanwhile a new presidential election took place in the united states there was to be a radical change in the government and the liberians were disposed to try further to see if some changes could not be made in the proposed arrangements most watchfully from month to month let it be remembered england and france were waiting and in any case it could easily be seen that as the republic approached its centennial it was face to face with political problems of the very first magnitude four economic and social conditions 
from what has been said it is evident that there is still much to be done in liberia along economic lines there has been some beginning in cooperative effort thus the balsa trading association is an organization for mutual betterment of perhaps as many as fifty responsible merchants and farmers the country has as yet nineteen twenty one however no railroads no street cars no public schools and no genuine newspapers nor are there any manufacturing or other enterprises for the employment of young men on a large scale the most promising youth accordingly look too largely to an outlet in politics some come to america to be educated and not always do they return a few become clerks in the stores and a very few assistants in the customs offices there is some excellent agriculture in the interior but as yet no means of getting produce to market on a large scale in nineteen nineteen the total customs revenue at monrovia the largest port amounted to one million ninety six thousand nine hundred and thirteen point twenty one dollars for the whole country the figure has recently been just about half a million dollars a year much of this amount goes to the maintenance of the frontier force within the last few years also the annual income of for the city of monrovia for the payment of the mayor the police and all other city officers has averaged six thousand dollars in any consideration of social conditions the first question of all of course is that of the character of the people themselves unfortunately liberia was begun with faulty ideals of life and work the early settlers frequently only recently out of bondage too often felt that in a state of freedom they did not have to work and accordingly they imitated the habits of the old master class of the south the real burden of life then fell upon the native there is still considerable feeling between the native and the americo liberian but more and more the wisest men of the country realize that the good of one is the good of all and they are endeavoring to make the native chiefs work for the common welfare from time to time the people of liberia have given to visitors an impression of arrogance and perhaps no one thing had led to more unfriendly criticism of this country than this the fact is that the liberians knowing that their country has various shortcomings according to western standards are quick to assume the defensive and one method of protecting themselves is by erecting a barrier of dignity and reserve one has only to go beyond this however to find the real heartbeat of the people the comparative isolation of the republic moreover and the general stress of living conditions have together given to the everyday life an undue seriousness of tone with a rather excessive emphasis on the church on politics and on secret societies in such an atmosphere boys and girls too soon became mature and for them especially one might wish to see a little more wholesome outdoor amusement in school or college catalogues one still sees much of jurisprudence and moral philosophy but little of physics or biology interestingly enough this whole system of education and life has not been without some elements of very genuine culture literature has been mainly in the diction of shakespeare and milton but shakespeare and milton though not of the twentieth century are still good models and because the officials have had to compose many state documents and deliver many formal addresses there has been developed in the country a tradition of good english speech a service in any one of the representative churches is dignified and impressive the churches and schools of liberia have been most largely in the hands of the methodists and the episcopalians though the baptists the presbyterians and the lutherans are well represented the lutherans have penetrated to a point in the interior beyond that attained by any other denomination the episcopalians have excelled others even the methodists by having more constant and efficient oversight of their work the episcopalians have in liberia a little more than forty schools nearly half of these being boarding schools with a total attendance of two thousand the methodists have slightly more than thirty schools with two thousand five hundred pupils the lutherans and their five mission stations have twenty american workers and three hundred pupils well it seems from these figures that the number of those reached is small in proportion to the outlay it must be remembered that a mission school becomes a centre from which influence radiates in all directions while the enterprise of the denominational institutions cannot be doubted it may well be asked if in so largely relieving the people of the burden of the education of their children they are not unduly cultivating a spirit of dependence rather than of self-help something of this point of view was emphasized by the secretary of public instruction mr walter f walker in an address liberia and her educational problems 
delivered in chicago in nineteen sixteen said he of the day schools maintained by the churches these day schools did invaluable service in the days of the colony and commonwealth and indeed in the early days of the republic but to their continuation must undoubtedly be ascribed the tardy recognition of the government and people of the fact that no agency for the education of the masses is as effective as the public school there is not one public school building owned by the government or by any city or township it might further be said that just now in liberia there is no institution that is primarily doing college work two schools in monrovia however call for special remark the college of west africa formerly monrovia seminary was founded by the methodist church in eighteen thirty nine the institution does elementary and lower high school work though some years ago it placed a little more emphasis on college work than it has been able to do within recent years it was of this college that the late bishop a p Dempfer served so ably as president for twelve years within recent years it has recognized the importance of industrial work and has had in all departments an average annual enrollment of three hundred not quite so prominent within the last few years but with more tradition and theoretically at the head of the educational system of the republic is the liberia college in eighteen forty eight simon greenleaf of boston received from john payne a missionary at cape palmas a request for his assistance in building a theological school out of this suggestion grew the board of trustees of donations for education in liberia incorporated in massachusetts in march eighteen fifty the next year the liberia legislature incorporated the liberia college it being understood that the institution would emphasize academic as well as theological subjects in eighteen fifty seven ex-president j j roberts was elected president he superintended the erection of a large building and in eighteen sixty two the college was opened for work since then it has had a very uneven existence sometimes enrolling aside from its preparatory department twenty or thirty college students then again having no college students at all within the last few years as the old building was completely out of repair the school has had to seek temporary quarters it is too vital to the country to be allowed to languish however and it is to be hoped that it may soon be well started upon a new career of usefulness in the course of its history the liberia college has had connected with it some very distinguished men famous as teacher and lecturer and president from eighteen eighty one to eighteen eighty five was edward wilmot blyden generally regarded as the foremost scholar that western africa has given to the world closely associated with him in the early years and well known in america as in africa was alexander crummell who brought to his teaching the richness of english university training a trustee for a number of years was samuel david ferguson of the protestant episcopal church who served with great dignity and resource as missionary bishop of the country from eighteen eighty four until his death in nineteen sixteen a new president of the college rev nathaniel h b cassell was elected in nineteen eighteen and it is expected that under his efficient direction the school will go forward to still greater years of service important in connection with the study of the social conditions in liberia is that of health and living conditions one who lives in america and knows that africa is a land of unbounded riches can hardly understand the extent to which the west coast has been exploited or the suffering that is there just now the distress is most acute in the english colonies and as liberia is so close to sierra leone and the gold coast much of the same situation prevails there in monrovia the only bank is the branch of the bank of british west africa in the branches of this great institution all along the coast as a result of the war gold disappeared silver became very scarce and the common form of currency became paper notes issued in denomination as low as one and two shillings these the natives have refused to accept they go even further rather than bring their produce to the towns and receive a paper for it they will not come at all in Morovia, an effort was made to introduce the British West Africa paper currency, and while this failed, more and more the merchants insisted on being paid in silver, nor in an, an ordinary purchase would silver be given in change on an English ten shilling note. Prices accordingly became exorbitant, children were not properly nourished, and the infant mortality grew to astonishing proportions, nor were conditions made better by the lack of sanitation and by the prevalence of disease. Happily, relief for these conditions, for some of them at least, seems to be in sight and it is expected that before very long a hospital will be erected in monrovia one or two reflections suggest themselves it has been said that the circumstances under which liberia was founded led to a despising of industrial effort the country is now quite awake however to the advantages of industrial and agricultural enterprise a matter of supreme importance is that of the relation of the americo-liberian to the native 
this will work itself out for the native is the country's chief asset for the future in general the republic needs a few visible evidences of twentieth century standards of progress two or three high schools and hospitals built on the american plan would work wonders finally let it not be forgotten that upon the american negro rests the obligation to do whatever he can to help to develop the country if he will but firmly clasp hands with his brother across the sea a new day will dawn for american negro and liberian alike End of section fifteen section sixteen of the social history of the american negro by benjamin griffith brawley this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter ten part one the negro a national issue one current tendencies it is evident from what has been said already that the idea of the negro current about eighteen thirty in the united states was not very exalted it was seriously questioned if he was really a human being the doctors of divinity learnedly expounded the cursed b canaan passage as applying to him a prominent physician of mobile gave it as his opinion that the brain of the negro when compared with the caucasian is smaller by a tenth and the intellect is wanting in the same proportion and finally asserted that negroes could not live in the north because a cold climate so freezes their brains as to make them insane about mulattoes like many others he stretched his imagination marvellously they were incapable of undergoing fatigue the women were very delicate and subject to all sorts of diseases and they did not beget children as readily as either black women or white women in fact said not between the ages of twenty-five and forty mulattoes died ten times as fast as either white or black people between forty and fifty-five fifty times as fast and between fifty-five and seventy one hundred times as fast to such opinions was now added one of the greatest misfortunes that have befallen the negro race in its entire history in america burlesque on the stage when in sixteen ninety six thomas southern adapted orinoco from the novel of mrs Afrobane, and presented in london the story of the african prince who was stolen from his native angola no one saw any reason why the negro should not be a subject for serious treatment on the stage and the play was a great success lasting for decades in seventeen sixty eight however it was presented at drury lane a comic opera the padlock and a very prominent character was mungo the slave of a west indian planter who got drunk in the second act and was profane throughout the performance in the course of the evening mungo entertained the audience with such lines as the following dear heart what a terrible life i am led a dog has a better that's sheltered and fed night and day tis the same my pain is their game me wish to de lord me was dead what is to be done poor black must run mungo here mungo dare mungo everywhere above and below sir come sir go do so and do so oh oh me wish to de lord me was dead the depreciation of the race that mungo started continued and when in seventeen eighty one robinson crusoe was given as a pantomime at drury lane friday was represented as a negro the exact origins of negro minstrelsy are not altogether clear there have been many claimants and it is interesting to note in passing that there was an african company playing in new york in the early twenties though this was probably nothing more 
than a small group of amateurs whatever may have been the beginning it was thomas d rice who brought the form to genuine popularity in louisville in the summer of eighteen twenty eight looking from one of the back windows of the theatre he was attracted by an old and decrepit slave who did odd jobs about a livery stable the slave's master was named crow and he calls himself jim crow his right shoulder was drawn up high and his left leg was stiff at the knee but he took his deformity lightly singing as he worked he had one favorite tune to which he had fitted words of his own and at the end of each verse he made a ludicrous step which in time came to be known as rocking the heel his refrain consisted of the words wheel about turn about do just so and every time i wheel about i jump jim crow rice who was a clever and versatile performer caught the air made up like the negro and in the course of the next season introduced jim crow and his step to the stage and so successful was he in his performance that on his first night in the part he was encored twenty times rice had many imitators among the white comedians of the country some of whom indeed claimed priority in opening up the new field and along with their burlesque these men actually touched upon the possibilities of plaintive negro melodies which they of course capitalized in new york late in eighteen forty two four men dan emmett frank brower billy whitlock and dick pelham practiced together with fiddle and banjo bones and tambourine and thus was born the first company the virginia minstrels which made its formal debut in new york february seventeenth eighteen forty three its members produced in connection with their work all sorts of popular songs one of emmett's being dixie which introduced by mrs john wood in a burlesque in new orleans at the outbreak of the civil war leaped into popularity and became the war song of the confederacy companies multiplied apace christie's minstrels claimed priority to the company already mentioned but did not actually enter upon its new york career until eighteen forty six bryant's minstrels and buckley's new orleans serenaders were only two others of the most popular aggregations featuring and burlesquing the negro in a social history of the negro in america however it is important to observe in passing that already even in burlesque the negro element was beginning to enthrall the popular mind about the same time as minstrelsy also developed the habit of belittling the race by making the name of some prominent and worthy negro a term of contempt thus cuffy corrupted from paul cuff now came into widespread use this was not all it was now that the sinister crime of lynching raised its head in defiance of all law at first used as a form of punishment for outlaws and gamblers it soon came to be applied especially to negroes one was burned alive near greenville south carolina in eighteen twenty five in may eighteen thirty five two were burned near mobile for the murder of two children and for the years between eighteen twenty three and eighteen sixty not less than fifty six cases of the lynching of negroes have been ascertained though no one will ever know how many lost their lives without leaving any record certainly more men were executed illegally than legally thus of forty-six recorded murders by negroes of owners or overseers between eighteen fifty and eighteen sixty twenty resulted in legal execution and twenty-six in lynching violent crimes against white women were not relatively any more numerous than now but those that occurred or were attempted received swift punishment thus of seventeen cases of rape in the ten years last mentioned negroes were legally executed in five and lynched in twelve extraordinary attention was attracted by the burning in st louis 
in eighteen thirty five of an man named mackintosh who had killed an officer who was trying to arrest him this event came in the midst of a period of great agitation and it was for denouncing this lynching that elijah p lovejoy had his printing office destroyed in st louis and was forced to remove to alton illinois where his press was three times destroyed and where he finally met death at the hands of a mob while trying to protect his property november seventh eighteen thirty seven judge lawless defended the lynching and even william ellery channing took a compromising view abraham lincoln however then a very young man in an address on the perpetuation of our political institutions at springfield january twenty seventh eighteen thirty seven said accounts of outrages committed by mobs form the everyday news of the times they have pervaded the country from new england to louisiana they are neither peculiar to the eternal snows of the former nor the burning suns of the latter they are not the creatures of climate neither are they confined to the slaveholding or the non-slaveholding states turn to that horror-striking scene at st louis a single victim only was sacrificed there this story is very short and is perhaps the most highly tragic of anything that has ever been witnessed in real life a mulatto man by the name of mackintosh was seized in the street dragged to the suburbs of the city chained to a tree and actually burned to death and all within a single hour from the time he had been a free man attending to his own business and at peace with the world such are the effects of mob law and such are the scenes becoming more and more frequent in this land so lately famed for love of law and order and the stories of which have even now grown too familiar to attract anything more than an idle remark all the while flagrant crimes were committed against negro women and girls and freemen in the border states were constantly being dragged into slavery by kidnappers two typical cases will serve for illustration george jones a respectable man of new york was in eighteen thirty six arrested on broadway on the pretext that he had committed assault and battery he refused to go with his captors for he knew that he had done nothing to warrant such a charge but he finally yielded on the assurance of his employer that everything possible would be done for him he was placed in the bridewell and a few minutes afterwards taken before a magistrate to his satisfaction he was proved to be a slave thus in less than two hours after his arrest he was hurried away by the kidnappers whose word had been accepted as sufficient evidence and he had not been permitted to secure a single friendly witness solomon northrop who afterwards wrote on an account of his experiences was a free man who lived in saratoga and made his living by working about the hotels where in the evenings he often played the violin at parties one day two men supposedly managers of a travelling circus company met him and offered him good pay if he would go with them as a violinist to washington he consented and some mornings afterwards awoke to find himself in a slave pen in the capital how he got there was ever a mystery to him but evidently he had been drugged he was taken south and sold to a hard master with whom he remained twelve years before he was able to effect his release in the south any free negro who entertained a runaway might himself become a slave thus in south carolina in eighteen twenty seven a free woman with her three children suffered this penalty because she gave succor to two homeless and fugitive children six and nine years old day by day moreover from the capital of the nation went on the internal slave trade when by one means and another a dealer had gathered twenty or more likely young negro men and girls he would bring them forth from their cells would huddle the women and young children into a cart or wagon would handcuff the men in pairs the right hand of one to the left hand of another make the handcuffs fast to a long chain which passed between each pair of slaves and would start his procession southward 
it is not strange that several of the unfortunate people committed suicide one distracted mother about to be separated from her loved ones dumbfounded the nation by hurling herself from the window of a prison in the capital on the sabbath day and dying in the street below meanwhile even in the free states the disabilities of the negro continued in general he was denied the elective franchise the right of petition the right to enter public conveyances or places of amusement and he was driven into a status of contempt by being shut out from the army and the militia he had to face all sorts of impediments in getting education or in pursuing honest industry he had nothing whatever to do with the administration of justice and generally he was subject to insult and outrage one might have supposed that on all this proscription and denial of the ordinary rights of human beings the christian church would have taken a positive stand unfortunately as so often happens it was on the side of property and vested interest rather than on that of the oppressed we have already seen that southern divines held slaves and countenanced the system and by eighteen forty james g burney had abundant material for his indictment the american churches the bulwarks of american slavery he showed among other things that while in seventeen eighty the methodist episcopal church had opposed slavery and in seventeen eighty four had given a slaveholder one month to repent or withdraw from its conferences by eighteen thirty six it had so drifted away from its original position as to disclaim any right wish or intention to interfere in the civil and political relation between master and slave as it existed in the slaveholding states of the union meanwhile in the churches of the north there was the most insulting discrimination in the baptist church in hartford the pews for negroes were boarded up in front and in stonington connecticut the floor was cut out of a negro's pew by order of the church authorities in boston in a church that did not welcome and that made little provision for negroes a consecrated deacon invited into his own pew some negro people whereupon he lost the right to hold a pew in his church he decided that there should be some place where there might be more freedom of thought and genuine christianity he brought others into the plan and the effort that he put forth resulted in what has since become the tremont temple baptist church into all this proscription burlesque and crime and denial of the fundamental principles of christianity suddenly came the program of the abolitionists and it spoke with tongues of fire and had all the vigor and force of a crusade to the challenge of the abolitionists the great difference between the early abolition societies which resulted in the american convention and the later anti-slavery movement of which garrison was the representative figure was the difference between a humanitarian impulse tempered by expediency and one that had all the power of a direct challenge before eighteen thirty one in the south the societies were more numerous the members no less earnest and the hatred of slavery no less bitter yet the conciliation and persuasion so noticeable in the earlier period in twenty years accomplished practically nothing either in legislation or or in the education of public sentiment while gradual changes in economic conditions at the south caused the question to grow more difficult moreover the evidence of open-mindedness cannot stand against the many instances of absolute refusal to permit argument against slavery in the colonial congress in the confederation in the constitutional convention in the state ratifying conventions in the early congresses there were many vehement denunciations of anything which seemed to have an anti-slavery tendency and wholesale suspicion of the north at all times when the subject was opened one cannot forget the effort of james g burney or that benjamin lundy's work was most largely done in what we should now call the south or that between eighteen fifteen and eighteen twenty eight at least four journals which avowed the extinction of slavery as one if not the chief one of their objects were published in the southern states only gradual emancipation however found any real support in the south and as compared with the work of garrison even that of lundy appears in the distance with something of the mildness of sweetness and light even before the rise of garrison robert james turnbull 
of south carolina under the name of brutus wrote a virulent attack on anti-slavery and representative drayton of the same state speaking in congress in eighteen twenty eight said much as we love our country we would rather see our cities in flames our plains drenched in blood rather endure all the calamities of civil war than parley for an instant upon the right of any power than our own to interfere with the regulation of our slaves more and more if this was to be the real sentiment of the south in the face of this kind of eloquence and passion mere academic discussion was powerless the liberator was begun january one eighteen thirty one the next year garrison was the leading spirit in the formation of the new england anti-slavery society and in december eighteen thirty three in philadelphia the american anti-slavery society was organized in large measure these organizations were an outgrowth of the great liberal and humanitarian spirit that by eighteen thirty had become manifest in both europe and america hugo and manzini byron and macaulay had all now appeared upon the scene and romanticism was regnant james montgomery and william faber wrote their hymns and reginald heber went as a missionary bishop to india forty years afterwards the french revolution was bearing fruit france herself had a new revolution in eighteen thirty and in this same year the kingdom of belgium was born in england there was the remarkable reign of william the fourth which within the short space of seven years summed up in legislation reforms that had been agitated for decades in eighteen thirty two came the great reform bill in eighteen thirty three the abolition of slavery in english dominions and in eighteen thirty four a revision of factory legislation and the poor law charles dickens and elizabeth barrett browning began to be heard and in eighteen thirty four came to america george thompson a powerful and refined speaker who had had much to do with the english agitation against slavery the young republic of the united states lusty and self-confident was seething with new thought in new england the humanitarian movement that so largely began with the unitarianism of channing ran through its later phase in transcendentalism and spent its last strength in the anti-slavery agitation and the enthusiasms of the civil war the movement was contemporary with the preaching of many novel gospels in religion in sociology in science education and medicine new sects were formed like the universalists the spiritualists the second adventists the mormons and the shakers some of which believed in trances and miracles others in the quick coming of christ and still others in the reorganization of society and the pseudo-sciences like mesmerism and phrenology had numerous followers the ferment has long since subsided and much that was then seething has since gone off in vapor but when all that was spurious has been rejected we find that the general impulse was but a new baptism of the old puritan spirit transcendentalism appealed to the private consciousness as the sole standard of truth and right with kindred movements it served to quicken the ethical sense of a nation that was fast becoming materialistic and to nerve it for the conflict that sooner or later had to come in his salutatory editorial garrison said with reference to his position in park street church on the fourth of july eighteen twenty nine in an address on slavery i unreflectingly assented to the popular but pernicious doctrine of gradual abolition i seized this opportunity to make a full and unequivocal recantation and thus publicly to ask pardon of my god of my country and of my brethren the poor slaves for having uttered a sentiment so full of timidity injustice and absurdity i am aware that many object to the severity of my language but is there not cause for severity i will be as harsh as truth and as uncompromising as justice on this subject i do not wish to think or speak or write with moderation no no tell a man whose house is on fire to give a moderate alarm tell him to moderately rescue his wife from the hands of the ravisher tell the mother to gradually extricate her babe from the fire into which it has fallen but urge me not to use moderation in a cause like the present i am in earnest i will not equivocate i will not excuse i will not retreat a single inch and i will be heard
with something of the egotism that comes of courage in a holy cause he said on this question my influence humble as it is is felt at this moment to a considerable extent and shall be felt in coming years not perniciously but beneficially not as a curse but as a blessing and posterity will bear testimony that i was right all the while in speaking to the negro people themselves garrison endeavored to beckon them to the highest possible ground of personal and racial self-respect especially did he advise them to seek the virtues of education and cooperation said he to them support each other when i say support each other i mean sell to each other and buy of each other in preference to the whites this is a duty the whites do not trade with you why should you give them your patronage if one of your number opens a little shop do not pass it by to give your money to a white shopkeeper if any has a trade employ him as often as possible if any is a good teacher send your children to him and be proud that he is one of your color maintain your rights in all cases and at whatever expense wherever you are allowed to vote see that your names are put on the lists of voters and go to the polls if you are not strong enough to choose a man of your own color give your votes to those who are friendly to your cause but if possible elect intelligent and respectable colored men i do not despair of seeing the time when our state and national assemblies will contain a fair proportion of colored representatives especially if the proposed college at new haven goes into successful operation will you despair now so many champions are coming to your help and the trump of jubilee is sounding long and loud when is heard a voice from the east a voice from the west a voice from the north a voice from the south crying liberty and equality now liberty and equality for ever will you despair seeing truth and justice and mercy and god and christ and the holy ghost are on your side oh no never never despair of the complete attainment of your rights to second such sentiments rose a remarkable group of men and women among them elijah p lovejoy wendell phillips theodore parker john greenleaf whittier lydia maria child samuel j may william j charles sumner henry ward beecher harriet beecher stowe and john brown phillips the plume knight of the cause closed his law office because he was not willing to swear that he would support the constitution he relinquished the franchise because he did not wish to have any responsibility for a government that countenanced slavery and he lost sympathy with the christian church because of its compromising attitude garrison himself termed the constitution a covenant with death and an agreement with hell lydia maria child in eighteen thirty three published an appeal in favor of that class of americans called africans and wrote or edited numerous other books for the cause while the anti-slavery poems of whittier are now a part of the main stream of american literature the abolitionists repelled many conservative men by their refusal to countenance any laws that recognized slavery but they gained force when congress denied them the right of petition and when president jackson refused them the use of the mails there could be no question as to the directness of their attack they held up the slaveholder to scorn they gave thousands of examples of the inhumanity of the system of slavery publishing scores and even hundreds of tracts and pamphlets they called the attention of america to the slave who for running away was for five days buried in the ground up to his chin with his arms tied behind him to women who were whipped because they did not breed fast enough or would not yield to the lust of planters or overseers to men who were tied to be whipped and then left bleeding or who were branded with hot irons or forced to wear iron yokes and clogs and bells to the presbyterian preacher in georgia who tortured a slave until he died to a woman in new jersey who was bound to a log and scored with a knife in a shocking manner across her back and the gaseous stuff was salt after which she was tied to a post in a cellar where after suffering three days death kindly terminated her misery and finally to the fact that even when slaves were dead they were not left in peace as a south carolina medical college in charleston advertised that the bodies were used for dissection in the face of such an indictment the south appeared more injured and innocent than ever and said that evils had been greatly exaggerated perhaps in some instances they were but the south and everybody also knew that no pen could nearly do justice to some of the things that were possible under the iniquitous and abominable system of american slavery the abolitionists however did not stop with a mere attack on slavery 
not satisfied with the mere enumeration of examples of negro achievement they made even higher claims in behalf of the people now oppressed said alexander h everett we are sometimes told that all these efforts will be unavailing that the african is a degraded member of the human family that a man with a dark skin and curled hair is necessarily as such incapable of improvement and civilization and condemned by the vice of his physical conformation to vegetate forever in a state of hopeless barbarism i reject with contempt and indignation this miserable heresy in replying to it the friends of truth and humanity have not hitherto done justice to the argument in order to prove that the blacks were capable of intellectual efforts they have painfully collected a few specimens of what some of them have done in this way even in the degraded condition which they occupy at present in christendom this is not the way to treat the subject go back to an earlier period in the history of our race see what the blacks were and what they did three thousand years ago in the period of their greatness and glory when they occupied the forefront in the march of civilization when they constituted in fact the whole civilized world of their time trace this very civilization of which we are so proud to its origin and see where you will find it we received it from our european ancestors they had it from the greeks and romans and the jews but sir where did the greeks and the romans and the jews get it they derived it from ethiopia and egypt and were brought from africa the ruins of the egyptian temples laugh to scorn the architectural monuments of any other part of the world they will be what they are now the delight and admiration of travellers from all quarters when the grass is growing on the sites of st peter's and st paul's the present pride of rome and london it seems therefore that for this very civilization of which we are so proud and which is the only ground of our present claim of superiority we are indebted to the ancestors of these very blacks whom we are pleased to consider as naturally incapable of civilization in adherence to their convictions the abolitionists were now to give a demonstration of faith in humanity such as has never been surpassed except by jesus christ himself they believed in the negro even before the negro had learned to believe in himself acting on their doctrine of equal rights they travelled with their negro friends sat upon the same platforms with them ate with them and in one enthusiastic abolitionist white couple adopted a negro child garrison appealed to posterity he has most certainly been justified by time compared with his high stand for the right the opportunism of such a man as clay shrivels into nothingness within recent years a distinguished american scholar writing of the principles for which he and his co-workers stood has said the race question transcends any academic inquiry as to what ought to have been done in eighteen sixty six it affects the north as well as the south it touches the daily life of all of our citizens individually politically humanly it moulds the child's conception of democracy it tests the faith of the adult it is by no means an american problem only what is going on in our states north and south is only a local phase of a world problem now whittier's opinions upon that world problem are unmistakable he believed quite literally that all men are brothers that oppression of one man or one race degrades the whole human family and that there should be the fullest equality of opportunity that a mere difference in color should close the door of civil industrial and political hope upon any individual was a hateful thing to the quaker poet the whole body of his verse is a protest against the assertion of race pride against the emphasis upon racial differences to whittier there was no such thing as a white man's civilization the only distinction was between civilization and barbarism he had faith in education and equality before the law in freedom of opportunity and in the ultimate triumph of brotherhood they are rising all are rising the black and white together this faith is at once too sentimental and too dogmatic to suit those persons who have exalted economic efficiency into a fetish and who have talked loudly at times though rather less loudly since the russo japanese war about the white man's task of governing the backward races but whatever progress has been made by the american negro since the civil war in self-respect to moral and intellectual development and for that matter in economic efficiency has been due to fidelity to those principles which whittier and other like-minded men and women long ago enunciated the immense tasks which still remain alike for 
higher and for lower races can be worked out by following whittier's program if they can be worked out at all end of section sixteen section seventeen of a social history of the american negro by benjamin griffith brawley this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter ten part two three the contest even before the abolitionists became aggressive a test law had been passed the discussion of which did much to prepare for their coming immediately after the denmark v c insurrection the south carolina legislature voted that the moment that a vessel entered a port in the state with a free negro or person of color on board he should be seized even if he was the cook the steward or a mariner or if he was a citizen of another state or country the sheriff was to board the vessel take the negro to jail and detain him there until the vessel was actually ready to leave the master of the ship was then to pay for the detention of the negro and take him away or pay a fine of one thousand dollars and see the negro sold as a slave within a short time after this enactment was passed as many as forty-one vessels were deprived of one or more hands from one british trading vessel almost the entire crew being taken the captains appealed to the judge of the united states district court who with alacrity turned the matter over to the state courts now followed much legal proceeding with an appeal to higher authorities in the course of which both canning and adams were forced to consider the question and it was generally recognized that the act violated both the treaty with great britain and the power of congress to regulate trade to all of this south carolina replied that as a sovereign state she had the right to interdict the entry of foreigners that in fact she had been a sovereign state at the time of her entrance into the union and that she never had surrendered the right to exclude free negroes finally she asserted that if a dissolution of the union must be the alternative she was quite prepared to abide by the result unusual excitement arose soon afterwards when four free negroes on a british ship were seized by the sheriff and dragged from the deck the captain had to go to heavy expense to have these men released and on reaching liverpool he appealed to the board of trade the british minister now sent a more vigorous protest adams referred the same to wirt the attorney-general and wirt was forced to declare south carolina's act unconstitutional and void his opinion with a copy of the british protest adams sent to the governor of the state who immediately transmitted the same to the legislature each branch of the legislature passed resolutions which the other would not accept but neither voted to repeal the law in fact to remain technically in force until the civil war in eighteen forty four massachusetts sent samuel hoare as a commissioner to charleston to make a test case of a negro who had been deprived of his rights hoare cited article two section two of the national constitution the citizens of each state shall be entitled to all the privileges and immunities of citizens in the several states intending ultimately to bring a case before the united states supreme court when he appeared however the south carolina legislature voted that this agent comes here not as a citizen of the united states but as an emissary of a foreign government hostile to our domestic institutions and with the sole purpose of subverting our internal police hoare was at length notified that his life was in danger and he was forced to leave the state meanwhile southern sentiment against the american colonization society had crystallized and the excitement raised by david walker's appeal was exceeded only by that occasion by nat turner's insurrection when then the abolitionists began their campaign the country was already ripe for a struggle and in the north as well as the south there was plenty of sentiment unfavorable to the negro in july eighteen thirty one when an attempt was made to start a manual training school for negro youth in new haven the citizens at a public meeting declared that the founding of colleges for educating colored people is an unwarrantable and dangerous interference with the internal concerns of other states and ought to be discouraged and they ultimately forced the project to be abandoned at canterbury in the same state prudence crandall a young quaker woman twenty-nine years of age was brought face to face with the problem when she admitted a negro girl sarah harris to her school when she was boycotted she announced that she would receive negro girls only if no others would attend and she advertised accordingly in the liberator 
she was subjected to various indignities and efforts were made to arrest her pupils as vagrants as she was still undaunted her opponents on may twenty fourth eighteen thirty three procured a special act of the legislature forbidding under severe penalties the instruction of any negro from outside the state without the consent of the town authorities under this act miss crandall was arrested and imprisoned being confined to a cell which had just been vacated by a murderer the abolitionists came to her defence but she was convicted and though the higher courts quashed the proceedings on technicalities the village shopkeepers refused to sell her food manure was thrown into her well her house was pelted with rotten eggs and at last demolished and even the meeting-house in the town was closed to her the attempt to continue the school was then abandoned in eighteen thirty four an academy was built by subscription in canaan new hampshire it was granted a charter by the legislature and the proprietors determined to admit all applicants having suitable moral and intellectual recommendations without other distinctions the town meeting viewed with abhorrence the attempt to establish the school but when it was opened twenty-eight white and fourteen negro scholars attended the town meeting then ordered that the academy be forcibly removed and appointed a committee to execute the mandate accordingly on august tenth three hundred men with two hundred oxen assembled took the edifice from its place dragged it for some distance and left it a ruin from eighteen thirty four to eighteen thirty six in fact throughout the country from east to west swept a wave of violence not less than twenty-five attempts were made to break up anti-slavery meetings in new york in october eighteen thirty three there was a riot in clinton hall and from july seven to eleven of the next year a succession of riots led to the sacking of the house of lewis tappan and the destruction of other houses and churches when george thompson arrived from england in september eighteen thirty four his meetings were constantly disturbed and garrison himself was mobbed in boston in eighteen thirty five being dragged through the streets with a rope around his body in general the abolitionists were charged by the south with promoting both insurrection and the amalgamation of the races there was no clear proof of these charges nevertheless may said if we do not emancipate our slaves by our own moral energy they will emancipate themselves and that by a process too horrible to contemplate and channing said allowing that amalgamation is to be anticipated then i maintain we have no right to resist it then it is not unnatural while the south grew hysterical at the thought it was as hart remarks a fair inquiry which the abolitionists did not hesitate to put who was responsible for the only amalgamation that had so far taken place after a few years there was a cleavage among the abolitionists some of the more practical men like bernie jarrett smith and the tappans who believed in fighting through governmental machinery in eighteen thirty eight broke away from the others and prepared to take a part in federal politics this was the beginning of the liberty party which nominated bernie for the presidency in eighteen forty and again in eighteen forty four in eighteen forty eight it became merged in the free soil party and ultimately in the republican party with the forties came division in the church a sort of prelude to the great events that were to thunder through the country within the next two decades could the church really countenance slavery could a bishop hold a slave these were to become burning questions in eighteen forty four to five the baptists of the north and east refused to approve the sending out of missionaries who owned slaves and the southern baptist convention resulted in eighteen forty four when james o andrew came into the possession of slaves by his marriage to a widow who had these as a legacy from her former husband the northern methodists refused to grant that one of their bishops might hold a slave in the methodist episcopal church south was formally organized in louisville the following year the presbyterians and the episcopalians more aristocratic in tone did not divide the great events of the annexation of texas with the mexican war that resulted the compromise of eighteen fifty with the fugitive slave law the kansas nebraska bill of eighteen fifty four and the dred scott decision of eighteen fifty seven were all regarded in the north as successive steps in the campaign of slavery though now in the perspective they appear as vain efforts to beat back a resistless tide in the mexican war it was freely urged by the mexicans that should the american line break their host would soon find itself among the rich cities of the south where perhaps it could not only exact money but free two million slaves as well call to its assistance 
the indians and even draw aid from the abolitionists in the north nothing of all this was to be out of the academic shades of harvard however at last came a tongue of flame in the present crisis james russell lowell produced lines whose tremendous beat was like a stirring call of the whole country to duty once to every man and nation comes the moment to decide in the strife of truth with falsehood for the good or evil side some great cause god's new messiah offering each the bloomer blight parts the goats upon the left hand or the sheep upon the right and the choice goes by forever twixt that darkness and that light then to side with truth is noble when we share her wretched crust ere her cause bring fame and profit and tis prosperous to be just then it is the brave man chooses while the coward stands aside doubting in his abject spirit till his lord is crucified and the multitude make virtue of the faith they had denied new occasions teach new duties time makes ancient good uncouth they must upward still and onward who would keep abreast of truth lo before us gleam her campfires we ourselves must pilgrims be launch our mayflower and steer boldly through the desperate winter sea nor attempt the future's portal with the past blood-rusted key as the present crisis came after the mexican war so after the new fugitive slave law appeared uncle tom's cabin eighteen fifty two when despairing hungarian fugitives made their way against all the search warrants and authorities of their lawful governments to america press and political cabinet ring with applause and welcome when despairing african fugitives do the same thing it is what is it asked harriet beecher stowe and in her remarkable book she proceeded to show the injustice of the national position uncle tom's cabin has frequently been termed a piece of propaganda they gave an overdrawn picture of southern conditions the author however had abundant proof for her incidents and she was quite aware of the fact that the problem of the negro north as well as south transcended the question of slavery said st clair to ophelia if we emancipate are you willing to educate how many families of your town would take in a negro man or woman teach them bear with them and seek to make them christians how many merchants would take adolf if i wanted to make him a clerk or mechanics if i wanted to teach him a trade if i wanted to put jane and rosa to school how many schools are there in the northern states that would take them in we are in a bad position we are the more obvious oppressors of the negro but the unchristian prejudice of the north is an oppressor almost equally severe meanwhile the thrilling work of the underground railroad was answered by a practical reopening of the slave trade from eighteen twenty to eighteen forty as a result of the repressive measure of eighteen nineteen the traffic had declined between eighteen fifty and eighteen sixty however it was greatly revived and southern conventions resolved that all laws state or federal prohibiting the slave trade should be repealed the traffic became more and more open and defiant until as stephen a douglas computed as many as fifteen thousand slaves were brought into the country in eighteen fifty nine it was not until the lincoln government in eighteen sixty two hanged the first traitor who ever suffered the extreme penalty of the law and made with great britain a treaty embodying the principle of international right of search that the trade was effectually checked by the end of the war it was entirely suppressed though as late as eighteen sixty six a squadron of ships patrolled the slave coast the kansas nebraska bill repealing the missouri compromise and providing for a squatter of sovereignty in the territories in question outraged the north and led immediately to the forming of the republican party it was not long before public sentiment began to make itself felt and the first demonstration took place in boston anthony burns was a slave who escaped from virginia made his way to boston where he was at work in the winter of eighteen fifty three to four he was discovered by a united states marshal who presented a writ for his arrest just at the time of the repeal of the missouri compromise in may eighteen fifty four public feeling became greatly aroused wendell phillips and theodore parker delivered strong addresses at a meeting at Fenuya hall while an unsuccessful attempt to rescue burns from the courthouse was made under the leadership of thomas wentworth higginson who with others of the attacking party was wounded it was finally decided in court that burns must be returned to his master the law was obeyed but boston had been made very angry and generally her feeling had counted for something in the history of the country the people draped their houses in mourning 
hits the procession that took burns to his ship and at the wharf a riot was averted only by a minister's call to prayer this incident did more to crystallize northern sentiment against slavery than any other except the exploit of john brown and this was the last time that a fugitive slave was taken out of boston burns himself was afterwards bought by popular subscription and ultimately became a baptist minister in canada in eighteen thirty four dr emerson an army officer stationed in missouri removed to illinois taking with him his slave dred scott two years later again accompanied by scott he went to minnesota in illinois slavery was prohibited by state law and minnesota was a free territory in eighteen thirty eight emerson returned with scott to missouri after a while the slave raised the important question had not his residence outside of a slave state made him a free man beaten by his master in eighteen forty eight with the aid of anti-slavery lawyers scott brought a suit against him for assault and battery the circuit court of st louis rendering a decision in his favor emerson appealed in eighteen fifty two the supreme court of the state reversed the decision of the lower court not long after this emerson sold scott to a citizen of new york named sanford scott now brought suit against sanford on the ground that they were citizens of different states the case finally reached the supreme court of the united states which in eighteen fifty seven handed down the decision that scott was not a citizen of missouri and had no standing in the federal courts that a slave was only a piece of property and that a master might take his property with impunity to any place within the jurisdiction of the united states the ownership of scott and his family soon passed to a massachusetts family by whom they were liberated but the important decision that the case had called forth aroused the most intense excitement throughout the country and somehow out of it all people remembered more than anything else the amazing declaration of chief justice taney that the negroes were so far inferior that they had no rights which the white man was bound to respect the extra legal character and the general fallacy of his position were exposed by justice curtis in a masterly dissenting opinion no one incident of the period showed more clearly the tension under which the country was laboring than the assault on charles sumner by preston s brooks a congressional representative from south carolina as a result of this regrettable occurrence splendid canes with such inscriptions as hit him again and used knock-down arguments were sent to brooks from different parts of the south and he was triumphantly re-elected by his constituency while on the other hand resolutions denouncing him were passed all over the north in canada and even in europe more than ever the south was thrown on the defensive and in impassioned speeches robert toombs now glorified his state in his section speaking at emory college in eighteen fifty three he had already made an extended apology for slavery speaking in the georgia legislature on the eve of secession he contended that the south had been driven to bay by the abolitionists and must now expand or perish a writer in the southern literary messenger in an article the black race in north america made the astonishing statement that the slavery of the black race on this continent is the price america has paid for her liberty civil and religious and humanly speaking these blessings would have been unattainable without their aid benjamin m palmer a distinguished minister of new orleans in a widely quoted sermon in eighteen sixty spoke of the peculiar trust that had been given to the south to be the guardians of the slaves the conservers of the world's industry and the defenders of the cause of religion the blooms upon southern fields gathered by black hands have fed the spindles and looms of manchester and birmingham not less than of lawrence and lowell strike now a blow at this system of labor and the world itself totters at the stroke shall we permit that blow to fall do we not owe it to civilized man to stand in the breach and stay the uplifted arm this trust we will discharge in the face of the worst possible peril though war be the aggregation of all evils yet should the madness of the hour appeal to the arbitration of the sword we will not shrink even from the baptism of fire the possession of the south is at this moment sublime if she is grace given her to know her hour she will save herself the country and the world all of this was very earnest and very eloquent but also very mistaken and the general fallacy of the south's position was shown by no less a man than he who afterwards became vice-president of the confederacy speaking in the georgia legislature in opposition to the motion for secession 
stephen said that the south had no reason to feel aggrieved for all along she had received more than her share of the nation's privileges and had almost always won in the main that which was demanded she had had sixty years of presence to the north's twenty-four two-thirds of the clerkships and other appointments although the white population in that section was only one-third that of the country fourteen attorneys general to the north's five and eighteen supreme court judges to the north's eleven although four-fifths of the business of the court originated in the free states this said stevens as an astonishing declaration we have required so as to guard against any interpretation of the constitution unfavorable to us still another voice from the south in a slightly different key attacked the tendencies in this section the impending crisis eighteen fifty seven by hinton rowan helper of north carolina was surpassed in sensational interest by no other book of the period except uncle tom's cabin the author did not place himself upon the broadest principles of humanity and statesmanship he had no concern for the negro and the great planters of the south were to him simply the whelps and curs of slavery he spoke merely as the voice of the non-slaveholding white men in the south he set forth such unpleasant truths as that the personal and real property including slaves of virginia north carolina tennessee missouri arkansas florida and texas taken altogether was less than the real and personal estate in the single state of new york that representation in southern legislatures was unfair that in congress a southern planter was twice as powerful as a northern man that slavery was to blame for the migration from the south to the west and that in short the system was in every way harmful to the man of limited means all of this was decidedly unpleasant to the ears of the property owners of the south helper's book was proscribed and the author himself found it more advisable to live in new york than in his native state the impending crisis was eagerly read however and it succeeded as a book because it attempted to attack with some degree of honesty a great economic problem the time for speeches and books however was over and the time for action had come for years the slave had chanted i've been listening all the night long and his prayer had reached the throne on october sixteenth eighteen fifty nine john brown made his raid on harper's ferry and took his place with the immortals in the long and bitter contest on american slavery the abolitionists had won End of section seventeen section eighteen of a social history of the american negro by benjamin griffith brawley this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eleven social progress eighteen twenty to eighteen sixty so far in our study we have seen the negro as the object of interest on the part of the american people some were disposed to give him a helping hand some to keep him in bondage and some thought that it might be possible to dispose of any problem by sending him out of the country in all this period of agitation and ferment aside from the efforts of friends in his behalf just what was the negro doing to work out his own salvation if for the time being we can look primarily at constructive effort rather than disabilities just what do we find that on his own account he was doing to rise to the full stature of manhood naturally in the answer to such a question we shall have to be concerned with those people who had already attained unto nominal freedom we shall indeed find many examples of industrious slaves who working in agreement with their owners manage sometimes to purchase themselves and even to secure ownership of their families such cases while considerable in the aggregate were after all exceptional and for the ordinary slave on the plantation the outlook was hopeless enough in eighteen sixty the free persons formed just one-ninth of the total negro population in the country there being four hundred and eighty seven thousand nine hundred and seventy of them to three million nine hundred and fifty three thousand seven hundred and sixty slaves it is a commonplace to remark the progress that the race has made since emancipation a study of the facts however will show that with all their disadvantages less than half a million people had before eighteen sixty 
not only made such progress as amasses a surprising total but that they had already entered every large field of endeavor in which the race is engaged to-day when in course of time the status of the negro in the american body politic became a live issue the possibility and the danger of an imperium in imperio were perceived and rev james w c pennington undoubtedly a leader said in his lectures in london and glasgow the colored population of the united states have no destiny separate from that of the nation in which they form an integral part our destiny is bound up with that of america her ship is ours her pilot is ours her storms are ours her calms are ours if she breaks upon any rock we break with her if we born in america cannot live upon the same soil upon terms of equality with the descendants of scotchmen englishmen irishmen frenchmen germans hungarians greeks and poles then the fundamental theory of america fails and falls to the ground while everybody was practically agreed upon this fundamental matter of the relation of the race to the federal government more and more there developed two lines of thought equally honest as to the means by which the race itself was to attain unto the highest things that american civilization had to offer the leader of one school of thought was richard allen founder of the african methodist episcopal church when this man and his friends found that in white churches they were not treated with courtesy they said we shall have our own church we shall have our own bishop we shall build up our own enterprises in any line whatsoever and even to-day the church that allen founded remains as the greatest single effort of the race in organization the foremost representative of the opposing line of thought was undoubtedly frederick douglas who in a speech in rochester in eighteen forty eight said i am well aware of the anti-christian prejudices which have excluded many colored persons from white churches and the consequent necessity for erecting their own places of worship this evil i would charge upon its originators and not the colored people but such a necessity does not now exist to the extent of former years there are societies where color is not regarded as a test of membership and such places i deem more appropriate for colored persons than exclusive or isolated organizations there is much more difference between these two positions than can be accounted for by the mere lapse of forty years between the height of the work of allen and that of douglas allen certainly did not sanction segregation under the law and no man worked harder than he to relieve his people from proscription douglas moreover who did not formally approve of organizations that represented any such distinction as that of race again and again presided over gatherings of negro men in the last analysis however it was allen who was foremost in laying the basis of distinctively negro enterprise and douglas who felt that the real solution of any difficulty was for the race to lose itself as quickly as possible in the general body politic we have seen that the church was from the first the race's foremost form of social organization and that sometimes a very close touch with it developed the early lodges of such a body as the masons by eighteen hundred emancipation was well under way then began emigration from the south to the central west emigration brought into being the underground railroad and finally all forces worked together for the development of negro business the press conventions and other forms of activity it was natural that states so close to the border as pennsylvania and ohio should be important in this early development the church continued the growth that it had begun several decades before the a m e denomination advanced rapidly from seven churches and four hundred members in eighteen sixteen to two hundred and eighty six churches and seventy three thousand members by the close of the civil war naturally such a distinctively negro organization could make little progress in the south before the war but there were small congregations in charleston and new orleans and william paul quinn blazed a path in the west going from pittsburgh to st louis in eighteen forty seven the prince hall lodge of the masons in massachusetts the first independent african grand lodge in pennsylvania and the hiram grand lodge of pennsylvania formed a national grand lodge 
and from one or another of these all other grand lodges among negroes have descended in eighteen forty two the members of the philomathean institute of new york and of the philadelphia library company and debating society applied for admission to the international order of odd fellows they were refused on account of their race thereupon peter ogden a negro who had already joined the grand united order of odd fellows of england secured a charter for the first negro american lodge philomathean number six forty six of new york which was set up march one eighteen forty three it was followed within the next two years by lodges in new york philadelphia albany and poughkeepsie the knights of pythias were not organized until eighteen sixty four in washington but the grand order of galilean fishermen started on its career in baltimore in eighteen fifty six the benefit societies developed apace at first they were small and confined to a group of persons well known to each other thus being genuinely fraternal simple in form they imposed an initiation fee of hardly less than two dollars and fifty cents or more than five dollars a monthly fee of about fifty cents and gave sick dues ranging from one dollar and fifty cents to five dollars a month with guarantee of payment of one's funeral expenses and subsequent help to the widow by eighteen thirty eight there were in philadelphia alone one hundred such groups with seven thousand four hundred and forty eight members as bringing together spirits supposedly congenial these organizations largely took the place of clubs and the meetings were relished accordingly some drifted into secret societies and after the civil war some that had not cultivated the idea of insurance were forced to add this feature to their work in the sphere of civil rights the negroes in spite of circumstances were making progress and that by their own efforts as well as those of their friends the abolitionists their papers helped decidedly the journal of freedom commonly known as freedom's journal begun march thirty eighteen twenty seven ran for three years it had numerous successors but no one of outstanding strength before the north star later known as frederick douglas paper began publication eighteen forty seven continuing until the civil war largely through the effort of paul cuff for the franchise new bedford massachusetts was generally prominent in all that made for racial prosperity here even by eighteen fifty the negro voters held the balance of power and accordingly exerted a potent influence on election day under date march sixth eighteen forty there was brought up for repeal so much of the massachusetts statutes as forbade intermarriage between white persons and negroes mulattoes or indians as contrary to the principles of christianity and republicanism the committee said that it did not recommend a repeal in the expectation that the number of connections legal or illegal between the races would be thereupon increased but its object rather was that wherever such connections were found the usual civil liabilities and obligations should not fail to attach to the contracting parties the enactment was repealed in the same state by january eighteen forty three an act forbidding discrimination on railroads was passed this grew out of separate petitions or remonstrances from francis jackson and joseph nunn each man being supported by friends and the petitioners based their request not on the supposition that the colored man is not as well treated as his white fellow-citizen but on the broad principle that the constitution allows no distinction in public privileges among the different classes of citizens in this commonwealth in new york city an interesting case arose over the question of public conveyances when about eighteen fifty two horse cars began to supersede omnibuses on the streets the negro was excluded from the use of them and he continued to be excluded until eighteen fifty five when a decision of judge rockwell gave him the right to enter them the decision was ignored and the negro continued to be excluded as before one sunday in may however rev james w c pennington after service reminded his hearers of judge rockwell's decision urged them to stand up for their rights and especially to inform any friends who might visit the city during the coming anniversary week that negroes were no longer excluded from the street cars he himself then boarded a car on sixth avenue refused to leave when requested to do so and was forcibly ejected he brought suit against the company and won his case and thus the negro made further advance toward full citizenship in new york 
thus was the negro developing in religious organization in his benefit societies and toward his rights as a citizen when we look at the economic life upon which so much depended we find that rather amazing progress had been made doors were so often closed to the negro competing white artisans were so often openly hostile and he himself labored under so many disadvantages generally that it has often been thought that his economic advance before eighteen sixty was negligible but nothing could be farther from the truth it must not be forgotten that for decades the south had depended upon negro men for whatever was to be done in all ordinary trades some brick masons carpenters and shoemakers had served a long apprenticeship and were thoroughly accomplished and when some of the more enterprising of these men removed to the north or west they took their training with them very few persons became paupers certainly many were destitute especially those who had most recently made their way from slavery and in general the colored people cared for their own poor in eighteen fifty two of three thousand five hundred negroes in cincinnati two hundred were holders of property who paid taxes on their real estate in eighteen fifty five the negro per capita ownership of property compared most favorably with that of the white people altogether the negroes owned eight hundred thousand dollars worth of property in the city and five million dollars worth in the state in the city there were among other workers three bank tellers a landscape artist who had visited rome to complete his education and nine daguerreotypists, typists one of whom was the best in the entire west of one thousand six hundred and ninety six negroes at work in philadelphia in eighteen fifty six some of the more important occupations numbered workers as follows tailors dressmakers and shirtmakers six hundred and fifteen barbers two hundred and forty eight shoemakers sixty six brickmakers fifty three carpenters forty nine milliners forty five tanners twenty four cake bakers pastry cooks or confectioners twenty two blacksmiths twenty two there were also fifteen musicians or music teachers six physicians and sixteen school teachers the foremost and the most wealthy man of business of the race in the country about eighteen fifty was stephen smith of the firm of smith and whipper of columbia pennsylvania he and his partner were lumber merchants smith was a man of wide interests he invested his capital judiciously engaging in real estate and spending much of his time in philadelphia where he owned more than fifty brick houses while whipper a relative attended to the business of the firm together these men gave employment to a large number of persons of similar quality with samuel t wilcox of cincinnati the owner of a large grocery business who also engaged in real estate henry boyd of cincinnati was the proprietor of a bedstead manufactory that filled numerous orders from the south and west and that sometimes employed as many as twenty-five men half of whom were white sometimes through an humble occupation a negro rose to competence thus one of the eighteen hucksters in cincinnati became the owner of twenty thousand dollars worth of property here and there several caterers and tailors became known as having the best places in their line of business in their respective towns john julius of pittsburgh was the proprietor of a brilliant place known as concert hall when president-elect william henry harrison in eighteen forty visited the city it was here that his chief reception was held cordeville became widely known as the name of the leading tailor and originator of fashions at new orleans after several years of success in business this merchant removed to france where he enjoyed the fortune that he had accumulated cordeville was representative of the advance of the people of mixed blood in the south the general status of these people was better in louisiana than anywhere else in the country north or south at the same time their situation was such as to call for special consideration in louisiana the f m c free man of color formed a distinct and anomalous class in society as a free man he had certain rights and sometimes his property holdings were very large in fact in new orleans a few years before the civil war not less than one-fifth of the taxable property was in the hands of free people of color at the same time the lot of these people was one of endless humiliation among some of them irregular household establishments were regularly maintained by white men and there were held the quadroon balls which in course of time gave the city a distinct notoriety above the people of this group however was a genuine aristocracy of free people of color who had a long tradition of freedom being descended from the early colonists 
and whose family life was most exemplary in general they lived to themselves in fact it was difficult for them to do otherwise they were often compelled to have papers filled out by white guardians and they were not allowed to be visited by slaves or to have companionship with them even when attending church or walking along the roads sometimes free colored men owned their women and children in order that the latter might escape the invidious law against negroes recently emancipated or the situation was sometimes turned around as in norfolk virginia where several women owned their husbands when the name of a free man of color had to appear on any formal document a deed of conveyance a marriage license a certificate of birth or death or even in a newspaper report the initials f m c had to be appended in louisiana these people petitioned in vain for the suffrage and at the outbreak of the civil war organized and splendidly equipped for the confederacy two battalions of five hundred men for these they chose two distinguished white commanders and the governor accepted their services only to have to inform them later that the confederacy objected to the enrolling of negro soldiers in charleston thirty-seven men in a remarkable petition also formally offered their services to the confederacy but most readily found illustration in new orleans or charleston was also true to some extent of other centers of free people of color such as mobile and baltimore in general the f m c s were industrious and they almost monopolized one or two avenues of employment but as a group they had not yet learned to place themselves upon the broad basis of racial aspiration whatever may have been the situation of special groups however it can readily be seen that there were at least some negroes in the country a good many in the aggregate who by eighteen sixty were maintaining a high standard in their ordinary social life it must not be forgot that we are dealing with a period when the general standard of american culture was by no means what it is to-day four-fifths of the people of the united states of eighteen sixty lived in the country and it is perhaps fair to say that half of these dwelt in log houses of one or two rooms comforts such as most of us enjoy daily were as good as unknown for the workaday world shirt sleeves heavy brogan boots and shoes and rough wool hats were the rule in philadelphia a fairly representative city there were at this time a considerable number of negroes of means or professional standing these people were regularly hospitable they visited frequently and they entertained in well-furnished parlors with music and refreshments in a day when many of their people had not learned to get beyond showiness in dress they were temperate and self-restrained they lived within their incomes and they retired at a seasonable hour in spite moreover of all the laws and disadvantages that they had to meet the negroes also made general advance in education in the south efforts were of course sporadic but negroes received some teaching through private or clandestine sources more than one slave learned the alphabet while entertaining the son of his master in charleston for a long time before the civil war free negroes could attend schools especially designed for their benefit and kept by white people or other negroes the course of study not infrequently embraced such subjects as physiology physics and plain geometry after john brown's raid the order went forth that no longer should any colored person teach negroes this resulted in a white person's being brought to sit in the classroom though at the outbreak of the war schools were closed altogether in the north in spite of all proscription conditions were somewhat better as early as eighteen fifty there were in the public schools in new york three thousand three hundred and ninety three negro children these sustaining about the same proportion to the negro population that white children sustain to the total white population two institutions for the higher education of the negro were established before the civil war lincoln university in pennsylvania eighteen fifty four and wilberforce university in ohio eighteen fifty six oberlin moreover was founded in eighteen thirty three in eighteen thirty five professor asa mahan of lane seminary was offered the presidency as he was an abolitionist he said that he would accept only if negroes were admitted on equal terms with other students after a warm session of the trustees the vote was in his favor though before this individual negroes had found their way into northern institutions it was here at oberlin that they first received a real welcome by the outbreak of the war nearly one-third of the students were of the negro race and one of the graduates john m langston was soon to be generally prominent in the affairs of the country it has been maintained that in their emphasis on education and on the highest culture possible 
for the negro the abolitionists were mere visionaries who had no practical knowledge whatever of the race's real needs this was neither true nor just it was absolutely necessary first of all to establish the negro's right to enter any field occupied by any other man and time has vindicated this position even in eighteen fifty however the needs of the majority of the negro people for advance in their economic life were not overlooked either by the abolitionists or the negroes themselves said martin v delaney our elevation must be the result of self-efforts and work of our own hands no other human power can accomplish it let our young men and young women prepare themselves for usefulness and business that the men may enter into merchandise trading and other things of importance the young women may become teachers of various kinds and otherwise fill places of usefulness parents must turn their attention more to the education of their children we mean to educate them for useful practical business purposes educate them for the store and counting-house to do everything practical business consult the children's propensities and direct their education according to their inclinations it may be that there is too great a desire on the part of parents to give their children a professional education before the body of the people are ready for it a people must be a business people and have more to depend upon than mere help in people's houses and hotels before they are either able to support or capable of properly appreciating the services of professional men among them this has been one of our great mistakes we have gone in advance of ourselves we have commenced at the superstructure of the building instead of the foundation at the top instead of the bottom we should first be mechanics and common tradesmen and professions as a matter of course would grow out of the wealth made thereby in professional life the negro had by eighteen sixty made a noteworthy beginning already he had been forced to give attention to the law though as yet little by way of actual practice had been done in this field robert morris jr of boston was probably foremost william c nell of rochester and boston at the time prominent in newspaper work and politics is now best remembered for his study of the negro in the early wars of the country about the middle of the century samuel ringo ward author of the autobiography of a fugitive negro and one of the most eloquent men of the time was for several years pastor of a white congregational church in courtlandville new york and henry highland garnett was the pastor of a white congregation in troy and well known as a public-spirited citizen as well upon james w c pennington the degree of doctor of divinity was conferred by heidelberg and generally this man had a reputation in england and on the continent of europe as well as in america about the same time bishops daniel a payne and william paul quinn were adding to the dignity of the african methodist episcopal church special interest attaches to the negro physician even in colonial times though there was much emphasis on the control of diseases by roots or charms there was at least a beginning in work genuinely scientific as early as seventeen ninety two a negro named caesar had gained such distinction by his knowledge of curative herbs that the assembly of south carolina purchased his freedom and gave him an annuity in the earlier years of the last century james durham of new orleans became the first regularly recognized negro physician of whom there is a complete record born in philadelphia in seventeen sixty two as a boy he was transferred to a physician for whom he learned to perform minor duties afterwards he was sold to a physician in new york orleans who used him as an assistant two or three years later he won his freedom he became familiar with french and spanish as well as english and he soon commanded general respect by his learning and skill about the middle of the century in new york james mccune smith a graduate of the university of glasgow was prominent he was the author of several scientific papers a man of wide interests and universally held in high esteem the first real impetus to bring negroes in considerable numbers into the professional world came from the american colonization society which in the early years flourished in the south as well as the north and undertook to prepare professional leaders of their race for the liberian colony to execute the scheme leaders of the colonization movement endeavor to educate negroes in mechanic arts agriculture science and biblical literature especially bright or promising youths were to be given special training as catechists teachers preachers and physicians not much was said about what they were doing but now and then appeared notices of negroes who had been prepared privately in the south or publicly in the north 
for service in liberia dr william taylor and dr fleet were thus educated in the district of columbia in the same way john v de grasse of new york and thomas j white of brooklyn were allowed to complete the medical course at bodowin in eighteen forty nine in eighteen fifty four dr de grasse was admitted as a member of the massachusetts medical society martin v delaney more than once referred to in these pages after being refused admission at a number of institutions was admitted to the medical school at harvard he became distinguished for his work in a cholera epidemic in pittsburgh in eighteen fifty four it was of course not until after the civil war that medical departments were established in connection with some of the new higher institutions of learning for negro students before eighteen sixty a situation that arose more than once took from negroes the real credit for inventions if a slave made an invention he was not permitted to take out a patent for no slave could make a contract at the same time the slave's master could not take out a patent for him for the government would not recognize the slave as having the legal right to make the assignment to his master it is certain that negroes who did most of the mechanical work in the south before the civil war made more than one suggestion for the improvement of machinery we have already referred to the strong claim put forth by a member of the race for the real credit of the cotton gin the honor of being the first negro to be granted a patent belongs to henry blair of maryland who in eighteen thirty four received official protection for a corn harvester throughout the century there were numerous attempts at poetical composition and several booklets were published perhaps the most promising was george horton's the hope of liberty which appeared in eighteen twenty nine unfortunately horton could not get the encouragement that he needed and in course of time settled down to the life of a janitor in the university of north carolina six years before the war francis ellen watkins later mrs harper struck the popular note by readings from her miscellaneous poems which ran through several editions about the same time william wells brown was prominent though he also worked for several years after the war he was a man of decided talent and had travelled considerably he wrote several books dealing with negro history and biography and he also treated racial subjects in a novel clotel and in a drama the escape the latter suffers from an excess of moralizing but several times it flashes out with the quality of genuine drama especially when it deals with the jealousy of a mistress for a favorite slave and the escape of the latter with her husband in eighteen forty one the first negro magazine began to appear this being issued by the a m e church there were numerous autobiographies that of frederick douglass first appearing in eighteen forty five running through edition after edition on the stage there was the astonishing success of ira aldrich a tragedian who in his earlier years went to europe where he had the advantage of association with edmund Keane about eighteen fifty seven he was commonly regarded as one of the two or three greatest actors in the world he became a member of several of the continental academies of arts and science and received many decorations of crosses and medals the emperors of russia and austria and the king of prussia being among those who honored him in the great field of music there was much excellent work both in composition and in the performance on different instruments among the free people of color in louisiana there were several distinguished musicians some of whom removed to europe for the sake of greater freedom the highest individual achievement was that of elizabeth taylor greenfield of philadelphia this singer was of the very first rank her voice was of remarkable sweetness and had a compass of twenty-seven notes she sang before many distinguished audiences in both europe and america and was frequently compared with jenny lind then at the height of her fame it is thus evident that honorable achievement on the part of negroes and general advance in social welfare by no means began with the emancipation proclamation in eighteen sixty eight ninths of the members of the race were still slaves but in the face of every possible handicap the one ninth that was free had entered practically every great field of human endeavor many were respected citizens in their communities and a few had even laid the foundations of wealth while there was as yet no book of unquestioned genius or scholarship there was considerable intellectual activity and only time and a little more freedom from economic pressure were needed for the production of works of the first order of merit End of chapter eleven section nineteen of a social history 
of the american negro by benjamin griffith brawley this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twelve the civil war and emancipation at the outbreak of the civil war two great questions affecting the negro overshadowed all others his freedom and his employment as a soldier the north as a whole had no special enthusiasm about the negro and responded only to lincoln's call to the duty of saving the union among both officers and men moreover there was great prejudice against the use of the negro as a soldier the feeling being that he was disqualified by slavery and ignorance privates objected to meeting black men on the same footing as themselves and also felt that the arming of slaves to fight for their former masters would increase the bitterness of the conflict if many men in the north felt thus the south was furious at the thought of the negro as a possible opponent in arms the human problem however was not long in presenting itself and forcing attention as soon as the northern soldiers appeared in the south thousands of negroes men women and children flocked to their camps feeling only that they were going to their friends in may eighteen sixty one while in command at fortress monroe major-general benjamin f butler came into national prominence by his policy of putting to work the men who came within his lines and justifying their retention on the ground that being of service to the enemy for purposes of war they were like guns powder etc contraband of war and could not be reclaimed on august thirtieth of this same year major-general john c fremont in command in missouri placed the state under martial law and declared the slaves there emancipated the administration was embarrassed fremont's order was annulled and he was relieved of his command on may nine eighteen sixty two major-general david hunter in charge of the department of the south south carolina georgia and florida issued his famous order freeing the slaves in his department and thus brought to general attention the matter of the employment of negro soldiers in the union armies the confederate government outlawed hunter lincoln annulled his order and the grace of the nation was again saved but in the meantime a new situation had arisen while brigadier general john w phelps was taking part in the expedition against new orleans a large sugar planter near the city disgusted with federal interference with affairs on his plantation drove all his slaves away telling them to go to their friends the yankees the negroes came to phelps in great numbers and for the sake of discipline he attempted to organize them into troops accordingly he too was outlawed by the confederates and his act was disavowed by the union that was not ready to take this step meanwhile president lincoln was debating the emancipation proclamation pressure from radical anti-slavery sources was constantly being brought to bear upon him and horace greeley in his famous editorial the prayer of twenty millions was only one of those who criticized what seemed to be his lack of strength in handling the situation after mcclellan's unsuccessful campaign against richmond however he felt that the freedom of the slaves was a military and moral necessity for its effects upon both the north and the south and lee's defeated antietam september seventeenth eighteen sixty two furnished the opportunity for which he had been waiting accordingly on september twenty second he issued a preliminary declaration giving notice that on january one eighteen sixty five he would free all slaves in the state still in rebellion and asserting as before that the object of the war was the preservation of the union the proclamation as finally issued january first is one of the most important public documents in the history of the united states ranking only below the declaration of independence and the constitution itself its full text is as follows whereas on the twenty-second day of september in the year of our lord one thousand eight hundred and sixty-two a proclamation was issued by the president of the united states containing among other things the following to wit that on the first day of january in the year of our lord one thousand eight hundred and sixty-three all persons held as slaves within any state or designated part of a state the people whereof shall then be in rebellion against the united states shall be then thenceforward and forever free and the executive government of the united states 
including the military and naval authority thereof will recognize and maintain the freedom of such persons and will do no act or acts to repress such persons or any of them in any efforts they may make for their actual freedom that the executive will on the first day of january aforesaid by proclamation designate the states and parts of states if any in which the people thereof shall then be in rebellion against the united states and the fact that any state or the people thereof shall on that day be in good faith represented in the congress of the united states by members chosen thereto at elections wherein a majority of the qualified voters of such state shall have participated shall in the absence of strong countervailing testimony be deemed conclusive evidence that such state and the people thereof are not then in rebellion against the united states now therefore i abraham lincoln president of the united states by virtue of the power in me vested as commander-in-chief of the army and navy of the united states in time of actual armed rebellion against the authority and government of the united states and as a fit and necessary war measure for suppressing said rebellion due on this first day of january in the year of our lord one thousand eight hundred and sixty three and in accordance with my purpose so to do publicly proclaimed for the full period of one hundred days from the date first above mentioned order and designate as the states and parts of states wherein the people thereof respectively are this day in rebellion against the united states the following to wit arkansas texas louisiana except the parishes of st bernard plaquemine jefferson st john st charles st james ascension assumption terrebonne laforge st marie st martin and orleans including the city of new orleans mississippi alabama florida georgia south carolina north carolina and virginia except for forty-eight counties designated as west virginia and also the counties of berkeley Accomac, northampton elizabeth city york princess anne and norfolk including the cities of norfolk and portsmouth and which excepted parts off for the present left precisely as if this proclamation were not issued by virtue of the power and for the purpose aforesaid i do order and declare that all persons held as slaves within said designated states and parts of states are and henceforth shall be free and that the executive government of the united states including the military and naval authorities thereof will recognize and maintain the freedom of said persons and i hereby enjoin upon the people so declared to be free to abstain from all violence and less than necessary self-defense and i recommend to them that in all cases when allowed they labor faithfully for reasonable wages and i further declare and make known that such persons of suitable condition will be received into the armed service of the united states to garrison forts positions stations and other places and to man vessels of all sorts in said service and upon this act sincerely believe to be an act of justice warranted by the constitution upon military necessity i invoke the considerate judgment of mankind and the gracious favor of almighty god in testimony whereof i have hereunto set my name and caused the seal of the united states to be affixed done at the city of washington this first day of january in the year of our lord one thousand eight hundred and sixty three and of the independence of the united states the eighty seventh by the president abraham lincoln william h seward secretary of state it will be observed that the proclamation was merely a war measure resting on the constitutional power of the president the effects on the legal status of the slaves gave rise to much discussion and it is to be noted that it did not apply to what is now west virginia to seven counties in virginia and to thirteen parishes in louisiana which districts had already come under federal jurisdiction all questions raised by the measure however were finally settled by the thirteenth amendment to the constitution and as a matter of fact freedom actually followed the progress of the union arms from eighteen sixty three to eighteen sixty five meanwhile from the very beginning of the war negroes were used by the confederates in making redoubts in doing other rough work and even before the emancipation proclamation there were many northern officers who said that definite enlistment was advisable they felt that such a course would help to destroy slavery and that as the negroes had so much at stake they should have some share in the overthrow of the rebellion they said also that the men would be proud to wear the national uniform individuals moreover as officers servants saw much of fighting and won confidence in their ability 
and as the war advanced and more and more men were killed the conviction grew that a negro could stop a bullet as well as a white man and that in any case the use of negroes for fatigue work would release numbers of other men for the actual fighting at last after a great many men had been killed and the emancipation proclamation had changed the status of the negro enlistment was decided on the policy was that negroes might be non-commissioned men or white men who had seen service would be field and line officers in general it was expected that only those who had kindly feeling toward the negro would be used as officers but in the pressure of military routine this distinction was not always observed opinion for the race gained force after the draft riot in new york july eighteen sixty three when negroes in the city were persecuted by the opponents of conscription soon a distinct bureau was established in washington for the recording of all matters pertaining to negro troops a board was organized for the examination of candidates and recruiting stations were set up in maryland missouri and tennessee the confederates were indignant at the thought of having to meet black men on equal footing and refused to exchange negro soldiers for white men how such action was met by stanton secretary of war may be seen from the fact that when he learned that three negro prisoners had been placed in close confinement he ordered three south carolina men to be treated likewise and the confederate leaders to be informed of his policy the economic advantage of enlistment was apparent he gave work to a hundred and eighty seven thousand men who had been cast adrift by the war and who had found no place of independent labor it gave them food clothing wages and protection but most of all the feeling of self-respect that comes from profitable employment to the men themselves the year of jubilee had come at one great step they had crossed the gulf that separates chattel from men and they now had a chance to vindicate their manhood a common post of the day represented a negro soldier bearing the flag the shackles of a slave being broken a young negro boy reading a newspaper and several children going into a public school over all were the words all slaves were made free men by abraham lincoln president of the united states january first eighteen sixty three come then able-bodied colored men to the nearest united states camp and fight for the stars and stripes to the credit of the men be it said that in their new position they acted with dignity and sobriety when they picketed the lines through which southern citizens passed they acted with courtesy at the same time that they did their duty they captured southern men without insulting them and by their own self-respect won the respect of others meanwhile their brothers in the south went about the day's work caring for the widow and the orphan and a nation that still lynches the negro has to remember that in all these troublous years of deeds of violence against white women and girls were absolutely unknown throughout the country the behavior of the black men under fire was watched with the most intense interest more and more in the baptism of blood they justified the faith for which their friends had fought for years at port hudson fort wagner fort pillow and petersburg their courage was most distinguished said the new york times of the battle at port hudson eighteen sixty three general dwight at least must have had the idea not only that they the negro troops were men but something more than men from the terrific test to which he put their valor their colors are torn to pieces by a shot and literally bespattered by blood and brains this was the occasion on which colonel sergeant van selmas plan Tien Qua said before a shell blew off his head colonel i will bring back these colors to you on honor or report to god the reason why on june sixth the negroes again distinguished themselves and won friends by their bravery at millikan's bend the fifty fourth massachusetts commanded by robert gould shaw was conspicuous in the attempt to take fort wagner on morris island near charleston july eighteen eighteen sixty three the regiment had marched two days and two nights through swamps and drenching rains in order to be in time for the assault in the engagement nearly all the officers of the regiment were killed among them colonel shaw the picturesque deed was that of sergeant william h carney who seized the regiment's colors from the hands of a fallen comrade planted the flag on the works and said when born bleeding and mangled from the field boys the old flag never touched the ground fort pillow a position on the mississippi about fifty miles above memphis was garrisoned by five hundred and fifty seven men two hundred and sixty two of whom were negroes when it was attacked april thirteenth eighteen sixty four the fort was finally taken by the confederates but the feature of the engagement was the stubborn resistance offered by the union troops in the face of great odds in the mississippi valley and in the department of the south the negro had now done excellent work as a soldier 
in the spring of eighteen sixty four he made his appearance in the army of the potomac in july there was around richmond and petersburg considerable skirmishing between the federal and the confederate forces burnside commanding a corps composed partly of negroes dug under a confederate fort a trench had a hundred and fifty yards long this was filled with explosives and on july thirty the match was applied in a famous crater form just before the explosion the negroes had figured in a gallant charge on the confederates the plan was to follow the eruption by a still more formidable assault in which burnside wanted to give his negro troops the lead a dispute about this and a settlement by lot resulted in the awarding of precedence to a new hampshire regiment said general grant later of the whole unfortunate episode general burnside wanted to put his colored division in front i believe if he had done so it would have been a success after the men of a negro regiment had charged and taken a battery at decatur alabama in october eighteen sixty four and shown exceptional gallantry under fire they received an ovation from their white comrades who by thousands sprang upon the parapets and cheered the regiment as it re-entered the lines when all was over there was in the north a spontaneous recognition of the right of such men to honorable and generous treatment at the hands of the nation and in congress there was the feeling that if the south could come back to the union with its autonomy unimpaired certainly the negro soldier should have the rights of citizenship before the war closed however there was held in syracuse new york a convention of negro men that threw interesting light on the problems and the feeling of the period at this gathering john mercer langston was temporary chairman frederick douglas president and henry highland garnett of washington james w c pennington of new york george l ruffin of boston and ebenezer d bassett of philadelphia were among the more prominent delegates there was at the meeting a fear that some of the things that seemed to have been gained by the war might not actually be realized and as congress had not yet altered the constitution so as to abolish slavery grave question was raised by a recent speech in which no less a man than seward secretary of state had said when the insurgents shall have abandoned their armies and laid down their arms the war will instantly cease and all the war measures then existing including those which affect slavery will cease also the convention thanked the president and the thirty seventh congress for revoking a prohibitory law in regard to the carrying of mails by negroes for abolishing slavery in the district of columbia for recognizing haiti and liberia and for the military order retaliating for the unmilitary treatment accorded negro soldiers by the confederate officers and especially thanked senator sumner for his noble efforts to cleanse the statute books of the nation from every stain of inequality against colored men and general butler for the stand he had taken early in the war at the same time it resolved to send a petition to congress to ask that the rights of the country's negro patriots in the field be respected and that the government cease to set an example to those in arms against it by making invidious distinctions based upon color as to pay labor and promotion it begged especially to be saved from supposed friends when the anti-slavery standard represented in the american anti-slavery society denies that the society asks for the enfranchisement of colored men and the liberator apologizes for excluding the colored men of louisiana from the ballot box they injure us more vitally than all the ribald jests of the whole pro-slavery press finally the convention insisted that any such things as the right to own real estate to testify in courts of law and to sue and be sued were mere privileges so long as general political liberty was withheld and as frankly not only for the formal and complete abolition of slavery in the united states but also for the elective franchise in all the states then in the union and in all that might come into the union thereafter on the whole this representative gathering showed a very clear conception of the problems facing the negro and the country in eighteen sixty four its reference to well-known anti-slavery publications shows not only the increasing race consciousness that came through this as through all other wars in which the country has engaged but also the great drift toward conservatism that had taken place in the north within thirty years whatever might be the questions of the moment however about the supreme blessing of freedom there could at last be no doubt it had been long delayed and had finally come merely as an incident to the war nevertheless a whole race of people had passed from death unto life then as before and since they found a parallel for their experiences in the story of the jews in the old testament they too had sojourned in egypt and crossed the red sea what they could not then see or only dimly realized was that they needed faith faith in god and faith in themselves for the forty years in the wilderness they did not yet fully know that he 
who guided the children of israel and drove out before them the amorite and the hittite would bring them also to the promised land to those who led the negro in these wonderful years to robert gould shaw the young colonel of the fifty fourth massachusetts who died leading his men at fort wagner to norwood penrose hallowell lieutenant colonel of the fifty fourth and then colonel of the fifty fifth to his brother edward n hallowell who succeeded shaw when he fell and to thomas wentworth higginson who commanded the first regiment of free slaves no ordinary eulogy can reply their names are written in letters of flame and their deeds live after them on the shaw monument in boston are written these words the white officers taking life and honor in their hands cast their lot with men of a despised race unproved in war and risked death as inciters of a servile insurrection if taken prisoners besides encountering all the common perils of camp march and battle the black rank and file volunteered when disaster clouded the union cause served without pay for eighteen months till given that of white troops they threatened enslavement if cat were brave in action patient under dangerous and heavy labors and cheerful amid hardships and privations together they gave to the nation undying proof that americans of african descent possess the pride courage and devotion of the patriot soldier one hundred and eighty thousand such americans enlisted under the union flag in eighteen sixty three to eighteen sixty five end of section nineteen section twenty of a social history of the american negro by benjamin griffith brawley this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirteen the era of enfranchisement part one one the problem at the close of the civil war the united states found itself face to face with one of the gravest social problems of modern times more and more it became apparent that it was not only the technical question of the restoration of the states to the union that had to be considered but the whole adjustment for the future of the lives of three and a half million negroes and five and a half million white people in the south in its final analysis the question was one of race and to add to the difficulties of this problem it is to be regretted that there should have been actually upon the scene politicians and speculators who sought to capitalize for their own gain the public distress the south was thoroughly demoralized and the women who had borne the burden of the war at home were especially bitter slave property to the amount of two billion sub dollars had been swept away several of the chief cities had suffered bombardment the railroads had largely run down and the confiscation of property was such as to lead to the indemnification of thousands of claimants afterwards the negro was not yet settled in new places of abode and his death rate was appalling throughout the first winter after the war the whole south was on the verge of starvation here undoubtedly was a difficult situation one calling for the highest quality of statesmanship and of sportsmanship on the part of the vanquished many negroes freed from the tradition of two hundred and fifty years of slavery took a holiday some resolved not to work any more as long as they lived and some even appropriated to their own use the produce of their neighbors if they remained on the old plantations they feared that they might still be considered slaves on the other hand if they took to the high road they might be considered vagrants if one returned from a federal camp to claim his wife and children he might be driven away freedom cried out and undoubtedly some individuals did foolish things but serious crime was noticeably absent on the whole the race bore the blessing of emancipation with a remarkable good sense and temper returning soldiers paraded there were some meetings and processions sometimes a little regalia and even a little noise then everybody went home unfortunately even so much the white south regarded as insolence the example of how the south might have met the situation was afforded by no less a man than robert e lee about whose unselfishness and standard of conduct as a gentleman there could be no question one day in richmond a negro from the street 
intent on asserting his rights entered a representative church pushed his way to the communion altar and knelt the congregation paused and all fully realized the factors that entered into the situation then general lee rose and knelt beside the negro the congregation did likewise and the tension was over furthermore every one went home spiritually uplifted could the handling of this incident have been multiplied a thousand times could men have realized that mere accidents are fleeing but that principles are eternal both races would have been spared years of agony and our southland would be a far different place to-day the negro was at the heart of the problem but to that problem the south undoubtedly held the key of course the cry of social equality might have been raised anything might have been said to keep the right thing from being done in this instance as in many others the final question was not what somebody else did but how one himself could act most nobly unfortunately lee's method of approach was not to prevail passion and prejudice and demagoguery were to have their day and conservative and broadly patriotic men were to be made to follow leaders whom they could not possibly approve sixty years afterwards we still suffer from the ku klux solution of the problem two meeting the problem the story of reconstruction has been many times told and it is not our intention to tell that story again we must content ourselves by touching upon some of the salient points in the discussion even before the close of the war the national government had undertaken to handle officially the thousands of negroes who had crowded to the federal lines and not less than a million of whom were in the spring of eighteen sixty five dependent upon the national government for support the bureau of refugee freedmen and abandoned lands created in connection with the war department by an act of march three eighteen sixty five was to remain in existence throughout the war and for one year thereafter its powers were enlarged july sixteenth eighteen sixty six and its chief work did not end until january one eighteen sixty nine its educational work continuing for a year and a half longer the freedmen's bureau was to have the supervision and management of all abandoned lands and the control of all subjects relating to refugees and freedmen of special importance was the provision in the creating act that gave the freedmen to understand that each male refugee was to be given forty acres with the guarantee of possession for three years throughout the existence of the bureau its chief commissioner was general o o howard while the principal officers were undoubtedly men of noble purpose many of the minor officials were just as undoubtedly corrupt and self-seeking in the winter of eighteen sixty five to six one-third of its aid was given to the white people of the south for negro pupils the bureau established altogether four thousand two hundred and thirty nine schools and these had nine thousand three hundred and seven teachers and two hundred and forty seven thousand three hundred and thirty three students its real achievement has been thus ably summed up the greatest success of the freedmen's bureau lay in the planting of the free school among negroes and the idea of free elementary education among all classes in the south for some fifteen million dollars beside the sum spent before eighteen sixty five and the dole of benevolent societies this bureau set going a system of free labor established a beginning of peasant proprietorship secured the recognition of black freedmen before courts of law and founded the free common school in the south on the other hand it failed to begin the establishment of good will between ex-masters and freedmen to guard its work wholly from paternalistic methods which discouraged self-reliance and to carry out to any considerable extent its implied promises to furnish the freedmen with land to this tale of its shortcomings must be added also the management of the freedmen's bank which was morally and practically part of the freedmen's bureau although it had no legal connection with it this institution made a really remarkable start in the development of thrift among the negroes and its failure involving the loss of the first savings of hundreds of ex-slaves was as disastrous in its moral as in its immediate financial consequences when the freedmen's bureau came to an end it turned its educational interests and some money over to the religious and benevolent societies which had cooperated with it especially to the american missionary association this society had been organized before the civil war on an interdenominational and strong anti-slavery basis but with the withdrawal of general interest the body passed in eighteen eighty one into the hands of the congregational church other prominent 
agencies were the american baptist home mission society also the american baptist publication society the freedmen's aid society representing the northern methodists and the presbyterian board of missions actual work was begun by the american missionary association in eighteen sixty one lewis tappan treasurer of the organization wrote to general butler to ask just what aid could be given the result of the correspondence was that on september three of this year rev l c lockwood reached hampton and on september seventeenth opened the first day school among the freedmen this school was taught by mrs mary s peake a woman of the race who had had the advantage of a free mother and whose devotion to the work was such that she soon died however she had helped to lay the foundations of hampton institute soon there was a school at norfolk there were two at newport news and by january schools at hilton head and beaufort south carolina then came the emancipation proclamation throwing wide open the door of the great need rev john eaton army chaplain from ohio afterwards united states commissioner of education was placed in charge of the instruction of the negroes and in one way or another by the close of the war probably as many as one million in the south had learned to read and write the eighty-three missionaries and teachers of the association in eighteen sixty three increased to two hundred and fifty in eighteen sixty four at the first day session of the school in norfolk after the proclamation there were three hundred and fifty scholars with three hundred others in the evening on the third day there were five hundred and fifty in the day school and five hundred others in the evening the school had to be divided apart going to another church the assistants increased in number and soon the day attendance was one thousand two hundred for such schools the houses on abandoned plantations were used and even public buildings were called into commission afterwards arose the higher institutions atlanta berea fisk talladega straight with numerous secondary schools similarly the baptists founded the colleges which with some changes of name have become virginia union hearts horn shaw benedict morehouse spelman jackson and bishop with numerous affiliated institutions the methodists began to operate clark in south atlanta claflin rust wiley and others and the presbyterians having already founded lincoln in eighteen fifty four now founded biddle and several seminaries for young women while the united presbyterians founded knoxville in course of time the distinctively negro denominations the a m e the a m e z and the c m e which last represented a withdrawal from the southern methodists in eighteen seventy also helped in the work and thus in addition to wilberforce in ohio arose such institutions as morris brown university livingstone college and lane college in eighteen sixty seven moreover the federal government crowned its work for the education of the negro by the establishment at washington of howard university as these institutions have grown they have naturally developed some differences or special emphasis hampton and atlanta university are now independent and berea has had a peculiar history legislation in kentucky in nineteen o three restricting the privileges of the institution to white students hampton in the hands of general armstrong placed emphasis on the idea of industrial and practical education which has since become world famous in eighteen seventy one the fisk jubilee singers began their memorable progress through america and europe meeting at first with scorn and sneers but before long touching the heart of the world with their strange music their later success was as remarkable as their mission was unique meanwhile spelman seminary in the record of her graduates who have gone as missionaries to africa has also developed a glorious tradition to those heroic men and women who represented this idea of education at its best too much credit cannot be given creveth at fisk ware at atlanta armstrong at hampton graves at morehouse tupper at shaw and packard and giles at spelman are names that should ever be called with thanksgiving these people had no enviable task they were ostracized and persecuted and some of their co-workers even killed it is true that the idea of education founded on the new england college was not very elastic but their theory was that the young men and women whom they taught before they were negroes were human beings they had the key to the eternal verities and time will more and more justify their position to the freedmen's bureau the south objected because of the political activity of some of its officials to the schools founded by missionary endeavor it objected primarily on the score of social equality to both the provisional southern governments of eighteen sixty five replied with the so-called black codes the theory of these remarkable ordinances most harsh in mississippi south carolina and louisiana 
was that even if the negro was nominally free he was by no means able to take care of himself and needed the tutelage and oversight of the white man hence developed what was to be known as a system of apprenticeship south carolina in her act of december twenty one eighteen sixty five said a child over the age of two years born of a colored parent may be bound by the father if he be living in the district or in case of his death or absence from the district by the mother as an apprentice to any respectable white or colored person who is competent to make a contract a male until he shall attain the age of twenty-one years and a female until she shall attain the age of eighteen males of the age of twelve years and females of the age of ten years shall sign the indenture of apprenticeship and be bound thereby the master shall receive to his own use the profits of the labor of his apprentice to this mississippi added if any apprentice shall leave the employment of his or her master or mistress said master or mistress may pursue and recapture this apprentice and bring him to or her before any justice of peace of the county whose duty it shall be to remand said apprentice to the service of his or her master or mistress and in the event of a refusal on the part of said apprentice so to return then said justice shall commit said apprentice to the jail of said county etc etc in general by such legislation the negro was given the right to sue and be sued to testify in court concerning negroes and to have marriage and the responsibility for children recognized on the other hand he could not serve on juries could not serve in the militia and could not vote or hold office he was virtually forbidden to assemble and his freedom of movement was restricted within recent years the black codes have been more than once defended as an honest effort to meet a difficult situation but the old slavery attitude peered through them and gave the impression that those who framed them did not yet know that the old order had passed away meanwhile the south was in a state of panic and the provisional governor of mississippi asked of president johnson permission to organize the local militia the request was granted and the patrols immediately began to show their hostility to northern people and the freedmen in the spring of eighteen sixty six there was a serious race riot in memphis on july thirty while some negroes were marching to a political convention in new orleans they became engaged in brawls with the white spectators shots were exchanged the police assisted by the spectators undertook to arrest the negroes the negroes took refuge in the convention hall and their pursuers stormed the building and shot down without mercy the negroes and their white supporters altogether not less than forty were killed and not less than one hundred wounded but not more than a dozen men were killed on the side of the police and the white citizens general sheridan who was in command at new orleans characterized the affair as an absolute massacre a murder which the mayor and police of the city perpetrated without the shadow of a necessity in the face of such events and tendencies and influence to some extent by a careful and illuminating but much criticized report of carl schurz congress led by charles sumner and thaddeus stevens proceeded to pass legislation designed to protect the freedmen and to guarantee to the country the fruits of the war the thirteenth amendment to the constitution formally abolishing slavery was passed december eighteenth eighteen sixty five in the following march congress passed over the president's veto the first civil rights bill guaranteeing to the freedmen all the ordinary rights of citizenship and it was about the same time that it enlarged the powers of the freedmen's bureau the fourteenth amendment july twenty eighth eighteen sixty eight denied to the states the power to abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the united states and the fifteenth amendment march thirty eighteen seventy sought to protect the negro by giving to him the right of suffrage instead of military protection in eighteen seventy five was passed the second civil rights act designed to give negroes equality of treatment in theatres railway cars hotels etc but this the supreme court declared unconstitutional in eighteen eighty three as a result of this legislation the negro was placed in positions of responsibility within the next few years the race sent two senators and thirteen representatives to congress and in some of the state legislatures as in south carolina negroes were decidedly in the majority the attainments of some of these men were undoubtedly remarkable the two united states senators hiram r revels and blanche k bruce both from mississippi were of unquestioned intelligence and ability and robert b elliott one of the representatives from south carolina attracted unusual attention by his speech in reply to alexander stevens on the constitutionality of the civil rights bill at the same time among the negro legislators there was also considerable ignorance and there set in an era of extravagance and corruption from which the carpet-baggers and the scalawags 
rather than the negroes themselves reap the benefit accordingly within recent years it has become more and more the fashion to lament the ills of the period and no representative american historian can now write of reconstruction without a tone of apology a few points however are to be observed in the first place the ignorance was by no means so vast as has been supposed within the four years from eighteen sixty one to eighteen sixty five thanks to the army schools and missionary agencies not less than half a million negroes in the south had learned to read and write furthermore the suffrage was not immediately given to the emancipated negroes this was the last rather than the first step in reconstruction the provisional legislatures formed at the close of the war were composed of white men only but the experiment failed because of the short-sighted laws that were enacted if the fruit of the civil war was not to be lost if all the sacrifice was not to prove in vain it became necessary for congress to see that the overthrow of slavery was final and complete by the fourteenth amendment the negro was invested with the ordinary rights and dignity of a citizen of the united states he was not enfranchised but he could no longer be made the victim of state laws designed merely to keep him in servile subjection if the southern states had accepted this amendment they might undoubtedly have re-entered the union without further conditions they refused to do so they refused to help the national government in any way whatsoever in its effort to guarantee to the negro the rights of manhood achilles sulked in his tent and whenever he sulks the world moves on without him the alternative finally presented to congress if it was not to make an absolute surrender was either to hold the south indefinitely under military subjection or to place the ballot in the hands of the negro the former course was impossible the latter was chosen and the union was really restored was really saved by the force of the ballot in the hands of black men it has been held that the negro was primarily to blame for the corruption of the day here again it is well to recall the tendencies of the period the decades succeeding the war was throughout the country one of unparalleled political corruption the tweed ring the crédit mobilier and the salary garab were only some of the more outstanding signs of the times in the south the negroes were not the real leaders in corruption they simply followed the men who they supposed were their friends surely in the face of such facts as these it is not just to fix upon a people groping to the light the peculiar odium of the corruption that followed in the wake of the war and we shall have to leave it to those better informed than we to say to just what extent city and state politics in the south have been cleaned up since the negro ceased to be a factor many of the constitutions framed by the reconstruction governments were really excellent models and the fact that they were overthrown seems to indicate that some other spoilsmen were abroad take north carolina for example in this state in eighteen sixty eight the reconstruction government by its new constitution introduced the township system so favorably known in the north and west when in eighteen seventy five the south regained control with all the corruption it found as excellent a form of republican state government as was to be found in any state in the union every provision which any state enjoyed for the protection of public society from its bad members and bad impulses was either provided or easily procurable under the constitution of the state yet within a year in order to annul the power of their opponents in every county in the state the new party so amended the constitution as to take away from every county the power of self-government and centralize everything in the legislature now was realized an extent of power over elections and election returns so great that no party could wholly clear itself of the idea of corrupt intentions at the heart of the whole question of course was race as a matter of fact much work of genuine statesmanship was accomplished or attempted by the reconstruction governments for one thing the idea of common school education for all people was now for the first time fully impressed upon the south the charleston news and courier of july eleventh eighteen seventy six formally granted that in the administration of governor chamberlain of south carolina the abuse of the pardoning power had been corrected the character of the officers appointed by the executive had improved the floating indebtedness of the state had been provided for in such a way that the rejection of fraudulent claims was assured and that valid claims were scaled one-half the tax laws had been so amended as to secure substantial equality in the assessment of property taxes had been reduced to eleven mills on the dollar the contingent fund of the executive department had been reduced at a saving in two years of one hundred and one thousand two hundred dollars legislative expenses had also been reduced so as to save in two years three hundred and fifty thousand dollars 
legislative contingent expenses had also been handled so as to save three hundred and fifty five thousand dollars and the public printing reduced from three hundred thousand dollars to fifty thousand dollars a year there were undoubtedly at first many corrupt officials white and black before they were through however after only a few years of experimenting the reconstruction governments began to show signs of being quite able to handle the situation and it seems to have been primarily the fear on the part of the white south that they might not fail that prompted the determination to regain power at whatever cost just how this was done we are now to see End of section twenty section twenty one of a social history of the american negro this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirteen the era of enfranchisement part two three reaction the ku klux klan even before the civil war was a secret organization the knights of the golden circle had been formed to advance southern interest after the war there were various organizations men of justice home guards pale faces white brotherhood white boys council of safety etc and with headquarters at new orleans the thoroughly organized knights of the white camellia all of these had for their general aim the restoration of power to the white men of the south which aim they endeavored to accomplish by regulating the conduct of the negroes and their leaders in the republican organization the union league especially by playing upon the fears and superstitions of the negroes in general especially in the southeast everything else was surpassed or superseded by the ku klux klan which originated in tennessee in the fall of eighteen sixty five as an association of young men for amusement but which soon developed into a union for the purpose of whipping banishing terrorizing and murdering negroes and northern white men who encouraged them in the exercise of their political rights no republican no member of the union league and no g a r man could become a member the costume of the clan was especially designed to strike terror in the uneducated negroes loose flowing sleeves hoods in which were apertures for the eyes nose and mouth trimmed with red material horns made of cotton stuff standing out on the front and sides high cardboard hats covered with white cloth decorated with stars or pictures of animals long tongues of red flannel were all used as occasion demanded the ku klux klan finally extended over the whole south and greatly increased its operations on the cessation of martial law in eighteen seventy as it worked generally at night with its members in disguise it was difficult for a grand jury to get evidence on which to frame a bill and almost impossible to get a jury that would return a verdict for the state repeated measures against the order were of little effect until an act of eighteen seventy extended the jurisdiction of the united states courts to all ku klux cases even then for some time the organization continued active naturally there were serious clashes before government was restored to the white south especially as the ku klux klan grew bolder at colfax grant parish louisiana in april eighteen seventy three there was a pitched battle in which several white men and more than fifty negroes were killed and violence increased as the red shirt campaign of eighteen seventy six approached in connection with the events of this fateful year and with reference to south carolina where the negro seemed most solidly in power we recall one episode that of the hamburg massacre we desire to give this as fully as possible in all its incidents because we know of nothing that better illustrates the temper of the times and because the most important matter is regularly ignored or minimized by historians in south carolina an act providing for the enrollment of the male citizens of the state who were by the terms of the said act made subject to the performance of militia duty was passed by the general assembly and approved by the governor march sixteenth eighteen sixty nine by virtue of this act negro citizens were regularly enrolled as a part of the national guard of the state of south carolina and as the white men with very few exceptions failed or refused to become a part of the said force the act of militia was composed almost wholly of negro men the county of edgefield of which hamburg was a part was one of the military districts of the state under the apportionment of the adjutant general one regiment being allotted to the district one company of this regiment was in hamburg in eighteen seventy six it had recently been reorganized with doc adams as captain lewis cartledge as first lieutenant and a t attaway 
as second lieutenant the ranks were recruited to the requisite number of men to whom arms and equipment were duly issued on tuesday july fourth the militia company assembled for drill and while thus engaged paraded through one of the least frequented streets of the town this street was unusually wide but while marching four abreast the men were interrupted by a horse and buggy driven into their ranks by thomas butler and henry getson white men who resided about two miles from the town at the time of this interference the company was occupying a space covering a width of not more than eight feet so that on either side there was abundant room for vehicles at the interruption captain adams commanded a halt and stepping to the head of his column said mr getson i did not think that you would treat me this way i would not so act towards you to this getson replied with curses and after a few more remarks on either side adams in order to avoid further trouble commanded his men to break ranks and permit the buggy to pass through the company was then marched to the drill rooms and dismissed on wednesday july five robert j butler father of thomas butler and father-in-law of getson appeared before p r rivers colored trial justice and made complaint that the militia company had on the previous day obstructed one of the public streets of hamburg and prevented his son and son-in-law from passing through rivers accordingly issued a summons for the officers to appear the next day july six when adams and his two lieutenants appeared on thursday they found present robert j butler and several other white men heavily armed with revolvers on the calling of the case it was announced that the defendants were present and that henry sparnick a member of the circuit bar of the county had been retained to represent them butler angrily protested against such representation and demanded that the hearing be postponed until he could procure counsel from the city of augusta whereupon adams and his lieutenants after a consultation with their attorney who informed them that there were no legal grounds on which the case could be decided against them waived their constitutional right to be represented by counsel and consented to go to trial on this basis the case was opened and proceeded with for some time when on account of some disturbance its progress was arrested and it was adjourned for further hearing on the following saturday july eighth at four o'clock in the afternoon on saturday between two and three o'clock general m c butler of edgefield formerly an officer of the confederate army arrived in hamburg and he was followed by mounted men in squads of ten or fifteen until the number was more than two hundred the last to arrive being colonel a p butler at the head of three score men immediately after his arrival general butler sent for attorney sparnick who was charged with the request to rivers and the officers of a militia company to confer with him at once there was more passing of messengers back and forth and it was at length deemed best for the men to confer with butler to this two of the officers objected on the ground that the whole plan was nothing more than a plot for their assassination they sent to ask if general butler would meet them without the presence of his armed force he replied yes but before arrangements could be made for the interview another messenger came to say that the hour for the trial had arrived that general butler was at the court and that he requested the presence of the trial justice rivers rivers proceeded to court alone and found butler there waiting for him he was about to proceed with the case when butler asked for more time which request was granted he went away and never returned to the court instead he went to the council chamber being surrounded now by greater and greater numbers of armed men and he sent a committee to the officers asking that they come to the council chamber to see him the men again declined for the same reason as before butler now sent an ultimatum demanding that the officers apologize for what took place on july four and that they surrender to him their arms threatening that if the surrender was not made at once he would take their guns and officers by force adams and his men now awoke to a full sense of their danger and they asked rivers who was not only trial justice but also major-general of the division of the militia to which they belonged if he demanded their arms of them rivers replied that he did not thereupon the officers refused a request of butler on the ground that he had no legal right to demand their arms or to receive them if surrendered at this point butler let it be known that he demanded the surrender of the arms within half an hour and that if he did not receive them he would lay the damned town in ashes asked in an interview whether if his terms were complied with he would guarantee protection to the people of the town he answered that he did not know and that that would depend altogether upon how they behaved themselves butler now went with a companion to augusta returning in about thirty minutes a committee called upon him as soon as he got back he had only to say that he demanded the arms immediately asked if he would accept the boxing up of the arms and the sending of them to the governor he said 
damn the governor i'm not here to consult him but am here as colonel butler and this won't stop until after november asked again if he would guarantee general protection of the arms were surrendered he said i guaranteed nothing all the while scores of mounted men were about the streets such members of the militia company as were in town and their friends to the number thirty-eight repaired to their armory a large brick building about two hundred yards from the river and barricaded themselves for protection firing upon the armory was begun by the mounted men and after half an hour there were occasional shots from within after a while the men in the building heard an order to bring cannon from augusta and they began to leave the building from the rear concealing themselves as well as they could in a cornfield the cannon was brought and discharged three or four times those firing it not knowing that the building had been evacuated when they realized their mistake they made a general search through lots and yards for the members of the company and finally captured twenty-seven of them after two had been killed the men none of whom now had arms were marched to a place near the railroad station where the sergeant of the company was ordered to call the roll allen t attaway whose name was first was called out and shot in cold blood twelve men fired upon him and he was killed instantly the men whose names were second third and fourth on the list were called out and treated likewise the fifth man made a dash for liberty and escaped with a slight wound in the leg all the others were then required to hold up their right hands and swear that they would never bear arms against the white people or give in court any testimony whatsoever regarding the occurrence they were then marched off two by two and dispersed but stray shots were fired after them as they went away in another portion of the town the chief of police james cook was taken from his home and brutally murdered a marshal of the town was shot through the body and mortally wounded one of the men killed was found with his tongue cut out the members of butler's party finally entered the homes of most of the prominent negroes in the town smashed the furniture tore books to pieces and cut pictures from their frames all amid the most heart-rending distress on the part of the women and children that night the town was desolate for all who could do so fled to aiken or columbia upon all of which our only comment is that while such a process might seem for a time to give the white man power it makes no progress whatever toward the ultimate solution of the problem four counter reaction the negro exodus the negro exodus of eighteen seventy nine was partially considered in connection with our study of liberia but a few facts are in place here after the withdrawal of federal troops conditions in the south were changed so much that especially in south carolina mississippi louisiana and texas the state of affairs was no longer tolerable between eighteen sixty six and eighteen seventy nine more than three thousand negroes were summarily killed the race began to feel that a new slavery in the horrible form of peonage was approaching and that the disposition of the men in power was to reduce the laborer to the minimum of advantages as a free man and to none at all as a citizen the fear which soon developed into a panic rose especially in consequence of the work of political mobs in eighteen seventy four and eighteen seventy five and it soon developed organization about this the outstanding fact was that the political leaders of the last few years were regularly distrusted and ignored the movement being secret in its origin and committed either to the plantation laborers themselves or their direct representatives in north carolina circulars about nebraska were distributed in tennessee benjamin papp singleton began about eighteen sixty nine to induce negroes to go to kansas and he really founded two colonies with a total of seven thousand four hundred and thirty two negroes from his state paying of his own money over six hundred dollars for circulars in louisiana alone seventy thousand names were taken of those who wished to better their condition by removal and by eighteen seventy eight ninety eight thousand persons in louisiana mississippi alabama and texas were ready to go elsewhere a convention to consider the whole matter of migration was held in nashville in eighteen seventy nine at this the politician managed to put in an appearance and there was much wordy discussion at the same time much of the difference of opinion was honest the meeting was on the whole constructive and it expressed itself as favorable to reasonable migration already however thousands of negroes were leaving their homes in the south and going in greatest numbers to kansas missouri and indiana within twenty months kansas alone received in this way an addition to her population of forty thousand persons many of these people arrived at their destination practically penniless and without prospect of immediate employment but help was afforded by relief agencies in the north and they themselves showed remarkable sturdiness in adapting themselves to the new conditions 
many of the stories of the negroes told were pathetic sometimes boats would not take them on and they suffered from long exposure on the river banks sometimes while they were thus waiting agents of their own people employed by the planters tried to induce them to remain frequently they were clubbed or whipped said one i saw a nine put in one pile that had been killed and the colored people had to bury them eight others were found killed in the woods it is done this way they arrest them for breach of contract and carry them to jail their money is taken from them by the jailer and it is not returned when they are let go said another if a colored man stays away from the polls and does not vote they spot him and make him vote if he votes their way they treat him no better in business they hire the colored people to vote and then take their pay away i know a man to whom they gave a cow and a calf for voting their ticket after election they came and told him that if he kept the cow he must pay for it and they took the cow and calf away another one man shook his fist in my face and said damn you sir you are my property he said that i owed him he could not show it and then said you shan't go anyhow all we want is a living chance another there is a general talk about the whites and colored people that jeff davis will run for president of the southern states and the colored people are afraid that they will be made slaves again they are already trying to prevent them from going from one plantation to another without a pass another the deputy sheriff came and took away from me a pair of mules he had a constable and twenty-five men with guns to back him another last year after settling with my landlord my share was four bales of cotton i shipped it to richardson and may thirty and forty perdido street new orleans through w e ringo and company merchants of mound landing mississippi i live four miles back of this landing i received from ringo a ticket showing that my cotton was sold at nine and three eight cents but i could never get a settlement he kept putting me off by saying that the bill of lading had not come those bills averaged over four hundred pounds i did not owe him over twenty-five dollars a man may work there from monday morning to saturday night and be as economical as he pleases and he will come out in debt i'm a close man and i work hard i want to be honest in getting through the world i came away and left a crop of corn and cotton growing up i left it because i did not want to work twelve months for nothing i've been trying it for fifteen years thinking every year that it would get better and it gets worse still said to another i learned about kansas from the newspapers that i got hold of they were southern papers i got a map and found out where kansas was and i got a history of the united states and read about it query was it genuine statesmanship that permitted these people to feel that they must leave the south five a postscript on the war and reconstruction of all of the stories of these epoch-making years we have chosen one an idol of a woman with an alabaster box of one who had a clear conception of the human problem presented and who gave her life in the endeavor to meet it in the fall of eighteen sixty two a young woman who was destined to be a great missionary entered the seminary at rockford illinois there was little to distinguish her from the other students except that she was very plainly dressed and seemed forced to spend most of her spare time at work yet there was one other difference she was older than most of the girls already thirty and rich in experience when not yet fifteen she had taught a country school in pennsylvania at twenty she was considered capable of managing an unusually turbulent crowd of boys and girls when she was twenty-seven her father died leaving upon her very largely the care of her mother at twenty-eight she already looked back upon fourteen years as a teacher upon some work for christ incidentally accomplished but also upon a fading youth of wasted hopes and unfulfilled desires then came a great decision not the first not the last but one of the most important that marked her long career her education was by no means complete and at whatever cost she would go to school that she had no money that her clothes were shabby that her mother needed her made no difference now or never she would realize her ambition she would do anything however menial if it was honest and would give her food while she continued her studies for one long day she walked the streets of belvedere looking for a home could any one use a young woman who wanted to work for her board always the same reply nightfall brought her to a farmhouse in the suburbs of the town she timidly knocked on the door no we do not need any one said the woman who greeted her but wait until i see my husband the man of the house was very unwilling but decided to give shelter for the night the next morning he thought differently about the matter and a few days afterwards the young woman entered school the work was hard fires had to be made breakfast on cold mornings had to be prepared and sometimes the washing was heavy naturally the time for lessons was frequently cut short extended far into the night but the woman of the house was kind and her daughter a helpful fellow student the next summer came another season of school teaching and then the term at rockford eighteen sixty two a great year 
that in american history won more famous for the defeat of the union arms than for their success but in september came antietam and the heart of the north took courage then with the new year came the emancipation proclamation the girls at rockford like the people everywhere were interested in the tremendous events that were shaking the nation a new note of seriousness crept into their work embroidery was laid aside instead socks were knit and bandages prepared on the night of january one a jubilee meeting was held in the town to joanna p moore however the news of freedom brought a strange undertone of sadness she could not help thinking of the spiritual and intellectual condition of the millions now emancipated strange that she should be possessed by this problem she had thought of work in china or india or even in africa but of this never in february a man who had been on island number ten came to the seminary and told the girls of the distress of the women and children there cabins and tents were everywhere as many as three families with eight or ten children each cooked their food in the same pot on the same fire sometimes the women were peevish or quarrelsome always the children were dirty what can a man do to help such a suffering mass of humanity asked the speaker nothing a woman is needed nobody else will do for the student listening so intently the cheery schoolrooms with their sweet associations faded the vision of foreign missions also vanished and in their stead stood only a pitiful black woman with a baby in her arms she reached island number ten in november the outlook was dismal enough the sunday school at belvedere had pledged four dollars a month toward her support and this was all the money in sight though the government provided transportation and soldiers rations that was in eighteen sixty three sixty years ago but every year since then until nineteen sixteen in summer and winter in sunshine and rain in the home and the church with teaching and praying feeding and clothing nursing and hoping and loving joanna p moore in one way or another ministered to the negro people of the south in april eighteen sixty four her whole colony was removed to helena arkansas the home farm was three miles from helena here was gathered a great crowd of women and children and helpless old men all under the guard of a company of soldiers in a fort near by thither went the missionary alone except for her faith in god she made an arbor with some rude seats nailed a blackboard to a tree divided the people into four groups and began to teach school in the twilight every evening a great crowd gathered around her cabin for prayers a verse of the bible was read and explained petitions were offered one of the sorrow songs was chanted and then the service was over some quaker workers were her friends in helena and in eighteen sixty eight she went to lauderdale mississippi to help the friends in an orphan asylum six weeks after her arrival the superintendent's daughter died and the parents left to take their child back to their indiana home to rest the lone woman was left in charge of the asylum cholera broke out eleven children died within one week still she stood by her post often she said those who were well and happy when they retired ere daylight came were in the grave for they were buried the same hour they died night after night she prayed to god in the dark and at length the fury of the plague was abated from time to time the failing health of her mother called her home and from eighteen seventy to eighteen seventy three she once more taught school near belvedere the first winter the school was in the country you can never have a sunday school in the winter they told her but she did in spite of the snow the house was crowded every sunday whole families coming as slaves even at that the real work of the teacher was with the negroes of the south in her prayers and public addresses they were always with her and in eighteen seventy three friends in chicago made it possible for her to return to the work of her choice in eighteen seventy seven woman's baptist home mission society honored itself by giving to her its first commission nine years she spent in the vicinity of new orleans near leland university she found a small one-room house after buying a bed a table two chairs and a few cooking utensils she began housekeeping often she started out at six in the morning not to return until dark most frequently she read the bible to those who could not read sometimes she gave cheer to mothers busy over the washtub sometimes she would teach the children to read or to sew often she would write letters for those who had been separated from friends or kindred in the dark days she wrote hundreds and hundreds of such letters and once in a while a very long while came a response most pitiful of all the objects she found in new orleans were the old women worn out with years of slavery they were usually rag pickers who ate at night the scraps from which they had begged during the day it was in the city an old lady's home but this was not for negroes a house was secured and the women taken in joanna moore and her associates moving into the second story sometimes very often there was real need but sometimes too provisions came when it was not known who sent them 
money or boxes came from northern friends who had never seen the workers and the little negro children in the sunday schools in the city gave their pennies in eighteen seventy the laborer in the southwest started on a journey of exploration in atlanta dr robert at atlanta baptist seminary now morehouse college gave her cheer so did president ware at atlanta university at benedict in columbia she saw dr goodspeed president tupper at shaw in raleigh and dr corey in richmond in may she appeared at the baptist anniversaries with fifteen years of missionary achievement already behind her but each year brought its own sorrows and disappointments she wanted the society to establish a training school for women but to this objection was raised and in louisiana also it was not without danger that a white woman attended a negro association in eighteen seventy seven and there were always sneers and jeers at length however a training school for mothers was opened in baton rouge all went well for two years and then a notice with skull and crossbones was placed on the gate the woman who had worked through the cholera still stood firm but the students had gone sick at heart and worn out with waiting she had last left baton rouge and the state in which so many of her best years had been spent bible band work was started in eighteen eighty four and hope in eighteen eighty five the little paper beginning with a circulation of five hundred has now reached a monthly issue of twenty thousand copies and daily it brings its lesson of cheer to thousands of mothers and children in the south in connection with it all is developed a fireside school than which few agencies have been more potent in the salvation and uplift of the humble negro home what wisdom was gathered from the passing of fourscore years on almost every page of her tracts her letters her account of her life one finds quotations of her verbial pith the love of god gave me courage for myself and the rest of mankind therefore i concluded to invest in human souls they surely are worth more than anything else in the world beloved friends be hopeful be courageous god cannot use discouraged people the good news spread not by telling what we were going to do but by praising god for what had been done so much singing in all our churches leaves too little time for the bible lesson do not misunderstand me i do love music that impresses the meaning of words but no one climbs to heaven on musical scales i thoroughly believe that the only way to succeed with any vocation is to make it a part of your very self and weave it into your everyday thought and prayer you must love before you can comfort and help there is no place too lowly or dark for our feet to enter and no place so high and bright but it needs the touch of the light that we carry from the cross how shall we measure such a life who can weigh love and hope and service and the joy of answered prayer an annual report of what she once asked the secretary of her organization report of tears shed prayers offered smiles scattered lessons taught steps taken cheering words warning words tender patient words for the little ones stern but loving tones for the wayward songs of hope and songs of sorrow wounded hearts healed light and love poured into dark sad homes oh miss burdett you might as well ask me to gather up the raindrops of last year or the petals that fall from the flowers that bloom it is true that i can send you a little stagnant water from the cistern and a few dried flowers but if you want to know the freshness the sweetness the glory the grandeur of our god-given work then you must come and keep step with us from early morn to night for three hundred and sixty-five days in the year until the very last she was on the roll of the active workers of the woman's american baptist home mission society in the fall of nineteen fifteen she decided that she must once more see the schools in the south that meant so much to her in december she came again to her beloved spellman while in atlanta she met with an accident that still further weakened her after a few weeks however she went on to jacksonville and then to selma there she passed when the son of man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory then shall the righteous answer him saying lord when saw we thee and hungered and fed thee or thirsty and gave thee drink when saw we thee a stranger and took thee in or naked and clothed thee or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee and the king shall answer and say unto them verily i say unto you inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren you have done it unto me End of section twenty one section twenty two of the social history of the american negro by benjamin brawley this recording is in the public domain chapter fourteen the negro in the new south one political life 
disfranchisement by eighteen seventy six the reconstruction governments had all but passed a few days after his inauguration in eighteen seventy seven president hayes sent to louisiana a commission to investigate the claims of rival governments there the decision was in favor of the democrats on april nine the president ordered the removal of federal troops from public buildings in the south and in columbia south carolina within a few days the democratic administration of governor wade hampton was formally recognized the new governments at once set about the abrogation of the election laws that had protected the negro in the exercise of suffrage and having by eighteen seventy seven obtained a majority in the national house of representatives the democrats resorted to the practice of attaching their repeal measures to appropriation bills in the hope of compelling the president to sign them men who had been prominently connected with the confederacy were being returned to congress in increasing numbers but in general the democrats were not able to carry their measures over the president's veto from the supreme court however they received practical assistance for while this body did not formally grant that the states had full powers over elections it nevertheless nullified many of the most objectionable sections of the laws before the close of the decade by intimidation the theft suppression or exchange of the ballot boxes the removal of the polls to unknown places false certifications and illegal arrests on the day before an election the negro vote had been rendered ineffectual in every state of the south when cleveland was elected in eighteen eighty four the negroes of the south naturally felt that the darkest hour of their political fortunes had come it had for among many other things this election said that after twenty years of discussion and tumult the negro question was to be relegated to the rear and that the country was now to give vain attention to other problems for the negro the new era was signalized by one of the most effective speeches ever delivered in this or any other country all the more forceful because the orator was a man of unusual nobility of spirit in eighteen eighty six henry w grady of georgia addressed the new england club in new york on the new south he spoke to practical men and he knew his ground he asked his hearers to bring their full faith in american fairness and frankness to judgment upon what he had to say he pictured in brilliant language the confederate soldier ragged half-starved heavy-hearted who wended his way homeward to find his house in ruins and his farm devastated he also spoke kindly of the negro whenever he struck a blow for his own liberty he fought in open battle and when at last he raised his black and humble hands that the shackles might be struck off those hands were innocent of wrong against his helpless charges but grady also implied that the negro had received too much attention and sympathy from the north said he to liberty and enfranchisement is as far as law can carry the negro the rest must be left to conscience and common sense hence on this occasion and others he asked that the south be left alone in the handling of her grave problem the north a little tired of the negro question a little uncertain also as to the wisdom of the reconstruction policy that it had forced on the south and if concerned with this section at all interested primarily in such investments as it had there assented to this request and in general the south now felt that it might order its political life in its own way as yet however the negro was not technically disfranchised and at any moment a sudden turn of events might call him into prominence formal legislation really followed the rise of the populist party which about eighteen ninety in many places in the south waged an even contest with the democrats it was evident that in such a struggle the negro might still hold the balance of power and within the next few years a fusion of the republicans and the populists in north carolina sent a negro george h white to congress this event finally served only to strengthen the movement for disfranchisement which had already begun 
in eighteen ninety the constitution of mississippi was so amended as to exclude from the suffrage any person who had not paid his poll tax or who was unable to read any section of the constitution or understand it when read to him or to give a reasonable interpretation of it the effect of the administration of this provision was that in eighteen ninety only eight thousand six hundred and fifteen negroes out of one hundred and forty seven thousand of voting age became registered south carolina amended her constitution with similar effect in eighteen ninety five in this state the population was almost three-fifths negro and two-fifths white the franchise of the negro was already in practical abeyance but the problem now was to devise a means for the perpetuity of a government of white men education was not popular as a test for by it many white illiterates would be disfranchised and in any case it would only postpone the race issue for some years the dominant party had been engaged in factional controversies with the populist wing led by benjamin r tillman prevailing over the conservatives it was understood however that each side would be given half of the membership of the convention which would exclude all negro and republican representation and that the constitution would go into effect without being submitted to the people said the most important provision any person who shall apply for registration after january one eighteen ninety eight if otherwise qualified shall be registered provided that he can both read and write any section of this constitution submitted to him by the registration officer or can show that he owns and has paid all taxes collectible during the previous year on property in this state assessed at three hundred dollars or more clauses which it is hardly necessary to say the registrars regularly interpreted in favor of white men and against the negro in eighteen ninety eight louisiana passed an amendment inventing the so-called grandfather clause this excused from the operation of her disfranchising act all descendants of men who had voted before the civil war thus admitting to the suffrage all white men who were illiterate and without property north carolina in nineteen hundred virginia and alabama in nineteen hundred and one georgia in nineteen hundred and seven and oklahoma in nineteen ten in one way or another practically disfranchised the negro care being taken in every instance to avoid any definite clash with the fifteenth amendment in maryland there have been several attempts to disfranchise the negro by constitutional amendments one in nineteen hundred and five another in nineteen hundred and nine and still another in nineteen eleven but all have failed about the intention of its disfranchising legislation the south as represented by more than one spokesman was very frank unfortunately the new order called forth a group of leaders represented by tillman in south carolina hope smith in georgia and james k vorderman in mississippi who made a direct appeal to prejudice and thus capitalized the racial feeling that already had been brought to too high tension naturally all such legislation as that suggested had ultimately to be brought before the highest tribunal in the country the test came over the following section from the oklahoma law no person shall be registered as an elector of this state or be allowed to vote in any election herein unless he shall be able to read and write any section of the constitution of the state of oklahoma but no person who was on january one eighteen sixty six or at any time prior thereto entitled to vote under any form of government or who at any time resided in some foreign nation and no lineal descendant of such person shall be denied the right to register and vote because of his inability to so read and write sections of such constitution this enactment the supreme court declared unconstitutional in nineteen fifteen the decision exerted no great and immediate effect on political conditions in the south nevertheless as the official recognition by the nation of the fact that the negro was not accorded his full political rights it was destined to have far-reaching effect on the whole political fabric of the section when the era of disfranchisement began it was in large measure expected by the south that with the practical elimination of the negro from politics this section would become wider in its outlook and divide on national issues such as not proved to be the case except for the noteworthy deflection of tennessee in the presidential election of nineteen twenty and republican gains in some counties and other states this section remains just as solid as it was forty years ago largely of course because the negro through education and the acquisition of property 
is becoming more and more a potential factor in politics meanwhile it is to be observed that the negro is not wholly without a vote even in the south and sometimes his power is used with telling effect as in the city of atlanta in the spring of nineteen nineteen when he decided in the negative the question of a bond issue in the north moreover especially in indiana ohio new jersey illinois pennsylvania and new york he has on more than one occasion proved the deciding factor in political affairs even when not voting however he involuntarily wields tremendous influence on the destinies of the nation for even though men may be disfranchised all are nevertheless counted in the allotment of congressmen to southern states this anomalous situation means that in actual practice the vote of one white man in the south is four or six or even eight times as strong as that of a man in the north and it directly accounted for the victory of president wilson and the democrats over the republicans led by charles e hughes in nineteen sixteen for remedying it by the enforcement of the fourteenth amendment bills have been frequently presented in congress but on these no action has been taken two economic life peonage within fifteen years after the close of the war it was clear that the emancipation proclamation was a blessing to the poor white man of the south as well as to the negro the break-up of the great plantation system was ultimately to prove good for all men whose slender means had given them little chance before the war at the same time came also the development of cotton mills throughout the south in which as early as eighteen eighty not less than sixteen thousand white people were employed with the decay of the old system the average acreage of holdings in the south atlantic states decreased from three hundred and fifty two point eight in eighteen sixty to one hundred and eight point four in nineteen hundred it was still not easy for an independent negro to own land on his own account nevertheless by as early a year as eighteen seventy four the negro farmers had acquired three hundred and thirty eight thousand seven hundred and sixty nine acres after the war the planters first tried the wage system for the negroes this was not satisfactory from the planters standpoint because the negro had not yet developed stability as a laborer from the negro standpoint because while the planter might advance rations he frequently postponed the payment of wages and sometimes did not pay at all then land came to be rented but frequently the rental was from eighty to one hundred pounds of lint cotton an acre for land that produced only two hundred to four hundred pounds in course of time the share system came to be most widely used under this the tenant frequently took his whole family into the cotton field and when the crop was gathered and he and the landlord rode together to the nearest town to sell it he received one-third one-half or two-thirds of the money according as he had or had not furnished his own food implements and horses or mules this system might have proved successful if he had not had to pay exorbitant prices for his rations as it was if the landlord did not directly furnish foodstuffs he might have an understanding with the keeper of the country store who frequently charged for a commodity twice what it was worth in the open market at the close of the summer there was regularly a huge bill waiting for the negro at the store this had to be disposed of first and he always came out just a few dollars behind however the landlord did not mind such small matter and in the joy of the harvest might even advance a few dollars but the understanding was always that the tenant was to remain on the land the next year thus were the chains of peonage forged about him at the same time there developed a still more vicious system immediately after the war legislation enacted in the south made severe provision with reference to vagrancy negroes were arrested on the slightest pretexts and their labor as that of convicts leased to landowners or other business men when a few years later negroes dissatisfied with the returns from their labor on the farms began a movement to the cities there arose a tendency to make the vagrancy legislation still more harsh so that at last a man could not stop work without technically committing a crime thus in all its hideousness developed the convict lease system this institution and the accompanying chain gang were at variance with all the humanitarian impulses of the nineteenth century sometimes prisoners were worked in remote parts of a state altogether away from the oversight of responsible officials 
if they stayed in a prison the department for women was frequently in plain view and hearing of the male convicts and the number of cubic feet in a cell was only one-fourth of what a scientific test would have required sometimes there was no place for the dressing of the dead except in the presence of the living the system was worst when the lessee was given the entire charge of the custody and discipline of the convicts and even of their medical or surgical care of real attention there frequently was none and reports had numerous blank spaces to indicate deaths from unknown causes the sturdiest man could hardly survive such conditions for more than ten years in alabama in eighteen eighty only three of the convicts had been in confinement for eight years and only one for nine in texas from eighteen seventy five to eighteen eighty the total number of prisoners discharged was one thousand six hundred and fifty one while the number of deaths and escapes for the same period totaled one thousand six hundred and eight in north carolina the mortality was eight times as great as in sing sing at last the conscience of the nation began to be heard and after eighteen eighty three there were remedial measures however the care of the prisoners still left much to be desired and as the negro is greatly in the majority among prisoners in the south and as he is still sometimes arrested illegally or on flimsy pretexts the whole matter of judicial and penal procedure becomes one of the first points of consideration in any final settlement of the negro problem three social life proscription lynching meanwhile proscription went forward separate and inferior travelling accommodations meagre provision for the education of negro children inadequate street lighting and water facilities in most cities and towns and the general lack of protection of life and property made living increasingly harder for a struggling people for the negro of aspiration or culture every day became a long train of indignities and insults on street cars he was crowded into a few seats generally in the rear he entered a railway station by a side door in a theatre he might occupy only a side or more commonly the extreme rear of the second balcony a house of ill fame might flourish next to his own little home and from public libraries he was shut out altogether except where a little branch was sometimes provided every opportunity for such self-improvement as a city might be expected to afford him was either denied him or given on such terms as his self-respect forced him to refuse meanwhile and worst of all he failed to get justice in the courts formally called before the bar he knew beforehand that the case was probably already decided against him a white boy might insult and pick a quarrel with his son but if the case reached the court room the white boy would be freed and the negro boy fined twenty-five dollars or sent to jail for three months some trivial incident involving no moral responsibility whatever on the negro's part might yet cost him his life lynching grew apace generally this was said to be for the protection of white womanhood but statistics certainly did not give rape the prominence that it held in the popular mind any cause of controversy however slight that forced the negro to defend himself against a white man might result in a lynching and possibly in a burning in the period of eighteen seventy one to seventy three the number of negroes lynched in the south is said to have been not more than eleven a year between eighteen eighty five and nineteen fifteen however the number of persons lynched in the country amounted to three thousand five hundred the great majority being negroes in the south for the year eighteen ninety two alone the figure was two hundred and thirty five one fact was outstanding astonishing progress was being made by the negro people but in the face of increasing education and culture on their part there was no diminution of the race feeling most southerners preferred still to deal with a negro of the old type rather than when one who was neatly dressed simple and unaffected in manner and ambitious to have a good home in any case however it was clear that since the white man held the power upon him rested primarily the responsibility of any adjustment old schemes for deportation or colonization in a separate state having proved ineffective or chimerical it was necessary to find a new platform on which both races could stand the negro was still the outstanding factor in agriculture and industry in large numbers he had to live and will live in georgia and south carolina mississippi and texas and there should have been some plain on which he could reside in the south not only serviceably but with justice to his self-respect the wealth of the new south it is to be remembered was won not only by the labor of black hands but also that of little white boys and girls 
as laborers and citizens real or potential both of these groups deserve the most earnest solicitude of the state for it is not upon the riches of the few but the happiness of the many that a nation's greatness depends moreover no state can build permanently or surely by denying to a half or a third of those governed any voice whatever in the government if the negro was ignorant he was also economically defenceless and it is neither just nor wise to deny to any man however humble any real power for his legal protection if these principles hold and we think that they are in line with enlightened conceptions of society the prosperity of the new south was by no means as genuine as it appeared to be and the disfranchisement of the negro morally and politically was nothing less than a crime End of section twenty two section twenty three of a social history of the american negro by benjamin griffith brawley this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fifteen the veil of tears eighteen ninety to nineteen ten part one one current opinion and tendencies in the two decades that we are now to consider we find the working out of all the large forces mentioned in our last chapter after a generation of striving the white south was once more thoroughly in control and the new program well under way predictions for both a broader outlook for the section as a whole and greater care for the negro's moral and intellectual advancement were destined not to be fulfilled and the period became one of bitter social and economic antagonism all of this was primarily due to the one great fallacy on which the prosperity of the new south was built and that was that the labor of the negro existed only for the good of the white man to this one source may be traced most of the ills borne by both white man and negro during the period if the negro's labor was to be exploited it was necessary that he be without the protection of political power and that he be denied justice in court if he was to be reduced to a peon certainly socially he must be given a peon's place accordingly there developed everywhere in schools in places of public accommodation in the facilities of city life the idea of inferior service for negroes and an unenlightened prison system flourished in all its hideousness furthermore as a result of the vicious economic system arose the sinister form of the negro criminal here again the south begged the question representative writers lamenting the passing of the dear dead days of slavery and pointing cynically to the effects of freedom on the negro they failed to remember in the case of the negro criminal that from childhood to manhood in education in economic chance in legal power they had by their own system deprived a human being of every privilege that was due him ruining him body and soul and then they stood aghast at the thing their hands had made more than that they blamed the race itself for the character that now sometimes appeared and called upon thrifty aspiring negroes to find the criminal and give him up to the law thrifty aspiring negroes wondered what was the business of the police it was this pitiful failure to get down to fundamentals that characterized the period and that made life all the more hard for those negroes who strove to advance every effort was made to brutalize a man and then he was blamed for not being a saint bernard 
fortunately before the period was over there arose not only clear-thinking men of the race but also a few white men who realized that such a social order could not last for ever early in the nineties however the pendulum had swung fully backward and the years from eighteen ninety to eighteen ninety five were in some ways the darkest that the race has experienced since emancipation when in eighteen ninety two cleveland was elected for a second term and the democrats were once more in power it seemed to the southern rural negro that the conditions of slavery had all but come again more and more the south formulated its creed it glorified the old aristocracy that had flourished and departed and definitely it began to ask the north if it had not been right after all it followed of course that if the old south had the real key to the problem the proper place of the negro was that of a slave within two or three years there were so many important articles on the negro in prominent magazines and these were by such representative men that taken together they formed a symposium in december eighteen ninety one james bryce wrote in the north american review pointing out that the situation in the south was a standing breach of the constitution that it suspended the growth of political parties and accustomed the section to fraudulent evasions and he emphasized education as a possible remedy he had quite made up his mind that the negro had little or no place in politics in january eighteen ninety two a distinguished classical scholar basil l gildersleeve turned aside from linguistics to write in the atlantic the creed of the old south which article he afterwards published as a special brochure saying that it had been more widely read than anything else he had ever written in april thomas nelson page in the north american contended that in spite of the five million dollars spent on the education of the negro in virginia between eighteen seventy and eighteen ninety the race had retrograded or not greatly improved and in fact that the negro did not possess the qualities to raise himself above slavery later in the same year he published the old south in the same month frederick l hoffman writing in the arena contended that in view of its mortality statistics the negro race would soon die out also in april eighteen ninety two henry watterson wrote of the negro in the chautauquan recalling the facts that the era a political turmoil had been succeeded by one of reaction and violence and that by one of exhaustion and peace but with all his insight he ventured no constructive suggestion thinking it best for everybody simply to be quiet for a time early in eighteen ninety three john c wycliffe a prominent lawyer of new orleans writing in the forum voiced the desires of many in asking for a repeal of the fifteenth amendment and in october bishop atticus g haygood writing in the same periodical of a recent and notorious lynching said it was horrible to torture the guilty wretch the burning was an act of insanity but had the dismembered form of his victim been the dishonored body of my baby i might also have gone into an insanity that might have ended never again and again was there the lament that the negroes of forty years after were both morally and intellectually inferior to their antebellum ancestors and if college professors and lawyers and ministers of the gospel wrote in this fashion one could not wonder that the politician made capital of choice propaganda in this chorus of dispraise truth struggled for a hearing but then has now travelled more slowly than error in the north american for july eighteen ninety two frederick douglass wrote vigorously of lynch law in the south in the same month george w cable answered affirmatively and with emphasis the question does the negro pay for his education he showed that in georgia in eighteen eighty nine to ninety 
the colored schools did not really cost the white citizens a cent and that in the other southern states the negro was also contributing his full share to the maintenance of the schools in june of the same year william t harris commissioner of education wrote in truly statesmanlike fashion in the atlantic of the education of the negro said he with the colored people all educated in schools and become a reading people interested in the daily newspaper with all forms of industrial training accessible to them and the opportunity so improved that every form of mechanical and manufacturing skill has its quota of colored working men and women with a colored ministry educated in a christian theology interpreted in a missionary spirit and finding its auxiliaries in modern science and modern literature with these educational essentials the negro problem for the south will be solved without recourse to violent measures of any kind whether migration or disfranchisement or ostracism in december eighteen ninety three walter h page writing in the form of lynching under the title the last hold of the southern bully said that the great danger is not in the first violation of law nor in the crime itself but in the danger that southern public sentiment under the stress of this phase of the race problem will lose the true perspective of civilization and ellie bleckley chief justice of georgia spoke in similar vein on the whole however the country well occasionally indignant at some atrocity had quite decided not to touch the negro question for a while and when in the spring of eighteen ninety two some representative negroes protested without avail to president harrison against the work of mobs the review of reviews that voiced the drift of current opinion when it said as for the colored men themselves their wisest course would be to cultivate the best possible relations with the most upright and intelligent of their white neighbors and for some time to come to forget all about politics and to strive mightily for industrial and educational progress it is not strange that under the circumstances we have now to record such discrimination crime and mob violence as can hardly be paralleled in the whole of american history the negro was already down he was now to be trampled upon when in the spring of eighteen ninety two some members of the race in the lowlands of mississippi lost all they had by the floods and the federal government was disposed to send relief the state government protested against such action on the ground that it would keep the negroes from accepting the terms offered by the white planters in louisiana in eighteen ninety five a negro presiding elder reported to the southwestern christian advocate that he had lost a membership of a hundred souls the people being compelled to leave their crops and move away within ten days in eighteen ninety one the jail at omaha was entered and a negro taken out and hanged to a lamp-post on february twenty seventh eighteen ninety two at jackson louisiana where there was a pound party for the minister at the negro baptist church a crowd of white men gathered shooting revolvers and halting the negroes as they passed most of the people were allowed to go on but after a while the sport became furious and two men were fatally shot about the same time and in the same state at rayville a negro girl of fifteen was taken from a jail by a mob and hanged to a tree in texarkana arkansas a negro who had outraged a farmer's wife was captured and burned alive the injured woman herself being compelled to light the fire just a few days later in march a constable in memphis in attempting to arrest a negro was killed numerous arrests followed and at night a mob went to the jail gained easy access and having seized three well-known negroes who were thought to have been leaders in the killing lynched them the whole proceeding being such a flagrant violation of law that it has not yet been forgotten by the older negro citizens of this important city on february one eighteen ninety three at paris texas after one of the most brutal crimes occurred one of the most horrible lynchings on record henry smith the negro who seems to have harbored a resentment against a policeman of the town because of ill-treatment that he had received 
seized the officer's three-year-old child outraged her and then tore her body to pieces he was tortured by the child's father her uncles and her fifteen-year-old brother his eyes being put out with hot irons before he was burned his stepson who had refused to tell where he could be found was hanged and his body riddled with bullets thus the lynchings went on the victims sometimes being guilty of the gravest crimes but often also perfectly innocent people in february eighteen ninety three the average was very nearly one a day at the same time injuries inflicted on the negro were commonly disregarded altogether thus at dixon tennessee a young white man lost forty dollars a fortune teller told him that the money had been taken by a woman and gave a description that seemed to fit a young colored woman who had worked in the home of a relative half a dozen men then went to the home of the young woman and outraged her her mother and also another woman who was in the house at the very close of eighteen ninety four in brooks county georgia after a negro named pike had killed a white man with whom he had a quarrel seven negroes were lynched after the real murderer had escaped any relative or other negro who questioned refused to tell of the whereabouts of pike whether he knew of the same or not was shot in his tracks one man being shot before he had chance to say anything at all meanwhile the white caps or regulators took charge of the neighboring counties terrifying the negroes everywhere and in the trials that resulted the state courts broke down altogether one judge in despair giving up the holding of court as useless meanwhile discrimination of all sorts went forward on may twenty ninth eighteen ninety five moved by the situation at the orange park academy the state of florida approved an act to prohibit white and colored youth from being taught in the same schools said one section it shall be a penal offence for any individual body of inhabitants corporation or association to conduct within this state any school of any grade public private or parochial wherein white persons and negroes shall be instructed or boarded within the same building or taught in the same class or at the same time by the same teacher religious organizations were not to be left behind in such action and when before the meeting of the baptist young people's union in baltimore a letter was sent to the secretary of the organization and the editor of the baptist union in behalf of the negroes who the year before had not been well treated at toronto he sent back an evasive answer saying that the policy of his society was to encourage local unions to affiliate with their own churches more grave than anything else was the formal denial of the negroes political rights as we have seen south carolina in eighteen ninety five followed mississippi in the disfranchising program and within the next fifteen years most of the other southern states did likewise with the negro thus deprived of any genuine political voice all sorts of social and economic injustice found greater license to industrial education booker t washington such were the tendencies of life in the south as affecting the negro thirty years after emancipation in september eighteen ninety five a rising educator of the race attracted national attention by a remarkable speech that he made at the cotton states exposition in atlanta said booker t washington to those of my race who depend on bettering their condition in a foreign land or who underestimate the importance of cultivating friendly relations with the southern white man who is their next-door neighbor i would say cast down your bucket where you are cast it down in making friends in every manly way of the people of all races by whom we are surrounded to those of the white race who look to the incoming of those of foreign birth and strange tongue and habits for the prosperity of the south were i permitted i would repeat what i say to my own race cast down your bucket where you are cast it down among eight million negroes whose habits you know whose fidelity and love you have tested in days when to have proved treacherous meant the ruin of your firesides in all things that are purely social we can be as separate as the fingers 
yet one as the hand in all things essential to mutual progress the message that dr washington thus enunciated he had already given in substance the previous spring in an address at fisk university and even before then his work at tuskegee institute had attracted attention the atlanta exposition simply gave him the great occasion that he needed and he was now to proclaim the new word throughout the length and breadth of the land among the hundreds of addresses that he afterwards delivered especially important were those at harvard university in eighteen ninety six at the chicago peace jubilee in eighteen ninety eight and before the national education association in st louis in nineteen o four again and again in these speeches one comes upon such striking sentences as the following freedom can never be given it must be purchased the race like the individual that makes itself indispensable has solved most of its problems as a race there are two things we must learn to do one is to put brains into the common occupations of life and the other is to dignify common labor ignorant and inexperienced it is not strange that in the first years of our new life we began at the top instead of at the bottom that a seat in congress or the state legislature was worth more than real estate or industrial skill the opportunity to earn a dollar in a factory just now is worth infinitely more than the opportunity to spend a dollar in an opera house one of the most vital questions that touch our american life is how to bring the strong wealthy and learn it into helpful contact with the poorest most ignorant and humblest and at the same time make the one appreciate the vitalizing strengthening influence of the other there is no defence or security for any of us except in the highest intelligence and development of us all the time was ripe for a new leader frederick douglass had died in february eighteen ninety five in his later years he had more than once lost hold on the heart of his people as when he opposed the negro exodus or seemed not fully in sympathy with the religious convictions of those who looked to him at his passing however the race remembered only his early service and his old magnificence and to a striving people his death seemed to make still darker the gathering gloom coming when he did booker t washington was thoroughly in line with the materialism of his age he answered both an economic and an educational crisis he also satisfied the south of the new day by what he had to say about social equality the story of his work reads like a romance and he himself has told it better than any one else ever can he did not claim the credit for the original idea of industrial education that he gave to general armstrong and it was at hampton that he himself had been nurtured what was needed however was for some one to take the hampton idea down to the cotton belt interpret the lesson for the men and women digging in the ground and generally to put the race in line with the country's industrial development this was what booker t washington undertook to do he reached tuskegee early in june eighteen eighty one july four was the date set for the opening of the school in the little shanty and church which had been secured for its accommodation on the morning of this day thirty students reported for admission the greater number were school teachers and some were nearly forty years of age just about three months after the opening of the school there was offered for sale an old and abandoned plantation a mile from tuskegee on which the mansion had been burned all told the place seemed to be just the location needed to make the work effective and permanent the price asked was five hundred dollars the owner requiring the immediate payment of two hundred and fifty dollars the remaining two hundred and fifty to be paid within a year in his difficulty mr washington wrote to general j f b marshall treasurer of hampton institute placing the matter before him and asking for the loan of two hundred and fifty dollars general marshall replied that he had no authority to lend money belonging to hampton institute but that he would gladly advance the amount needed from his personal funds toward the paying of this sum the assisting teacher olivia a davidson afterwards mrs washington helped heroically her first effort was made 
by holding festivals and suppers but she also canvassed the families in the town of tuskegee and the white people as well as the negroes helped her it was often pathetic said the principal to note the gifts of the older colored people many of whom had spent their best days in slavery sometimes they would give five cents sometimes twenty-five cents sometimes the contribution was a quilt or a quantity of sugar-cane i recall one old colored woman who was about seventy years of age who came to see me when we were raising money to pay for the farm she hobbled into the room where i was leaning on a cane she was clad in rags but they were clean she said mr washington god knows i spent the best days of my life in slavery god knows i was ignorant and poor but i knows what you and miss davidson is trying to do i knows you is trying to make better men and better women for the colored race i ain't got no money but i want you to take these six eggs what i's been savin up and i wants you to put these six eggs into de education a de spoys and gals since the work at tuskegee started added the speaker it has been my privilege to receive many gifts for the benefit of the institution but never any i think that touched me as deeply as this one it was early in the history of the school that mr washington conceived the idea of extension work the tuskegee conferences began in february eighteen ninety two to the first meeting came five hundred men mainly farmers and many women outstanding was the discussion of the actual terms on which most of the men were living from year to year a mortgage was given on the cotton crop before it was planted and to the mortgage was attached a note which waived all right to exemptions under the constitution and laws of the state of alabama or of any other state to which the tenant might move said one the mortgage ties you tighter than any rope and a wave note is a consuming fire said another the wave note is good for twenty years and when you sign one you must either pay out or die out another when you sign a wave note you just cross your hands behind you and go to the merchant and say here tie me and take all i've got all agreed that the people mortgaged more than was necessary to buy sewing machines which sometimes were not used expensive clocks great family bibles or other things easily dispensed with said one man my people want all they can get on credit not thinking of the day of settlement we must learn to bore with a small arger first the black man totes a heavy bundle and when he puts it down there is a plough a hoe and ignorance it was to people such as these that booker t washington brought hope and serving them he passed on to fame within a few years schools on the plan of tuskegee began to spring up all over the south at denmark at snow hill at utica and elsewhere in nineteen hundred the national negro business league began its sessions giving great impetus to the establishment of banks stores and industrial enterprises throughout the country and especially in the south much of this progress would certainly have been realized if the business league had never been organized but every one granted that in all the development the genius of the leader at tuskegee was the chief force about his greatness and his very definite contribution there could be no question three individual achievement the spanish-american war it happened that just at the time that booker t washington was advancing to great distinction three or four other individuals were reflecting special credit on the race one of these was a young scholar w e burkhart du bois who after a college career at fisk continued his studies at harvard and berlin and finally took the ph d at harvard in eighteen ninety five there had been sound scholars in the race before du bois but generally these had rested on attainment in the languages or mathematics and most frequently they had expressed themselves in rather philosophical disquisition here however was a thorough student of economics and one who was able to attack the problems of his people and meet opponents on the basis of modern science he was destined to do great good and the race was proud of him in eighteen ninety six also an authentic young poet who had wrestled with poverty and doubt at last gained a hearing after completing the course at a high school in dayton paul lawrence dunbar ran an elevator for four dollars a week and then he peddled from door to door two little volumes of verse that had been privately printed 
william dean howells at length gave him a helping hand and dodd meade and company published lyrics of lowly life dunbar wrote both in classic english and in the dialect that voiced the humour and the pathos of the life of those for whom he spoke what was not at the time especially observed was that in numerous poems he suggested the discontent with the age in which he lived and thus struck what later years were to prove an important keynote after he had waited and struggled so long his success was so great that it became a vogue and imitators sprang up everywhere he touched the heart of his people and the race loved him by eighteen ninety six also word began to come of a negro american painter henry o tanner who was winning laurels in paris at the same time a beautiful singer madame cicioretta jones on the concert stage was giving new proof of the possibilities of the negro as an artist in song in the previous decade madame marie selica a cultured vocalist of the first rank had delighted audiences in both america and europe and in eighteen eighty seven had appeared flora batson a ballad singer whose work at its best was of the sort that sends an audience into the wildest enthusiasm in eighteen ninety four moreover harry t burley competing against sixty candidates became baritone soloist at st george's episcopal church new york and just a few years later he was to be employed also at temple emmanuel the fifth avenue jewish synagogue from abroad also came word of a brilliant musician samuel coleridge taylor who by his hiawatha's wedding feast in eighteen ninety eight leaped into the rank of the foremost living english composers on the more popular stage appeared light musical comedy intermediate between the old negro minstrelsy and a genuine negro drama the representative companies becoming within the next few years those of cole and johnson and williams and walker especially outstanding in the course of the decade however was the work of the negro soldier in the spanish-american war there were at the time four regiments of colored regulars in the army of the united states the twenty fourth infantry the twenty fifth infantry the ninth cavalry and the tenth cavalry when the war broke out president mckinley sent to congress a message recommending the enlistment of more regiments of negroes congress failed to act nevertheless colored troops enlisted in the volunteer service in massachusetts indiana illinois kansas ohio north carolina tennessee and virginia the eighth illinois was officered throughout by negroes j r marshall commanding and major charles e young a west point graduate was in charge of the ohio battalion the very first regiment ordered to the front when the war broke out was the twenty fourth infantry and negro troops were conspicuous in the fighting around santiago they figured in a brilliant charge at las Quasimas on june twenty four and in an attack on july one upon a garrison at el caney a position of importance for securing possession of a line of hills along the san juan river a mile and a half from santiago the first volunteer cavalry colonel roosevelt's rough riders was practically safe from annihilation by the gallant work of the men of the tenth cavalry fully as patriotic though in another way was a deed of the twenty fourth infantry learning that general miles desired a regiment for the cleaning of a yellow fever hospital and the nursing of some victims of the disease the twenty fourth volunteered its services and by one day's work so cleared away the rubbish and cleaned the camp that the number of cases was greatly reduced said the review of reviews in editorial comment one of the most gratifying incidents of the spanish war has been the enthusiasm that the colored regiments of the regular army have aroused throughout the whole country their fighting at santiago was magnificent the negro soldiers showed excellent discipline the highest qualities of personal bravery very superior physical endurance unfailing good temper and the most generous disposition toward all comrades in arms whether white or black roosevelt's rough riders have come back singing the praises of the colored troops there is not a dissenting voice in the chorus of praise men who can fight for their country as did these colored troops ought to have their full share of gratitude and honor end of section twenty three